<laughs> For as long as I've known, I have always had unexplained experiences along with my mother, grandmother, and siblings. I'm starting to think this is a genetic trend, although I feel I have these occurrences more often than they do. I'm now at the age of 29. Most of these experiences happened when I was younger. I'm going to tell you one of an experience I had in this story when I think I may have visited hell. I remember this night very vividly. My parents were harshly arguing with one another, as usual. It died down after a while, but I still went to bed a little overwhelmed. I remember falling asleep like usual, like any other night, nothing different. From what I can explain, is to me, it felt as though my soul has lifted out of my body and drifted into another dimension. It felt like I was flying through the air bodiless and then promptly landed in what I thought to be a dimension of hell. I landed on high altitude light brown rock formation and it seemed to be a very hot summer day. Everything seemed very physical and realistic. The sky looked normal, but as I looked around, there were no living creatures. Nothing was alive. There was no grass, no trees, nothing but this brown rock material for as far as I could see. I realized I had been placed in near the front of a line alongside with my mom against other people I had never even seen before, facing a little white chapel-like house that seemed to be the only thing in the entire dimension. The people in line looked like everyday ordinary people, except no one was making noise or moving a muscle. Everyone was very silent and still looking at the chapel-like house. I was very confused on what was happening. I began observing, but I never got out of line. I'm not sure why. It felt out of my control to do so. All of a sudden, I heard a very deep, scary demonic voice that muttered the words, Go inside. I looked up to see where it came from, and there was a huge, transparent, dominant-looking face in the sky. I couldn't really make it out, or its features, or exactly what it was looking at. There was a few people in front of me who began walking slowly into the chapel-like house. They seemed terrified, but had no choice but to go in. A few people had to go in at a time, and the door slammed behind them. We were next in line. I turned to my mom, who was behind me, and whispered frantically because I didn't want the face to hear me. Don't go in. It's not safe. She nodded in agreement with me, but seemed kind of zombie-like as she didn't actually reply to me. As I looked at the chapel, there was a huge window in front that I could see in. What I saw was very disturbing and mentally unexplainable. It was very dark inside. The only thing I could see was four autopsy tables with four people on them as though they were dead, but not dead. I could only see from their feet up to their waist. It seemed like they were dead, but were able to move their feet. They looked like they were freshly dead. They didn't look like they had rotted or anything like that. Each of them seemed to have had a little ticket wrapped on each of their big toes, along with a white blanket covering them. I couldn't even see any further than that. It almost seemed like I was being forced to walk into a torture chamber. I was petrified and unable to move, and the door looked as if it was about to open again. All of a sudden, everything disappeared, and everything went to a fog. It seemed as if my soul traveled back to my body and I could see myself sleeping. That itself was very chilling and in a flesh I shot into my body and woke up all at once. I absolutely can't mark this off as just a dream 
And I would love to hear any comments, feedback, or similar experiences anyone has had. The Baby Cemetery In this story, I'm going to tell you one of my many real-life experiences. I was about 16 when this event occurred, and I'll never be able to explain how this happened or exactly what it was that I experienced. I remember falling asleep in my blue waterbed the night this occurred. That being said, let me begin. I woke up, but it wasn't my bed that I was in. It was someone else's. As I sat there confused, I also realized I wasn't in my own house either. The bed's sheets and comforter were white with purple flowers. The room was tan. There was a window to my right that was open, and the plain white curtains were blown softly as the daylight came through. The bed was located in the left corner of the room, touching the wall. I just laid there, confused. I was still very tired, so I closed my eyes for a moment or two. When I opened my eyes, I was surrounded by five dead babies that were all facing me. They were very gray and rotted looking. They stared at me with very dark, soulless eyes. They had a cloth diaper and couldn't have been over the age of one. I felt complete terror in that moment. I could not move a single muscle in my body or make any type of emotion. It felt like the dead infants were there for hours. Suddenly, they disappeared, and the day became night in the blink of an eye. I remember finally getting up out of the bed and walking through the house. I could feel the physicality of everything I did, and I was very observant. I remember feeling like the house was very sad and lonely, like I was there to help somehow. I walked outside of the house and looked at the front of it. I couldn't put it together in the dream, but it looked very familiar. Suddenly, I woke up again, but this time in my own bed and in my own house. The dream was still very vivid in my mind, and that's when I remembered why the house looked familiar. A few weeks earlier, I had dropped off my friend's 13-year-old brother's friend at his home, but I never went inside. The house was the exact house I had seen in my dream on the outside. This was something that I had to tell him about. The next day, he was at my friend's house, so I told him I had a dream that I was in his house. When I first told him this, he was laughing and denying it, until I started explaining his entire house in detail to him. I told him about the room I woke up in, everything that was in it, how many stairs he had on his staircase, and everything I had seen in exact detail. He looked completely shocked. He knew I had never been in his house before. He started crying and explained to me that his mom has been experiencing similar things. Apparently it was his mom's room that I had woke up in. The backyard to their house had a very small yard and then nothing but woods. He told me that he and his mom had walked deep into the woods once and found a children's cemetery from the late 1800s, and the graves were all for babies. Thanks for reading. It's that thing again. Jeez. So one day, my mom had made a bottle for my brother, and she checked it and everything. Then went to get my brother. When she came back to the kitchen, the bottle was gone. We checked everywhere, and we didn't find it. So my mom just gave up and made another one. She fed my brother and bathed him. Then we went to sleep. The next day, everyone woke up and got ready for church. When we got to the living room, the bottle that my mom had made was in the middle of the living room. I, being my dumb self, went to grab it. Just as I grabbed it, 
The bottle turned really hot, and it burned my hand. My mom was scared, and my dad was trying to stay stable. When I screamed, I felt a pressure on my chest, and then my brother started babbling, then started crying really hard, and then my dog looked at me, then started barking extremely loud. Then I felt the pressure come off, and at the same time, my brother stopped crying, and my dog stopped barking. When that happened, I just fell to the ground and started crying. My mom was in shock, so my oldest sister ran to me and just held me there for like 10 minutes. Another one is that when my cousin was a baby, she would fall asleep in the living room, and when we would take her to her room, she would cry looking up at the ceiling. My uncle told his co-worker, and his co-worker told him to take a picture wherever my cousin was looking. He did, and when he looked at the picture, it was a huge skeleton head, and it didn't stop there. They had so many things happen, but I'll tell those stories later. Thanks for reading. The Wood Street Years this may be a little long and oddly written as I had to write it all down quickly. It's not exactly a single story, but more of a collection of experiences from my old house that I wanted to discuss with you all to see what ideas and theories you all had. My family moved into the house in 1987. It was a 1950s council owned property that they were renting. The village was an old place that housed a lot of miners that would go to and from the local coal pits and also had mines under the most of the streets. It was an odd but lovely place, but there were always stories of hauntings throughout the village. It was as if the whole place was a hotbed of activity. Ever since the move to this new house, my family experienced odd things. My sister would complain of people sitting on the edge of her bed during the night. My father was followed by a hooded figure, even outside in the streets, and my mother had personal items vanish. Over the years, the activity became more and more intense. In 1995, my father moved out and went to live elsewhere, but we, my mother, sister, and brother stayed in the house. My sister complained of activity in the house when we were out. Banging and scraping from the kitchen, items being shuffled, plates clattered. She got so scared at times that she would run into my mother's bedroom and sleep in there. The stairs and landing area always held some nasty element to it. And on the whole, the entire family hated it without any reason to. It was just something we all felt and never really voiced to each other until many years later. If we had to turn off the light in the hall, we'd run out and run back in. If we had to turn off the landing light at night, we'd do the same. We'd run out of the bedroom and quickly turn it off, only to hurl ourselves back into bed as fast as we could. And heaven forbid, we needed the toilet during the night. My sister eventually moved out and got married, and so did my brother. This left myself and my mother alone in the house. My mother got a job after years of being unemployed, so I'd often be on my own from 5 a.m. to 12 p.m. It was then I began to really notice things. One morning, I had decided that instead of staying awake from 5 a.m., I would get some more rest. I settled back down into bed and closed my eyes. The next thing I knew, I heard a banging sound, followed by hurried footsteps coming up the stairs. The thing was, I knew it was our stairs, as they had a unique and distinct squeak to them. The top step would creak, and the next two steps up would make a lighter squeak. Then a thud. It was definitely them. I thought Mom had come back due to forgetting something, like keys or her purse even, but there was silence. 
We had a break in a couple of years previous, so I was naturally on edge. It was actually my first thought. So I grabbed my phone and called my mother, who was almost at work, so it couldn't have been her. She also had assured me that she had locked the door, as normal. I was on the phone when I heard the exact same footsteps again. I have no idea how I did it, but I got back to sleep about a half an hour later. A couple of years passed where nothing much happened. Just the odd thing, like items vanishing and reappearing, noises from the attic and odd smells. Then we started noticing it again. My mother and myself went to the shops one day to pick up a snack from the local deli. When we returned, there was dripping coming from the ceiling just above the back door. We could hear whooshing from the pipes too. We bolted upstairs to find the bathroom taps fully on and the plug in. The bathroom was flooded. To this day, we have no idea what the hell happened there. This happened again about two years after when we returned from an outing with my brother. This time, the plug was not in, thankfully. It was from that point, it began to get more and more frequent. I would see things at night that I couldn't explain. I first put it down to lucid dreaming, but I was not the only one seeing them. I would see strange insect-like creatures crawling up the curtains and on the ceiling. I'd stare at them, and they would vanish after about 15 seconds. There was one time that I was not sleepy and I was looking out the bedroom window at the street. It was about 1 a.m. at the time and I saw something very strange on the hedge that surrounded the house. The only way to describe it was a spider, but it had ridiculously long legs and it was gliding effortlessly across the top of the hedge. My fiancé also saw this for himself back in 2009, and he sat there staring in amazement. And he's a skeptic too. Other things I would see were a man in my room. He would be halfway through the floor of the room. The stairs were directly under my room. Sometimes I would open my eyes and see a face looking back at me in close proximity only to fade in a second or two. I admit, that was very unwelcome. The last few years of living in the house had more physical things happen. Objects would be thrown across the room, things would stop working, or randomly activate by themselves. My laptop, which, by the way, does not do it anymore now. I live elsewhere. And we, my mother and myself, would have our covers pulled from us when in bed. I remember one night literally having to battle to keep the cover on me. There were also random and vile smells, almost like rotting meat and an invasion of flies. Thankfully, this only happened once and only lasted three weeks or so. We even checked for dead animals. But of course, we found nothing. Now keep reading because it gets a lot more freakier. My fiancé moved in with me in the house not long before we moved out. He was the type that didn't believe in ghosts. He had been taught from an early age that when you die, that is it. My mother began to date again and was out of the house frequently, leaving myself and my fiancé alone. We decided to clean the house up a little as we wanted to make my mother feel happier. She had been suffering from severe depression. I don't think it was approved of as things kept going wrong. The vacuum would randomly overheat, even though in this new house, it never has. Things would fall on us. Items would vanish. I even had the unit of our old computer literally fling out from under the desk. It hit me square on my shin even though there was no way it could have. I also had the vacuum cleaner itself chucked at me. We would also hear loud thumps from inside the wardrobe, as if someone was punching it from the inside. 
We'd joke and say, "Uh, enough of that. Probably not the best of ideas, but we didn't intend to be scared by it, whatever it was. Another thing we noted was that when the door to my brother's old room, which had been used for storage over the previous few years, was left open, the toilet light would turn itself on. We would be out during the day, return at night, and it would be on. Or we'd wake up in the morning, and it would be on. But it didn't happen when the door was shut. One day, I recall the door being left open, and I saw a stack of my drawings get lifted and flipped through right in front of my eyes. This was in the dead of winter, with no doors or windows open. Needless to say, I was not impressed and slept with the covers over my head that night. One night, my fiancé was upstairs shaving while I was amusing myself playing a Facebook game. It was midnight, so naturally I was hungry. I always get hungry for some reason after midnight. So I went to the kitchen and started making myself a snack. I was addicted to omelet and cheese bagels at the time, so I started making one. After it had finished cooking, I took it into the living room and continued messing about on the game I was playing. I had almost finished it when I heard Lee shout from on the landing. We had no bathroom light at the time as the bulb had gone and we couldn't get the light cover off to replace it, so Lee was having to use a mirror on the landing. I went up to see what he wanted and he said that he had seen a man in the mirror looking back at him. I was naturally confused, but my gut did flip-flops. I asked what kind of man, and he said it was a short, bald man. He even said that he stared at him and could see him out of the corner of his eye, looking over his shoulder, as if it was a real person present. Remember, my fiancé is a skeptic. I admit, I was a touch unnerved. The door to my mother's room, which we had taken as our own by that point, was open a little way, and for some reason, I daren't look in. I also felt a little horrible cold feeling that felt as if it was wrapped around my ankles. I didn't want to stay up there at all. I went downstairs and called my mother up to see if there was anyone in the family who had died that fit the description. She said there was no one. So I tried to shrug it off immediately and finished the last bit of my bagel, only for my fiancé to shout again. He came running down the stairs with foam still on his face, saying that he'd seen him again. Only this time, it was as if he was screaming at him, but he couldn't hear any sound. It had really freaked him out, and he was incredibly uncomfortable. I said for him to finish shaving quickly and calm down. Reluctantly, he went back up and tried to shave. But for some reason, the razor was not cutting anymore, no matter how hard he pressed. Also, the cold tap was chugging out scalding hot water, which burned his hand. During this time, I had gotten onto my mother again and told her he had seen this man again in the mirror. While I was on the phone, I could hear odd noises coming from upstairs. My fiancé finished shaving and ran downstairs again, only to pause and stare into the kitchen with an absolutely horrified look on his face. I stopped talking to Mom to ask him what was wrong. He said that he had seen the man again outside the kitchen window, walking past with an unearthly grin on his face and his was very skinny and looked like he had no arm on one side. I told him to get into the living room and while I was still talking to my mother, I could hear loud footsteps coming from above me, my mother's old room. My bones were also cold and the atmosphere was horrific. She suggested I get in touch with my brother so I could stay the night at his. But while she was talking, I felt the atmosphere lift suddenly. It was instantly warmer again, and I felt oddly happy. I actually mentioned it to her, 
as it was so sudden and drastic. But then, it dropped again. The feeling of dread and the cold returned, and it felt as if something was circling us. I got off the phone with her and called my brother. In a state of panic, I explained what was happening and the fact that we couldn't just stay in the house. We ended up at his place, sleeping in his living room. And now my fiancé is more open-minded about the paranormal. The house was never right from the start. I would love to know just what was going on there, but I guess I will never truly know. The day we moved out was interesting too. During the move, my mother had experienced a couple of little things while alone, i.e. a piece of paper scooting across the bedroom floor. But it was when the house was totally empty and the power had been turned off. Myself and my brother's missus went to check the rooms to be sure we hadn't left anything. All was well and clear. Then we got to my brother's old room. We opened the door and we were hit in the face by the most intense cold breeze. It was bone chilling. It made our eyes water. We turned to each other, nodded, and said that it was fine and we should go. We legged it down the stairs, said goodbye to the house, and left to live in this new house we are in now. I wouldn't say that my story is a haunting, just a presence that I feel every day. My grandmother died in January 2003. At that time, my daughter was only 14 months old. My grandma just lived and breathed her grandchildren. We always used to say that the love was so strong that she would probably come back and see them. Well, I think that is exactly what is happening in my house. I've never seen her but I feel her presence. My daughter, I would think, would not remember my grandma because she was so young. It's been over a year now since her death. And my daughter is now two and a half years old. She constantly talks about Gigi visiting her in her room. Gigi meant great grandma, and that's what all the kids called her. She tells me things that she wouldn't know. She sees pictures and knows exactly who she is. She tells us that Gigi visits her in her room at night, with a flashlight, or she will say, Tell Gigi to stop waving at me. Last night, as I was tucking her in bed, she looked at me and said, Shh. I said, Why? She responded that Gigi was standing right there. I casually just said, Oh yeah? And she again responded, Yes, she is right there and she is waving at me with a ladybug in her hand. And she proceeds to tell me that Gigi plays with her and her toys all the time. After she said that, she looked over to the area where she said Gigi was and smiled and laughed. I said to her, what are you laughing at? Her response was, Gigi, she told me that I have to start using the potty. Jamie is still potty training. Another time, we were driving in our car on our way home from shopping. It just so happened to be my grandmother's birthday that day, but it was not mentioned at all. It was just in our minds that today was her birthday. My daughter said to me, You know what today is, Mommy? I said, No. What? She said, Today is Gigi's birthday. I was shocked. I asked her how she knew about that, and her response was, Gigi told me herself. She's sitting right next to me, almost as a matter of fact sort of way. Different things like this happened since she died. I don't feel that she is haunting us. I just feel that she loved my daughter so much that she likes to see her. Do you think that is the case? Or am I going crazy? When I was 10, both my grandparents died. Before them, my aunt and uncle died also. They lived with us. Both nights after we found out, my sister and I both woke up in the middle of the night to feel our bed shaking violently while everything else in the house was still. Then, after coming home from each funeral, the door to the bedroom was seen opening and shutting. About seven weeks after the door, lights went on and off in our basement when no one had been down there. When walking into our rooms, 
One of my sisters, brothers, or my belongings would fall off of a shelf. My cat was seen chasing a string, hanging in midair, as if my aunt was playing with her. Creepy feelings of being watched while watching TV in my living room were also felt. When outside, you could hear your name being called softly in a little girl's voice and childish laughing. Random cold spots can be felt around my house, even near heating vents while the heat is on. Computers randomly turning on, and so do faucets, lights, TVs, and radios. Sometimes footsteps can be heard in my house, hurrying up and down the halls. Once I even heard childish crying, like the little girl ghost who calls your name and laughs. I know this story is a little shorter than most, but I appreciate you listening. Does anybody know what's going on exactly? I'm pretty sure it's my grandparents, but who knows? This is something that happened in an old farmhouse my mother lived in quite a few years ago in a little farm town in Ohio. When she and my younger siblings moved in, they would call and tell us things that were happening around the house. The first thing was the lights either coming on or going off. I told her to tell her landlord because it was faulty wiring. However, when my daughter went to spend a week with them, they were sitting watching TV and the light was turned off. My sister had to actually get up and turn it back on. So, we knew things were really going on. My mother told me about hearing cars pull up the lane, but when she would get up to look, nothing would be there. This went on for a while, and then she called and told me that one night, when she heard the car, she thought it was my brother coming home, and she just rolled over and went back to sleep. Later, she heard water running in the tub, but it didn't go off. She got up and went to check, thinking my brother turned it on and went to sleep. When she went in, the tub was almost running over and my brother had not come home yet. This happened quite often after the first time, so they made sure to check the tub whenever they heard water running. So, we went to pick our daughter up one summer and I was lying in bed by the window and everyone else was asleep. I heard a car pull up into the driveway and saw the lights flicker on the window and go off. I raised up to look, but nothing was there, so I had proof of that part of their story. However, after lying back down and trying to go to sleep, all of a sudden, I felt someone or something lay their arm across my waist, just like if it was a spouse, laying there in spoon fashion. I screamed so loud, I woke the whole house. We figured whoever this was, my husband and I were in their bedroom. It scared me really bad at first, knowing no one else was in there. But after the initial shock, I was not afraid because I did not feel threatened by their presence. These things went on until my family moved out. And that's the end of the story. Hope you enjoyed. As a teenager, I lived in Emory, Texas, in Raines County, and had a very strange experience when we first moved there. Our first residence was in an apartment building that had at one time been the Raines Coal School. When the new school was built, the old one was abandoned until someone bought it and decided to turn it into apartments. During the renovations, a group of local children were in the old school gymnasium, playing in what used to be a storage building to hold the chemicals and supplies being used in the work and repairs. Apparently, there was a large drum of flammable liquid in storage there, reportedly paint there, that was ignited by the children playing with a lighter or matches. In the ensuing explosion and fire, one of the boys was killed and the others injured to varying degrees. The gymnasium was destroyed, but this building was connected to the part of the school that was being turned into apartments. The renovations were completed and the apartments were ready to be occupied. Hence, my family enters the picture. We were the first occupants of apartment 12. The first night we were in the apartment, we heard a lot of movement in the attic area, which my mother put off as some type of animal being up there, even though it sounded awfully loud to be a small animal to me. The next day, I was talking to my next door neighbor's son and asked him if they heard anything in the attic the night before. 
He said he had heard something every night since they had moved in, and said his parents too had tried to explain it away, in something simple. We talked to some of the other people in the building, and found out that a lot of them had heard the same thing. We also found out that the ceiling directly over the apartments were drop ceiling, so that it would be easier to keep the apartments cooler in the summertime and warmer in the winter. This was very distressing to me, because that would make it impossible for someone to be walking on this. But to us, it sounded like heavy footprints directly overhead, but that is in the end. After about a week, we kept noticing little things, like objects apparently being moved forward from the places they were being left. The strangest occurrence to me was a music box belonging to my mother that had a baseball on it and played take me out to the ball game. Somehow kept moving off the shelf and sat on and onto the living room table, sides being moved around. We will wake up in the middle of the night to the sound of it playing in the living room. My mother kept blaming my little brother and me for this until she was home one night alone and woke up to the sound of the music box playing by itself and sitting on the coffee table even though she knew that it was on its shelf when she went to bed that night. We finally got used to this happening on a regular basis and even started joking around with each other when we couldn't find something by saying the ghost must have moved it even though to my brother and me it was still a little creepy. Finally Christmas time rolled around and the fun really began. We put up our Christmas tree on Thanksgiving day right after dinner as is our family custom and took great care in placing the ornaments as many of them were handmade ornaments from our mother dating back to the time we were born. The next day we were up bright and early to head out for our other family tradition the day after Thanksgiving shopping spree which was always an all day affair for us. When we returned that evening, we unloaded the car and were dividing up tape, wrapping papers and bows to go into our rooms and start wrapping gifts. When we noticed that all of the ornaments on the tree were completely rearranged for how they had been when we left that morning, we then moved them back to where we wanted them and went on our way, wrapping presents and didn't give it a whole lot of thought. After we finished this, we placed our gifts under the tree, made hot chocolate, and listened to Christmas music. The next morning we woke up, only to discover that the ornaments had once again been rearranged. And not only that, but the gifts under the tree had also been moved around by someone during the night, and the music box was once again sitting on the table in front of the couch. We were all pretty well freaked out, but resigned to the fact that no matter what, our guests had a definite opinion on how things should be, and we were fighting a losing battle. During this time, I somehow began to develop an attachment to our guest and started thinking of them as a member of the family. This was the young boy who had been killed during the fire when the renovations were being done and he was lonely and looking for a friend. I even started asking our friend where things were when I couldn't find them and it was almost like something would tell me where to find them. I even began telling our guest goodnight when I would get ready for bed at night. This continued throughout the Christmas season even though I'd learned to accept things, my brother and mother couldn't, and she decided it was time to look for some place else to live. Shortly before the end of January, my mother announced she had found a house for us, and we would be moving the 1st of February. While we were packing for the move, we kept noticing that the things we were boxing up kept appearing back where they had been, like someone didn't want us to leave, which was very disturbing to me, because by now, I felt a real attachment to our guests. One of the saddest moments of my life was when I closed that apartment door for the last time because I felt like I was leaving something or someone very important behind. The strangest part was, I could have sworn that I heard a young boy's voice telling me goodbye. I've been a fan of your website for a couple of months and I connected with some of the stories that have been listed, although I felt some of them were far-fetched. I've always been drawn to ghost stories and understanding the paranormal, even considering taking college courses in paranormal studies. I never really thought about why I was so drawn to it till my older brother and I were talking about all the different houses we lived in. Throughout my life, half of the houses, maybe more that I've lived in, have been haunted. Ever since I can remember, there was always something going on in my house, whatever house we were in at the time. One of the first houses I lived in 
the first I can remember. The previous owner's grandmother passed away in the house and decided to stay. Most of the haunting, from what I remember, I was maybe three or four years old at the time, was centered in my older sister's bedroom, but the grandmotherly ghost liked my closet too. I figured she liked it because my sister's closet and mine shared the same wall. I was often tucked in by her too. My memories are hazy, but I don't ever remember any harm or maliciousness coming from her. Nine years later, the worst haunted house we lived in, well that one had a reputation of being spooky. It sat on a double lot, with plants and grass, overgrown and neglected. Many of the neighbors' reactions to us moving in were, Oh my god, you're moving in there? No one ever wanted to tell us why they reacted that way, or why they would come up with some lame excuse for the reaction such as, We're just surprised, it's been empty for a while. We soon found out why. With good cause, it wasn't a gradual haunting, starting off small. It was as if we were disrupting someone's routine, and we were unwelcome. I still get shivers when I think of that house, and living there. The atmosphere was stifling and oppressive. I was so frightened, I couldn't get a handle if the spirit was male or female, but looking back, I think it was male. He liked playing with electricity, flickering the lights, and sometimes turning them off completely, leaving us in the dark until he found it to his benefit to turn them back on. My brother and I were usually the only ones to experience these things, while our parents continued to be skeptical. They preferred to ignore the unexplainable, and hired an electrician to check out the breaker panel. Nothing was found, no surprise to my brother or me. I was stressed, trying to stay out of the house as much as possible, getting by however I could. Then I had the nightmare. To give you a little background on this, at the time, I had a Winnie the Pooh giant stuffed bear that I had since I was three. In my dream, he grew claws and teeth and flew through the air, chasing us from the house. We needed to get away from that place. That was the message in the dream, loud and clear. Waking up from the dream, I looked across my bedroom to see my Pooh bear looking at me. I could have sworn I'd put him in the back of my closet. That was enough for me. I ran to my brother's room and dived in his bed. I sobbed and begged him to let me sleep with him, and he held me and calmed me down. Soon after that, my father lost his job and we lost the house. Thank God for miracles in disguise. A few years after that, we lived in a house where the owner died in my bedroom. The haunting was slow and gradual, and it was my first experience with night terrors. I wrote it off as being stressed. And at this time, I was a little more well-read on the subject. I knew that being a teenager, I was more susceptible to poltergeist and high-anxiety paranormal activity. But then, my brother experienced the presence too. We were laying on my bed, talking, and this thing came through my window, traveled between us, and circled the room, exiting where it came. I say thing, because it was invisible, but we felt it heard the energy in the form of a high-pitched ringing. I felt more relieved I wasn't alone, or crazy. Since then, I've experienced many more spirits, night terrors, and deja vu experiences. I seem to be sensitive to these things. I would appreciate any and all feedback. You know, every ship in the Navy has a ghost. Or at least, that's what they say. I've been in the Navy for 11 years now, and I'm on my fourth ship. I haven't noticed a ghost on all of them, but that doesn't mean they weren't there. I did notice one, though, a few times. The ship was the USS Frederick, LST-1184. It's decommissioned now, but when I was there, I met the ship's ghost before anyone even told me there was one. But for the sake of the reader, I'm going to tell you the story about how the ghost came to be first, and then I'll tell you how I met him. All Navy ships have a compartment called a sea chest. This is a void on the bottom deck of the ship that is used for quick ballast. It can suck in water, but force water out by creating either a positive or a negative vacuum in the space. Needless to say, you don't want to be in one when it's operating. Well, 
This poor soul in the ship went down into one of the sea chests one day during his watch. He didn't have to be in there, but he wanted to take a nap and not get caught. Nobody knew he was in there, and nobody bothered to check. And they engineered lid off the sea chest pumps by creating the vacuum in the space. Within seconds, the poor kid's head imploded as the air got sucked out of his body. Now his ghost haunts the ship. It travels from space to space, mainly in engineering, looking for people that are sleeping on watch. If he finds you sleeping, and you're on watch, he will violently wake you up. This could be anything from making a loud noise to what he did to me. I was sitting in my shop. It was around 2300. That's 11 p.m. for those that don't know 24 hour time. I was technically on watch, but my watch was an on call watch where they just needed to know where I was in case I was needed. I didn't have to stay up or even stay in my shop, but I was up and in my shop and I got tired. So I leaned back in my chair facing the door and closed my eyes for a quick power nap. Now, my desk was against the bulkhead wall to the left and was facing the door. The only way into and out of my shop was through a large metal gated door that squeaked and rattled when it moved. Along with that, the only way to get to me was to walk around the right hand side of the desk, which was at the time a maze of broken equipment that I was working on. I was sleeping for maybe five minutes and I was by no means sound asleep. Out of nowhere, I felt someone punch me on the left hand side of my chest really hard. I had a bruise there the next day. No, I didn't see him, but I know it was a ghost for a few reasons. One, there was no way for anyone to get in my shop without me knowing it. Two, no one could have hit me as hard or where I was hit without first coming around my desk. And second, breaking my pen, which I kept in my left chest pocket. The final reason I know it was the ghost it was because I immediately opened my eyes and saw no one there. The next night was the kicker about that ghost. He never went into the birthings. That's where everyone sleeps. Some say it was because not enough people on the ship believed in him, but I think it was simply because people are allowed to sleep in there. But that night, he went into my birthing. I went in my rack, bed, and I had that feeling that I was being watched. So I woke up opened the curtain on my rack and looked out to see who was there and what they wanted. There stood the ghost. I knew it was the ghost because he had no head. He was standing there, facing my rack. When he noticed me looking at him, he gave me a small bow, which I took as he was sorry about the night before. He hadn't known that I wasn't sleeping on watch. The incident that I'm about to relay occurred many years ago around 1969 or so, in the presence of myself, a friend, and several other people who were on the street at the time. It was a hot summer night in New York City at about 9 p.m. or so. It was hot enough out that even the elderly Ukrainian women who live on East 10th Street were still outside by their stoops on their lawn chairs, as it was still too hot to go indoors. My friend and I were passing by the old Russian Turkish bathhouse on our way to my apartment after having had dinner in the village. Communal steam baths were a tradition back in turn of the century Russia. Some of the old white Russians who fled Russia after the 1917 revolution settled in the north end of the Lower East Side and brought the tradition of the steam baths with them. Suddenly, as we were walking by the lawn, high stoop of the bathhouse, we almost ran into a screaming black man at the foot of the stairs. He looked real in every detail except for two things. He glowed purple and seemed to be composed of pixels as a television image would be. He was screaming and cursing at someone at the top of the bathhouse stoop and kept looking back while screaming as he ran across the street towards the little group of elderly Ukrainian women who also let out a scream themselves. He ran about 15 yards east down the block, and just as suddenly as he appeared, disappeared into thin air. My friend and I looked at each other and exclaimed in unison, that guy was purple. The Ukrainian women 
were laughing and chatting nervously at this point, and nobody could figure out where this guy could have gone. About a year later, I was in an old Bertino's bookstore when a small volume of prose and photographs caught my eye. The title of the book was 10th Street by Bill Benson, published in 1968 by Grossman Publishers. On one of its pages, the book describes three old women sitting in their chairs one summer evening on 10th Street between 1st Avenue and Avenue A. It goes on to say, one summer evening, there was a loud altercation directly across the street in the doorway of the Russian Turkish baths. Suddenly, one man picked up a chair and brought it down with tremendous force on the head of another man. The latter toppled and rolled down a dozen steps to the foot of the stoop, where he lay dead on the sidewalk in a great puddle of blood. The ladies all observed this with very little dismay, and long before the corpses lugged away, they had returned to their evening chat. I lived on 10th Street for many years after 1969, but never again did I encounter this man, purple with rage, on this street again. A friend of mine who had come from Russia was acting as a caretaker for an older man with a breathing disability who lived alone in a large, two-story building in one of the rundown areas of our city. The building had once been something like a VFW hall, with the first floor being more like a warehouse area, and the second floor being an empty dance hall, complete with stage and bar. There was also a basement, and I believe, possibly an attic. The first floor had been partitioned into rooms by hanging large sheets where no actual walls existed. It was a dark, cavernous place, with weird props like mannequins and paraphernalia from the World War II era strewn about. There were twisting stairways and little, hidden passages here and there. It was a classic, spooky place to begin with, but mostly from neglect. I can't remember exactly why we called it Goose Hall, as it had another name. I think it was because there was a banner hung in front of the building at one time, referring to it as Goose Hall. It was a good name for a strange place. My friend, who I'll call Sergei, had taken the position of caring for this man, who I'll call Edward, as Sergei a little money, and didn't mind the weirdness of the place, as it provided him with the room and board. Not many other people would have wanted this job. Not long after Sergei had moved in, he began to notice odd things, like lights being turned on that had previously been off, and pictures and clocks falling off walls by themselves. Since Edward was better at it, Sergei knew it wasn't him doing it, but he found it annoying and puzzling. Then one night, around 2 a.m., he heard footsteps walking around on the second floor, overhead. He did nothing about it at the time, but told Edward the next day that he thought intruders, kids most likely, had broken into the house and were walking around. That's the ghost, said Edward. Don't worry, he won't bother you. Edward went on to explain that the ghost had always been there and did odd things like move stuff around or turn lights on and off. He further explained that the footsteps Sergei heard were also the ghost's doing and that sometimes, the ghost also made sounds like boxes and cartons being pushed over on the second floor, even though the second floor was empty. This usually happens around 2 a.m. in the morning. Sergey, being an intelligent and educated man, believed nothing of this. He was convinced that it was teenagers breaking in and hanging out for kicks. He was determined to trap and confront them. Edward told him he was wasting his time and not to worry about it. For my part, I'd visited Sergei and Edward in this building, which was about a 30 minute drive from my house, and listened to his story intently, as I'd witnessed phenomena before in my life, and was hoping to see something manifest. However, in the times I visited, day or night, nothing ever happened. Sergei, however, as he was living there, frequently witnessed or heard some odd things, which he was still convinced was someone pulling a prank. Then one day, I went to visit and found Sergei in an agitated state. 
She wanted to tell me about what happened to him a couple of days previously. I was staying up late. He began, quietly listening to some music. About 2 a.m., I heard the footsteps walking overhead, and I grabbed a flashlight and ran to the stairwell, determined to catch the kids who were breaking in. There were no working lights in the second floor. I ran up the steps and onto the dance floor, where I could still hear the footsteps walking and show my flashlight in the direction of the sound. I was now directly illuminating the spot where the footsteps were, and I could still hear them, but there was no one there. Then, the footsteps suddenly stopped, turned in direction, and began walking straight towards me. I kept a flashlight on the source of the sound, and followed it as it approached me, but there was no one in the room but me. About five to ten feet from me, the footsteps suddenly halted, while I continued to shine the light. Were you scared? I asked. Yes, he replied, but I tried to think about it rationally and decided that I wasn't going to be physically hurt and that I couldn't let my emotions overwhelm me. So I decided the only thing to do was to turn around and to leave, which I did. Sergey said now that he was convinced that Edward was right and there was a ghost in the place, but that he would just ignore it from now on like Edward did. As he was telling me the story, a chill went up my spine as I don't think I could have been quite that brave, especially in an eerie place like this. But I still wanted to experience the phenomena for myself as a story is just a story until something happens to give you your own proof. It was several months later that I got my wish. I was visiting Sergei one summer evening and we talked late into the night and he was playing some new CDs for me he had recently purchased. It was about 2 a.m., and I was standing next to the stereo quietly, listening to the music when it happened. I would have missed it entirely, except that Sergei got my attention and said, Listen, there's the ghost. I want to give us their own explanation of what I experienced as possible, since it seems to me that there are some oddities as to how this type of phenomena is perceived. First off, the music that was being played was not as loud, as Sergei did not want to disturb Edward, who was in the adjacent room, probably about the level of background music in a department store. Secondly, I was in no way thinking about the ghost, and we hadn't even discussed it previously that evening. What I was hearing was the sound of boxes being pushed over and shoved, on the floor above me, the entire manifestation lasted perhaps 10 to 15 seconds. What is hard to describe, and perhaps part of the reason I almost missed this, is that the sound seemed to be coming in some way from inside my head, rather than externally through my ears, and yet Sergei was hearing exactly the same thing as I was. It was like tuning into a different world, much the same way that you can imagine a conversation you have had with someone in recollection and hear the words being spoken inside your head. Only in this case, it was much more amplified, and the recollection was being controlled by someone else. The best way I can put it is that the sounds were not located in the physical place where I was standing, but were somehow layered on top of it. And there was also a kind of an odd purity to the sounds I was hearing, as if they had been recorded on tape, enhanced, and a little reverb added. But the sense of these sounds being inside me made the possibility that someone was actually doing that unlikely. I remember asking Sergei if he wanted to grab a flashlight and go upstairs and look. He said no, but that I was welcome to go myself if I wanted. I declined. And that was that. The rather dramatic postscript to this recounting is that the phenomena continued on and off for the entire time that Sergei lived there and he basically ignored it and lived with it. Then one evening, he heard a loud bang in the next room and went over to investigate, only to find that Edward had put a gun in his mouth and blown his brains out against the wall, leaving a note behind, apologizing, saying that he just couldn't take living in this condition anymore. The police, of course, immediately put Sergei through the ringer for hours until they were convinced he had nothing to do with it. They could see, as he told me later, that he was freaked out and shaken, and Edward's daughter 
who lived elsewhere and knew that Sergei was taking care of her father, was contacted and apparently didn't feel that Sergei had anything to do with it. She felt that her father indeed had taken his own life, plus the fact that he left notes in his own hand for everybody. Edward's daughter allowed Sergei to stay for a few months in the building until he finally moved out. After Edward's death, all the manifestations in the house seized immediately. I'd like to think that Edward finally evicted his nosy and pesky tenant once he was finally able to do it so that Sergei wouldn't have to be in a haunted place. After all, that place had already given him enough bad memories. A final note on the story. I've had a little training in writing, so I've tried to make this retelling here a bit more dynamic than a simple narrative. However, Nothing has been fictionalized except the names and the conversations as reported, as I recall them from memory. These incidents are all true and dynamic as they are. This is the way it happened. I have twin brothers called Chris and Gareth. They have bunk beds and Chris sleeps on the top. On some nights, Chris will suddenly wake up for no reason. And while he's awake, he says he sees a body emerge from the ceiling. The body which he can't see the whole of will float down and lie on top of him. He can't make out facial features or any other features to the body. It's like a slightly shining image, but he can definitely see it. Then, the image will whisper to him, but he can't hear it. It's like if I spoke to him. It's like the floater. I think that's what we call him. It's in him. Passing the message mentally, like he already knows this information. The first time this happened, Chris was physically sick. The bed starts to rock slightly and gets fiercer and fiercer. This wakes his brother, and Gareth wakes because of the moving bed. Gareth jumps out of the bed, quite scared. He stands back and sees Chris lying as stiff as a board, staring up at the ceiling. Gareth runs down the stairs to drink some water. When he comes back up, Chris is asleep, as if nothing had happened, so Gareth does the same. The next day, Gareth tells me what happened when I came around to visit. I ask Chris, and he doesn't remember much except the body, the whisperings, and how he felt paralyzed. Later, when Gareth told Chris about the shaking, Chris did not believe him. I think it was because he was scared and didn't want it to be true. Well... We tell her mother about this, but she said it was just a dream and doesn't seem too worried about it. After so many times this has happened, I started to get worried about my brothers. It hasn't affected neither of them seriously, but it still plays on my mind, as I've done research and found out some information I wish I never looked up. This is a true story, which deeply disturbs us all. Thanks for reading. I was camping at Jeffrey's Bridge in the Wharton Forest last July 4th with my daughter, son-in-law, and grandson. We got there on Friday afternoon to get a nice spot by the Wading River, and we were right on the riverbank. There were no other campers anywhere close by. Around 9 p.m., a thunderstorm was starting to roll in, and we secured things before the rain came. My grandson, Ryan, and I bedded down to the back of my Suburban, and his parents retired to their tent. Unfortunately, I had the pee really bad, and since the outhouse was quite a distance away, and there was no one around, I thought that I'd just go a reasonable distance away. We were in the woods. It was pitch dark, but the lightning was flashing pretty regularly, and I'd scoot about ten paces with each flash, until I figured I was far enough. As I was in the process of relieving myself, the lightning flashed again, and to my great embarrassment, a woman was walking across my front and 12 feet away. Even though it was only an instant, I got a strong image of this slender woman dressed in a long dress with long sleeves and some sort of bonnet or bandana with her hair in a bun and pulled back. She was moving fast in the direction of the river. Then it was dark and being embarrassed, I turned back towards the light of the truck and as I moved back, I started thinking, where did she even come from? There was literally no one even remotely close. 
Where was she going? In about 10 seconds, she'd be knee deep in the river. And how the hell is she moving so fast in the dark woods? By the time that I got to the truck, I decided that what I'd seen was not of this world. I locked my doors and fully expected to see a pale face at the window with each flash. I should mention that I'm a retired US Marine, Vietnam veteran, and drill instructor. I'm not quick to jump to rash conclusions. I thought I'd share. Thanks. This house that I lived in was built around 1920, and I had no clue what I was about to get myself into. From the day I set foot in my room, I felt utterly depressed. Maybe it was the heat. Maybe it was the fact that nobody had slept or lived in that room before me, so it did not make me feel very welcomed, or maybe it was my ghost. There were two rooms to upstairs, mine, and my best friend's Carrie. Anyway, the first three nights, while trying to fall asleep, I would feel as if someone was staring at me from one particular corner of the room. Of course, I kept looking over there, expecting to see something, anything, but there was nothing. I questioned my boyfriend if he felt something staring at him, and he said he did, but maybe it was from outside. I knew it wasn't. This happened every night. On the fourth day, the house held their first meeting, finally disclosing to the newcomers they thought the house was haunted. Believe it or not, I was very relieved to hear this. After all, I thought I was losing my mind. For the next three months, I refused to sleep in my room. I would sleep in Carrie's room. She had a twin bed we both squeezed onto. There was AC. It was North Carolina, but I still needed the protection of a blanket. One night, Carrie moved, which sort of woke me up. Then I felt someone playing with my second toe, the one next to the big toe. Someone was flicking my toe. I quickly grabbed the blanket. I unintentionally kicked off and sweated out the rest of the night. My mom, who was capable of being a medium, like her mother, told me to sleep in my bed, that she was harmless. She said the girl stayed in the attic space, between Carrie's in my bedroom, and the reason I felt so depressed was because she was but that she was not malicious. Well, that was all well and good, but we had a man too. One night, while trying to sleep in my room, with all the lights on and the TV going, after three months, I sat on the edge of my bed, gathering my courage to turn everything off and go to bed. All of a sudden, footsteps plain as day walked across my room. I knew it was the male trying to freak me out, but I left and went into Carrie's room anyway. Carrie had the sighting of the girl, not me. Carrie was in her room getting ready for class. Everyone in the house was already gone. She heard someone coming up the stairs. Of course, she thought it was me. When she turned the corner, expecting to see me, she saw a female standing in front of my door instead. Then she vanished. We had many experiences in the house. People walking around, Door slamming, shadows moving. One of my good male friends saw the man ghost. He was the only one that did. The male was a kidder. He liked to tap you on the shoulder, walk across the rooms, and down the hallways. I even heard him talking to someone one day. I was up in my room, and he was downstairs. No one else was home at the time. I eventually just told him to go away and leave me here, and he did. One day, my other roommate and I decided to research the house's history. We came home and told all the roommates. That night, Carrie had stayed at her boyfriend's house, so I was the only one upstairs, sleeping comfortably in my own bed by then. Thank you. I tried to fall asleep, but heard knocking on the wall. I sat up, thinking it was the cats. The banging stopped. I laid back down. It continued. I then heard a door slam. I got up to get the cats, who only stayed upstairs, and bring them into my room. I searched the hole upstairs, calling out to them, but they were nowhere. I decided to look downstairs. Nowhere. I had one roommate who was very allergic to cats. That is why we kept them upstairs. We kept our door closed, just in case they got out. For some reason, I decided to look in there for them, 
and they were there. Somehow, the ghost opened the door and shut them in there. I have no idea how. I brought them up to my room, shut them in there, and the knocking stopped. I have many stories while living there, one of which is too freaky, and not many people believe it. Carrie's sister came to visit. We decided we would perform the sort of cleansing to make the ghost girl happy. We walked to the attic door. I placed my hand on the door just to point out where we think the girl hides out and this energy just shot up my arm and made me just sob. At first it was like I couldn't take my hand off. All I could say was, she is so sad. Finally, I got my hand off and stopped crying at once. We gathered some candles and things from family members which held sentimental value to us and placed them in front of the attic door. Then we sat down with me in the middle, held hands, and closed our eyes. We concentrated on emitting love and peace. I opened my eyes at one point to see the flames of the candles reaching so high up. Once we completed the cleansing, the flames were back to normal. During this cleansing, Carrie said in her mind she saw a girl lying on a bed, just crying, but we have no idea why. Well, we tried to make her happy, and I didn't feel as depressed after that, but she became a little more active. I think we made a mistake, and I'll never presume to do that again. I will call on the professionals if I am ever in that situation. So, that is my story. Well, just a couple of them. Thanks for reading. I experienced the much dreaded sleep paralysis. There is, however, one other story worth mentioning. In 1991, I was a 20-year-old army corporal stationed in Germany. By this time, I was a graduate of French commando school and was in charge of my own cavalry recon squad, a jeep with two other guys. One chilly winter night, my unit was deployed somewhere in southwestern Germany in the wilderness during field exercises. We were literally in the middle of nowhere. Me and my crew spent half the night slinking through the woods, doing the usual cavalry style patrols. At around 2 a.m., we were told to stop the jeep and set up a listening post in a clump of trees. I decided to be the first watch of the night while the other two guys got some sleep. After about 30 minutes of staring into black nothingness, I decided to get up and walk around a bit. With a weapon in hand and a radio on my back, I began to prowl around the area. Yes, it was unbelievably dark, but at least this was keeping me occupied. Suddenly, a very average night turned into a counter I will never forget. After several minutes of walking, I suddenly realized how quiet the night was. Not a sound to be heard from, an animal, or even an insect. Thinking this was a bit strange, I walked a few more paces before realizing I was right in the middle of a very old deserted village. I pulled out my night vision goggles and noticed that the village consisted of about seven or eight old stone houses. Only the walls remained as the old thatched roofs were long gone. Suddenly, I felt this dark, evil presence like a weight on my shoulders. I knew I was being watched by someone or something and I knew that I was not welcome in this place. I slowly turned around and began walking back the way I came, with every footstep in the tall dry grass sounding like a firecracker. It was very slow and painful walking out of this place. I consider myself a rational person, but was truly scared as I made the long walk back to the jeep. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night inside the jeep. As you read the stories on the site, it may be hard to appreciate the feelings others have felt if they try to tell their tales. I promise you, the fear and success we have felt during these tales are the most important part of the story. Hi, my name's Brooke. I work at an assisted living facility in Pennsylvania. I worked the 11 7 shift, so of course, there are a lot of stories about the place already, but besides that, I was wondering if the experiences I've had, as insignificant as they may seem or be, 
could be the activities of ghosts, or just my mind. Of course, I'm not the only one that claims to have seen things, but who knows? For instance, I'll just be walking around the building, and I constantly think that I see things, like out of the corner of my eye. It's not a definite thing, it's just a shape. It's either black or white. A lady I work with always sees black when she sees things out of the corner of her eye. As for me, I always see white. The forms are white, that is. Is there a reason she sees black and I see white? And today, for instance, I was walking and I was sure there was someone behind me. When I semi-turned around, out of the corner of my eye, I swore there was a figure for a split second, but it was gone. It scared me to death, actually. That is why I'm writing to you today, because today, that was the closest a form or figure has ever been. No one has ever died in this facility that I work in, but they have died in the hospital. The building has only been open for four years, maybe five. I was just wondering if these could be ghosts or just my eyes playing tricks on me. A lot of the residents say that they see a woman in white in their room or sitting on their bed. I don't know how to explain or take that either, but I appreciate your reading. Thanks for listening as well. The story I'm about to tell you happened to me directly and has forever changed my view on the supernatural. I would like to state for the record that I've always been a skeptical person who never believed in anything that couldn't be proven. Before my experience, I didn't believe in ghosts and never given the topic a second thought. Since that period of time, it has always been on my mind frequently. This is my story. The event in question occurred several years ago at my grandparents' house. I was 19. I'd been out with my friends and returned home around 2 a.m. I retired to my bedroom on the second floor of the house and got into bed. I'd been lying there for two or three minutes, reflecting on the events of the evening, when suddenly, I heard the muffling screaming of a woman coming from the basement. Almost immediately, the screaming began to slowly ascend the stairs and within a minute had reached the first floor. It continued to ascend the stairs and 30 seconds later had reached the second floor and was right outside of my room. The screaming was very loud and was clearly that of a woman. My bedroom door was closed and I could therefore see nothing. The screaming continued outside of my room for approximately one minute and then slowly began to descend the stairs into the basement. When it reached the basement, the screaming ceased and the house was silent. That is the end of my story. I feel that in order for me to give an objective account of this occurrence, it is important that I detail my own actions and opinions. When I first heard the noise, I recognized that it was coming from the basement and although it sounded like a woman screaming, I immediately disregarded this as being ridiculous. I started to try and rationalize what I was hearing. However, my analysis ended rather abruptly when I realized that the noise was getting closer. By the time I reached the first floor, it had become quite loud, and being unable to think of any rational explanation for such a noise, I became convinced that the ghost of a woman was ascending the stairs of my grandparents' house. I became completely terrified and quickly sat up in bed, both so that I could hear better and so that I could run, if necessary. When I reached the second floor and was outside my room, every hair in my body was standing on end and my hands were literally shaking with fear. I was too scared to move and for that reason remained stationary until I returned to the basement and the noise subsided. I stayed where I was for several minutes, waiting for the noise to return. When it didn't, I got up, turned on my light, and sat back down on my bed. Being wide awake and in no mood to sleep, I spent the next couple of hours lying in my bed, listening and thinking about what had happened. Eventually I fell asleep, and the next morning, when I woke up, my light was still on, and I was completely convinced that I had heard a ghost. I spent the entire day gathering information and trying to figure out what I had heard. The only other people in the house were my grandparents. My grandmother is a sound sleeper, my grandfather is hard of hearing. They heard nothing. They bought the house in 1966 and sold it in 2000. During that time, they never heard anything that even remotely resembles what I described. My mother lived in the house for several years in her late teens and never heard anything either. 
I myself lived in the house on and off for years, and never heard anything before, and have not heard anything since. I consider that maybe the pipes or something else in the house made the noise, although I don't think any pipe on earth could have made the noise I heard. I dismiss this theory anyways, because if the house did make odd noises, someone would have heard them in the past 30 years. I also dismiss the wind, because I have spent many windy nights in the house and heard absolutely nothing. In the end, I came to the conclusion that there was no earthly explanation for what I heard, and that what I experienced must have been supernatural. It sounds crazy saying that, but I know what I heard. I will never forget it. I'm sure it was a ghost. In conclusion, I would just like to state that all of my friends think I was asleep and that the whole thing was a dream. I would like to touch on this briefly. The first thing I would like to say is that I know I was not asleep. Here's my case. I have been in bed for two or three minutes, less than five for sure, and was laying on my back thinking. I have always had a difficult time falling asleep. It usually takes me 20 to 30 minutes, and I have never been able to sleep on my back. At the time, I was making no attempt to sleep, but was lying there, thinking. Secondly, no matter how real a dream seems, you always wake up afterwards, and that's how I know you are dreaming. I don't think it's possible to remember a dream without waking up and realize you are dreaming. If it is, it's never happened to me. If it had been a dream, I would have woken up and said, wow, that one was weird. That never happened. I was awake. Thirdly, I turned the light on after the occurrence and it was still on when I woke up in the morning. I know for a fact that I was awake. That is my story and I swear to you that every word of it is the truth. I don't know if you will believe me. No one else will. But I swear, it's the truth. I am 17 years old. In the past 7 years, I would lived in 3 different houses and every one of them had a ghost. The first one we lived in was from 94 to 96. The occurrence that spooked me there happened in my parents room. A week before anything weird happened, a bunch of knickknacks fell off of my mother's headboard. So, she put it back and pushed it away from the edge. On Easter morning of 95, I was with my brother, sister, and dad watching TV in the living room. About 20 feet away from my parents' bedroom door, I heard a bang and my mom came running out of her room. She really wanted to know who was pounding. Apparently, when I heard the bang, all the stuff had fallen off her headboard and kind of flew off this time. Not only that, but this Oreo tin can she had looked like it had been stepped on. After that, our next door neighbor told us that she had seen this old man that lived here before us in the backyard on the day he died in the hospital. Now, the living room looked into a hallway. In the hallway, you could see into my brother's room and my parents was right next door. The living room had a clear view of my parents' room. One night, my dad fell asleep in the living room. He was sleeping, facing the hallway. He suddenly woke up and looked into his room. He saw this cloud of smoke billowing in the hallway, moving towards his room. He jumped up and yelled fire. When he yelled, my brother woke up and saw this. The cloud settled in the hallway and disappeared. I know this was not any kind of imagination because my brother and my dad are very logical and analytical people and they both witnessed this. In the next house, it was never anything really. The only occurrence that happened was the night one of our cats died. The cat house was in the corner of my room, and I had a nightlight next to the cat house. I looked up to the top cat house, and I saw the shadow of our dead cat. The cat loved sleeping on the top every night, and this night was no exception. The third house is the house we have lived in for the past three years. I believe it all started with the woman. My dad wakes up early in the morning to get ready for work. When this happened, my mom would occasionally fall asleep in the living room. There is a door next to the entryway that leads into the back hallway where all the rooms are. The first room is my brother's, the second is my parents, then he turn, and then comes my sister's room, and lastly, mine. Now, on this morning, my dad woke me up and looked over. He saw the back of a woman and assumed it was my mom. He got up and went out into the living room and saw my mom sleeping on the couch. He went back to his room, and no one was there. After that, I had an experience with a man. It was about 4 in the morning, and I was suddenly woken up 
By the feeling of a large man tapping my foot, I looked up and no one was there. I have this ticker stuffed animal that I got for my birthday from my sister. At the time of my next story, my large dog slept in my room with me. She would sleep up against the door so I couldn't sleepwalk and open it without waking up. I woke up one morning and my ticker was nowhere so I figured it rolled under the bed. I opened my door and it was laying outside of my door. About a year ago, my mom started sleeping out in the living room for health reasons. The wall our couch leans against is connected to my brother's room. We had a family friend staying in there while my brother was in boot camp. One morning, my mom woke up about 7 a.m. She heard a knocking on the wall between the living room and my brother's room. She thought it was just her friend when it moved to the wall behind her computer about 10 feet away. This is an inside wall and there's no way there could be any knocking. It then moved to the ceiling. She said it sounded like someone knocking. A couple nights later, I heard her banging in my parents' room. Their bathroom is across the hall from my brother's room. My bathroom is across from my sister's room and the bathtub stalls are back to back. When I heard the banging, it sounded like it was coming from the wall where the shower head is and they have a lot of shelves over there so it would be impossible to bang as clearly as I heard. A couple of hours later, I heard shuffling footsteps in the hall coming from the bathroom. On two occasions, my dad has seen a streaking white figure that appears to be a cat, but we are not positive. We have also seen shadow people walking in the side yard through our shutters. Not long ago, our next door neighbor told us that the houses in our neighborhood was built on Indian burial ground. We are not sure if this has anything to do with all this. The house we live in now appears to be the most haunted so far. I'm 17 years old and I used to live in an old house made in 1921 in Haverhill, Massachusetts that I know is haunted. One day, when I was 10, I was in my upstairs bedroom with my two sisters coloring. I think that's when it started. We were home alone when we heard the closet at the end of the stairs slide open. Then we heard it slide back. The sliding doors of the closet always made a loud rumbling noise when it was open. When we heard it that day, we didn't get scared at first because we thought my mom had gotten home from work, so we ran downstairs to greet her to find that nobody was home. We looked around and then looked outside to see if the car was in the driveway, but we were alone, or so we thought. We ran back upstairs to our room and grabbed shoes and hangers for the so-called protection. Then all of a sudden, we heard footsteps racing up the stairs, then back down. We never saw anything actually reach the top of the stairs, but they ran up and down repeatedly about 10 times, then it stopped. We were so scared, we just sat there crying, waiting to hear more, but nothing else happened. Then, when I was 15, I was taking care of a dog, and when I brought it to the foot of the stairs, he froze and just stared at the top. I didn't think much about it, so I picked him up and brought him up the stairs to my room and closed the door. The dog then began crying and it seemed to be getting nervous and uneasy and he started scratching at the door. When I opened the door to let him out, he ran down the steps so fast that by the time I got out the door, he was gone. After that, many more things started to happen. I woke one morning to hear something or someone dragging themselves in the rug next to my bed. I was so frozen with fear that I didn't even look to see what it was. The cabinets in our kitchen would open and slam shut by themselves. I could also hear the silverware jiggling and slamming inside the drawers. There are even moments where the computer keyboard would also type by itself. I've also had my foot slapped and have felt something sit on me while I was laying in my bed. There are also too many noises and weird things to explain and also creepy dreams. So I'm glad to be out of that house well, I would like to know if the house is some kind of history or if anybody died there. Last year, after we moved out of the house, our cousins were sleeping over and we were talking about our old house. One of my cousins, who slept over our house a lot, asked why our dad always walked up to our room and why he did it over and over without ever coming into our room. 
We told him about the day we heard the racing footsteps, running up the stairs, and she got so freaked out. My other cousin also said she hated sleeping in our room, because she always heard the same footsteps coming up the stairs, but never making it to the top, before it ran back down again. Now in our present house in Orlando, Florida, weird things have suddenly begun to happen. Noises, shadowy figures, and also short wide figures have appeared. I always seem to see something in the corner of my eye, but when I turn my head to look, there is nothing there, and my sister felt somebody whistle and blow in her ear. Well, that's all I have for you for today. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you for reading. Hello, my name is Nikki, and I'm 14 years old, unfortunately. I don't remember the details to my story very well, because it happened when I was about 4 or 5 years old. But anyway, my family lived in a large house that was actually quite old. One night, I was asleep in my bedroom upstairs, and I awoke in the middle of the night. I went straight across the hall to my brother's room and asked him to come downstairs with me because I was scared and wanted to sleep with mom and dad. He asked me why I was so scared, and I said I didn't know. So he came down with me, we started down the stairs, and I froze at the sight of what I saw. There was a little boy at the end of the stairs. Now, this could have been my younger brother, but my brother was just a few months old. This little boy had brown hair and was just sitting at the bottom of the stairs. I wasn't scared, so we kept walking. We got into my parents' room, and I was getting ready to climb in their bed, and all the lights in the house came on at once. My dad woke up and checked the circuit breaker, but nothing was wrong, so he went through the house and shut off all the lights. Well, the next night, I saw the same little boy, and the same thing happened again. This activity continued for a few more days, and my parents checked out some information by the guy that lived there before. He said a little boy around the age of five died because he was very sick. He died in the middle of the night in his sleep, and a few hours before he went to sleep, he turned all the lights in the house on because he was afraid of the dark. I have never seen anything since, even though I have moved several times. I always somehow sense when there is an unknown presence around them, but I will always remember that night. I have since been afraid of the dark, though I hate to admit it, but it's not like anyone is going to criticize me for it. And this is a true story, and this happened to me when I was 8 years old. I'm now 28 with three kids of my own. It happened in my hometown of Soak Village, Illinois, which is known to be a place that Indians pass through using South Trail to get to other destinations. At least, that's what the official story is. There are others, like myself, who believe more. We believe that Indians actually settled there, if only for brief periods of time. There's always been talk of bones being found when a pool is dug up or a garden was put in, but most say it's just that. Talk, not me. I believe it. I also not only believe, but know that the ground the Silk Village is residing on is sour, cursed, beyond anybody's wildest dreams, and I have many stories to support that belief, but for now. I will start with my first story of proof. It was a cold normal night in the season of autumn, cold enough to keep you inside your house and snuggled under a blanket. I was doing exactly that. An eight year old can only do so much during these times and I chose to do my homework so I could read later. I had been listening to a Rick Springfield album on 8 track. I was playing it on my 2XL robot toy. This was a toy that you could put 8-track cartridges in that was made by the company to be a sort of trivia game. You'd play the cartridge and it would ask you questions and tell you jokes. It had two big red robot eyes that flashed red when you were correct. It had three buttons you could push to answer your questions. 2XL could also play normal 8-track music and of course its red robot eyes flashed in time with the music. 
Saul's doing exactly just that, on that cold autumn night, flashing its eyes to Rex Springfield, and I was quite contented. My bedroom was on the second floor of my house, and faced north, along with my bed. I had a window north of me, and east of me. Of course, it was dark outside, but it was so warm inside, and so very comforting. Every now and again, I'd look up for my homework, and just look out into the darkness. No reason. It was just something I did. Well, this was the last time. I ever did that again in that house. As I was sitting there, all of a sudden, I felt instantly cold, and every single hair in my body was raised. My blood felt like it had ran cold, and decided to just stop pumping through my body. My heart was racing. I was perfectly terrified, and I didn't even know why. Yet, my 2XL was suddenly stuck and I kept playing the same verse from Rick over and over, hole in my heart, and its eyes weren't flashing anymore. No, they were just burning, bright red, blood red. Then I felt this magnetic pull, like something was pulling me to my right. I turned my right head, and looked out the east window, and saw something that haunted me for the rest of my life. Sitting just barely outside my window, levitating, was the most horrifying image I'll ever see in my life. A creature, about two feet tall, but sitting Indian style. His skin was snowy white, and you could see the outlines of his bones, because he was that skinny. He wore some sort of white cloth, draped sideways on his body. This is why I later named him Gandhi Monster. My young mind thought his skinny body and his white cloth looked like the real Gandhis did. This creature's head was too big for his body. His two horrible, big dark eyes were piercing my soul as he stared at me. He opened his mouth and grinned a grin at me that haunted my dreams for years. His mouth was full of long, snarly, razor-sharp looking teeth, dripping with blood. I don't know how a mouth could fit so many nasty teeth into it, but it did. I watched as the blood dripped from his teeth and slid down his chin and onto his white cloth diaper shorts. He raised his hands and reached for me. The fingernails were at least four inches long, gnarled looking, and sharpened to points also dripping with blood. I wanted to scream. I wanted to run. But I was locked into place by his piercing eyes. I couldn't breathe. I felt as if my brain was being scrambled and my soul was being raped. His grin became larger and he opened his mouth wider. He kept looking at me as if he knew me, as if he had been waiting for me. He started to lift his arms, and it looked as if in seconds he would actually be inside my room and not just outside my window. All traces of reason disappeared, and my mind snapped. I still don't know how I did it, but I managed to tear my gaze away and leap off the bed and out my bedroom door, screaming with every inch of my soul, all in like two seconds. I could feel him pulling me. I could feel that horrible stare penetrating my back as I screamed down the hallway to my mother. Of course, when her and my father and younger brother came back, it was gone. But they knew I saw something, and they did not try to tell me it was my imagination. They comforted me and taped up all the windows in my room. They actually had to pull down all the shades and seal all sides with duct tape. I couldn't even sleep in that room for almost a year. My brother even remembers coming into the room with my parents afterwards. The Gandhi monster was a story we didn't often tell, but it always brought fear to speak of it to us and to others. My parents never spoke of it again either. 
As I grew up, I tried to face my fear and sleep in that room, but never did I sleep with my back to a window. Never. 18 years later, I moved to Florida with my own little family and have found peace within myself, but I'll never manage to forget that creature, and I'll never sleep or sit with my back to a window, and I will never forget the one thing I heard it say to me in my mind as I was running out of my bedroom door. Someday, I'm coming back. Hey, I'm in my mid-teens, and I've experienced ghostly encounters. The one that really freaked me out was when me and my family moved to Scotland. For a few months, we lived in chalets. Me and my older sister shared one on our own. A few weeks after we moved in, we began to feel uncomfortable and felt as if we were being watched there, and there was also a threatening atmosphere. We told our parents, and they said it was just because we were next to the graveyard. A few weeks later, I was lying in my bed with the door open when a tall dark figure stood, leaning over me. I didn't think at that particular moment. But it wasn't until my sister asked me if I felt somebody was in my room the previous night. We started to talk, and she too felt as if somebody tall was leaning over her. I then started to sleep in my sister's room, and the figure didn't return, so I moved back into my own room. But then again, the figure returned this time. It was kneeling beside me. The next morning I told my sister, and again, she felt the presence of a tall man. Our dad told us that the large house next to us was where the Vikers used to stay until the house was sold. One night, my mom came in, and she was holding two necklaces with crosses on it. Me and my sister aren't religious, so her mom thought it had something to do with that. So we went to bed, holding the crosses. That night... It was very uncomfortable in both rooms. After that, we haven't felt the presence of the tall man. The figure that visited did so on a few occasions. Each time, it felt as though it was getting closer and more angry. When the crosses were given to us that night, the figure seemed very angry. Its face was literally pressed into mine, and it felt as if he was gritting his teeth at me. My sister also had this very uncomfortable, menacing figure who was pressed into her face. All you could do was hide under the guilt, closing your eyes really tight, and hope you'd fall asleep quick. Since that last visit, nothing has returned, and we've since moved then, and nothing. We don't even use the crosses anymore. Other things that we didn't think of as being connected at the time now do seem connected, such as the chalet that mom and dad were in, although the same, was different in feeling. Because mom and dad's chalets always had a comfy feeling, yet ours didn't, whether it was because there was just me and my sister alone in there, and it was our imaginations or not, we don't know. Although in mom's and dad's chalet, there was only one more person over there, from the moment we stepped into the chalet, it was always cold, even with the heaters on. Plus, there was often a bad smell wafting around, a lot like fish, rotten. This was only in my bedroom, possibly me, my sister says. Also in my room, there was a strange noise of scratching, as if someone was sketching or writing. This noise accompanied the presence of another figure, smaller in stature, and of the female sex. My sister also felt the smaller presence, but not the noise. She only came once, very different, not menacing, quiet in nature, and much older. She was almost a comfort, but it's still not nice to be watched over at night by ghostly figures. It's strange because we didn't actually see anything, yet you get so much from these feelings, the sex, age, 
angry, happy, etc. Plus, we get almost exactly the same feelings. But is it just our imagination? Are we certifiably insane? Are we demented? No, we definitely feel we had a visitor. Previous to this experience, my sister had not really believed in it, ghostly visits and such. But now, I think she has had a change of mind. Me, myself, I've always believed. My mom's grand did often visits, a kind presence, bringing good luck, such as when she was having problems. He visits to let us know everything will be okay. He often visited when we were babies, watching over our cots. Our dad also saw what appeared to be him. Whenever he visits, we know him by the distinct smell of putty. He used to repair windows. So really, we are used to the visits, although my sister had never experienced any until now. Unfortunately, it wasn't a happy experience, one not to forget. Happened to surf onto your website, and I just wanted to let you know that I saw Resurrection Mary in Justice, Illinois, back in October of 92. After getting off of work at 3 a.m. from a chemical plant, Witco Corporation, near 51st and Central in Chicago, I was driving by that particular cemetery at about 3.30 a.m. on my way home from work. Driving by, but initially not thinking much of this site, as there was a nightclub with women of ill repute nearby. I saw a woman, in a light blue or white palm dress, standing by the trunk of what looked like a Black Park limousine at the front SW Cemetery driveway off Archer Avenue to the cemetery. I slowed down quite a bit to get a better look at the odd sight, but then drove off. I thought it was probably a prostitute with her John. However, looking back at my mirror, maybe a second later, the woman in the limo were gone. Let me reassure you that there was no way that I would have missed the limo driving off in that second that it took me to look back in the mirror. They weren't on the road or in the cemetery because I looked for taillights. The cemetery gates are pretty large, and it would have taken a great effort and time to open both of the cemetery gates for the car to get through. I did not think much of the incident until a few days later. I was talking with some of my employees that lived in the area near the cemetery. Two of my employees mentioned that I'd probably seen the ghost called Resurrection Mary. I didn't much believe in ghosts until that incident, and I'm still somewhat skeptical, but I cannot fully explain what I saw that night. That incident is still vivid in my memory, and kind of creepy to think about it, to this day. Ever since I can remember, I've always had an interest in ghost stories. That is why I'm writing you this letter. No. I don't have a ghost in my house. A friend of mine told me about this place at least 10 months ago. I was so amazed at this story, I asked if he would take me to this place. No one really ever goes there. I guess because it's so creepy and dark looking at night, but during the day, it is okay. Nothing strange happens. Well first, before I tell you more about this place, let me tell you the story of why it is so unusual. The city is called Lake Forest, California. And they call it Canyon Creek, I guess, because it is nothing but canyon and wide open spaces of nothing but rocks and wildlife. The story goes back 30 years ago of a lady who was in her 40s. Nobody knew what her name was. She lived alone with her two Great Dane dogs. She was very rich and owned all of the canyon, which is like miles and miles of land. This lady never married and had no children. It was just her dogs and herself. She lived in this trailer park home and it was not a pretty house by any stretch of the imagination. Well, about six years later, the story goes that a police officer got a call about the lady and her dogs. The officer went to the lady's home 
and knocked at the door, and no one answered. The officer ended up breaking down the door, and what he found next was horrifying. It is said that the officer found the lady dead. Nothing was left but her decaying body, and her bones were visible. Worst of all, laying right next to her were her dogs. They had both died as well. Now, on to the paranormal part. People who have never been to this place don't know what to expect if they come into this place. It's unpredictable. Sometimes, when you go back to the area where she passed, you'll notice paranormal phenomena. Other times, you won't. A man was driving alone on the canyon by himself one night, and the story goes that he saw the presence of the lady standing at the side of the road with her two dogs. The man did not stop at all to give the lady a ride. He just kept going. This other story was told by my friend. My friend told me that his ex-girlfriend and her boyfriend went up there one night to check it out. They stopped where the lady's house was. They were only there about 15 minutes away when they were just talking and listening to music. Then, all of a sudden, they heard a knock on the side door of the driver's seat. They both turned to look, and they saw the lady standing there knocking on the window. She was dressed in all white and covered in blood. They also saw the dogs nearby as well, far off into the distance, appearing as silhouettes. They sat there in shock for three minutes, horrified by what they just saw. For some reason, the lady was still knocking at the driver's side of the window, but in reality, it was really not that long. They both said, that she must have been there about 40 seconds. After that, my friend said they never returned back there. That was not the only story that happened to anyone. There are far more. What I would like to know is who is this lady and why is she doing this? There is something more to why she has to haunt people who have done nothing to her. Maybe it is because she does not want anyone on her land that she loves so much. What could it be? Here's my email address. If you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. I would like at least some kind of feedback on this story. Please, I beg you. I'm so confused and I'm scared. Please let me know what is going on. I find this intriguing. When I was 12, my family moved to a newer house about 10 miles away from where I grew up. The house was seven years old, and no one had ever died there. From the start, I would hear footsteps in the carpeting, and I always felt that I was being watched, especially when I played her piano. That was the extent of my experiences until I was in my early 20s. One evening, my sister and I were sitting in the den talking. It was spring, and the temperature was perfect, so all the windows were closed and the air was off. Suddenly, in the back of the room, where there were a lot of plants sitting together, one plant in the middle started shaking furiously. My sister and I looked at each other and went into the other room. A few weeks later, my mother and I were sitting alone in the house when it sounded like someone very roughly raked their fingernails down a couch in the back of the room, which was in sight, and again, a plant that was sitting at the end of the couch started shaking ferociously. My mother just would not admit that we were being visited, even though she'd witnessed it firsthand. The last time anything paranormal happened was on a Friday afternoon. I was in my mother's room, talking to her, when I noticed that atmosphere had seemed to grow heavy, and I got chills. As the afternoon wore on, the feeling increased until I couldn't stand to go into the room any longer. That evening, my sister and I were alone and watching TV. I had gone to the fridge for a snack and felt the heaviness with the goosebumps on the left side of it. I told my sister that the ghost was in the kitchen. I could feel it. A few minutes later, 
a picture that was hanging in the kitchen fell off of the wall. When we got the nerve up, my sister and I went to another door in the kitchen on the opposite side of the room. We walked in and stood there, seeing and feeling nothing. Suddenly, the hair on our arms literally stood up and we had to run out. Immediately afterwards it left and hasn't been back. I don't even feel like I'm being watched while playing the piano. I guess whatever it was only wanted to communicate, but I was too frightened. I felt the heaviness with chills in other places, but until the last few years, I hadn't seen any entities. I've moved twice and really don't believe the houses were haunted, but internally and for short periods of time, I believe there were entities present. I've seen a man with long salt and pepper hair with a dark cloak looking at me with bright colorless eyes. It looked like a negative of a photo. Also, I've seen a bright, elongated white shape out of the corner of my eye around my bed several times. The most profound experience I've ever had was when I was visited by the spirit of a friend who had died a week before his 16th birthday. Also 10 years later, I started having dreams with him there, and I'll wake up with the most wonderful feeling of being loved. During one of these dreams, I was at home alone during the day and had to sleep because I was working nights. It was a little warm, but not enough for the air. I had two blankets in my bed and threw one in the floor, and the other one was a mess because I had been tossing and turning. I finally made it back to sleep and dreamed of my friend. I got too hot and woke up to find the blanket I tossed on the floor laid over me very neatly. I've had too many experiences to discount anything to just chance, and my mother is finally admitting that she's experienced the paranormal. I live in Tucson, Arizona. Shortly north of the city lies Mount Lemmon. This peak is a great forested 7,000 foot getaway from the desert city. I had my brother and two friends over at my place at about 1am a few months ago, and after a few hours of boredom, we decided to go to Mount Lemmon and enjoy some nice, cool night air. I would often take the 45 minute trip to wind down and watch the stars, so this is a very familiar place. The trip started off very normal. Our first stop was without occurrences. The next stop, I became mildly aware of a presence. This is nothing new to me, however, so I ignored it. By the third stop, we got out again. My brother and our friend Steve stayed in the car, and my friend Thea and I went for a walk. After a short discussion about friend trouble, she interrupted and said she kept seeing a shadowed figure from the top of a nearby peak. I told her that something was watching us, but not to worry because I didn't sense hostility. We started the walk back and kept hearing the sound of scattered gravel and an extra set of footsteps on the other side of me. This was at first amusing because we knew at this time we had gained a friend that was not from around here. By the time we got to the car, Thea panicked, and when we got in, my brother and Steve spoke of the shadowy figures they saw. We smiled, started the car, and drove down the mountain. As we spoke about what we saw and what we felt, it was decided that we would stop again. We pulled off at a scenic view of a canyon area where we found a newer Ford Bronco with the engine running, the dome light on, and no one in or around the vehicle. This was unsettling, but could surely be explained, no matter how far-fetched the explanation. We stayed here for about 10 minutes. After the first couple of minutes, my brother and I simultaneously noticed a large dark mass above the peak where we were being watched earlier. Thea saw the figures on the top of the peak I could see the mass disappear as if moving down the mountain towards us. 
He said the figures were walking down the mountainside. No one was scared at this point. We we're all very amused. When I could no longer see the mass, I was only able to see it above the mountain because the sky posed as a backdrop. We all got a wave of panic. Gravel started swirling around everywhere, and Thea and Jason ran for the car. I was stunned, so I was the last to get there. Jason entered the car from the other side, but his heavy trench coat was flipped over his head as he opened the door. We started the car and sped down the mountain. We spoke with Steve about what we saw, and he said he saw the same shadow figures that Thea had seen. We pulled over one last time without getting out of the car to show Steve the black mass that was causing all of the commotion. We then kept driving until we reached the city again. The whole way down, seeing cars pulled to the side, some with dome lights on, never with anyone in or around them. This is very odd for 3 a.m. on a Thursday morning. Furthermore, vehicles are not allowed to park on the road after 10 p.m. The next night, he and I returned. We never got out of the car this time. However, every time we cut the engine in all power, we hear scratching underneath the car and eventually it would start to rock. We pulled over four times and this happened every time. Finally, the fifth time, we decided to get out of the car before that happened so we would have enough guts to see what else would happen. Once again, we didn't make it. We opened the doors and pointed our flashlights outside. And as soon as we did, gravel started swirling around louder than before. There was no wind and we watched it jumped around as if someone was kicking it right in front of us. After this trip, it turned out that the brakes in front of the left of the car where we heard the scratching from where the car was off were worn down badly. However, the rest of the brakes were completely fine. We stumped the mechanic, but once again, this is something that may be explained. I just don't know how. I'm planning a return trip, well equipped now. I'll bring a camera, several flashlights, and a video recorder. Depending on the outcome of this trip, I'll forward any eventful messages to your site. I'm stuck wondering two things now. First off, what is this entity? There are no local legends that I've found about Mount Lemon. Second off, will it be there again when I visit next week? I hope so. There's so much more I would like to learn before it just becomes a memory. I was stationed at Ford Island, Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, in the early 1980s. I was a corpsman assigned to the hospital there, which at the time was only an aid station, kept there because of the brig on the other side of the island. I spent many nights in the large hospital, alone. They only used a small area in the ER. All throughout the night, you could hear people moving around and doors opening and windows closing. I would walk around looking for the source of the sounds, but no one else was there. Many people died there December 7th, and many years after that. More than one night, I woke up thinking someone was watching me, and a few nights, I was awakened by the sound of the ER doors closing by themselves. I'd even seen the presence of an old man wandering the halls from a distance, except it looked like he was floating and was missing a leg. There was always this hospital room that smelled rancid, even though it was supposed to be the cleanest room. Every time I'd walk by there, I'd see a dark fog sitting there through the corner of my eye. I would then completely look into the room, and the fog would disappear instantly. I've never written about this before. There were about 20 others who had duty there, and some men and women would pay me to take their duty 
so that they would not have to sleep there. I was so shocked to see that no one had reported it on their list in Hawaii. Ford Island has many suicides and strange deaths, from people driving their cars off the runway to a group of ski divers landing on rocks just off the coast. My husband and I took our two children to Florida to visit his parents this past Christmas. Since his parents live in a small two-bedroom condo, there wasn't room for all of us to sleep there. My mother-in-law has some friends with a condo about three or four miles from her building, and they primarily use it for furnished rental. It happened to be unoccupied at the time, so she made arrangements for my husband and me to sleep there. The first night we went over to go to bed, I noticed some dark shadows moving around the apartment, but just out of the corners of my eyes. I've seen spirit shadows before, and they do not look like regular room shadows. They're darker and more solid appearing. I didn't pay too much attention at first, didn't realize what I was seeing, I guess, until I got up early the next morning and went outside onto the apartment's small balcony. I saw something light colored go through the kitchen and assumed my husband had come out of the bedroom. But when I went back into the apartment, he was in the bathroom and had not come into the kitchen at all. While I was getting dressed, I saw something small and black retreat under the closet door in the bedroom. I thought at first it was a roach, rare, as they are in the nice 5th floor Florida condos, it was not impossible. I pulled back the closet door, and there was nothing in the closet but pale gray carpeting on the floor and empty hangers on the rod. I began to have my suspicions, but kept them to myself. That night, my husband stayed at his mother's with our younger child, and my oldest son, age 13, came back to the borrowed apartments with me since we were going fishing very early the next morning. He put his stuff down in the smaller bedroom, then came out in the hallway and asked me who else was in the apartment. I said we were alone. Why did he ask? He told me he'd just seen something go through his bedroom. Well, that clinched it for me, but I kind of brushed it off, not wanting to scare him. I didn't leave my light on all night, though. I saw the dark shadows up near the top of the bedroom door several times. The next night, when my husband and I arrived, I went into the master bedroom, and as I entered the room, I felt this wave wash over me, sort of a combination of curiosity, irritation, and loneliness. Who are you? Why are you here? And where or where have you been? I decided I did not feel up to trying to communicate with this entity on its terms. Not that I've been very successful with that anyway. So I sat on the bed and spoke aloud and told it I was just visiting with permission from the owners. I promised to clean up everything before I left. For some reason, I had the feeling that my travel clutter was making it upset. And in return, please. It would not scare me by materializing unexpectedly. After the evening, the place just felt empty. I didn't see the shadows anymore and had the feeling that whoever it was had vacated or was just trying to stay out of the way. I guess we reached some sort of compromise. I told my husband that I thought there was a ghost in the apartment and while he scoffed and told me I was crazy, I noticed he spent the remaining three nights at his mother's and sent our son back with me. No one has died in that apartment that I know of, but it's in a large building full of retirees, and I'm not sure many residents have passed on over the 30-year life of the building. Maybe someone was just wandering around. I will never know. I've sent info before, but I'm using a friend's computer today since the battery in my car is dead. Nothing to do with ghosts, I don't think. 
Anyway, having read about people seeing black figures, I thought I would add my two cents. The first time, I was 16, living with my grandparents in LA, who were out of town at the time. I wasn't drinking, just alone, when I left my bedroom and crossed the hall into the kitchen. That's when a figure stepped out in front of me. It was the strangest figure I'd ever seen. He appeared as a hairy ghost of some sort. His arms, face, and legs were completely covered in fur, but he still looked humanoid. It's a little difficult to explain, but it kind of looked like that famous Bigfoot photo in footage from 1967, except the presence was still a dark silhouette. Not dark enough that you couldn't see the fur, but still dark. It was creepy. I got a baseball bat and turned on all the lights in the house and even called a friend. Nothing else. Then, just less than two years ago, I'd since moved to Corrales, New Mexico. I was living with another woman. I got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom. As I came out, through the door, there was another shadow being right in front of me. I saw its head and shoulders, and it was taller than me. I put my hands up as if to gesture, excuse me, or not, to run it over. Since then, here in Corrales, I felt things in the corners, running around the room, and such. I bought my own house in July 1999, and my dog barked incredibly at one particular corner. My roommate at the time immediately burned sage, and he stopped. What are these things? I've not seen anything in my place, and the dogs haven't acted weird since. Any ideas? Someone did say that I might have been dimension jumping. Have you heard of this? Let me start off by saying, I've never met my real father. He died when I was a baby. Anyhow, I've always known about my deceased father. His name was Jerry. Now, no one in my family talks about my deceased dad, and we don't know anyone by the name of Jerry. One day, when I was between the ages of eight to nine, my cousin and my mother and myself were downstairs, and we were in the basement singing. The phone began to ring, and even though we had a phone in the basement, I went upstairs, one flight, to our library, to answer the phone, so as to not disturb my mother's song. When I answered the phone, I noticed immediately the static on the line, and I knew it wasn't our phone, so I asked the caller to speak louder. Now, from here on out, it gets weirder. The caller asked to speak to REC, my mom's nickname. I then asked who it was calling, and the caller replied Jerry. I immediately knew my mother knew of no other Jerry, so I repeated the name, and the caller acknowledged that that was his name. I tell him to hold on. I run down the stairs to where my mother and cousin were, and tell my mother to pick up the phone, that she had a phone call and that the caller's name was Jerry. My cousin looked up shocked, as did my mother, and simultaneously said Jerry. This is all happening within a minute or so. So my mother picks up the phone and answers the call, only there is no one on the line now. I run back upstairs to the library to hang up the phone, and I go back to the basement, and both my mother and my cousin are trying to figure out if I got the name right. I assure them I did, and then I tell them about the connection and the static. We all just kind of dismissed the call. Only later when I started thinking about it, did I realize that my father never knew me and died very tragically when he was struck by a car. I think he wanted to hear my voice and hear my mother's voice. What I didn't tell my mother or my cousin is that the caller addressed me by my name. I never told the caller my name, but he knew my name. 
to Maya. My ex-boyfriend lived in a very old part of town, in a house that was built in the 1800s. At one time, the home had been a stately and elegant one, with a long and gracefully curving stair as the focal point upon the entrance into the foyer. Through time, and with the coming of rough economic periods, the home grew into disrepair and was eventually sectioned off into a two-family home. One side housed a family of bikers, whose moonshine sent many of folk into orbit. We didn't have any moonshine the night this happened. And then the other lived my boyfriend and his roommate. One night, myself, my boyfriend Nick, Nick's friend Dave, and my friend Stacy, who was dating Dave at the time, were at the house. We were descending the grand staircase I mentioned earlier on our way out to enjoy our Saturday night. All was dark, except for the soft lighting coming from the kitchen, which was illuminating the front doorway. On the front door, we saw the unmistakable silhouette of a woman in a long old-fashioned hoop skirt, like women wore in the 1800s. She scared the wits out of me and Stacy, and we both refused to go any further down the stairs until the rest of the lights were put on chickens, aren't we? Although Nick and Dave were in a position to see the woman's shadow, for some strange reason, they were unable to see her. Maybe she only liked women, but I know this for a fact. The next moment we actually saw the woman, it looked as if we saw her with her eyes gouged out, and she was running towards us, flying down the hallway. It was actually pretty creepy but it happened in the corner of my eye, so I don't know if I was hallucinating or I actually saw her full steam ahead, but it definitely creeped me out. Another moment, my friend Stacy was upstairs and the door was completely wide open, the bathroom door that is, and she saw that same woman in Victorian era clothes just laying in the bathtub with again her eyes gouged out. I honestly don't understand what happened to this woman. At first I thought it was pretty innocuous, but now I understand. She must have been murdered. There's no other explanation I had than that. Thanks for reading, and I hope you enjoyed the story. I've always been hesitant to talk about this story, but what I tell you is true. In 1992, when I was separated from my wife for the first time, I was living at Old Farm in an apartment. One Saturday night, when my kids were off to their grandmothers and my girlfriend, who was a teacher, had an event to attend, I found myself in my apartment all alone. I rented a couple of movies, ordered a pizza hut, went on over to the whirlpool for a while and sat down to enjoy a peaceful night alone at last. I was really looking forward to a night by myself. When I was reading in bed, I noticed a black silhouetted figure standing in my bedroom door. The figure appeared to have a cloak drawn over its head. I couldn't recognize any features, nor was there any attempt to verbally communicate. I was wide awake and I was terrified. My heart was racing and I kept pulling the covers over my head. It seemed like every second was one of terror. The figure stood in my doorway well into the morning hours and I knew my eyes were as big as they could get. When the silhouette disappeared, I was covered with sweat my hair was wringing wet. I rushed out to the front room because I really couldn't believe it had left me. No, the only thing I had to drink was a Diet Coke with popcorn. I'm not a big drinker. After the ordeal, I quickly showered and raced off to go hiking. I can honestly tell you that no communication with the figure was made. When I would ask who you are, there was no response. 
This went on all night, until by the grace of God, it went away. This event has always affected my life. I know of another person who had a similar experience like mine. Can you tell me what was standing in my door? Why there was no communication? And why me? Have you ever had any stories like this reported to you? Until now, the only person I ever told this story to was a good friend who is a Catholic priest. It still scares me to tell this story. Why was there no attempt to communicate? And yes, when I check my doors, they were all bolted and locked. My father loved the state of Maine. Not enough, however, to give up his cush job in Boston to live on the going wage of a down easter. So every summer, from the mid 50s until I reached high school, we would vacation on the scenic Maine coast. Very seldom will we stay in the same place twice. Usually, it was some remote cottage located on the outskirts of some tiny coastal town. A two week ordeal was in store for me with no TV or friends to speak of. To keep me sane, my mother would buy me comic books and play board games with me long into the night. We've been at this cottage now for about 10 days and I was counting the hours until we would leave. It was a chilly August night and dear old dad had a few too many and drifted off to bed. Our terrier, Joe, was snoozing on the carpet in front of the fireplace and through the big picture window the surf was something out of a South Pacific movie. The waves were gently breaking on the rocky shore, not 20 yards from the cottage. The only sound was the reverie coming from a cruise ship that was passing off the point. In summary, the night was calm. Suddenly, Joe jumped to his feet with his hackles up and growled at the door. I yelled at the dog to be quiet as he interrupted me over a card game. In an instant, the front door blew open and with a bang, it hit the interior wall. Just then, a ghostly presence entered through the doorway. He looked as if he was from the colonial era, had a musket in his hand, and seemed as though only half his face was visible, even though the figure itself had a blur to it. This lasted a few seconds, then the figure disappeared like a fog that evaporated. Joe cowered, and my mother's hair moved like it had been ruffled by some invisible breeze. The playing cards scattered about, and before we could take a breath, the door slammed shut and Joe went back to his sleeping position. We decided not to tell the old man, as he wouldn't believe it anyway. A few days later, we were filling up the old Plymouth for the return trip to Boston, and my father started gabbing with the local about his vacation. With the windows of the car down, we heard every word. So where did you stay? The man asked, with the main dialect. Oh, down on the point at the Jensen Cottage, my old man answered. Folks around here know that place well, the man said flatly. They refer to it as the front door. My name is John. I'm 41 years of age and currently live in the city of Lincoln, England. During my life to date, I've seen several ghosts and whilst I still find them surprising and of course fascinating, I'm no longer afraid of whatever they are or appear to be. I saw my first ghost at around the age of eight whilst having in my childhood home, a large Victorian house on the edge of Manchester, England. The ghost was one of a young boy of a similar age to mine at the time. He was leaning over the banister rail of the stairway landing outside my bedroom as I was making my way up to bed. The shock and surprise of seeing him sent me flying downstairs into the front room of my house. Needless to say, 
that none of my family appeared to believe what I told them I had seen. Although over the years, I've experienced strong sensations of ghostly presences, my next positive encounter was not until I was 22, whilst living and working in the city of Newcastle. I'd obtained the keys to a vacant industrial building, which my firm was taking over. My job was to assess the work involved in converting the building for its future use. I'd locked myself in the building and was therefore sure that no other person was on the premises and was proceeding up some steep and narrow stairs when I felt a hand touch me on the top of my head and give my hair a friendly ruffle, rather like an affectionate parent may give their child. I immediately turned around, only to find the stairway completely empty. Surprised, but not afraid this time, I continued my inspection of the building. We moved into the premises, and although I had my office at the top of the stairs where I had my encounter, and worked there often late into the night, I never saw, heard, or felt anything unusual there again. My next encounter took place right here in Lincoln, about three years ago. Walking her dog out late one night, I noticed the cyclist approaching me along a side street. I thought the cyclist appeared a little unusual, in so far as he was riding an old style, sit him up and beg cycle. His hair looked rather old fashioned too, and most curiously of all, he appeared to be wearing an old style Royal Air Force uniform. I could see the street light reflecting off the silver buttons on his uniform tonic, and from the chrome handlebars of his cycle. He got to within about 30 yards of me, when for some reason, I glanced down for a second. When I looked up again, he had completely disappeared from the street, and there was no way in which he could have left the street in the vicinity of where I last saw him. I wonder whether his appearance was, in some way, connected to the fact that there used to be an open-air swimming pool adjacent to where I saw him. This pool is very popular with air crews during World War II, and I can only assume he may have been on his way for a midnight swim. My most recent encounter was very brief, occurring during the first time I visited my mother's cottage in North Wales. Built around 200 years ago, the back room opens directly out into the rear garden, with the narrow stairs descending into the back room right beside the back door to the building. Whilst coming down the stairs, I saw an elderly woman walk through the back door and disappear. She was aged about 80, approximately 5 foot tall, wearing a gray dress with long sleeves, a white apron, and her straight gray hair was tied up in a sort of bun, which in turn was covered by a small handkerchief on the top of her head. She was followed immediately by a young girl, aged about 10 or 12, dressed in a long light, colored smock. Her hair was very long, blonde and straight, falling down her back. She also disappeared straight away. I have no idea what ghosts are or why they appear. I do not see them as threatening. In fact, on more than one occasion, a curious sensation of contentment seems to fill the air after they have gone. I have noticed that my mind is not thinking about anything in particular at the times I've come across them. Thanks for reading. I grew up in western New York and knew the local legends of ghosts, the Rochester Durant White Lady, for example. I never really put much faith in them. I never had an experience until I left New York. In October of 99, I was transferred to Elyra, Ohio. After a few weeks, I was asked to work in Sandusky. I accepted the promotion, but having just settled into a new apartment, I decided to commute rather than move again. Halfway between Elyra and Sandusky, there was a rest stop on I-90, Route 2, just outside Vermilion. 
I would stop sometimes on the way home for a bathroom break, or rest a bit. It's a funny design. You drive around and park in back of the building, between the building, and wooden walking trails. I usually got off work after about 11 p.m., but it was usually pretty busy, so I never gave much thought to stopping there late at night. One night, in March of this year, I'd stop for a bathroom break. I noticed that there was only a few cars in the lot. It was a warm spring night. I wondered why more people weren't out. As I returned to my car, I had this urge to walk into the wooded area. A stupid thing to do, as it would be easy for a human assailant to hide on the trails. I walked in about 10 feet, and the path split to the left and straight ahead. I walked a little further straight ahead and felt something in there with me. I turned and started the walk out when I heard a noise, kind of like a lumbering sound. Feeling foolish and thinking there was probably an animal, like a hedgehog or deer, walking through the woods, I looked back and saw a pair of yellow eyes on the path quite a while back. I knew it could not be an animal, as only the parking area was lighted. The only light in the woods came from the ambient light and the moon. I quickly closed the distance between myself and the parking area, keys in hand. To my relief, nothing pursued me and the eyes were gone, or at least I couldn't see them anymore. I went straight home. The next day, I felt rather silly. Thinking about the matter during the day, none of it seemed like it should have scared me. I rationalized the whole thing. That night, I stopped for a bathroom break. Feeling brave, I decided to once again check out the woods and dispel my fear once and for all. This time, I walked out only halfway to the fork and I felt an overwhelming sense of dread. I was not afraid in the usual sense rabbit heartbeat, sweating, etc. I just had this feeling of not being able to walk any deeper into the woods. It was like the air got heavier the further I walked. As I walked out of the woods, the feeling went away, just as it had come. I decided to come back on my day off and investigate, during the day. I'd never been in the day, and I didn't know where the trails led, or what was in the woods that attracted people to them. I returned a few days later with my jogging shoes, ready to explore. The trails wrapped around to each other and only totaled a mile loop. There was a ledge, a cliff area, but it was fenced off and there was no way to get down, but I could see a stream in the distance. I didn't feel anything strange at all. Nonetheless, I made it a point not to stop there after dark. A few months later, I was transferred to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, which leads me to my next story, but we are still looking into it, and it's AM now, so I need some sleep. I don't usually share this with anyone, since most people would consider me crazy for believing in this stuff my husband and father included. When I was about two years old, back in 1973, I have very vivid memories about my childhood, and my mother confirms my memories. We rented an old house, about a hundred years old. It was there when in Phoenix, Arizona. It was not much, but a lot of farmland. There was a smaller house next to it that used to be the old barn. It's still there today, but surrounded by huge mansions. Anyway, things were peaceful there until our next door neighbor hung himself in the kitchen and my father found him. I never knew about it. But about three months after, things began to happen. My mother was having an argument with my father one morning before getting out of bed. She got really mad and got up and went to the kitchen. She saw a man sitting at the table with his head in his hands on the table so that she couldn't see his face. She 
she turned around and went back to bed, not saying a word to my dad. Later, I began to see a hand floating in my room and would hear it talk to me. I called it, and this is kind of weird, Bugs, but now, I think it could have been about Abbott Bugs or something about that. As a child that young, it was difficult to express myself with words yet. I didn't have the word for ghost and would be spanked by my father for crying at night when this thing would appear and talk to me. One time, I was sitting on the potty with my mom there to supervise. I couldn't get off the toilet like something was holding me down. My mother was pulling me by the arms to try to get me off, but couldn't. Finally, it let go. Sometimes, the door was slammed shut and locked with me on the other side, and I couldn't get out. Only the lock on the other door didn't work anymore. No matter how hard my mother would pull, the door would not open. Then all of a sudden, it would feel as if nothing happened. At night, you could hear scratching noises under the wood floor in the master bedroom. Dad said it was just animals. He crawled under the house, but didn't find anything. He never believes in this stuff. At night, when I would go to bed, always fussed about not wanting to go because I was scared. Before falling asleep, I felt something was trying to pull me through the wall. Sometimes, I felt like I was floating, like in another dimension or something. My mother finally had enough and made my dad find a new house to buy. We moved, and nothing quite as dramatic as that ever happened to me again. The new house had its little incidents, but that's another story. My parents are still alive in the house, and they bought it 27 years ago. First of all, let me explain. I'm from England. I'm a 26-year-old male living in Cambridge. I was born in Yorkshire, North England. Just up the road from where I lived was a place called Oakwell Hall, located in an area called Birkinshaw. Oakwell Hall is a fairly small house compared to some in the UK, but it certainly has local character. Many a day away from school would be spent wandering around the grounds. Local legend has it that the hall was once inhabited by a great local family named the Bats, hence the local town of Batley, and that one of the sons of the family, a womanizer and gambler of no small repute, found himself in a duel fought on the local moors. The servants all knew of this, and so were relieved. The sounds of his horse were heard, re-entering the stables. They were even more relieved when the son was seen walking through the hall, up the stairs, and to his bedchamber. They then made a rather spooky discovery when they noticed a bloody footprint on the staircase. Thinking their master was injured in a duel, they entered his chambers to see if they could help him. He was not there. The bed had not been disturbed. There was no horse in the stable. News was later conveyed that the son had died in the duel, and every Christmas Eve, the same bloody footprint can be seen on the staircase. This is not what I saw. I was eight years old, and it was the school holidays. Two friends, Stephen and Stuart and myself, were walking through the garden when Stuart noticed one of the windows was blacked out. We noticed it as the sun was behind the house and so should have been shining pretty much through the hall and out the other side. Thinking that there may be something going on, there are occasionally demonstrations in the hall. We entered the building and up the stairs. As we got to the top of the stairs, Stephen remarked he felt a bit funny and I suddenly felt cold. The next thing we saw was a black blob about a half a meter off the floor and about 1.5 meters tall flow out of one door and into another. Stuart asked if anyone else had seen it, and we all said we had. Stuart then started to walk through down the corridor 
very slowly while Stephen and I stayed at the top of the stairs and were quite scared. Stuart looked around the corner and then ran back to us. We were so scared at this point that we just ran out and down the drive to the gate. Stuart told me later that he saw a figure about six foot tall that seemed to be made of shadows. He was dressed in a long coat and wore what looked like a top hat. He seemed to be looking for something and then it became aware of him. He told me much later, about 10 years later, that it looked over its shoulder at him and rather than a pair of eyes, it had a single red slit that seemed to pulse. I've been back to the hall since and seen nothing out of the ordinary. However, I felt very uneasy about certain rooms. Oh well, there you go. I don't know if this qualifies as having a haunting or possession, or if I'm just crazy. I've read several stories on your site, which is great by the way, and haven't come across anything similar to one of my experiences, which I'll tell below. My father is suffering from advanced rheumatoid arthritis, along with hepatitis C. Not a good combination. Anyway, I've been living with the pain of knowing he would be sick and in pain for the rest of his life since I was 16. I'm now 22, and watching him suffer and struggle with his diseases. Because of this, I've become increasingly interested in whether or not there is another phase of existence after we leave this world. I've been asking, both mentally and out loud, for some type of proof of this, mostly for my own comfort. Anyway, I've recently been hearing noises that sound like a lot of people talking at once in my house when I'm home alone. It doesn't bother me or scare me, and it's so faint that it could be my imagination. Along with this, I've heard walking on my ceiling, my rooms are in the finished basement, and thinking my fiancé was home, went upstairs to greet him, only to find myself still alone in this very house. Since I've been asking for proof, I wonder if it's only my imagination, but this next part was scary. I heard the voices. Sounds like a crowd of people all talking at once, but this time, I wasn't hearing them externally, with my ears, originating from inside my head. I had this weird feeling that they were all talking directly to me, rather than just overhearing things like the other occasions. Anyway, the voices in my head just kept getting louder and louder, and all of a sudden, I was laughing uncontrollably for no reason. Probably doesn't sound too scary to you, but the whole time I was laughing, about five minutes, I was having thoughts like, why am I laughing? Why can't I stop laughing? There's nothing funny about this, and such. I was scared and physically willed myself to stop laughing, which didn't work. The voices started fading after about five minutes, and my laughing reduced to giggles and then to shock silence. I've never told anyone about these things. I even think I sound crazy. And no, I was not on any mind-altering substances at the time this happened. Has the voices laughing thing happened to anyone else out there or am I just crazy if this has happened to someone out there please email me okay I know there are skeptics out there but my grandmother my mom and I are very in tune with our spirits for some reason I'll start with my grandparents babysitting ghost we call him that, because only kids could see him if all the adults were out of the house. To explain the house a bit, the hallway is L-shaped. There is a bathroom to your immediate right, then two bedrooms, bedrooms one and two, 
on your left, when you turn the corner, there is a bedroom, number three on your left, another bathroom on your right, and the last bedroom, number four, at the end of the hall. My mom's dad was at work, and her mom and all my mom's brothers and sisters were outside, talking to friends and such. My mom was just sitting and watching TV. As my mom was watching TV, she saw something moving out of the corner of her eye and looked down the hallway from the living room. There was a very tiny old man sitting in a rocking chair, reading a book and looking up at her from time to time. She said he just smiled at her and kept rocking and reading. When the adults came back into the house, he disappeared. Two of my cousins have seen him also. The one thing that totally freaked us out was after my mom and I moved in with my grandparents. My uncle Kay had died in the first bedroom about a year before. He was really into drinking and drugs, so one night his heart, liver, and kidneys just failed on him. He was the practical joker of the family. Anyhow, my mom and I came home one night. My grandparents were out. We both had to use the bathroom really bad. So my mom ran to the first one, and I went to the second one at the end of the hallway. All of a sudden, I heard my mom yell, Hey! I was about to open the door to ask why she was yelling, when I saw a hand open the bathroom door. I hurried up and finished my business and ran to my mom and asked her what happened. Why did she open the door to the bathroom and not tell me what she needed? Then I realized she was still in the bathroom. She said she saw a hand opening her bathroom door. I told her I saw the same thing. We're the only people in this house, and this happened on the opposite ends of the house. She just looked up at the ceiling and said, Kay, stop scaring us. We don't want to play with you right now. Your jokes aren't funny. We heard the most evil laugh we could imagine. At that point, we looked at each other and ran out of the house. When we came back, my grandparents were home and we sat my grandma down and told her what happened. She had to have the house blessed three times before the spirits went away. I was visiting some relatives in Denton, Texas in early July of this year when this strange event took place. My relatives live in a trailer park and some of the trailers are sitting close together. One late night when I was there, my nephew left his cigarettes in his car, so he went out to get them. I went with him. As we were walking to his car, we noticed that next door, there was someone rummaging around in a trash can that was in the back of the neighbor's truck. We thought nothing of it, thinking it was just one of the neighbors looking for something they threw away. As it was dark near where the vehicles were parked, we couldn't make out who it was. Well, my nephew got his cigarettes out of his car, and we were walking to the front of his trailer, where there is a bench you can sit on. We were walking towards it, when we noticed whoever it was that was walking through the garbage can, was now walking up to the next door neighbor's porch, which was a good 20-30 feet from us. For whatever reason, just the sight of the person made both of us freeze, while this figure just stood at the foot of the next door neighbor's porch steps with its back to us. It was almost as if this figure knew we were looking at it, but it wasn't even facing towards us. It just stood there, and we felt that somehow it was looking at us. Somehow. In the light of the porch lights, we could make out the details of this figure. The figure was of a small boy, but what was weird was that his head was shaven on both sides of his head, and in the middle was a blonde mohawk type haircut, except it wasn't the short type, but more of the longer hairstyle mohawk. This kid had 80s style clothes on, the short, 
multicolored and unbuttoned, light blue shorts, and white tennis shoes. This kid just stood there for a few moments and began ascending the next door neighbor's steps in a stiff, awkward way. Its arms were close to its sides, and as it went up the steps, it just continued staring straight ahead, not once looking down or in any other direction. Then, the view of the kid was obstructed by the neighbor's porch, so we could no longer see him. The weird thing is, we never heard the next door neighbor's front door open or anything that would indicate this person went in. My nephew and I, very unnerved and chilled, ran into his parents' trailer. We sat in his living room for a while, trying to rationalize what we had seen. He told me that the neighbors had two girls, but looked nothing like what we had seen. We asked my nephew's mother, my sister, if she knew if the neighbors had some relatives over, and if so, if they had a boy that looked like what we described. She said, not that she knew of. Well, the next day, we go over to the neighbor's trailer and ask them if they had anyone over that looked like what we saw. They said no, we've had no visitors in two weeks, and no, we have no boys or children like what you described. My nephew and I then noticed their two girls in the living room. We confirmed that that was the only children they had. So, who or what could have been? Where did it go? We didn't hear it go in the neighbor's home that night. So maybe it was just the strange neighborhood kid and went through their backyard to where they were going. Well, that would have been very difficult since the neighbors have one of those extremely high wooden fences with no doors on it in their backyard. Besides, why would it go through the trouble of going up into their porch when they could have gone around? It's an old trailer park and there's no telling how many people have lived and died in a lot of those trailers. I'm just glad I don't live there. Something and everything about this is strange. And what we saw that night, I know in my heart that it was not normal, but paranormal. I'm just glad the figure never turned around to look at us. I don't know what would have happened then. I'd hate to find out. My name is Paul, and I live in Canada, in the province of Nova Scotia, in a small city called Sydney. This small city was at one time an industrial center, with coal mines and a large steel plant that employed thousands. This area's past employment promises has drawn in many foreigners to settle here, and we have a rich history of superstitions and beliefs. I should say that I'm not exactly a believer in ghosts, although I have an open mind to the idea that there may be something to it at all. Anyway, on with my story. I think I was 17 or 18 when this happened, which was around 1987. I was working for my local McDonald's restaurant and was working until 2 a.m. It was shortly after midnight when I took a break and call my girlfriend to say goodnight. As we talked, she stopped to see if someone had come down the stairs from the second level of her parents' home because she thought she had heard footsteps. She checked the stairs twice, but nobody was there. The conversation turned to the fact that at times, she would hear sounds in the house as though someone was walking the stairs. Our topic then returned to the normal teenage babble until she happened to look into the adjacent room. She thought she saw someone sitting at the end of the sofa. She put the phone down momentarily while she turned on the light in the darkened room. It was only a sweater and a jacket laid over the backrest of the sofa, so we resumed our conversation once again. I can tell you that she had no thoughts of anything paranormal, she was thinking that maybe someone else was home, other than her sleeping parents, as she had a number of older brothers still living at home. I can remember that as we talked, 
She stopped dead in mid-sentence and started to weep. I was wondering what was wrong, thinking that I had said something to upset her. When I got her to speak, she told me that there was someone there, standing in the doorway of the room where she had just been. She sobbed that she was trying to sit very still in the hopes that this apparition would not see her and just go away. I tried to talk to her and settle her down, not quite sure if this was a joke or not. I think that the figure stood in this position for at least five minutes. Then, just when my terrified girlfriend calmed down a little, the figure moved into the hallway and assumed a sitting position, legs crossed. I again had to try and calm her down by talking to her and asking her to describe what she was seeing. The figure, she said, appeared to be a boy of about 8 or 10 years old. He was wearing a modern looking winter jacket and a winter hat. She said that although the facial features were not plain, the eyes could be clearly seen and were blue. The hands and feet area of the figure faded out of sight. This boy sat on the floor, not 10 feet from her, and looked right at her. Another minute or two passed, and then my girlfriend started weeping again. I remember her whispering, Oh, Paul, it's a girl. She told me that the figure had reached up and pulled a hat off its head, and long blonde hair flowed from under it. The figure sat and stared in my girlfriend's direction a few minutes more, and then appeared to stand up and go back into the room where Ed came and disappeared. My girlfriend stayed on the phone just long enough to be sure it was gone. Then she hung up with me and ran for her parents' bedroom. That was the end of the experience, and had lasted about 15 minutes. She asked her parents the next day if they could think of who this may have been. They had no ideas, and probably didn't believe her. I wasn't quite sure if I believed her either, and I kept asking her if she was playing a joke on me. She insisted she saw what she saw, and she wasn't comfortable talking about it, for fear that it may reappear. I'm now married to my girlfriend, and she still swears every word of this is true. She still doesn't like to talk about it. No one has ever seen a ghost in that house before, or since, that I'm aware of. My wife over the years has gotten spooked, and came running to me saying that she felt uneasy, and was afraid she was bad, but she hasn't been. I don't know if you respond to these letters or not, but if you do, write me a note to tell me what you think. Thank you for reading. I've always been interested in the supernatural, and am convinced that ghosts do exist. Unfortunately, I've never seen nor felt one. I am, however, overly curious and try on occasion to find one. I have a friend that often accompanies me, but sometimes she gets too afraid to press on. She can feel their presence and bows out. I think she can feel them. And if she perceives them as evil, well, she just quits. She has a gift that I can only wish I had. I, on the other hand, don't possess that gift, and as a result, am fearless. I suppose I ought to get on with my stories. Again, I've never seen a ghost, but listen to this. My curiosity in the supernatural goes years back. When I was younger, I attended a university in southern Illinois. I had a friend named Tanya, whose parents lived in a supposedly haunted house. They claimed that a ghost lived in the attic of their home. I don't remember the spirit's name at this time, but I do remember that they claimed that she liked to play with the hangers in the attic and that they could hear her slamming doors and climbing to the stairs to the attic at night. There were other farther fetched claims as well, but they said that whenever something strange happened, they would always have the association of the smell of Lilyx. It was, apparently, the popular perfume of the time when this girl passed. No explanation was given as to the events of her passing. 
Anyway, I was invited to sleep in the attic of their home one night. I was apprehensive at first to be able to relax enough to sleep, but in time, I started to drift away. Just as sleep began to overtake me, I heard a very loud and unsettling rustling in front of my face. I instantaneously turned on a light right next to me. Nothing was there. The memory of that sound made it very difficult for me to concentrate on sleeping again, but after what seemed to be about two hours, I started to succumb to sleep again. As I drifted again, again came that sound, louder this time. I stayed calm for a few minutes to be sure this was actually happening. I stayed still, but pulled my eyes open to see if anything was there. There was no light. My eyes were wide open. I was fully awake, and the noise persisted. Again, I turned on the light, and there was nothing there. Once the light came on, the noise ceased instantly. This time, I decided to feign asleep. I turned out the light, closed my eyes, and regulated my breathing. I did everything like sleeping without actually sleeping. Eventually, I even got my heart to stop pounding. Hell, I was scared, but managed to seem oblivious. Once again, it started, and in an instant, I turned on the light yet again. There, in front of my eyes, was a mass, a ball of white moths, about the size of a softball. As soon as the light hit them, they flew straight into the shadows of the room. Not like moths fly, they flew straight course into the various shadows and disappeared. They disappeared into shadows, not holes or cracks. They weren't real. No moth could do what I'm trying to describe here. Once they disappeared, my fear was gone and has been ever since. I'm no longer afraid of ghosts. I believe that if a spirit chooses to stick around, it is because it or they have something to tell you. I'm convinced that these moths were presented to me by Lily at Girl, and I believe that she showed them to me only because she wanted to be acknowledged, not feared. I think that if I were to return to this house, she'd show me the moths again. This time, I'd be much more appreciative and a lot less afraid. I'd see it as a welcome to an old friend than as a threat to a newcomer. I think she just needs someone to talk to. She must have been terribly lonely. Moth story number two. About a year after that incident, I was still in college. I was on the 16th story of my dorm, cramming for finals. I happened to look out onto the ledge outside the window, where sat a beautiful green wood moth. I knew it meant something, but at the time, not what. My roommate walked into the study area and informed me that I had a call from my mother. I went into my room and answered the phone by saying, is Gran dead? My mom was speechless for a time. Then she said, how did you know? I, I didn't answer. You see, my Gran was 103 when she died. For years, she didn't know my name. She always just called me Janine's son. Well, on the day that her husband died at 98 years old, I took her for a long walk around her house. She hadn't been out in years. During that brief walk, I had found a feather in a greedwood moth's wing. I saved them as a token of that day. After that walk, she never called me Janine's son anymore. She called me that nice boy who took me for a walk about twice. Then she just called me that nice boy. When I heard of her passing that day, I made arrangements to get to her funeral. I did, and upon viewing her casket, I placed the feather and the wing on her body. I feel that she's still around and still views me as the nice boy. Once again, I must reiterate that I've never seen a ghost. I promise you though, that they are real and I don't need to see to believe. Just as Grandma Chip 
she's still there. Look for a moth. When you do, he'll be a greenwood moth. This is what I like to call motion pictures on the wall. The first time it happened was when I was about six years old. I had woken up in the middle of the night and crept into bed with my parents. I still couldn't sleep, and when I rolled over towards the wall, it appeared that someone was showing a movie on it. Hard to explain, but it was a dim, full-color, silent motion picture like a living painting of a man dressed like Henry VIII talking to a woman being helped into a wide hoop frame that went under her dress. That was it. Then it ended. Totally harmless, but still. How the heck did it get there? I told my mom about it in the morning. I had tried to wake her up and dad, but they were sound asleep. She said I was just hallucinating because I was so tired but was still amazed at my description of the hoop skirt and undergarment, as I have never seen one before. Okay, fast forward three more years. My brother and I were staying with our folks at our grandparents' house. We kids begged to sleep in the dining room under the huge table, so we could pretend it was a fort. Again, in the middle of the night, I awoke to find a huge silent motion picture on the wall. This time, I was able to wake my brother up, and together we watched it. He stood up and looked out the window to see if someone was doing it from the outside. No, nothing, no source of light or anything. In fact, the shadow of his head didn't even show on the wall. It completely disappeared for a second. But then, I heard a noise coming from the hallway in the house, a really frightening, disturbing wailing. It was the scariest sound that I have ever heard in my life, like someone being butchered to death. Then, into the dining room came a black shadow. We only saw this shadow for about 40 seconds before it ultimately dissipated. I swear to God, the shadow looked as if it was wearing a top hat, and it was running around before ultimately dissipating, like I said. I don't know how this happened, but even my friend saw this at the time, and we were in the dining room like I said, but there's nothing to explain this away. Maybe it was connected to the silent motion picture I saw on the wall. In fact, I can almost guarantee the motion picture on the wall was actually a family of ghosts. Actually, it was a family of ghosts that were shadow people. That's what I truly believe. Of course, I'm guessing that this family of shadow people must have been a part of a huge tragedy because it's apparent that something caused the scream to happen. Whatever the case it was, it didn't matter now. It turned into something harmless and then became ruthlessly scary. I hope I never find out what exactly happened in the house. I'm not willing to face it. My second daughter was born on October 28th, 1986. She died of a sudden infant death syndrome six weeks later. She often lets us know she is still around by playing pranks and sometimes allows other family members to see her. When the movie Pocahontas came out, my oldest daughter loved it. We bought her a Pocahontas talking bank. If you haven't seen the type of bank I mean, it is one of Pocahontas and Grandmother Willow. If you drop a coin in it, Grandmother Willow starts talking. It has a button you can push for the same result. For about three months, this bank would start talking when no one was in the room with it. We kept the bank on a shelf in the bathroom above the sink. One morning, I was standing in front of the mirror shaving. The bank was two feet in front of me. But when the bank started talking, well, I don't often cut myself shaving, but this time, another time my wife had washed her favorite shirt, it was loose fitting and lightweight, perfect for working in her garden. She washed it 
and I know I took it from the washer and put it in the dryer. When we took the load of clothes out of the dryer, the shirt was nowhere to be found. Three months later, we found it in a small cabinet in our bedroom. We only use the cabinet for storing small things and rarely open it. I can't remember what I was looking for, but I opened the cabinet and there was the shirt neatly folded. There was another time when my wife bought me some material to make me a couple of shirts. She brought it home and folded it and put it away in her sewing trunk to work on later. A week later she opened her sewing trunk to begin the work and the material was gone. Six months later we had forgotten about the material and my wife was going to sew another project. She opened her trunk and there was the material, replaced once again by my second daughter. My youngest daughter, now 11 years old, often sees her sister either in the house or out in the yard. She sometimes talks to her and I mean she carries on a conversation. My oldest daughter has also seen her. I've seen her once. She was standing by the living room in the entrance of the hallway. I was coming out of the kitchen and saw her in my peripheral vision. When I looked up, she vanished. I can say that those on the other side do not stay children forever. My second daughter, who we lost when she was a baby, now appears to us as a lovely 16 year old. Then again, Perhaps a spirit can appear in any form. Perhaps my daughter appears the age she would, so we can recognize her. It may seem strange to some people that we live with a spirit as normal part of the family, but that's exactly what she is, and we love her the same as our two children who are here in the flesh. Being of Cherokee and Iraqi descent, we do not fear spirits, but try to understand them. They are not here to harm only to guide. My great-grandfather was a self-proclaimed ghost hunter. I've heard many stories growing up from my grandfather of his exploits in the field. Now, he wasn't the whole mystical crystals and holy water type. His theory on ghosts was one shared by many. They are here for something. Either lost item from their past her deed left undone. The way he went about the hunt was fairly simple-minded. He would follow tales of haunted houses, graveyards, bridges, whatever, and research them as well as he could, and try to figure out what the ghost wanted, and give it to them. At the time in history when he was doing this, many people were offering rewards for someone to step in a haunted house for a night, so he would move in and spend however much time it took. Not all of the stories my grandfather told were successes, but one I remember vividly was, I will tell it to you now, and then I will relate my own experience. Back in the 1800s, my great grandfather was a ghost hunter. He mainly did it for the reward money offered to sleep in haunted houses at first, but a growing need to help soon took over. One such place was a farmhouse in the Oklahoma Prairie, where a woman in white, I know, stereotypical ghost story, would be seen walking down the staircase and out onto the front porch. It was one of those old wraparound types that goes all the way around the house. Once on the front porch, she would pace the length of the front of the house a few times and then disappear. Other times a woman would be crying but you could never pin down the sound. My great grandfather moved into this house and lived there for about two months while trying to figure out what the ghost wanted. Many times he would be sleeping in the entryway of the house at the foot of the stairs, trying to catch a glimpse of the lady. After about three weeks of research, by talking to all the people that live nearby, we are talking about 1800s Oklahoma nearby and I guess that would be within a 10 mile radius. He found an older couple who had known the original builders of the house and every family that lived there since. They began relating the story of the house to him as best they could. It seems that the first lady to live in the house had only two children, a boy and a girl. 
and when the girl was about 16, she fell in love with one of the local farmer's sons. After a few months, the marriage was arranged, and events were set into motion. They got married in the spring in the front room of the house. They built their own small house on some of the land, and lived there for a few years, until the girl's mother got ill. Then they moved in to stay, and take care of her, and the family. The brother had recently joined the army, and was away. After a few months, the mother passed away and the girl and her husband also became ill. The father was left to take care of them and soon became ill as well. They all died after about a year of fighting the illness and trying to keep the house and land cared for. After that, the boy now serving in the army came back to collect any belongings and dispense with the house. He sold the house to the local bank and left to live in Texas. About a year later, a young couple moved into the house and lived quite happily for about three years until they started seeing the lady walking down the stairs and along the porch. They soon moved away and let the loan default back to the bank. A few other families had lived in the house, but all moved out soon after and the bank was stuck with his house. Finally, the owner of the bank decided to offer a ward for anyone to sleep in the house to prove it wasn't haunted. Well, empowered with this knowledge, my great-grandfather went back to the house and set watch for the ghost. After seeing her a few times, he noticed she seemed to be looking for something on the porch. So he got some digging equipment and began to dig under the porch. After about two weeks of digging, he found a small gold ring. Thinking that had to be what the ghost wanted, he placed it on the railing of the porch and waited that night to see what happened. Nothing happened for about another week. Then he was sitting on the porch, enjoying the good weather, when he caught sight of her walking down the stairs. Not daring to move, he watched as she walked the length of the porch until she came even with the ring. She turned and seemed to look at the ring for a long time, then just vanished. He spent another week in the house and never heard so much as a creak and never saw the woman again. The ring he put under the first step of the stairway and as far as anyone knows, is still there. That is how my grandfather related that story to me. Not in the scary ghost story boogity boo way, just a plain and simple fact. A piece of family history. Now my story. I was about 18 and living with a friend of mine and his mother. We all lived in a small house. Some would call it a shotgun shack because you could shoot a shotgun through the front door and not hit anything but the back door. It was all one room only separated by a small wall that ran about three feet from each outer wall. You could walk straight from the living room to the kitchen, going through the bedroom in a straight line. One night, I was sleeping on the floor in the living room when I was awakened in the middle of the night. I don't know if it was a sound that woke me or just a bad feeling, but when I woke up, I happened to be turned so that I looked straight into the bedroom. I saw what looked like sheer curtains lit by moonlight blowing outside beside the bed that my friend's mother was sleeping in. I had an eerie feeling, but being half asleep, didn't think anything of it and promptly fell back asleep. When I woke up in the morning, I remember what had happened and looked at the wall, expecting to see an open window. The problem was, there is no window on that wall, not anywhere in the house. All the windows are on the opposite wall, so it couldn't have been a curtain. Later that day, I asked my friend's mom about it, and she told me that it was her father, that he came to help her when she had a bad night. She had terrible arthritis. She said that she never saw him, but could feel his presence. I had many other strange experiences in the house. Rocking chairs that didn't need anyone sitting in them to rock. Things disappearing and reappearing in strange places when no one was home. Say the least, I was glad when I got an opportunity to move out.
This incident occurred about 20 years ago in Michigan, Indiana, when I was only nine. Our house was built in 1904, so I had the huge solid oak doors in trim. The living room was very long, with ceilings which are 12 feet high. I hope you got the idea of the architecture of this house. The basement was a full one, divided into two rooms, and this is where most of the presents seemed to be. I'll get to that later. Back to the house though. The master bedroom was downstairs, with this entrance being oak sliding doors. All of the fixtures were of the early 1900s also, so the living lights were hanging chandeliers, one at each end of the living room. The upstairs had three bedrooms, with a landing at the top with a banister, guarding the stairs. The stairs were enclosed and curved, and this will be important in a minute. The house upstairs was not insulated well, so in the winter, it was cold, and in the summer, hot. As a consequence, my two brothers and I slept on the pull-out couch downstairs. One night, my younger brother and I went upstairs to get ready for bed. And as we were going down the stairs, I looked back up due to the feeling something was there, and I saw an apparition coming towards us. I screamed and told my brother to look up. He did and saw the same, so we flew down the rest of the stairs and yelled at our parents to go look for the man. They did, and of course, nothing was there. Now, let me describe the ghost. He was not opaque, he was complete in his form, and he was dressed in Catholic's priest clothes. I noticed this because we were not Catholic, but my friend next door was, and I visited her church just down the road. I thought this was very peculiar, but what I thought was even more peculiar was the fact he was holding a gun, and he pointed it directly at us, or so what I thought was a gun. Of course. My parents told us we were young and had very vivid imaginations, and it was nothing. Years later, however, my mother confessed that she knew the house was haunted, and also because when she was the only one home, she would hear something walking up the stairs and on the stairs. We always had German shepherds, and her dog would growl at the ceiling and would never go in the basement. Now, on to the basement. I knew there was a presence here in the back room where the water heater was, because it was much colder, and felt wrong. It felt evil and bad, and didn't want anyone there, because it felt you, and you just had to leave immediately. I want to say that the upstairs didn't have this feeling to it, even though this is where we saw the man. I'm not sure of the history of this house, and soon after this incident, we moved to Florida on my dad's company transfer. I just want to give my opinion on this. After researching different types of hauntings, I feel that this was a replay of some kind, and I was a witness to it. I do feel that there might have been more than one presence, because the evil in the basement was different than the other, and the one in the basement didn't want anyone there. He did other things to give us this feeling. Mostly, the noises were harmless and no bother to us, but it was the basement that we avoided for whatever reason. I would love to hear what you all think of this and the type of haunting you feel it is. I used to spend a lot of nights driving around in my youth. I was young and reckless and had no clear direction in life, so I'd often find myself aimlessly driving late at night. I'd spent a majority of my adolescent years dependent on drugs, and unfortunately, almost succumbed to an overdose. I was harming others, but most importantly, I was on a path to self-destruction. The night before my overdose, I had a creepy paranormal experience that, fortunately for me and those around me, changed my entire life for the better. It was another one of those late night drives. I'd gotten into a verbal altercation with my parents. Words that weren't meant to be said were exchanged, and I ended up running away from home. I took the keys and headed out driving for hours until I ended up in an unfamiliar town. I was starting to get a little exhausted, 
was six hours away from home and was running low on gas. What happened next will always be embedded into my subconscious for the rest of my life. I pulled up to a gas station in the middle of nowhere. Now, like I said, this area was completely isolated from the rest of the world. It had a last house on the left kind of feel. Until I ended up at the gas station, I'd driven past miles and miles of just cornfields and farmland. Woods all around, nobody in sight. I ended up walking to the gas station and bought myself a pack of cigarettes from the station attendant. He noticed I looked a little confused and asked if I was lost. I said yeah, I was. This was before GPS and cell phones and I didn't have a map with me. He told me there was a bridge in the distance that was visible from the gas station less than a mile or so away, but said if I crossed it, I could pass another town nearby and find a highway that could take me back home. I thanked him, told my gas, and went driving towards the bridge. As I started to make my way through this road, and on my way through the bridge, rain started to pour down and I could barely see through my windshield. It had rained so much that it almost obscured my vision, and there was no source of light anywhere along the dirt road I was traveling on, except for my headlights. A guy at the gas station told me the bridge was very close by, and even though I could see it in the distance before it started raining hard, it felt like it had been forever before I could see it. Just then, I finally came across the bridge, despite the downpour. This is the part that really startled me. I was driving across the bridge, absolutely nobody in sight, no other cars. It was late at night, 3 a.m., and nothing but trees and bushes scattered around the bridge. I kept driving across this long bridge, and that's when my headlights shined onto this small child who suddenly appeared within my field of vision. All I could remember was that his eyes were glowing almost like an animal in the night. I was unable to stop in time, and I thought I had hit him. I immediately panicked, stopped the car in the pouring rain, got out to check to see if he was okay, and the kid was nowhere to be found. It confused the hell out of me, because again, what kid would be playing around in the middle of the night, in the middle of nowhere, and in the pouring rain? I didn't even hear a thud, or any noise besides the sound of the rain falling down on my car. At the moment of impact, I looked under the car. It was as if this child didn't even exist. I remember distinctly that the boy was wearing overalls and a hat. It looked like a completely real boy. There was no mistaking that this was a human. Now, I mentioned my recklessness and drug abuse because this incident caused me to turn my life completely around. I was so worried that I accidentally hit a child and it may have ran off into the woods that it made me swear to always be alert and never fight with my parents again. This happened when my brother was around 5 years old. It was around 2 am and he went into my parents room to get in bed with my mom. My mom's bed was right by one of the bathroom doors. The door on the other end of the bathroom led to where the back door was, and the stairs to the basement. He got in bed and was facing the bathroom. He got scared and woke up my mom and asked who the little girl in the bathroom was. He said he had never seen her before. He told my mom that she was just standing there, staring at him. My mom said the way he was talking, like there was really someone there. It really scared her. She said she just rolled over and shut her eyes. She was too scared to even look. I don't think a five-year-old imagines things like that. While we were in the same house, my mom's cousin was hunting in the mountains and accidentally fell on his gun and killed himself. The family thinks he came back to say bye because it was such a sudden death. A few days after he died, when we were all in bed, a light in the hallway bathroom would click on and off. It was an older house, so the switch made a really loud click when he turned it on and off. My mom would be sitting on the couch late at night, with her back facing the hallway. 
You can sometimes feel when someone is behind you. And she said she heard me breathing hard and walking up the hallway. She called my name and turned around and no one was there. At the same time, at her cousin's parents and sister's house, similar things were happening. His old toys from when he was younger were stored in the basement of his parents' house. One night his electric train turned on and was going around the track. No one knew this was happening to other family members until my mom called his parents and told them what was happening to her. The next day they went somewhere and tried to contact them. They all said they loved him and it was time for him to move on. They think he was trying to contact the family because he died suddenly. After they talked to him, everything stopped. The following happened back in July 1995. Me and a friend traveled around the UK by train. It was about 4 p.m. Then we checked in at a bed and breakfast in Manchester. All double room was occupied, so we got the two single rooms, which was located next to each other. We were quite tired after a long day trip by train, so we rest for a moment. Later we went out to eat something, had a beer in the hotel bar, and then headed up to the rooms for sleeping. The time was about 11pm. I closed the Venican blind, turned off the light, and almost immediately fell asleep. The room was pitch dark. Then, after about two hours, I woke up and found the room bathed in light. The light almost blinded me. I had a strong emotion to walk towards the window, just like I was enforced to do so. And then I went up. I heard voices and music, like old folklore or something. The voices was only like a murmur, so I actually couldn't hear what it says. It was like being in a full up restaurant or a pub or something. I was not actually scared, but it was an easy and confusing experience. Then, I reached the window and opened the Venetian blind. Everything turned to normal again, quiet and pitch dark. I went back to bed again, and to my surprise, I fall asleep after only about 10 minutes. The morning after, we met up and headed down the stairs for breakfast. Afraid of being regarded as a fool or jackass, I told him it was only a dream. Then, I almost dropped my coffee pot when he told me that the exact same thing happened to him. He has always been quite skeptical to the paranormal things, but I think this experience has changed his mind a bit. I would be very glad if you could give me your opinion. I have apprehension about what really happened that night. I know I was fully awakened, and it can't be my imagination, because the same thing happened to him. As I said in a previous mail, I'm not so good with English, so I hope you understand me. You may publish my story if you want, but you better circumscribe it before. Hi there. My name's Joe. My friend Colin probably wrote you recently about some recent activity. For the past I don't know how many years, I've been able to feel, and to an extent see ghosts. I can sense what they are feeling and what their intentions are. However, for about three years, my friend Colin started having sleeping problems. I already knew his house was haunted, but what was haunting it was the spirit of what I think is a five-year-old child. For Christmas the year before, a friend of ours that lived in Thailand sent us all gifts. However, Colin was the one that received a house that she would leave tokens and gifts in to help ward off evil spirits. Over time, it stopped doing that. Trapped in the house was some kind of creature, like a demon. It was huge, dark, and very menacing. I still don't know how to use all of my abilities very well, but at the time, I sure as hell didn't, but I attempted this anyway. We attempted to destroy the house and everything in it. It took 45 minutes just to get it to catch fire. During this 45 minutes, 
I was attempting to immobilize the creature inside the house. After 45 minutes, I was able to trap it by pure luck. After I trapped it, I was able to see what was being stored in the house. It was a large field, fire everywhere, dead bodies on fire, blood everywhere. It reminded me of what hell would look like when described to you as a child. After that I was drained. I couldn't do much of anything. I thought I lost all my abilities. But after two months they started coming back. Very slowly. I knew this only because I was able to see the ghost in Colin's house again. While I was living in Korea, I encountered a few spirits. But they were by chance and left over from the war. That was when I knew my abilities were back to full, but I wanted to learn how to better use them, and I'm not having any luck. Well, to end the story on a bad note, last week my friend Jess asked about any ghost encounter any of us have had, so Colin and I talked about this one, so Jess got curious and wanted to see where it happened. Reluctantly, we took him there. Surprisingly enough, Development has been going on in the area for the last five years, but at the spot where we destroyed the house, nothing is built. We went to the spot, and I was able to fill it out from residue from when we first destroyed it, but after a few minutes, it wasn't just that. The feeling I was getting became stronger until it made me sick. I almost passed out, and I doubled over dry heaving. It turns out it was still trapped there, until that night, somehow, it got loose. I don't know how or why, but now I have to get rid of it for good, and I don't know how. In 1989, I moved into a government apartment in a small town containing seven units. The last apartment was occupied by a single mom with a small child and her boyfriend. The previous year, they, man and woman, were murdered and shot to death in their bed, in their first bedroom by the woman's estranged ex. No one wanted to move into the apartment because of the history surrounding the apartment. I was a young mother and had two children and needed a place to live and thought nothing of this. In time, I was told of the strange happenings of the place and chalked it up to superstition or small-minded people with too much time on their hands. Things were pretty quiet for me and my little ones for the first few months. Then small things started to occur. Light over the sink area in my kitchen will mysteriously come on in the middle of the night. Being the only adult in the house and the only person who would actually reach the switch, this had me worried that I had electrical short or something and promptly had it checked out. Nothing. Perfectly normal. Kitchen cabinet doors would be halfway open in the mornings when I awoke. I scolded my oldest daughter, seven years at the time for climbing the counters and getting snacks out, and she told me that she was asleep and she didn't do it. My youngest daughter, two years old at the time, was starting to make a habit of getting up in the middle of the night and getting into bed with me. Very unusual for her, she's a hard sleeper. At one point, I was having trouble sleeping, so much so to the point I went to a doctor and got sleeping medication, all to no avail. I always woke up at 3 a.m. and had a difficult time getting back to sleep. Nothing worked until I rearranged my bedroom furniture and moved my bed from one end of the room to the other. Once while my oldest daughter was visiting her grandmother overnight, myself and my youngest daughter decided to take a bubble bath together in the late evening. While we were in the tub, I heard jingle bells rattling around in the cup on a shelf not five feet from me. All of my windows were closed and no one else was in the house. Couldn't explain it at the time. After three years, I chose to move in with a man to a better neighborhood. My landlord chose that time to tell me the complete history of my apartment. He showed me the newspaper articles on what happened, and after reading all of them, I understood all. 
The ex climbed through the bathroom window and shot them both dead at 3 a.m. and took the child, which was sleeping between the two. And her bed was in the exact position as I had my bed when I couldn't sleep. The mom was a stay-at-home mom and was always in the kitchen fixing stuff for her little child, making homemade cookies, snacks, and such. She always left the kitchen sink light on for her boyfriend when he came in late at night. My daughter always getting into my bed late at night was quickly understood by me. The other bedroom was never used by the child. She always slept with her mother and the boyfriend. No other tenants have reported any activity in this unit. Of course, they didn't have a smaller female children either. Time will tell if this ghost will ever find peace or her final rest. Before moving out, the last night there, I made my peace with her and told her I understood why she did the things she did. I understand she wasn't trying to scare me or my little girls, and I wished her peace. One afternoon of 1995 or 96, I was dusting our bedroom, the master bedroom, in our apartment. Right beside our bedroom was a small hallway leading up to the bathroom into the other bedroom. I remember being in a very good mood. I'd been doing a few changes in the decoration of the bedroom and was now dusting. I was happy with the results and as I was dusting, I was talking about the changes with my husband or what I thought was my husband standing in the hallway. All smiling and happy, I started to tell him or what I thought was him. Hey Frankie, Look at what I've just done. Isn't that nice? I advanced in the hallway to bring him in the bedroom, and as I neared him, he disappeared. I nearly jumped. Now, as I was dusting, I happened to turn my head towards the hallway, which was on my right, and there stood a man who very much looked like my husband and who was dressed in modern clothes, a short and a t-shirt. When I saw him, I was sure he was my husband. That is when I started talking to him, and as I was cheerily and happily explaining the changes to him, he had this most beautiful smile of encouragement. He seemed to be happy for me. What a surprise when I realized that I had been speaking to someone or something else than my husband, and when I saw it, it disappeared. It is when this being disappeared that I realized that my husband was lying on the couch and watching TV. He was very surprised when I told him what happened. I live in Australia and I've been seeing spirits ever since I was about two years old. My first experience was just after my grandmother's death. I was visiting her grave for the first time and then all of a sudden I started hearing voices. They were telling me to leave, that it was too dangerous for them and me if I stayed, that I had to run and never turn around. It is weird that I remember it, although my memory is not as clear as my mother's, but I remember most of the details. I know that this is pretty hard to believe, but I give you my word it is true. Although I think about it now and realize that I wasn't scared, at the time I knew that I had to leave. So I told my mom and dad, and we left. My dad didn't believe me, but my mom did. Since then, I've had many experiences with spirits, all of which have been good, except for one. This happened when I was 15. I'd been roped into a swimming carnival, and I can't swim too good, so I was practicing in my pool. The pool is down the very back, and he can't see the house from the pool, as it is behind a shed. I've often seen spirits down the back, but it has never worried me. It was getting late, and I've been swimming for a while, so stop for a break. Whilst I was standing in the middle of the pool, I seen a baby sitting on the fence that surrounds the pool. I tried to look away, but I was in a trance. I finally stopped looking at it. But it was good, as I was suddenly dragged under the water. I struggled for about two minutes, 
before it would let go. When it finally did, I ran inside. I told my mom, and she never believed me, but I've never been down there on my own ever since. My name is Evan, and my friend's name is Scott. We're making a trip to North Carolina for a concert in August of 1996. After the concert, we drove for a long while, finally making it to South Carolina, and we're in need of a place to camp, as it was getting pretty late. We found the Kings Mountain State Park entrance, but being almost 2 a.m., the gates was locked. We both got out of the VW camper to see if we could get the gate open. The road was completely deserted, and being at the entrance, we were not even close to any campsite. With the headlights of the camper as their only source of light, a woman appeared out of nowhere. She had dark hair, thin white dress, and was barefoot. She asked us if we were with the wedding party, and we replied that we were not. As quickly as she appeared, she was gone. Scott and I thought it was kind of weird. No evidence of another car on the road, and the fact that she was barefoot in the middle of nowhere at 2 a.m. in the morning. Entertaining the thought that we may have had an encounter with a ghost, we forgot about it. Recently, I was reminded of the incident and thought I'd surf the web to see if there was documentation of some similar experience when I found your site. I was blown away when I found an entry for Kings Mountain State Park and the woman in the white dress. The entry said that she was murdered by the clan for marrying a black man. I wonder if they were married right before the murder, and that's why she asked us if we were the wedding party. In 1977, in the afternoon, when I was 11 years old, me and a couple friends were crayfishing at Happy Hollow Park in San Jose, California. We were fishing on the other side of the creek, away from the park. As we were walking through the heavy bush, we seen a lady with long black hair and wearing a red short dress and blouse, with a thick black belt, standing behind some bushes. She kind of looked like she was from the 60s. She was just standing there and staring at us. We were going to ask her about how she got across the creek, because she was dressed nicely, and the crossing was about 10 to 20 feet, and there was no log or shallow part of the creek, and as we got closer, she just faded away. Then we just ran across the creek to the park. Me and my friend still remember this encounter. After this incident, I was interested in the paranormal and collected stories from my friends and family. I know this is kind of a short story, but I thought it was worth sharing. Thank you. I will try to make a short story, but wanted to share my story with your group. We purchased a home about four and a half years ago. I met the lady and saw the husband only a short time when we had the inspection of the home. We were delayed on the closing because her husband passed away. Approximately three or four months after moving in, I kept seeing a man by our pool. Thinking it was the neighbor who lived behind us, I forgot about it. Our home sits on a couple of acres of land and eventually, I started seeing this man near the woods and where they had a garden plot before. It appeared as though this man was hiding and smoking cigarettes of all things. I met and talked to one of the neighbors and told her of the strange behavior of the neighbor and asked if he ever did that on our property. I described the man to her and what he was doing and her face went white. She told me I was describing the old owner of the house and that he died of lung cancer but refused to stop smoking and did those things while living there so as his family wouldn't catch him. Eventually, he started appearing to me in the house, especially in the evening hours, sometimes slamming doors to unoccupied rooms or making hammering noises in the garage, which is under our house. It is just my husband and I who live in the house 
and for almost a year and a half, I was the only one to see him, but other people could hear the noises. Finally, my husband did see him, or what he thought to be the shadow of a man behind him, one day in our bedroom. As time went on, he became more and more active until I started to be afraid to be in the house by myself. He was beginning to be active, even during the daytime. I don't know if active is the right words to describe this, so I apologize if I am wrong. I finally was able to track down the previous owners and tell them what was going on. These people were wonderful and believed everything I was trying to tell them because of the things I was able to tell them about Dave that I couldn't have possibly known. They contacted us and agreed to come over to our house. They went through the whole house and talked to Dave as if he was there and telling him he had died. They told him we were the owners of the house now and he no longer lived there and he had to leave. Now, I'm surely not a ghost expert, but I do know that after that night, I've never seen or heard from him again. Did this man cross over as I heard shows talk about? Luckily I have wonderful friends, and they believe me, even though if I hadn't been there, I might have not. Thank you for listening to my story, even though you've probably heard stories like this quite often. Your website is great, I enjoyed visiting. When I was younger, I often despised sleeping in our basement, especially alone. So oftentimes, I would stay in my sister's room whenever my brother, who I shared a room with, was on a scouting adventure or something of that nature. But one night, I was out of luck when it came to the blessing of having someone to sleep with, when they were all either gone at a friend's house or attending girls camp or a fishing trip. And of course, being 10 years of age, my mother, although loving and magnificent, believed I was a little too old to sleep with her. So I came up with a plan. I would invite my best friend over. Ever since Kristen and I were four years old, she has always hated that there were bars over our basement windows. Well, finally, it was off to bed. We scurried about brushing our teeth and giggling before mom came to tuck us in. My brother and I shared a bunk bed, and I always liked to sleep up top. I felt safer with the concoct idea that any monsters would have to eat whoever's on the bottom bunk before they could get to me. Therefore, I could easily get away. Hope you followed it. Anyways, back to the story. So we were laying there and talking, and slowly drifted off to sleep, when I was suddenly awakened by a strange noise outside of the barred window. I glanced over to see what appeared to be a woman in white, staring with no expression at all at Kristen and I from outside the window. My heart began to race. I'd never seen her before. She has dark brown hair that seemed to be ratted, and a long stained torn and tattered dress. She looked so pale, and like I said, she was merely staring with no expression. I was officially freaked out. I thought I should calm down. It's my imagination running wildly, because I'm not with anybody or anyone. So I closed my eyes, praying that when I opened them again, she would be gone. So then I opened them, and she was still there. This time, she reached out her hands to me, as though she wanted to hold me. I screamed, and then noticed she wasn't looking at me anymore merely placing her focus on Kristen. Then I saw Kristen get up. She started walking towards the window. I called her name and said, what are you thinking? Kristen ignored me and continued walking. She crawled up on top of her toy box and began to unlatch the window. I screamed for her to stop. She seemed as though she was in a trance or daze and couldn't even hear me. I struggled between staying in bed and not moving or getting up and latching the window and saving Kristen. My heart was racing. I felt nauseated. Then, all of a sudden, everything returned to normal. Then, all of a sudden, she woke up. She was awake from her trance. 
It turns out that she was sleepwalking. Curiously enough, I looked outside the window again, and the woman that I once saw had completely vanished. I was completely confused and dumbfounded, so I went over to Kristen to see if she was alright. At this point, Kristen was in my arms. She was shaking uncontrollably, and she regained consciousness. I asked her what she was thinking why she ignored me, and she said all she could recall was an angelic voice singing to her, begging her to come with her. I said, what? She said she had some sort of dream or vision, and this is what happened. At that point, that's when I told Kristen that she got up and walked towards the window. I also let her know that there was a woman right outside the barred window, and she couldn't even believe it. Maybe this was the angelic person that she was talking about. The woman. Maybe she telepathically communicated, and as a result, ended up infiltrating her dreams, and then Kristen started sleepwalking. I know you might think I'm crazy, but this story did actually happen. I can vouch for two people being there, me, and of course her side of the story. Immediately when it happened, we were both so frozen that we didn't know what to do after that. I looked at Christy. And she was so delirious, but also very shocked at everything that happened. I asked her if she wanted to go to sleep again, and she replied, but I can barely even move. So I said, we can sleep here right on the floor. The next day, when we were at breakfast, we both just knew that this isn't a story many would believe. So we mostly just kept to ourselves. Until, of course, I actually wrote this story here today. Thank you guys for listening. I really appreciate you letting me tell this tale. And believe me, this is not something anyone would want to experience. But I guess we have a good story now. So impressed and comforted by your sight. I had an experience at the Sourdough Inn in Seward, Alaska two years ago that I've never shared with people anymore because they don't believe me and felt inspired to write after reading on your site. The hotel was a brothel at the turn of the century, and the innkeeper will happily tell you that the upper rooms are haunted by the spirits of the girls who live there. The most prevalent is the lady in white, who was the madam. I may be remembering the name wrong, but there are a few rooms downstairs in the basement as well, and that is where I had my encounter. My friend, Ollie and I, decided to stay there because of the legends, and had spent two nights upstairs without a peep. Our last night was in the basement. I had a little head cold and sniffles, and the innkeeper advised us to keep the windows closed due to a nasty draft. After securing the windows shut, we went to bed. About two hours into a fitful sleep, I was awakened by the window creaking open. I thought it was odd, since we had latched it, the window being to my left. I was staring at it, when I realized there was a woman in white standing next to my bed. This is typically where people stop believing me. She noticed me notice her, and reached out to feel my forehead. She was also holding what looked like a towel in her right hand, and was smiling in the most comforting way. I couldn't help it though. I reached out and shook Ollie awake, looked back, and she was still there. Ollie fumbled to focus, and then I screamed like I've never screamed before in my life. I think she was just checking and making sure I was okay. And here's the interesting thing too. When we finally woke up and got our bearings, we realized the room was way too hot and even smelled a little funny. We had left our propane lantern on. I think that's why she opened the window. Ah, I feel better. It is a beautiful, magical place to stay. If I ever return, I have every intention. There was no malice in her visit. I only hope I cannot scream at her if I ever see her again.
I just wanted to write and say that I had a scary experience at Bangs, Ohio, House of Nightmares Haunted House. Well, I was on the volunteer fire department for Centerburg, and we went there to work and to inspect the house. Well, one night, they had me working the spider, which I had to go up on the staircase by myself. The house once was an orphanage, mental hospital, and a Bible college. While I was working the spider, I had to look down to watch when the people were coming. Well, once, I just felt like someone was watching me, so I looked up and saw this little girl. She was see-through and was wearing a white tattered nightgown, had blonde hair, and was dragging a brown teddy bear. She was looking towards the ground, so I just started to freak out. So I shut my eyes and opened them again, and she was gone. Another experience I had at this house of nightmares. I was working the spider, and up on the staircase there was no door or anything, and I heard this man's voice ask if I was okay. Yes, up on the staircase, at the top, where there is no door, just completely alone and isolated from the rest of the people. And since there is no door, there is no way anyone could have gotten up there. Another time, when I was working on the spider, again, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It almost looked like a floating head coming straight towards me. Because I was looking at it in the corner of my eye, I couldn't get a clear look of what it looked like. But it could have been an orb as well. I'm not sure though, but I had a feeling that it was a head. Anyway, thanks for allowing me to share my story. I know it sounds kind of weird, but all of these events are true. I have felt, until rather recently, an unsettling presence in my apartment since my ex-husband moved out last November. It was almost as if the dwelling itself warned me away from crossing into particular rooms or areas of the apartment. There have been times when I could not sleep in my own bedroom because it was located near the rear of the apartment. I was afraid to go past the middle hallway. One night, I came up to get a jacket while my boyfriend was waiting outside for me, in the car. I got as far as one foot in the doorway and felt the overwhelming presence in some sense telling me to turn around and get out now. I forgot about the jacket and ran back downstairs and outside. I hadn't had one of those experiences some time until my best friend came over to do an in-depth tarot card reading. She relies upon the power of her spirits and her lord Phoenix. She's a phoenix witch, but she explains to me as someone who has crossed over was offered a second chance at life, but with the cost of helping less fortunate souls find their way back to heaven. My boyfriend was there at the time as well. When she was about finished with her reading, I happened to glance over by my computer in the dining room and saw a small, round, blurry ball floating past the computer and disappearing before it reached my living room where we were doing the reading. I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I had to use the bathroom, which was located near the bedroom. As I went to get up and glance in that direction of the apartment, I had the overwhelming feeling to stay back away from there again. I asked her what was over there, and she went into the middle hallway with the candle. She came back with an angry expression, saying that the thing called her an abomination. She felt it referred to her being brought back and given a second chance at life. She felt the presence was jealous and hurt, she called me over to join her in the exorcism of the spirit. When she asked it repeatedly to leave, we both heard it in a strong, emphatic male voice say, No. I was so scared. What scared me even more was that my boyfriend declared out of the blue, Someone died in your bathroom. What? Yes, someone died in your shower. I knew about it since the first time I showered here. I decided it was not wise to sleep alone in my place that night, so as I went into my bedroom with both friends to pack, 
we noticed that things in my room had been disturbed and moved around. When we moved into my bathroom to get my toiletries, my boyfriend proceeded to tell me how the person died, slipped and fell in the shower, broken neck. I couldn't take it anymore and left that night. That was the last time I had my best friend to do any readings here without her spirit protection. This event is true and happened when I was nine years old. It was the night of November 12th, my birthday. Me and my friends were walking back from the bowling alley to my house for a sleepover. The bowling alley was only 10 minutes away. Anyway, on the way back, my friend Matt dared me to go to the middle of the woods without my flashlight. I went in and came out 10 minutes later. All my friends had terrified looks on their faces. What? I asked. Matt pointed behind me. When I turned around, a five foot tall woman in a white dress with black hair was standing there. She looked really mad. We ran as fast as we could. We finally got to the house and jumped in our sleeping bags. No one moved and we eventually all fell asleep. I awoke at 3 a.m. in the morning to go get a glass of water. I had totally forgot about the incident until I stopped and heard very, very heavy breathing behind me. I thought it was my dog, but when I turned around, it was her. She had the same look on her face. I screamed as loud as I could, and my friends came running down the hall, asking me what happened. I told them, and we all went back in the room and stayed up until the next day. I told my mom what happened, but she didn't believe me. That is, until she found my pet snake dead, and she started seeing the strands of long black hair all over the house. We moved out shortly after that, and I will never go back to the house again, let alone look at it. I still find black hair in my bed sometimes, even though we're at our new house, and there's no one in my family with black hair. I think she is following me, maybe trying to tell me something. On rare occasions I'll be playing my drum set, when all of a sudden I stop and hear mumbling and groaning. If I ever have an encounter with this ghost again, I'll send it ASAP. Thank you. When I was 15, my friend Terry, who was a couple years older than me, spent the night. There's no way either of our parents would allow us to have our own Ouija board in our possession, so we decided to make our own with poster boards and scissors. I myself really didn't believe in the Ouija, and what many claimed it could do. I just always assumed that someone was always pushing it to say whatever they wanted it to say. Terry really wanted to do this, so I decided to go along with it, figuring she was just going to try and scare me or something. We talked with the spirit that just so happened to call herself Terry also. You can guess. I didn't believe this thing was really moving on its own. I had my mind set that she was moving it the whole time. Well, we started to argue over it, when all of a sudden, the planchet started to spin around really fast. Still assuming it was Terry, I got mad. Then it just suddenly stopped. That was it. Terry started telling me that you were supposed to make it say goodbye or it stays here. Still mad. I said, yeah, right, whatever. We started talking about other stuff, and in the washroom, which is on the other side of the kitchen, we started hearing a lot of noise. Now there were three doors to that room. One went outside, one connected to the kitchen, and other connected to my sister's room. My sister was an RN and was working the night shift, so no one was in her room. We knew that no one could have gone through the kitchen, because they would have gone right past us and we would have seen them. The outside door was locked and bolted from the inside so that excluded anyone coming in from outside. Both of us just stood there as the sound got louder and louder. My dad had a bunch of empty boxes stacked up in the front of the outside door. To me, it sounded like two people were throwing these boxes back and forth all over the room. Of course, we were scared, but I didn't associate it with anything having to do with a ghost, etc. I was thinking that someone had gotten in from the outside, somehow. I don't know why, but I grabbed up a butcher knife and told Terry to go and get Brian, my brother. He and my parents were asleep. All this time, you could still hear these boxes being tossed around everywhere. 
Terry and Brian came up to me at the door, and you could tell by the look on Brian's face. He was hearing the commotion too. He took the knife from me and jerked the door open. Everything at that moment went dead silent. The boxes had been moved because they were laying everywhere, but no signs of anyone in the room. Needless to say, we were all pretty freaked out. I didn't dare tell him what we'd been up to earlier playing with the Ouija board. To this day, I can find any explanation as to why we heard what we did or how the boxes got moved. Thanks for reading. When I was a teenager, around the age of 16, I found a Ouija board at a yard sale and bought it for 25 cents. Skeptical of the Ouija, I devised the experiment deemed a test of simply a matter of self-suggestion. I was going to ask what pet would die next and think to myself fish. We had several adult cats, dogs, and guinea pigs who were not elderly and in very good health, but I had a tank of tropical fish, several of which were getting on in fish years. I was trying to trick the board by seeing if it would give me the answer I was thinking, which would be a logical conclusion. I tried the Ouija board with my mother, a skeptic of all things supernatural. After setting it up, I asked my question. We put our fingertips on the planchet and waited. After five seconds of no response, mom tired of wasting her time and decided that she was going to bed and left the room. I put the board away and didn't think about it for a few days. Later that same week, I was talking to a male friend of mine on the phone. I was telling him my disbelief and attempt at experimentation with the board. I just told him the question that I was going to ask it. What pet would be the next to die? I took a breath and told him, and the answer I was looking for was... When all of a sudden, the books on the shelf behind me tipped over. They knocked into a figurine and sent it to the floor, where it shattered. The figurine was of a ceramic fish. These books had never tipped over before and were securely in place. I have not seen them fall in such manner since this time period, almost 13 years later. The timing of the fall was too eerie. It was exactly at the point where I would have said fish. My friend said that he heard the noise and that I sounded stunned. Though it was a long distance call, I ended it hastily, went and got the Ouija board out of my closet and put it in the garage. I would not touch it again. My mother had to get rid of it without my knowledge, as I so feared it. I think that was a warning sign for me. I've taken Ouija boards seriously since then. If they do not channel the dead, then they certainly set up a psychological premise which I don't think should be tampered with. I feel like it is opening up the door to a stranger, either an earthbound or entity. I don't know, but thanks for reading. When I was about 8 or 9 years old, we moved into a house which had a scary history as it turns out. My mom and dad took my youngest brother to dinner. Linda, my sister and I, didn't want to go. We were instructed to bring the boxes of books in the garage upstairs to the library. While we were doing this, we found an old Ouija board and started playing with it. I thought for sure it was my sister pushing it as it told me I was going to be hit by a car and die by the time I was 10, which obviously 25 years later, I'm still here. It also said that there were five spirits in the house and its name was Jax, boring, and we put it away. That was when we started hearing footsteps in other parts of the house running, lights going on and off, radios blaring that we knew we had turned off, door slamming, knocking, and rapping in the wood, boxes being moved about in the attic, etc. We lived there for five years, and I can tell you that. I have nightmares to this day. Now this house was on a road which was formerly known as the Santa Fe Trail. A couple of miles up the road was where the Santa Fe Trail and the Pikes Peak Trail met. There were Indian encampments, settlements, and a bad stagecoach accident and fire all in the general vicinity. I don't know if Linda and I had visited into the house, or it was there to begin with. My family are Sears, so I suppose I should get used to it but I've never been free of haunting since then. Thanks for reading. I went to a friend's house to stay for the weekend. My friend and I always loved ghost stories, magic, psychics, and anything else mysterious. Those things would just get us going when we were bored. Well, I decided to bring my Ouija board, which we use many times and usually wait until midnight to use it. This particular night, it was midnight, and we were playing with it, just regular, everyday things, when all of a sudden, it said, don't be alarmed, in the next few hours, you're going to get a cold chill running through your bodies. We asked it, what do you mean don't be alarmed? Well, 
The board replied that I and all the people around me will notice something in the next hour. Well, right after I said that, my friend's little brother came into the room with us and it just started to hit us. This is what it were telling us were going to happen. My friend's brother is terrified of ghosts, so we all decided to just put the board up and wait to see what, if anything happened. My friend said he had an idea. I got a string out that attaches to a crystal. He said it's kind of like a mini Ouija board and you can ask it yes and no questions. Well, we said for yes, move it vertically and for no, move it horizontally. We also requested that the responses cause the crystal to move fast and big, so we can detect when a spirit is present. We hung this crystal on a string from a lamp and waited. It was about a half an hour to an hour later, when all of a sudden, we heard a big ting ting sound coming from the lamp. We flipped on the light, and the crystal was swinging violently. I mean, it was starting to really scare me and my friend. I can only imagine how my friend's little brother would have reacted if he witnessed this. We turned the lights off and got real calm and quiet. The atmosphere in the room seemed to change. It got eerily quiet and it felt as if something were about to jump out at us at any minute. It also got really hot, really fast. My friend remarked that he thought something big was about to happen. Right when he said that, we heard the door creak open. It wasn't much, but it was like someone was trying to sneak by us. Then suddenly, it got real cold and I mean so cold that we were shivering and covering up. All of a sudden, you could see a light blue or white colored light getting brighter as it got closer. Then just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. Then it appeared again, only this time it got real bright and was coming from the middle of the closet. While we were focusing on that, my friend's little brother said look over there, and when we turned to look in that direction, you could see a shadow like someone were walking by. Next thing we knew, the crystal was reacting to it, and it just fell off the lamp. This shadow appeared to wave, as if to tell us, yeah, I'm here, but I won't hurt you. The wind blew outside, and right when the wind blew, the shadow was vanished. Thanks for reading. One boring summer night, my neighbor suggested we give the Ouija board a try. Everyone in our apartment complex were fully aware we're haunted, so I agreed. I wanted to get my baby to sleep first. As I rocked my baby to sleep, I asked my neighbor how she came to have this Ouija board because she had never mentioned it before. She said that the lady on the other side of her was carrying it out to the dump the day before, so she asked her why she was throwing it away because it seemed to be in good condition. The other neighbor said that she was throwing it away because ever since she had it in her apartment, things were falling off the walls and breaking. My neighbor said, well, if you don't mind, I would like to have it. That's how she got it. Now that my daughter was in good deep sleep, I made a pallet for her upstairs in my neighbor's bedroom. I put her on the floor because I didn't want her falling off the bed and getting hurt. I also didn't want her in the same room as we toyed around with the Ouija board. Some more friends came over, so all together, there were the four of us. The spirit contact said no when we asked him if we were a man. It also said no when we were asked if it were a woman. At this point, I took my hands off the board. One of the other people there told me that that was a bad idea because that was the opening of circle we had formed. I immediately put my hands back on the board, but my friend said it was too late, that it was already let out. Right after he said this, we heard a big bang in the room upstairs where my baby was. My baby started to cry. When we went to check, nothing was moved and my baby seemed to be only startled by the noise. After that, I decided I wanted nothing more to do with the Ouija board. Thanks for reading. Recently, my friend Aaron lost control of his motorcycle and died. Prior to the accident, Aaron, myself, and a few friends, Brutus, Megan, and Alex, decided to play with the Ouija board. We played for a while, when all of a sudden the planchet just froze. We couldn't move it for anything. Next thing we knew, the planchet just started moving on its own. We sat on the floor in amazement watching this board acting on its own free will. All of a sudden, the planchet turned in Aaron's direction and scooted forward about an inch or so. Right about that moment, Aaron's cell phone rang. He picked up his phone, expecting it would be someone he knew calling him. Only whoever it was, or whatever it were on the other line, hung up. That's when we decided we'd pick up the board. Not long following this incident is when Aaron had his accident. After Aaron's accident, 
My friend Megan and I decided we'd try and contact him using the Ouija board. We were in the living room with only candles for lighting. We had a picture of Aaron sitting across from us. We asked, is Aaron there? The board replied, yes. I then asked, how are you doing? The board responded, great. Then before we could ask any further questions, the planches said stop. We asked stopped what? The board said all. We then asked all of what? Then Megan asked, do you want us to leave you alone? The board replied yes. We both looked at each other and Megan said, he wants to rest in peace. I agreed. And then we said bye. It then said bye, Brett. Megan said, I love you, Aaron. And the planchet spelled out, I love you too, Megan. We took our hands off the planchet and it moved on to its own by saying goodbye. Needless to say, we both were pretty teary-eyed after that. Thanks for reading. When I was about 17 or 18, I was at a friend's house, a friend who swears to this day her house is haunted. She claims that her and other family members would hear all kinds of sounds, especially when they were alone or if it were an exceptionally quiet night. Something even tried to get in one of the doors once, but when they looked out the window to see who was there, they found nothing, no one. Anyway, this particular night, my friends and I decided to play with a Ouija board. I've never personally ever used one before, and after this incident, will never participate in using one again. The planchet began moving on its own free will, as if that weren't bad enough. We didn't properly close the session, and I swear something evil followed me home that night. I tried to tell my parents about it, but I don't think they believed me. There were nights when I would hear what sounded like a stick being tapped on the walls, circling the whole parameter of my bedroom. I feel that's where this evil entity dwelt because the rest of the house was uneventful. I began having terrible dreams. I would wake up and try to get out of my room as fast as I could, always with some sort of interference preventing me. I woke up once and felt as if I couldn't get out of bed. It was pitch dark, blacker than black that night. I threw my blanket off and tried to find my way to the door. It took me about 10 minutes before I finally found the door handle and light switch. It was as if they had just vanished from my room for that period of time. When I finally got a hold of the handle to the door, for some reason, I couldn't get that door to open for anything. I had to pop my window out and crawl out of the room that way. I had left home for a while. I returned to find my bedroom door wide open and just fine. One night, I also heard something fall in the bathroom next to where I was at. It was very loud. After I finally moved out and in with my boyfriend, who is now my husband, it didn't seem to follow me. It continued to stick to only that room of my parents' home. My brother moved into my bedroom after I left, and he too reported unusual occurrences in that room as well, but he seemed to experience more than I did. He was so disturbed by the things happening in his room that he ended up putting all sorts of crosses, religious practices, and even a wooden statue of Christ he got from our pastor all over his room for protection. One day, I went into his room and discovered the top of a statue appeared to be burned. That's when he told me about the weird occurrences happening in his room, including the statue appeared to have smoke coming out of it. Another disturbing thing that happened was that the cross had flipped in an upside down position in the middle of the night. He also claimed he felt as if he were being choked at different times. The same sounds I heard when I stayed in this room, he heard as well. Eventually, a family bought the place for my parents. They had two young girls, ages 11 and 12. I was talking with a friend of mine, and they told me that the new owners swear one of the rooms is haunted. I can only guess what room they were referring to. I have no doubt that whatever we did that night with the Ouija board, whatever was moving that planchet came home with me, and to this day, still dwells in that one room of our old home. Two summers ago, I started working at a camp, a haunted camp. No one has ever shared these stories outside of the camp and fear might scare campers away. During staff week, I heard talk of ghosts and spirits at the camp, but being a skeptic, I just blew them off. The more I listened, the more real it became. Senior staff members, even the camp director, told stories that chilled me to the bone. On the fourth night of staff week, I was invited to use the Ouija board in the chapel. I'd used one as a child, but assumed it was always just people moving it around. This time was different. You can tell if the Ouija pointer, Planchet, is working, because it floats. If someone is moving it, the pointer will scrape, 
but it was floating and making no noise. When we asked who it was, it gave three initials. We asked what it did before it died, and it said logging. We took this as logging. The camp used to be used for logging, and a lumberjack was not likely to know how to spell correctly. We asked a few more uninteresting questions that I cannot recall, because I was preoccupied with the rustling I heard nearby. It was the unmistakable sound of footsteps. After about three minutes of hearing footsteps that sounded like they were walking around the chapel and gradually getting louder, oh yeah, the chapel is outside, and it just has a roof and foundation. It is not an enclosed building. We took the message to heed and beat foot out of there. This is my own personal account of a Ouija board experience, but according to another staff member's mother who decided to join me one night, she was shaken back and forth by a spirit and the Ouija board flipped itself over. The last incident of my second summer was in the chapel again. We were playing with the Ouija board again, but this time, we didn't get such a nice spirit. It said nasty things to us, like kill you and die. It said go or die, so we decided to take the first option and we left. As we were walking away, I looked back and saw a face in the window of the small room connected to the chapel. It was glowing silver. I was about 50 yards away, and I could not make out much except an outline, but my friend saw it too, and it was enough to make us run. Thanks for reading. When I was about 12 years old, I went to my friend's family Halloween party. We were bored, so we went to the garage to see what we could find to do. We found an old Ouija board sitting on the game rack and asked her aunt if we could take it back to my friend's house. She said we could, so we did. When we got there, we went to her room and shut all the lights off, except a little lamp. We were talking to someone, and I didn't believe that it was moving on its own, and blamed it on my friend. She asked the board to give us a sign that something was there. About two minutes later, her dresser and bed started shaking really hard. It scared us so bad, we put it away. We went to bed an hour later, and put the board under her bed neatly. When we woke up, it wasn't there any longer. We haven't seen the board since. When I was 17, I moved into a two-bedroom unit. Me and my mates made a Ouija board and used it. I feel like it must have opened a gateway for a bad entity. When I moved in the house, it made no noises, but after that, you could feel a bad presence. Wherever this entity would go, the walls and ceiling around it would creak. At night, I would be lying in bed, and I could hear it creaking in the lounge room, and then start to move into my bedroom. I would then feel pressure in my bed, and a feeling as though something was pushing me down on the bed. It would also turn on things like the fan over the stove and the heater, which was gas. You could physically see the dial move. Also, my mood started to change while I was there. It got to the point where I was too scared to sleep there, so I stayed up at my mom's a lot. She got sick of it, so she took her psychic circle there. My mom has been talking to a spirit called Wayne for years. She talked to the spirit, and it said it didn't want to leave. But with the assistance of the spirit named Wayne, he made it leave. When I returned home, I could feel the entity had gone. Thank you for reading this story. I know it's short, but I hope you appreciate it. First off, I want to say that I've been brought up with stories of ghosts and haunted houses. I live in the South, Louisiana to be exact, and tales of the supernatural are nothing new to this area. I have many stories I can share but the better ones all include my grandma's house. The house is located in a small town called Swords, and my mom would tell me stories of when she was a kid growing up with a ghost that lived there in the house with her and her siblings. The ghost does not have a name. She is only known as the White Lady since she wears a white dress. My mom told me stories of seeing this White Lady many times as a child, but she never was scared of the White Lady. She told me she felt as if the ghost was watching over her and her sisters, and that they never felt threatened. She told me she would see the ghost at night, walking in the hallway or on the staircase. Other times she just felt the presence of the ghost. She would be in her room after school doing homework, and she knew someone was in the room watching her. When I was a kid, going to grandma's was always something special because I would look for this ghost. I remember very well the first time I saw the white lady. I was 14 and my friend Chad was with me and my grandma's. We had just gotten home from school 
and I had the key to grandma's because that's where I went after school until my mom picked me up when she got off work. Grandma was not there, so Chad and I made ourselves at home. He knew of the stories about the house and was very skeptical. We made some snacks and went into the den to sit and watch TV. The staircase is in full view from the den, and as we watched TV, I felt a presence. Chad felt it too. He claimed it got really cold. I thought it was a draft, so we went into the hallway and checked to see if any windows were open. As we were going to the living room, my eye caught something. I stopped and grabbed Chad's arm. There, at the bottom of the staircase, was a figure of a woman. At that moment, she looked at us, and that cold chill went right through me. She proceeded to go up the stairs. I watched her details. Her hand was on the banister, but you could see right through it. She was transparent all the way through her figure, and she looked up as she walked, as if looking for something. Chad and I were literally paralyzed. We watched her, not knowing what was going to happen. For a second there, the figure paused, glanced back at us, and then continued walking up, but she never made it to the top. She vanished on the fourth step just before the landing. When she disappeared, Chad ran up the steps. I guess he wanted to catch her? Idiot. He said the spot where she disappeared was so cold. At that point, I wanted to get out of the house. We both grabbed our book bags and ran outside and stayed out on the front porch until my mom came. We told her what happened, and she told us not to be scared. This being our first time seeing the spirit, hell yeah, we were scared. But mom came in the house with us, and we felt better with her there. The second time I saw the white lady was Thanksgiving, 1997. I had not been to grandma's much before then. Things at my house got complicated, and I had to take care of things, so there was not much time left for visits. But then, Thanksgiving did roll around and all of my family came to grandma's. My mom has 10 siblings, so it was quite the event. Grandma has a huge dining room table that seats 24 in the main room of her house. We were all sitting down at dinner, having a good time. I was between my uncle Kevin and my cousin Joseph. We call him Shacks. People were coming and going through the doors that led to the kitchen, and clean out of nowhere, I looked up and I saw a lady wearing white come in from the door on the right and walk from there to the left side of the room, then disappear into the wall. I jumped up. I was startled. She had passed right by everyone and right through my Uncle Patrick who was standing by the wine cart. He didn't even flinch. I looked over to my mom. She saw her too, but she put her finger on her mouth, mentioning me to keep quiet. I didn't say anything, but Shags was nudging me under the table. I turned to him, and he whispered to me, did you see that? I told him yes. After dinner, I was helping grandma with the dishes, and I told her what I saw. She saw her too, but she said it did not surprise her at all. The white lady likes to show up when there are a lot of people at the dinner table. All she does is walk from one side of the room to the other, then disappear into the wall. But not everyone sees her, that's what I find odd. I told her how she just walked through Pat, and he didn't notice anything. Weird. A number of days later, I found out that only four other people saw her that day in the dining room. My Aunt Jen, my cousin Brad, his girlfriend Ashley, and my aunt's husband Mark. Grandma told me that they phoned her and told her about the white lady. I haven't seen the white lady since that Thanksgiving day. Grandma says she's still around. She had company over this past September. Some friends had come from Florida and stayed the night there. They witnessed a white lady on the staircase disappearing, but something else occurred. Grandma and others are now hearing footsteps and laughter in the upstairs bedroom that is used as a drawing room. I'll have to do some investigating on that one. Thanks for reading. When I was about 13, my father was a professor at a college in California. The campus was built during the 1600s and was originally a Catholic boy's home. There are catacombs where the boys would hide when people came to persecute them. 
The story goes that one particular night, a well-known Christian hater came to kill the boys. They all went down into the tunnels. One eight-year-old boy got lost and was so scared he hung himself. His body was never recovered. Anyway, back to my personal story. We lived on campus and my father was also a night guard. He had a tendency to get preoccupied with different things and he often didn't get home until an hour after his shift was over. On one particular night he was later than usual. My mother sent me to go check on where he was. The other guard said he was still on the rounds, so I rode my bike around looking for him. I saw a light on in the library, so I parked my bike and went in. The staircase to the aforementioned tunnels, or catacombs, is in the back of the library, off to the left, and there's a cemetery under the staircase. I looked all through the library, and suddenly, the light turned off. A little boy, about eight years old, came running through the door of the staircase, right where another certain eight-year-old's body was rumored to be. Needless to say, I hauled out of there, and I have not gone back in the library since. The first thing I must explain is that I lived in a place where there was a horrible fire in the late 1800s. Across from my house was a cemetery where all of the 800 people that perished in that fire were buried. My best friend had come over and we were wanting to be alone, so we scampered up to our room. Shortly after that, we began to hear strange noises, like footsteps running up and down our spiral staircase. We yelled to my sister to stop bothering us, but she was nowhere in sight. We closed the door and backed up our trunks against it. While we sat there, a pattern knocking sound began on the wall. An eerie feeling came over us and we no longer felt safe there. We rushed out of the door and the room was filled with blue smoke. I never ventured up there alone again. It's strange that everything weird that ever happened happened in my bedroom because there was another night I remember vividly. The night I saw a figure dressed in a red and blue checkered smock standing there. She smiled and waved, but then, when I went to touch her, she disappeared. Thank you for letting me share my experience. My friend would love you for it. It's important to be able to share these experiences. I don't think their ghosts were unfriendly, but they sure scared the living daylights out of me. Thanks for reading. This is a story that my mom told me about when my grandma worked as a maid for a rich family in England. The house she worked in was haunted and some really weird things happened there. The most interesting was whenever someone cooked bread in the oven, it would come out smeared with blood. So after that happened several times, they blocked off the kitchen with a wall. Another neat thing happening occurred there when my grandma woke up in the middle of the night and heard the table being set but then she found out that no one was up and it was the middle of the night. To make things even more creepier, whenever she was cleaning the third floor and she knew that no one was up there with her, she got the strangest feeling she wasn't alone. One night, a thunderstorm was so loud it woke her up, yet her room was the only one that had the thunder that could be heard. Another night she woke up and her bed was rocking. In the morning, she asked the people who owned the house about it and they said that her room was once the room of a young boy who became very sick and every night his mother would rock him to sleep. Interesting story and thank you for reading. The story I'm about to tell happened when I was about 15. For the last month or so, when we talked on the telephone, my friend had been telling me that during the middle of the night when he was in bed, he could hear rocks bouncing off the roof, and this would go on for hours every single night. His parents also heard this and would go outside during the middle in the dark night to find nothing. Needless to say, it kept happening night after night. As time went by, the events got worse. Mr. Knock Knock, as they called him, started knocking on the door in the middle of the night and also during the day, which of course, when they would go to look, Nobody was there. At this point, I didn't know if I believed him or not. One time, when I was talking to him on the telephone, I heard a really big boom and he told me 
Oh my God, Mr. Knock Knock just knocked the door open. Of course, he went and looked, but as always, nobody was there. This got me excited. I said to him I want to stay over and hear Mr. Knock Knock. Now, I don't know if it was that night, but I did stay over. It was late in the afternoon, and we were in the kitchen, and I made the remark that I wanted to hear Mr. Knock Knock. Right after I said that, boom, on the door. We went outside and found nothing. Finally, they had the police install cameras around the whole house, mostly in the trees, but they never recorded anything. They say that a man many years before hung himself in the shed. The same events went on for a period of time, then they just stopped. I think it was the man who hung himself many years ago. I know it was some spirit, but what it wanted, I don't know. I hope you all enjoyed the story though. Thanks for reading. The following incident is significant because it put me on the path where I am today and it will be important to know when I submit my other stories. On Saturday, Halloween Day, 1992, my friend Debbie and I decided to go to a neighborhooding park in St. Louis, bordering on South Grand and Arsenal, for those who hail from there. We'd stop at our favorite donut shop, then went to a little lake we knew of to sit and gossip. There happened to be a wedding photo group there at the same time, so we sat on a bench nearby and critiqued the dresses, etc. I wasn't paying attention to my surroundings, and Debbie and I chattered for about 15 minutes before she got an odd look on her face and whispered to me, What is this? A rumble? I cautiously glanced around and saw several youths drawing up to the lake on various sides. Debbie said, I think it's time we leave. Walk slowly and don't look back at them. We got up and began walking to my car. Some 300 yards off, we got about halfway there when we heard a pop, pop, pop. Being a city girl, it didn't register in my brain what it was at the moment. It sounded like firecrackers. Needless to say, that's not what it was. Get down, she screamed. Before I could react, Debbie had thrown me down on the ground as she was going down herself. I know we were both praying as this occurred. Suddenly, the shooting got louder and we both realized that there was a gunman firing about three feet behind me over our heads. The way we were lying on the ground, Debbie could see behind me and I could see behind her. She told me not to look, so I just kept my head down. We heard clicking and cursing. The guy's gun jammed. He ran off. As suddenly as it began, it was over and all the gang members were running their separate ways. Badly shaken but not hurt, we took off running to my car, jumping in and flooring it to her house a few blocks away. When we were safely inside and slightly more calm than we had been, Debbie said, I just can't believe it. I can't believe it. I was warned about this and I didn't listen. I asked what she meant. She said her father appeared to her in a dream the night before. I don't remember the details exactly, but it was in the kitchen with the back door open. In the dream, he was warning her about some danger and wanted her to be careful. Debbie's father died when she was a teenager. At the time of the occurrence, she was in her late 20s. A weird, though not really scary, closure. At the time of this occurrence, Debbie and I worked together at a local newspaper and our office was based in the basement of City Hall, sharing a room with the office attached to a recorder of deeds. Four ladies worked for the city there and we knew them pretty well. On Monday morning, one of them described how her daughter had come to her on a previous Saturday afternoon and told her of the horrific shootout that occurred at her friend's wedding party in the park near the lake. No one was hurt, but the limo took two slugs in the door and fender. Prior to the shooting, both Deb and I would have long discussions about the afterlife, ghosts, and etc. And we are both believers in the power of the mind and spirit. But this experience set me on a path of dealing with spirits that I still encounter today. These will be submitted for your approval at a later date. Back in 1986, when my daughter was three years old, she was playing in her bedroom 
and I was watching all my children on television when all of a sudden she came out of her room asking me to tell the man to leave her alone. Startled because she and I were the only ones in the house at the time, I said what man? She said the man in my room, he keeps talking to me. So I got up and went into the room and looked for this man. In fact, I decided to look all over the house for this man and could not even find him. I then made sure all the doors and windows were locked and I told my daughter that there is no man in the house. So she went back to play. About 10 minutes later, she came back into the living room and announced, tell the man to leave me alone. This time I freaked out and told her, Dana, there's no man in the house. I looked everywhere for him. I do not see anyone here. And she replied to me, he's right here. I asked where, and she pointed to the hallway and she acted like she was holding someone's hand. I asked, what are you doing? She replied, he just wants to say hi to you. Incredulous and open mouthed, I asked, me? What happened next sent chills down my spine. My three year old daughter walked with this man to the wall as if she was still holding his hand. I asked her, what does this man want from you? She said, he says he loves you. I asked her for the man's name and she simply replied, Monk. Almost in shock, I got out, what did you say? She looked up at this man and said, as if to the air, what did you say your name was? And then she once again looked back at me and said, Monk. I asked her several times if the man's name was Monk and every time she said yes. But then I was freaking out because my grandfather's nickname was Monk. Still not believing. I told her this isn't funny and she said, he just wanted me to tell you he loves you and he wanted to say hi. I asked her to describe him and then he described my grandfather to a T. You see, my grandfather died in 1969 in Illinois when I was four years old. It was so long ago, there is no way my three year old could possibly have known this. He couldn't have even seen what he looked like because he did not have any pictures of him until 1991. That was the only time my child had an encounter, but what encounter it was. And I'm left to scratch my head thinking if it was actually my grandpa or not. I'd like to think it was, but at the time, it was so terrifying not knowing who this person was at the moment. Wasn't it an intruder? Was it someone else? But no, it was my grandfather checking in on me to see if I was okay. What a man he was. A former associate and friend told me this once. Her parents once lived in Lee Master, a little hollow in Buchanan County. While they lived there, they could hear a baby crying outside. When they went out on the porch, it would stop. But as soon as they went back in, it would start again. This went on for a long time until one day, a bunch of young boys were digging in the dirt, playing with their trucks and such when they happened upon an old buried jar. After further inspection by the children and my friend's father, they found it contained the remains of a baby submerged in alcohol to keep it in good condition. Turns out, a young girl had once lived in the area and had a miscarriage. Instead of having a proper funeral, she put it in the alcohol and buried it afterwards. After the discovery by the children, the crying stopped, the baby found peace and all was quiet again. Thanks for the short read. I was 10 years old at the time, now 27, and my mother, sister, who was 8 at the time, and I had just moved into a basement level apartment. The place was very dark and gloomy, as most basements are, I imagine. It had only two bedrooms, a small eat-in kitchen that adjoined the living area, a small hallway that led to the bedrooms and bath. I can still remember the fact that it only had three windows and one set of sliding glass doors in the dining area that allowed any natural light in. One window was in the living room, one in the room that my sister and I shared, and one small window in our mom's room. Like I said, very dark and gloomy. We had only lived there a few weeks when at first, only my sister was noticing weird things. Since our mother worked full time, 
and I was bused across town to a different school than my sister. She would arrive at the apartment first in the afternoons. She would later tell me about the noises she heard and the strange shadow she saw darting around the corner of her eyes. I clearly remember one afternoon when I arrived home, which was about an hour after she did, only to discover my sister huddled up on the top of the steps that led down to our front door. She had her arms wrapped around her drawn up legs, her head lowered to her knees, and she was shaking and rocking back and forth. It was obvious that she was terrified. I asked her what was wrong, and all she did was point down the stairs. Curiously, I walked down and started towards our door. I noticed absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. I marched back up the steps to ask her what was wrong with her. Finally, she related this to me. When she came home from school, she walked down to our door, only to find it standing wide open. She knew I wasn't home yet, and neither was her mom. She would have seen her car out front. She walked slowly to the open doorway and peered into the living room, at which time she says the chairs in the dining room table all flew away from it simultaneously, and what sounded like all the kitchen cabinets and drawers slammed shut, their contents rattling from the force. She said she saw the chairs move, but nobody was in the apartment. She then said she was so scared that she dropped her books, let the door standing wide open, and ran up the stairs and sat there until I arrived. I explained that she must have imagined it all, as the door was closed and I saw no books in the hallway. She swore it happened exactly like she said, but I was still skeptical. So me, being the older, wiser, and therefore fearless one, I pressured her into going back down there with me. I mean, we had to go in sooner or later, right? I unlocked the door and slowly opened it, while my sister hid behind me, clinging to me like a cheap sweater. Lo and behold, gasp, everything was as it should be, with the exception of my sister's school books, all piled neatly on the coffee table. The chairs were where they should be, and nothing was amiss in the kitchen. Needless to say, I didn't believe a word my sister told me. That was until I saw the shadow man. A few weeks after finding my sister cowering on the steps, I bought a Walkman radio and some cassettes. We're talking early 80s here, to go with it. That night, I decided to listen to my Walkman after my sister and mom went to bed. I believe it was around 11pm when I started getting the distinct feeling that I was being watched from the open doorway to our room. I don't know why, but I was instantly afraid. I just knew it wasn't my mom. So, since I was lying on my back, all I had to do was turn my head in the direction of the doorway and find out if anyone was there or not. I turned the Walkman off and waited, lying stiff as a board and holding my breath, just waiting to hear anything unusual. I was still getting the impression that someone was in the doorway staring at me, but I was too terrified to look. I just knew that I wouldn't like seeing who was there, and now I was certain that there was somebody there. Finally, I got the nerve to slowly turn my head towards the door. To my absolute horror, there was a man standing there. I had never been so scared in all my life. I didn't dare to move or make a sound, or even breathe for that matter. I just kept my eyes glued to the doorway. That's when I noticed that I could see right through it. Before I could really panic, it occurred to me that it must be a shadow of someone that was standing out at street level. I rationalized that the street lights were casting the shadow into the hallway through the window that was in our room. I was starting to calm myself down and decided to prove my theory by turning around and looking at the window that was behind me. As soon as I did, panic assailed me all over again. There was no shadow on the sheer curtains nothing but the soft glow of the street light in the parking lot. I immediately looked back to the doorway, hoping and praying desperately that the figure would be gone. It was still there, only now it appeared darker, but I could still make up the thermostat for the heating and the air on the wall through it. It also seemed to be projecting a seriously negative feeling. I don't understand why I felt that, but I did, and I was definitely terrified. It made no movement whatsoever, and I was able to really look at it. It appeared to be a man wearing a long trench coat and a fedora-style hat. 
reminded me of a Dick Tracy kind of character, if you know what I mean. All this was in outline with no other distinguishing features, no face, hands, or feet for that matter, and it seemed to hover in one spot. I didn't know what to do at this point, and it seemed an eternity had passed since I noticed its presence. It occurred to me then that I didn't hear my sister snoring, which was a usual thing for her to be doing, hence the reason I had bought the Walkman. I figured she had to be awake, so I whispered her name. Imagine my disbelief when she responded, and I could tell she was terrified too. I couldn't blame her one bit. After all, the foot of her bed was only three feet from the doorway and it. I whispered to her, do you see it? Yes, she hissed and then started whimpering. We have to get out of here. On the count of three, we run as fast as we can to mom's room. So much for me being the fearless one. She didn't want to, but I wasn't staying, that was for sure. Our escape would mean running through the thing, but at that point, I didn't see any other options. I counted the three, bounded off the bed, grabbed my sister from her bed, and we were both screaming and running hellbent for leather from my mom's room down the hall. We jumped into the bed with her. She was already sitting up, having heard us screaming. I don't recall what she said, or what we even told her. It seems I just passed out from the fright. My mom didn't ask us about what had happened the next day, and my sister, nor myself, brought it up then. Maybe my mom didn't need to ask. Who knows? We never saw the Shadow Man after that, thank God. As it happened, we moved out shortly thereafter. I don't think it was a coincidence either. Arlie's wasn't up until six more months. I didn't complain, and neither did my sister. We never spoke of it until I brought it up to her during a phone conversation in 1996 when I was telling her about my new haunted house. I'll send some of those stories later. We were both surprised that the other remembered the incident so clearly. After all those years, the details of that night were still very clear to the both of us. This was my very first ghostly encounter. I hope you enjoyed it. It's exactly how I remember it. And of course, I could never forget the Shadow Man. This event happened while I was back in Pine Ridge, visiting family. In Pine Ridge, there is no rhyme or reason to where cemeteries are placed. There are numerous little cemeteries on hilltops and mixed in with the various homes. Then there is a main cemetery behind Red Cloud School where lots of weird stuff happens there as well. I don't go back to visit very often, and because of this, I'm not nearly as superstitious as the locals when it comes to hanging around cemeteries. One of the superstitions which I found out the hard way is the real deal, is to never go around a graveyard at dusk and be careful who you talk to or see in the cemetery. By my cousin's house is a cemetery within walking distance on a small hill that looks over the street that she lives on. I don't actually know anybody buried in the cemetery, since all of my family is buried in either Red Cloud Cemetery or St. Anne Cemetery. At the time of this story, my cousins both had small daughters, and they would come by and visit often. My cousin had mentioned that he had gone up to the cemetery on the hill one evening to clean the area up a little, and while he was there, he saw an old woman dressed in black, standing by an older grave, crying. He didn't recognize her and walked up closer to see if she was alright. He approached her and when she turned around, she only had eyes but no face. My cousin was very scared and hightailed it out of there. What he didn't realize was he brought a visitor back with him. After this happened, my aunt started hearing things in the house and small objects would be moved around. They figured someone had come down from the cemetery. My aunt is a kind of new ager, so she didn't find this to be upsetting, she just accepted it. While I was there one day during broad daylight, I was sitting in the living room and I saw a little girl walking down the hall and she walked into the bedroom. I'd been there only a couple of days, so I thought it was one of my two cousins little daughters. I wondered if my cousins had pulled up and she had come into the house, so I called out and then got up and looked. Nobody was there. 
I went to my aunt and asked if my cousins and their kids were there. She said no. I then told her, well, some kid just walked down the hallway. Turns out, it was the little dead girl from the graveyard. I was really freaked out because after that, she started making her presence more known. For instance, I would wake up in the middle of the night and the bedroom light would be on, the door would be open, I would shut it, and it would open up back again. Weird stuff like that. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well until I left. This story happened when I was 18 years old. My friend Chris had just moved to Reno, Nevada, about 30 miles north of Carson City, into her first apartment. This apartment was a regular run-of-the-mill one-bedroom apartment, nothing special, and within the budget of someone just getting out of high school. When Chris was moving in with the help of a boyfriend and some other friends, there was still some junk in the apartment from the previous tenant. You know when you first move into a place, there are little scraps of paper, pins, buttons, etc. Especially in the closets and stuff? Well, while they were cleaning up, they found a driver's license. It was a guy's license, and he was over 21. We all know where this is headed, right? Anyway, Chris's then boyfriend, who was under 21, figured this was a real lucky find. He could use it to go out and get into the clubs and go drinking in the casinos. We all had false IDs back then, but having an unaltered license was the best. Chris got moved into the apartment, and initially, everything was going great, then she started to notice some odd things happening in and around her apartment. For starters, whenever she would come home, the light in the walk-in closet would be on. At first, she just thought that she had left it on when she was getting dressed. But after a few more times, when she was sure that she had turned it off and then it was on, she started getting a little freaked out about it. After this had gone on a while, the window in her bedroom would also be found open. She even went so far as to lock and nail it shut. Sure enough, she got back from work, and it was open. Small things also began to be misplaced, and then show up somewhere else in the apartment. Finally, one night Chris, her boyfriend, and a group of friends went out to a club called the Premier Club in Reno. When they were standing at the door, waiting to get in, the bouncer was, of course, doing the prequisite ID checks. When the bouncer got to Chris's boyfriend who had used this ID already numerous times before, he took a look, stopped, and then got really angry. He kept saying over and over, this isn't you, this is not you. And of course, Chris's boyfriend started to sweat the load because he thought for sure he had somehow been found out. He tried to bluff, saying yes it was him, but the bouncer only stared back at him and said, I know this guy, and repeated, this isn't you. As it turns out, the young man who the ID did belong to was the one that was found in Chris's closet. Not long before, he had hung himself in that same very closet and was found dead there. Needless to say, Chris moved out of the apartment pronto. Anyone who has ever served in the Navy has certainly heard a ghost story or two. Although deaths in peacetime on board naval ships is rare, it does occasionally happen, usually due to mishaps or suicide, and, although rare, murders occur as well. This particular ship was a destroyer, and this destroyer was haze gray and underway most times. When a ship is underway, one must perform their usual duties, plus collateral duties, and stand various watches. The watches that can be the longest are when you are standing out on the ship somewhere at night in the middle of the ocean. There had been various rumors aboard this particular ship that people saw someone walking around the ship in places that they didn't belong and when challenged would simply disappear. One night, a friend of mine had the watch. It was around 1am or so and he was standing out by the fantail after having walked around and was having a smoke. He was of course still looking around, but in the middle of the night, there isn't anyone to see. Suddenly, he saw a shape that was darker than the rest of the dark, standing silhouetted by the tower area of the ship. 
This was an area that a person wouldn't have any business being in at that time of night. So my friend D yelled out, Hey, you up there. He expected for someone to yell back down. Instead, the person ran straight up the side of the tower and onto the radar equipment. There is no way that a real person could have done this. It had the outline of a man and was the same size as a shipmate would be. Once he reached the top of the tower, he just vanished. My friend D came back down after his watch and started talking about the weird crap he just saw. And of course, that's when the other story started rolling in. Turns out, at times, sound-powered phones through the ship would ring even if they weren't in use at the time. Even the phones on board the ship, which are usually out of service when the ship is underway, would ring. If someone picked the phone up, they would just hear static and silence. Other men reported that they had seen a man walking around corners and disappearing from the passageways before anyone could catch up with them. Others had also seen the sailor out on various parts of the ship at night. But did someone die on board? Chances are, somewhere along the line someone has. But who was this? No one ever did find out. The first story I told you about my house in Spur was the first time that anything strange had ever happened there, but it sure wasn't the last. First, I think I should give you a little background information. When I lived in Spur, I was married to a guy named Gary. He died of a major heart attack in November of 1991. I lived in the house until June of 1992. During those eight months, my house became what I would like to call very lively. This story isn't really scary, but it does prove that not all ghosts have to be terrifying. When my husband died, I was devastated. For the first time in my life, I wasn't sure if I could go on or if I even wanted to. I cried constantly. Everything I saw or heard always seemed to remind me of him. About two weeks after he died, I sent my daughter Trina to my mother's house for the night. I hadn't been alone even once since Gary's death, and I felt that I needed the time alone. I knew I would most likely spend most of the evening crying again, and I knew my poor daughter needed a break from my crying. I had to get my grief under control for my daughter's sake, and I hoped that by being alone, I might be able to come to terms with my feelings and so on. I watched TV for a while, cleaned the house, and ate a small luncheon for supper. It had been three hours and I still didn't cry. I was proud of myself for that. I started to get tired, so I turned off all the lights and laid on the couch. I tried hard to resist it, but the tears came anyways. I was crying harder then than ever before. It hurt so bad that I began to imagine a way to make it stop hurting. I thought if I could go to sleep and never wake up, I could be with him again. Suddenly. A cool breeze, not a cold one, just a cool one, seemed to drift across my face, and with it came the scent of Gary's favorite cologne. I sat up on the couch and scanned the room, thinking that it was going to appear, and all of this had just been a terrible nightmare. I saw nothing, but I could smell his cologne even stronger. My heart began to race, and I knew that it was there with me. Then I noticed that it felt like somebody had just sat down next to me, because the couch springs seemed to groan a little, and I knew it wasn't me, because I hadn't moved. The funny thing was, I wasn't scared. For the first time since his death, I felt safe, and I knew I would be okay. I leaned back against the couch, and just let what I knew was Gary comfort me with his presence. I cried, and I told him how much I loved him and missed him. I remember thinking how wonderful it would be to be in his arms once more, Incredibly enough, I felt what seemed like someone putting their arms around me very gently. I can remember feeling so happy and contented. I closed my eyes and fell asleep in my husband's arms. When I awoke the next morning, I faced the day with new hope and a happiness inside that I hadn't felt in a long time. I knew he wanted me to go on for my daughter's sake. I remember telling him that I would survive for our child. I finally felt like I could let him go, and I told him that before I went to pick up Trina, the only thing was, 
Gary never really left. Many other things happened that I knew was him, but I didn't mind. It was comforting to know that he was always there with me. Not all the things that happened in the house were good though. Some were downright mean and cruel. I know that Carrie would never be so mean and cruel, so I can only assume that there was another presence there in my house. But that's another story. As a child, I had a very creative mind and have grown up to be a fairly competent artist. However, even an endless imagination couldn't have prepared me for the encounters I had at 8 years old and the events had been burned into my mind. It was 1974 and my family had just moved from Quantico, Virginia. My dad was a Marine officer to Camp Pendleton Marine Corps based in California into a two-story duplex. Just about the time it got settled in, my paternal grandfather was murdered. A few months later, my mom's parents visited. Since we had a big family, a few of us kids were delighted to give up our beds for visiting family. Pappy got my bed, and I was relocated to my brother's bunk bed. Mark and I didn't get along, so I slept on the bottom with Daniel, with my head at the foot of the bed. At about 4 a.m., the first night, something awakened me. I didn't think anything about it and started to sleep again. However, I felt as if someone was watching me. Then I could hear very heavy breathing and felt a downward draft on my face. Scared out of my mind, I squinted my eyes and saw a hulking black figure, looking like the Grim Reaper without bones, hovering over me as if staring into my eyes. I tried to ignore it, but it wouldn't go away. I even snored, but it still didn't leave. Thinking that a little movement might disrupt the nightmare, I moved towards the center of the bed, but I didn't wake up, and the tormentor continued to breathe on my face, moving around the bed and laying down beside me. Immediately, I leapt from the bed and screamed at the top of my lungs, it's got me, it's got me. Everyone in the family came running to see what had happened commenting that a dark figure had disappeared in the hallway to the bedroom. Needless to say, I didn't sleep the rest of the night. What's worse, that black fiend and his lot continued to haunt me, the family, and the neighbors for years. I resorted to sleeping with an adult very close by, as often as I was allowed. Otherwise, encounters like the following were a nightly ritual. If I ever turned my head from the hallway light, which was left on for my security. The fiend shadow would appear, and he would start panting like he'd just run a 26-mile race. Sometimes, he'd hide behind the door or in a closet. Sometimes, the whole family would hear chains dragging across the floor or glass breaking downstairs. One night, it sounded as if plungers were being walked up and down the stairs. By this time, I'd mustered enough courage to investigate the sounds and saw nothing in the stairwell. Perhaps the scariest moment was the night I heard the hideous, angry laughter. As usual, something had awakened me, and I sat there wondering what to expect. Suddenly, I heard a commotion from downstairs, followed by laughter that could have come from the movie Sybil or The Exorcist. First it was one voice, then it was two, as if they were running around the first floor. Then they stopped. Suddenly, the first one started again, and I could hear it coming from up the stairs. It entered the hallway, ran to the bedroom, and brushed up against me, passing into the wall. Then the second voice started, but I didn't lie in bed waiting for it. I ran straight to my parents' room. Another time, one of our cousins came to visit, and it was decided that he and I would share a bed. Sometime that night, I was awakened to see the outline of a goat's head on my mom's wardrobe. It was kept in my room with a bright ring in its nose and spiraling fiery horns. As I screamed, it went away. Finally, one night, I'd had enough of the crap from whatever was haunting me. He had decided to inhabit the corner behind my bedroom door, just staring and breathing towards me. I sat up and said, in the name of Jesus, leave me alone. Guess what? It stopped. I've never seen that thing again, 
And every day, I thank God for the relief. However, all the haunting hadn't stopped. As recently as 1988, I've been harassed by a paranormal phenomenon. Even though we moved across the country, at times, I would wake up being dragged by my feet off the bed. I also asked my parents if they had noticed my old bunk bed, the one from California, would sometimes shake and squeak as if a couple were going at it. My dad confided that, when I was young, the bed would often make lots of noise, sometimes when I was asleep on it, which would explain why I was often awake in the middle of the night. He bolted out of his room, swearing someone was harming one of his boys, only to find us all sleeping soundly. He also said the neighbors in California, the Martins, shared similar experiences to what I'd had. The past 11 years have been pretty uneventful, paranormally, and I hope it stays that way. A few nights before the big production at my high school, the director was staying after school to work on the set's final touches. She was alone on stage when suddenly, a single long blonde hair fell from above. She thought to herself, hmm, must have been Stephanie's. Yeah, it must have stuck in the light fixture when she was working on it. Still, Miss Holton couldn't shake the somewhat eerie feeling that crept around her neck. She'd had this feeling ever since the beginning of rehearsals. The next day, Miss Holton went to visit a friend in hers in the school. Elizabeth, I had the strangest thing happen last night. I was staying after, and when I was on stage, when this long piece of hair from the ceiling fell. Was it long blonde? Asked Elizabeth. Yes, why? It must have been Julie's, Elizabeth said in an eerie tone. Who's Julie? You mean you haven't heard of Julie before? Back in 1974, the drama department decided to put Romeo and Juliet for the spring production. Julie was a tall, beautiful blonde senior who was talented in every way. She was determined to get the part of Juliet. Auditions came around. And sadly, Julie didn't make the cut. She was outraged. She told the director... If he didn't give her the part, she would die. Simply die. If I don't get the part, Julie told him, I'll kill myself. Of course, no one took her seriously. And a few months later, Romeo and Juliet opened up. The first night, Julie was there, sitting directly in the middle of the house, staring angrily at Juliet. She didn't laugh or cry. When the play was over, she got up and left. Juliet went to the house manager and told him, My God, Julie was giving me the creeps. She just kept staring at me. Her friend comforted her and told her not to worry about it. No, she's just jealous, that's all. She won't come back the next night. But Julie came back again. She sat in the center of the house, neither laughing or crying, just glaring at Juliet. Once again, Juliet went to the house manager and told him, She was here again, Jared. She just kept staring at me. Now, I mean it. If she comes tomorrow, give her a different seat. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Sure I will. Whatever you say. Sunday was the final night, and sure enough, Julie showed up. Somehow, she got the same seat and glared at poor Juliet. When the show was over, she got up and left. The house closed and the teachers began to knock down the set. They left a ladder center stage and a rope hanging from one of the pipes. Sometime in the middle of the night, Julie broke into the theater and climbed the ladder. She hitched a rope around her neck and hung herself. On Monday morning, she was found by a teacher. She was dead and bloated. And that is Julie's story. Elizabeth completed the story and asked, What play were you originally going to do anyway? Miss Holton gulped, Romeo and Juliet. Juliet's haunted our theater since the night of her untimely death. Sometimes she makes props disappear. Other times she makes the noise of a chair being thrown down. Of course, 
No one will find the invisible person who's pranks, or are they warnings? Scare them. Her footsteps simply ring in the empty halls. One thing is for certain though, we know Julie had come to visit. It all started when I was about 8 years old. My family and I moved into a rented house in Haltom City, Fort Worth, Texas. This house was not really all that old, maybe built in the 50s, that's a guess. Anyway, moving in, I was outside in the front yard playing and two neighbor boys came out and started talking to me. Eventually, I went to the house to visit and got to know these prospective new friends. While inside, I was standing in a particular spot in their kitchen when one of the boys looked at the other and then at me and says, I wouldn't stay in there if I were you. Curious, I asked, why not? And the boy replied, because there was a ghost in that very spot one time. Needless to say, I jumped right off that spot and went outside. Then I was curious. I started asking these guys about their ghost and they told me that their aunt and little cousin had come to visit them and while they were in the kitchen talking and catching up, the little boy was running around in the house playing. A little bit later, the little boy walked into the kitchen and stood next to his mom. His mom noticing him out of the corner of her eye went to place her hand on his shoulder and her hand passed right through him. She jumped back aghast and looked at the little boy. The kid just looked up at her and then all the other adults in the kitchen one by one then vanished and about that time the little boy came running down the hall screaming like something was chasing him. As a kid that story frightened me quite a bit. But then they proceeded to tell me that they would be sitting watching TV and the channel would change or the volume would go up full blast all of a sudden and sometimes their front door will swing wide open with the deadbolt still poking out as if it passed right through the door or something. The boys I was chatting with had an older sister. She was about 17 or 18 years old and one night she was asleep and she distinctly felt someone grab her by her arms firmly and lift her into the air and start banging her into the window like it was trying to toss her out. Of course, she woke up terrified and started screaming at the top of her lungs. When her parents burst into her room and turned the light on, it dropped her and disappeared. It was never visible, but left right then. The next day, I saw the bruise marks on her arms that were shaped like someone with large hands had been squeezing them very hard. At the time, I was too scared to ever go into the house, but at the same time, I felt like they may be pulling my leg and making up these stories. That is, until one day, my parents were outside talking to these boys' parents and they told my folks the same stories that they told me. To top it off, they said to my parents, some very strange things have happened in your house too, but we'd rather not talk about that. And they never told my folks what happened in our house. I'll send in another story soon. I don't know why, but I've always had experiences ever since I can remember. The experiences have been from ghostly encounters too. Well, I'd rather let you decide what the others are. I guess the reason why I draw these things towards me and others around me is that my awareness is higher than most people or that I'm just lucky. All my life, I felt things that I cannot explain. I'll visit a new place with my family or go on a school field trip and things will happen or they just happen at my home. I've had very pleasant experiences and then there were the scariest kinds. I'll tell you a few of the scary ones. Massachusetts is a very old state with a lot of very old homes and that's why haunted tales are not unusual. But no matter how many experiences people have or tell, no one seems to believe them. I will say that all of my stories are true, believe them or not, that's your choice. By the summer before my 8th grade in junior high, my family, mom, grandmother and myself moved into a new house. Ever since I can remember, things would move around on my bedroom dresser. I have crystal vases, boxes, etc. 
I would go downstairs and realize that I forgot something and all the things on my dresser would have been moved completely to the other side of the dresser. Since I was only child at the time, my grandmother was downstairs and my mother would be at work. I knew it was a ghost. However, it wasn't threatening, so I didn't think about it too much. I just let it do what it wanted to. About three years later, I experienced something very scary. I had a friend from school sleep over my house, and that evening, I saw someone in my room. I awoke from sleeping. I was on the floor in a sleeping bag, and my friend was in my bed. I thought my grandmother was in my room. I saw a figure pacing back and forth in front of my bed. Again, I thought it was my grandmother, so I called out to her. I thought she was just checking to make sure we had enough blankets, etc. But when it finally turned to look at me, I realized it wasn't her. It was a medium-sized man, dressed in black, with a long black cape and a hood over his head, and the whitest face I had ever seen. And one more thing, I swear that he had a mark on his face in black, similar to the letter Z. After I saw this, I turned to my friend and started yelling at my friend to wake up. When she finally did, I told her to look, and of course he wasn't there. She told me that I was imagining it and to go back to sleep. The next morning, we both went downstairs and I told my family what I had seen. They all laughed at me, but I was serious and my mother told me she believed me. About a week later, I was on the phone with another friend of mine, Shelly. We were talking about what we had been up to. She told me that last weekend, she and some of our friends went out at the end of the evening for a drive to a nearby cemetery. She said the three of them got out to walk around the graveyard, but she stayed behind in the car to wait. She said that when she was waiting for the others to come back, she saw this man coming towards the car at her. She then proceeded to tell me that she was never so scared in her life. She started to freak out. She quickly leaned over all of the seats of the car to make sure the car door was locked. And when she looked up, the man was still walking towards her in the car. She then described the man to me on the phone. And she described him to the T as the man that I saw in my room that same weekend. I was speechless on the phone and just listened to her story. I didn't tell her about my visit from the man who I called the Z-Man. About a month passed after that and I finally told her my story. She was shocked and thought I was making it up. I told her I wanted to tell her that night she called me, but I was so scared that I just couldn't. Two months passed towards the end of the summer. Shelly and I and some of our friends went to the drive-in theater. She and I had to go to the restroom. As we waited in line, we turned to look on the wall and saw, written black, was the Z-Man is coming. We then both looked at each other and ran out of there as fast as we could. All I know is that it was evil, and I didn't want to find out if he or it was coming again or not. I haven't saw this man since 1989, or at least not that I can remember, but nor do I want to. Then again, I live in Florida now, and maybe that could be a reason why he hasn't made an appearance. Thanks for reading. It all happened when I was at my old house, which was a rather smallish farmhouse. There I lived with my mother, father, and 17-year-old brother. I was always a little suspicious, but not greatly into anything like ghosts in any big way or manner. Little things would always happen around the house, Things like books falling off shelves, vases, etc. But no one really took any particular notice. Everyone else in my family simply blamed it on the old house's feeble foundation. But me being a little sus, I always came to the same conclusion. That it had to be a ghost and that the house was truly and purely haunted. Especially since someone died in the old place about 10 years before we moved in. And well, that would give you the creeps, right? Well... It did a righteous turn for me, I assure you. I'm not quite sure how the person died. No one ever talked about it. Anyway, my brother used to love attempting to scare me. He would jump out at me all the time and go running past my door and screaming boo. Stupid, immature things like that. 
But one day, I was in my room, lying on my bed, just glancing at my door that was wide open. My brother was in his bedroom, right next to mine. I could tell this because his music was turned right up. My father was at work and my mother was, well, I didn't have a clue as to where she was. I thought she was in the kitchen. So, I was staring at my door in the middle of the day when suddenly a shadow whisked past my door. It appeared about the half the size of a human being and seemed to almost float. I thought it was just my brother playing tricks on me as if he had just ran past my door and was squatting to make himself look short. So I called out to him, very funny ads, very funny. I looked at the door again and once again the thing ran past my door in the opposite direction heading towards my parents room to the back of the house. This time I was freaked but I still believed or wanted to believe that it was my brother fooling around. So I ran into his room to find it unbelievably empty. So I ran back into my room and looked out my window and there out the front of our five acre block was my mother and brother doing some gardening. I ran out the front and accused my brother of being stupid and he had no idea whatsoever what was going on. My mother became suspicious and we all went back into the house together. We searched the house from front to back, finding absolutely nothing to blame. Strange things kept happening around the house. We soon moved, thank God. Now that we've moved house into town, we only just found out that one of the houses around the corner where we used to live was also supposed to be haunted. Apparently, once a whole bookshelf fell over, almost crushing the owner of the house for no apparent reason. The world is weird, but we definitely are not alone. When my husband and I were first married, some 29 years ago, he took me to Columbus, Ohio to meet his family. His mother lived on West 2nd Avenue, and his sister and her family lived across the street from her. Tootie, my husband's sister, was a nice, friendly person, and we got along great from day one. She and her family lived in a big old house that, like many other old houses, had been divided into two apartments, one upstairs and one down. Tootie and her family lived in the downstairs apartment. My husband and I were staying with his mother, but we visited Tootie and her family every day. Several times during the visits, I heard the front door open. The two apartments shared a common front door and foyer, then each had their own individual doors to the apartments, footsteps going up the stairs to the other apartment, and then what sounded like people moving around up there. I found nothing strange about this, as I was not familiar with the house or its occupants. Then one night, Tootie, her three children and I were alone in her apartment. She was in the kitchen fixing supper while I kept an eye on the kids who were watching TV in the living room. Again, I heard the outside door open, someone going up the stairs and the door to the other apartment open and close. About that time, Tootie called the kids and me to supper. During the course of conversation over supper, I asked her who lived in the upstairs apartment. No one, she said. That apartment has been empty since we moved here three years ago. I felt the blood draining from my face because I knew that someone had been going up there all week and was, in fact, up there at the moment we were talking. My first thought was that someone was up to no good and that they were using the empty apartment as a base. Tootie was looking at me strangely. Someone is up there, I said. I heard them go up there a while ago. That's impossible, Tootie replied. The only other person with the key to that apartment besides myself the landlord had given her a key so she could check on the other apartment from time to time. Is the landlord, and he's out of town this week. At that moment, we all heard heavy footsteps plodding down the hallway upstairs. The hallway led down a block flight of stairs, which ended at a door, which was kept locked at all times, that opened into Tootie's apartment. The footsteps were headed for that door. Badly frightened, we all jumped up from the table. Call the police, I screamed. I'll call Ted's, her husband's brother, she said. He lives just two houses down the street and can get here before the police. Tootie's brother-in-law and a friend that happened to be visiting him arrived within minutes of her frantic call. Tootie gave them the key to the apartment and they just went upstairs with flashlights. 
There was no electricity on in the upstairs apartment to check things out. Tootie, the kids and I, sat huddled in the kitchen, expecting the man to yell call the police at any moment, but nothing happened. Then, we heard footsteps coming down the stairs to the door that led into the kitchen. There they stopped. We thought it was Tootie's brother-in-law and his friend, and Tootie called out to him. There was no answer. A few minutes later, Tootie's brother-in-law and his friend came down the stairs via the door in the kitchen and called for Tootie to let them in. They had seen or heard nothing. They said it had been through the whole apartment. They probably thought we were two hysterical women who had spooked each other, but we knew what we had heard. Tootie said that after that night, the footsteps and banging doors in the upstairs apartment got so bad that she eventually moved out, even though her apartment was a really nice place. She moved across the street to the house where her mother had lived and stayed there for the next 10 years. People moved in and out of the downstairs apartment in her old house at an alarming rate and no one ever stayed long. Strangely enough, no one ever rented the upstairs apartment, even though it was a nice place. About 10 years after this incident, a strange odor started permeating the air on West 2nd Avenue. It smelled like something dead. Everyone up and down the street assumed that some large animal, a dog maybe, had crawled into the basement of a house and died. Eventually, they decided the odor was coming from the house that Tootie had lived in. The police were called to investigate, and they found the body of Tootie's former landlord, you guessed it, in the upstairs apartment. One has to wonder if the entity that haunted the place had anything to do with the old man's death. I certainly hope not. I hope he died a peaceful death, but the police said a pure look of terror was frozen on his face when they found his decomposing body in that awful apartment. Thanks for reading. Last year in the month of June, my twin sister Kelly decided that she didn't want to be on this earth anymore. We were both 20 years old, and I knew at that time she was going through a depressed state. Being her closest sister, I could sense her depression first off before anyone, but just thought it was friends, or maybe that she wasn't feeling well. Her mood swings were affecting mom and dad, and they were concerned if she was sick or worried about anything that she could tell them, but she didn't let anyone know her reasons for being moody. Two months before she died, she started writing in a journal. It wasn't a daily journal, but she entered things in it that were occurring in her life or about how she was feeling. One of her entries captured my attention. She wrote about a 22-year-old man by the name of David and his visits to her. At first, I thought it was someone she was seeing that none of us knew about, but as I read on, she mentioned that David was a ghost, but he didn't scare her. She went on about how she came to visit her when she was alone in her room and when she was asleep. His presence was always willed because he would touch her lightly on her hair or on her shoulder and it would be a very cold feeling. Kelly went on to say that this only happened in her room. At first when I read the story, I was a little frightened that this was happening in our house. But then Kelly wrote that David was a gentle spirit that kept her company and she became very attached to him after some time. Then her depression set in. She didn't want to live anymore and go through the hassles of being an adult with all the responsibilities involved. I always knew she wanted life to be handed to her on a silver platter and that she was never one to be realistic. She just ignored the important things in life and went on. She entered into her journal that life was boring and that she didn't have the same direction or goals that I had. We were identical twins but had totally different personalities. I cried when I read that because I would have always tried to help her if she was sad. I wish I had been a better sister to her during her depressed time, and I get mad at myself for not being persistent enough to have helped her. Kelly's last entry was two weeks before she died, and it said that life with David would be more happier for her. She would plan her departure to be with David soon, and she hoped that everyone would understand what she was going through and that this is what she wanted to do. I've never understood why she killed herself, and neither has anyone else. The reason why she died is just too bizarre to understand. On December 10th, at about 11pm, I was closing all the windows and locking the doors in our house before I went to bed. Mom and Dad had gone away for a couple of days for a break from work, and Mom still had not gotten over Kelly's death, 
So I was the only one at home as I was securing the house when I heard the sounds of someone running up the stairs in laughter. My heart started pounding as I knew no one was in the house except for me. I wasn't sure what to do, so I grabbed one of mom's kitchen knives and started up the stairs. Then the running footsteps vanished into Kelly's old room and the laughter continued. Now my stomach was churning and I was scared to even look. I just thought to myself that this can't be happening and gripped the knife tightly as I neared the entrance of the room. As I edged closer, I heard the sounds of two people but could understand what they were saying. I could only hear the voice of a male and a female. I asked who was there but no one replied so I stormed into Kelly's bedroom. It was empty. I opened the wardrobe door to see if anyone was hiding in there and that was also empty. But oddly, her bedroom window was open and a cool breeze was entering the room. As I turned around, I was startled to see a hazy figure standing at the bedroom doorway. My heart felt like it was going to be ripped out as it was beating so fast. I stood in shock and stared in amazement. Even though I felt silly for asking, I asked if she was Kelly. I could tell by the shape of the figure that it was a female and then she started to come towards me. I backed off a bit and then she became familiar with me. She was wearing faded blue jeans and a blue top. Tears were streaming down my face. These were the same clothes Kelly had worn when she had hung herself. Even though her face was not clear to me, I knew that she was smiling. She blew me a kiss and walked out of the room and into the hallway. I ran after her but she had disappeared quicker than a blink of an eye. After that experience, I've always had a feeling that Kelly is watching me. It's a scary memory I have of her visit, but I do feel comforted that she is not sad. I miss her deeply and have not seen her spirit since. I hope she is finally at rest. Before I moved to Las Vegas, I used to visit a lot. My family and I enjoyed staying at the various hotels. About three years ago, we stayed at one of the original older hotel casinos on the Strip in Las Vegas. At the time, this hotel casino was experiencing difficulties with the union. Our room was 179. When we got to the door, I put in the key card. The little green light went on, and I tried to open the door. It was impossible to open. It took me and my dad to open it. At the time, we thought it was some kind of vacuum or the hinges on the door needed to be fixed. Of course, five minutes later, we forgot all about it. A few minutes after I put my clothes in the drawers, I searched around the room to check for any dropped casino chips from past guests. To my dismay, I found nothing. After that, I looked for the Bible in the room. There was none. Now that was odd. They are always in hotel rooms. Someone must have taken it. Later that day, we all went out to the strip. My mom got tired around 11 o'clock, so she went back to the room. Me and my dad stayed out till 1 o'clock in the morning. When we got back, I was really tired. I slept on the couch and my parents slept on the bed. We had a suite. The next morning, my dad was almost crying. He said that he had seen a ghost. I thought he was joking because he had always said that there was no such things. He said he saw it around 4.45 in the morning. According to him, he felt something at the foot of the bed. He turned over, sat up, and opened his eyes. Standing before him was a woman dressed in a white dress. He said it looked like something from the 40s or 50s. The lady had her arms folded across her chest. He could see all the wrinkles in her dress. She just stood there and didn't make a sound, but he did not see a face or hands, just whiteness. When he saw her, he yelled at my mom to wake up. My mom didn't wake up right away. He shook her a few times to wake up. When she did, my dad looked at the woman at the foot of the bed. Then, she just dissipated from the outside in. They didn't want to wake me until 8 a.m. They said they didn't want to keep me awake. I really don't know what to think. So, being the smart ass that I am, I lit a match and said, Ghost, you are no longer welcome here. Get out of your room. But then I said, oh, never mind. You can just stay over in that corner if you don't bother us. My parents were apprehensive about staying another night. I convinced them that we should stay another night because I thought it would be cool and so they agreed. That night, I fell asleep around 1230. At about four in the morning, 
I felt something in the room. I was afraid to look. I put my head in my blankets for about 15 minutes. I was breathing pretty hard. I decided to stick my head out of the blankets, and when I did, I was scared out of my pajamas. There, in the corner that I told the ghost to go, was the ghost, white dress and all. Immediately, I put my head under the covers. Tears were coming down my face. I hoped to God that the ghost didn't come over to me. I stayed awake and didn't move until I heard my parents were awake. When I had told them what had happened, they decided that we would never return to this hotel ever again. We packed up all of our stuff and headed out, and when we got to the door, the maid was there. My dad asked her, what was that we saw in the room? The maid's eyes got big, and she asked us if we had seen the ghost. We all answered yes in unison. She said that she would not clean the room, handed off the towels to us, and ran off crying. When we checked out, we didn't ask anyone about the ghost because we didn't want to cause a scene. When we got home, I told all my friends about it. They all said cool. I don't think it was cool at all. At work, my dad asked if anybody knew any ghost stories about the place we had stayed at. One of his coworker girlfriends who had been a cocktail waitress there and said that in the 50s, a country western singer had stayed there. He was cheating on his wife with his mistress his wife visited him while he was in bed with the mistress and shot her, the mistress. That's all of the story I heard. The mistress of the man may or may not be the ghost in room 179, but all I know is that there is a ghost in that room, and I'll never go there ever again. My teen years were turbulent and not very pleasant. I won't go into too much detail but a little background is necessary in order to fully explain the story I have to tell. My family, being military, traveled often. This made us very dependent on one another. However, in 1985, my father retired to a small, miserable town called Lebanon in the cornfields of Illinois. Being a small town, it was chock full of every small town cliche imaginable. My sister, being two years older than I, found the prospect of not being uprooted suddenly very pleasing and made many friends very easily. I, on the other hand, couldn't stay in the bumpkins we lived among and quickly became the town outcast. My father, hating retirement, found a local job and was gone from the house a lot. My mother and I were never close and she soon became lost in my sister's popularity and forgot about me. None of this bothered me after all. I knew one day I would leave. Nonetheless, I found myself alone a lot. Our house was a clone of the typical 1950s two-story white house. We even had the white picket fence in the backyard. There had only been one previous owner of our abode, a nice old couple that had retired to Florida. They did not smoke, and no one in my family did at that time. However, shortly after moving in, we would smell cigarette smoke in various areas of the house. It was so strong, it would make one's eyes water. Then it would be gone. My father was never a believer, still isn't, so this was easily dismissed by him. However, my mother soon named the smoke the work of Fred. Once Fred became named, he made himself very believable. The footsteps, the lights, so on were all par for the cause. However, Fred's favorite activity would be rearranging the food in the fridge. We would come to breakfast in the morning, and all the food would be alphabetized or arranged according to color, size, so on. Once he even crammed all the food onto one shelf, my mother yelled, Oh, Fred, don't you ever do that again. Now clean this up. The next time the door was opened, it was cleaned, although my father would say it was a half ass effort. But it was when I was alone that I could feel Fred more closely. He would be there so strongly. I would talk to him out loud, never getting an answer but feeling better. In our basement was a makeshift hobby room the previous owner had constructed. We kept our tools in this room as well as our empty luggage. When I would enter this room, I would feel like I was intruding. It always felt cold, and as soon as I found what I was looking for, the feeling to get out would be even stronger. Nothing bad ever happened, just the urgency to get out. I asked Fred if he wanted me to stay out of his room. The lights began to flicker, and I took that as a yes. I moved the tools and luggage and never went in there again. 
This continued for three years until one day, I was viciously attacked. Gotta love those small towns. Once I returned home and slept in my bed again, I felt someone sit down next to me. I thought it was my sister, but when I looked, I saw only a butt print, no body. I cried and talked to Fred all night about what had happened, and from that point on, he slept with me every night. I could sometimes feel him sit next to me on the couch or on the front porch swing. He was very comforting. I graduated from high school in 1990 and got the hell out of Dodge. The last night I was to sleep at home, I told Fred I was leaving. I heard a very heavy sigh explode next to me. I promised I would visit, and I did. Each time I would visit, he would sit next to me and I would fill him in on my life. Then in 1995, my parents moved to Alabama and sold the house. On the last day that I would ever be in the house, I had to say goodbye to Fred. I went into my now empty room and told Fred the news. I heard the sigh again, then footsteps as he walked away from me, down the stairs and then into the basement. I cried all the way home. Someone else lives in the house now. I drove by it yesterday, the first time in almost four years. It looked well taken care of. I wonder if Fred is still there, if he likes the new people. I wonder if they like him. I miss him, my friend, and think of him often. I lived in Savannah, Georgia for almost three years. It is the most haunted city in the US. I feel, and I have several stories to prove it, perhaps some other time. Thank you for letting me tell my story. I was at a friend's house on the new year of 1999, and she has a giant picture window in her dining room. I was spending the night, and we were the only ones awake. Her parents were asleep in the room, pretty much right next to us, and her brother and sister were asleep on the floor in the living room. We went over to the picture window to try and see the fireworks. We were trying to see them when we heard a clatter right above us. We look up at the ceiling while hoping it was only rats. We ignored it and continued searching for the sky for fireworks. After about a minute, we heard heavy footsteps. They were horrible. After that night, she still comes to me with outrageous stories from the night before. One of them was not too long ago. She told me that she heard a voice one night while she was having trouble sleeping. She walked out of her room, looked down the stairs, and saw a dark figure standing at the end of the stairs. She thought it was her mom and started saying something to her, but it wasn't her mom, not at all. She looked down the stairs closer, and then it opened its eyes. She says they were a bright glowing green. When she told me this, a bolt of pure, unspeakable terror shot down my spine. She also says that after she claimed she was in her room and she looked out her window, she saw in her little sister's room a blood red man looking right at her. She always has terrifying stories and yet she is never scared or fazed by them herself. I remember in the third grade I was at her house every morning because I had seen strange figures in my hallway. Every morning my mom would take me in and I lay on the couch. As I watched her headlights dance across the wall and then disappear, the room would lower to an agonizing freezing cold. I guess I could chalk that up to coincidence, but knowing all the experiences I had previously and the ones that I just mentioned, I kind of doubt that. But I know that there is a presence in my house. Thanks for reading. My name is Ian and I recently just spent two weeks in Italy. I live in LA and was told of the many must see locations in the area of Tuscany, but the one that most appealed to me was the torture museum in the famous city of San Ginanamo. On the ninth and last day in Tuscany, before I took my long drive home to Rome, we decided to stop in San Ginanamo. My father told me to leave me in the torture museum, aka the criminal museum, while he went off with my sisters. The criminal museum was originally a torture chamber, built during the time of the Spanish and Italian Inquisition. I bought my ticket at around 5.30 p.m. and proceeded to the bottom part of the torture chamber. As I entered the deepest part of the chamber, I got really scared. I was all alone, except for a German man and his children. The chamber was quite odd 
and in some places it was really cold and I would go back to that same place and it would not be cold anymore. Light gusts of wind would come out of nowhere and there were no windows, doors and it was underground. I began proceeding through the chamber until I stopped by a ghostly figure standing right behind an iron maiden. It was a shade of white that I had never seen before. I could barely make it out, but there were depressions where the mouth, eyes, and nose were. I stood frozen for what felt like ten minutes. It then darted straight across the room, in the direction of the opposite wall. I could even hear its feet going across the floor. I ran like a bat out of hell, and nearly cleared twenty stairs, but fell and slid down the ten other. I later spoke to the man in the reception room. He asked me where I saw it, and I said in the chamber. He told me that there are hundreds of ghosts in there, and many seem to be insane. I will never forget what happened to me in Italy, and I hope others will enjoy my story. My name is Julie, and I'm 32, mother of a wonderful four-year-old son which I would give my life for, married to a wonderful, incredible man. We live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. When I was about eight, I believe, I had my first terrifying experience with the dead. My great-grandma had passed away a few days earlier, although I can't really recall the event all that well. One night, a few days after her death, I woke up in the middle of the night, needing to go to the bathroom. The bathroom was just in front of my bedroom, separated by a long hallway that went basically across the part of the first and only floor. Beside my bedroom was my parents' bedroom. My bedroom to the bathroom was only like three feet to walk across the hallway. As I walked towards the bathroom, for some reason, I looked into my parents' bedroom. What I saw terrified me. Across my parents' bed, I saw my great-grandma lying on her side, holding her head with her left arm looking at me with these black, see-through eyes. I will never forget. Very young and innocent, I didn't really ever think that ghosts really existed. That made me aware of another world that we were not taught about in our upbringing. When I got a little older, we had bought a house in Hawkesbury, Ontario, that we stayed into for, I would say, five to six years. I was about 16 at the time. We had just purchased the house, and while my father was renovating the upstairs, the whole family would be sleeping in the basement. One night, as we were spending a little time together, we heard this funny noise upstairs. We thought someone, for some reason, had entered our home, so my father went up to see what was going on. To all of our surprise, all four rings of her ceiling light had just fallen on the floor. Not one at a time, but all four. We could hear footsteps in the house, and when I was alone, the front doorknob would turn and nobody was even there. I was so terrified. I did not know what to make of these events. At night, I would hear someone open the fridge door and close, open pantry doors and close loud. I would constantly feel a presence. I would barely have any sleep in the house. Sometimes, I would go and sleep with my brother. It is a terrible feeling as a child to be afraid like this. It's not okay. I don't think in any way that this is a funny thing. When you're a child, you get confused and don't understand the logic of these things. Actually, because there is no logic. When I got older in my early 20s, my grandmother passed away. God, I adored her. She was my best friend. And to this day, I miss her like crazy. Not long after she had died, maybe a few nights after, she appeared to me while sitting on the side of my bed, late one night. She appeared right next to me. She had her arm around my neck, and she looked at me saying, Julie, don't be sad. You know that I'm not really gone. And she disappeared into thin air. I felt such a relief that she felt my sadness, and that she loved me enough to come and comfort me. I will never forget that precious moment. For you, Grandma, I love you. Julie. start my story. My father and I pretty much had a decent relationship most of my life. Of course, when I was a teenager, I did the usual teenage crap 
We rebelled, and we grew apart. I had moved out, and ended up with an abusive boyfriend. I ended up moving back home, and Dad and I renewed our relationship. Those nine months before my dad's death were great. We actually got a chance to really talk, and I think my dad knew his time was short. He kept telling me that I would find the right guy eventually, and I would make a good mom someday. On February 11th, 1997, dad passed away after a long illness that we would discover later was periodontis. Things didn't start happening right away. It started after I met the man who would be my husband later and I became pregnant with our son. About four months into my pregnancy, we started noticing little things around the house, mostly having to do with noises and objects that had belonged to my father. After my son was born, and he was about a month old, my husband and I were watching television in the living room, and the baby was asleep. My mother's room. We were staying with her, due to after dad died, she couldn't pay the bills on her own, was right off the living room. She had went to bed, and after about a half hour, she said she had seen a white orb about the size of a softball traveling between the bedroom door and her vanity mirror. No light source constant. Her room was pitch black because she kept tinfoil and trash bags over her windows to keep the light out. Then, when we were getting things ready for the wedding, it seemed like all hell broke loose. Objects being thrown, kitchen drawers opening, and shutting by themselves, strange noises, you name it, we had it. Then, the wedding day came. I wasn't nervous, cause I knew dad was there. I wore his turquoise ring I gave him for a Father's Day present, for something blue. Everyone at the wedding and the reception said they could feel him. Even some of the pictures taken at the reception were questionable. A couple have, what appears to have a mist in them. My son is in most of those photographs. Then we didn't really have anything happen for a while, until my son started getting old enough to talk. Then in the evening, when only me and my son were at home, watching TV most times, he would get all excited, as if someone had just come home. He would run up to the baby gate, wave, and yell hi, and I would go up to the gate and look down the hall to see no one there, and I would ask him, who are you talking to? And he'll look up at me and smile and say, Grandpa Mama, he never met my father. My son was born on 2100, and Dad died on 211, 97. After he did this for a couple of weeks, I invested in an EMF detector. After running a few test runs to get readings from the hallway on basic electrical outlets and whatnot, I waited for my son to say hi to Dad again. Sure enough, about a week later, it happened again. This time I ran into the hallway to see if I could get a reading. I did. A perfect circle about two feet in diameter, smack dab in the middle of the hallway. I knew it was dad. We have since moved, but my son still says hi on occasion to grandpa, and my sister and I can still sense his presence. I'm 19 now, and most of my experiences have happened recently. Although I remember a few from when I was a child, I'm a student at a Big Ten university and stayed in the dorms my first year here. My roommate and I were soon to find out we had another roommate. One night, I was dreaming that I was lying in a bed across from another bed and a girl was pacing in between. Well, my dream soon faded to reality when I noticed myself blinking. We had lost, so the floor that was in my dream was now gone. But the girl was still pacing, about five feet in the air. I don't know what came over me, and I didn't mean to say anything, but I blurted out, what are you looking for? The girl stopped and looked at me. Her eyes were just dark holes, and then faded away. I wasn't scared of her. I just went back to sleep. During other nights, I would be startled awake, what sounded like heavy books being thrown to the floor, and in the morning, nothing would be out of place. Things would go missing only to end up in the middle of the floor, days later. My first touching experience took place there also. I was taking a nap on the futon with my boyfriend when I felt what I thought was my boyfriend's scruffy chin rub on my forehead. It woke me, but I didn't open my eyes. It happened again, and so I thought he was trying to get my attention. 
I looked up, expecting to see his face, and there was nothing there. He was about two feet away from me, with his back towards me, fast asleep. My roommate, however, had the creepiest experience. She rarely had any, but hers, I think, didn't happen to me. She came in the room from the shower, down the hall, and went to her mirror. When she noticed she had a drop of blood on the tip of her nose, she wiped it off onto her finger, expecting to see a pop zit or something, but her nose was clear. She showed me the blood on her finger and told me what happened, so we checked her arms and legs everywhere to see if she had cut herself shaving. We checked her towel, robe, slippers, everything, and there was no blood anywhere else. We still do not know where it came from. Last night was my most recent experience, which made me want to read about stories online. It was at my parents' home, which we all think is haunted by some man. I was ready to fall asleep when I was startled awake by a loud pop in front of my face. Minutes later, I heard dripping water. That ghost mostly bothers my brother, whose bedroom is in the basement where most of the activity takes place. I would like to share my experiences with someone who doesn't think I'm crazy. When I was five years old, my mom, dad, and I moved to a house in Crownsville. It was about seven years old and had originally been built as a summer home only. My dad did a lot to the house over the years to renovate it. When I was about 10 years old, he finished the new bedroom on the front of the house and he and my mother moved in. I got their old bedroom at the back of the house. I'm not sure if this bedroom was in the house originally because it was built on a concrete slab and the rest of the house was over a basement. My mother claimed to see a ghost materialize from the heating vent into the room. We all laughed it off. Later on, I didn't think it was so funny anymore. My parents were very strict and didn't leave me alone in the house until I was 13. After they left, I was really creeped out by the feeling in the house. I felt as though I was being watched. I wandered into the kitchen and heard a really weird sound. Then I noticed that the cupboard doors were moving. It looked like they were vibrating. I recognized the noise as the glasses in the cabinets all vibrating against one another. I ran back to my room and stayed there till my parents got back. One time, I got this brilliant idea to bring a Ouija board into the house. My grandmother had lots of junk in her backyard, and as I dug around, I had found the board wedged between two small buildings. If I'd been a bit older and a bit smarter, I would have left the damn thing there. I shoved it into the back floorboard of my mother's car, underneath my jacket. Somehow, I snuck it inside later on, without being seen. It was just the board in the planches, the Parker Brothers kind. I put it in my underwear drawer, all the way at the bottom hoping to play with it later. I had failed school that year, so I had to go to summer school. I knew I would have to get up early, so I went to bed early. I was weakened some time later, after my parents went to bed. I thought I heard a rattling. I listened for several minutes, heard nothing, and went back to sleep. I woke up again, a little while later. Again, I thought I heard rattling, and this time, I thought I had come from my dresser. I was slightly freaked out, but I heard nothing after a few intense minutes of listening, so I rolled over and went back to sleep. I woke up a third time. This time, I was angry. I still heard it when I woke all the way up, so I hurried and turned my light on. I saw the dresser drawer move for a few seconds, then it stopped. There was no more sleep for me to be had that night. The light stayed on, and I stayed sitting up in my bed till dawn. Then I got into the dresser, snapped the board in pieces, and threw it out my back window. The last thing that happened while I lived in the house occurred when my best friend stayed the night. We were supposed to be sleeping in my bed, but being kids, we were up talking. We both shut up at once and looked out my bedroom door. It was the kind of house where all the doors line up. I could look out of my door and see clear to my parents' bedroom door, in between were my old room the kitchen, and the living room. We both saw glowing orbs floating around in the living room. There were about five of them, and they were way brighter than any of the lamps we had. 
She and I stared in awe for a few minutes, and then they faded away. She and I are still friends, but we never have talked about the glowing balls floating around my living room. Thanks for listening. I have been able to explain what happened the night of the Ouija board rattlings. For all I know, it could be the workings of an overactive imagination, but it sure seemed to be real to me. The terror of that night never has faded. Hi, I've owned this large, three-story, late 1800s building for the past 25 years or so. The first floor is two storefronts, and the second and third originally had three apartments per floor. I converted two of the second floor apartments into one large apartment for myself. When I first bought the building, I had a great deal of work to do on it. My mother would occasionally visit, and she would ask me who was in the back room of the main store. There was no one there, but she would insist. I never thought much about this until later in life, and she now sees non-existent people nearly everywhere. Sometime after gutting the building and making it partly usable, I was working on the first floor and saw a young boy running through the store. Since the place was locked up tight, and there were seven alarm systems, and only one was off, it was impossible for the child to hide from me. No child was to be found. Over the years, I and many others have seen a child running through the store. I've seen the occasional person while looking in a mirror, although this doesn't happen often. Many years ago, my friend Scott shared the apartment and had a rear bedroom of his own. One evening, he came out to see me when I got home and complained that something had sexually assaulted him. He found the event very painful. I somewhat dismissed this as folly on his part, but never forgot it. A few years later, I rented that same room to another fellow, and he had a similar experience. He moved out the next day. I rented a room to a fellow who was gay. He never had problems until his friend came over to visit. They were alone in the bed at the time. They were in the bedroom when the bed lifted a few inches off the floor and fell down. Then the bed moved a couple of feet from its location. Finally, the tenant had a set of barbells sitting on the floor. They were tossed up in the air several times, hitting the floor with a bang. After this happened, I began to read up on getting rid of spirits in the building. I placed a pentagram with proper symbols in the room above the tenant's room and went through the ceremony. From that day forward, nothing else happened in the building. That is until the roof leaked above the room, and I bought up a tarp and bucket to catch the leak. The tarp covered the pentagram. Since then, people, including myself, see things in the building, mostly visions of people. Some people leave the building immediately when this happens. Over the years, nothing has ever happened to me physically, and my sightings of spirits are rare. I'd like to mention another place in Buffalo. It is on West Avenue near Fury. The location was originally Buffalo's hanging grounds, and now there are houses on it. My friend Paul owns the house. Occasionally, when no one is in the house, there will be loud screams coming from inside the house. Police have been summoned by neighbors on several occasions, but couldn't find anything out. Thanks for reading. I had a couple of strange experiences at a cemetery in Vancouver as a teenager about 15 years ago or so. Everyone I've told the story to over the years seems to get a chill run down their necks from hearing it, so I thought I'd make a good addition to your website, which I enjoy reading through on occasion as I'm interested in hearing about other people's experiences with the unexplained. Back in the late 80s, I hung around with a group of friends who I'd hang around with and mostly get into trouble with. I guess looking back, we didn't really have any beliefs or interest in the supernatural or spirituality, and I suppose we were kind of like teenage nihilists in a way, getting into trouble with the police and partying a lot, not conscientious about school or the future. So what would happen at the cemetery would all seem the more strange. Well anyways, one school night, we are out looking for something to do at around 10 or 11 at night, and we couldn't really think of anything as it was midweek and most people our age only went out on the weekends. 
We ended up just driving around with no destination in mind. And at one point, someone suggested we go to a local cemetery just because we had nowhere else to go. This cemetery is cut into the forest on the side of a mountain and is basically just a giant field surrounded by trees and all the headstones are just flat plates on the ground so that if you didn't know it was a cemetery, it would just appear as a big empty field upon entering it. The point is, is that there's absolutely nothing to obstruct your view or cast strange shadows in the cemetery. To get into the cemetery, you have to drive through a 40 meter winding road that runs through trees and bushes, etc. And this road eventually branches out so that cars can access different parts of the cemetery. There were three of us in the car, with myself driving a friend in the front seat and one in the back. As I pulled the car into the small entrance road, I slowed the car right down and put on the high beams and drove the car at a snail's pace towards the cemetery. As we made the last little bend in the road and entered the cemetery, the high beam suddenly illuminated the entire field and it was at this point that I suddenly and finally jammed my foot on the brakes because about 15 meters in front of us stood a group of about 30 to 40 people. I think I recall my friend sitting next to me, saying something to the effect of, what the hell is going on here? I don't know. I answered maybe some kind of midnight burial or something, and then cracking some joke that maybe they were druids. I remember my friend, in the back seat, suggesting that we back the car the way we came in, so as not to disturb whatever was going on, which I declined to do in saying it, would be a better idea to make the first turn and come around as it's a narrow road. At this time, probably about 20 to 30 seconds might have passed, and I took my foot off the brake, and we proceeded forward. After the car had moved forward, maybe 15 feet, and I was staring intently at the group of the people the whole time, there strangely now seemed to be less of them, which confused me. Although I remember slight movement within the group, they didn't seem to be bothered by the headlights, and I don't recall any of them looking directly at us. Well, by the time the car had reached about half the distance to where they were standing, and this is the odd part, there was no one left standing there, just an empty field, and it was at this point, when I hit the brakes again, I can remember the intense feeling of my scalp feeling like it was covered in goosebumps and shrinking, because it was only at this point that it clicked into my mind that something ghostly and unnatural had occurred. I drove the car up to a spot alongside where the group was standing, and rolled down the window to have a closer look, but there was no explanation for what we had seen. At this point, someone suggested that we get the heck out of there, and we did, quickly. I can think of no possible explanation for what happened, and even went up there a couple weeks later with the same car, but a different friend, to see if maybe we could duplicate the feet and try to come up with some explanation, but we were unsuccessful. Strange thing was, now all three of us saw the same thing from different vantage points, and there was nothing that the headlights could have refracted off to cause an illusion against the windshield. And anyways, the groups were clearly standing at a distance of 50 or so meters in three dimensional space, so there's no way it could have been a reflection. When I tried to duplicate the experience in the same car, nothing happened. I suppose it was this experience that has caused me to have a belief in a greater reality than we see in our everyday lives. Something else happened at that cemetery months later. Not quite as strange, but strange nonetheless. But this email has turned out longer than I intended it to, so perhaps I'll submit it another time. I've had a family member was buried at that cemetery since that time, and the experience has helped me to believe that perhaps some of them is still with us in some way. I would like to share the experience we've had, my husband and I, with the ghost of a dead boy. We had some pretty scary moments. A few years ago, we moved into our new home. An old lady had lived there for years and had passed away two years before shortly after she moved into an old people's home. The house had been left empty since she moved out. We were the first ones to move in. It was the beginning of springtime, so it was a little cold inside. As we turned on the central heating system, we heard a noise as if a kettle was whistling. We thought it was just a little dry, as it had not been used in the last two years. This was just the beginning. 
when you entered our house, you would see a hallway surrounded by the living room, bathroom, bedrooms, and closet with the central heating system inside. As time passed away, we did not take any notice of the heating system making noise. I must say, I felt kind of awkward when I passed the particular closet. Next thing happened was on our clock. The pendulum would stop at different times. I would give it a swing, and it would keep going for days. It happened many times, and looking back on it, our cats were always looking at things we weren't able to see, especially into the direction of the clock. Then our candles. We used to burn them every night at two places in our living room. We never had any problems with drafts, but suddenly, we noticed our candles were burning unsteadily. All these things happened in our living room, and we never thought anything of it, until one evening, the pendulum stopped, the candles started flickering, and a cold chill went through the room. The temperature dropped instantly, and suddenly, the noise from the central heating system didn't sound like a whistling kettle anymore, but like a stream drain running right through our living room. We looked at the TV, and suddenly, we saw the display changing numbers, and the screen turned to snow. It looked like it was trying to find a channel to display something we did not want to see. My husband rushed to the thermostat to turn it down, so the central heating would stop making noise. The TV went back to the channel we had been watching before, and everything went back to normal. Except for the two of us, we were scared to death, and we realized that something was haunting us. As we thought back at all the times the pendulum stopped, the noises from the central heating the uncomfortable feeling we got from that closet and the candles. Something or someone was trying to scare us out of our home. I told my husband that it was time to take some action or things could get worse. As we decided to go to bed, the central heating started whistling again. And as I passed the closet, I yelled at it, stop it and shut up. Believe it or not, it did stop. Believed as I was, I rushed into the bedroom to find a halogen lamp flickering heavily, and the whistling started again. I decided to take a run through the hallway, back into the living room, to turn the thermostat off, so the noise would stop. My husband was too scared to get out of bed, and I'll tell you, I wasn't happy either, but I managed to do so, and I was glad to return to bed, hiding under the sheets. The next day, I decided to call a psychic, called Jan who's well known for leading ghosts into another dimension with the help of his guide, Layla. Through Layla, he was told that a young man in his early 20s had been living here before we moved in. He had died, jumping or falling off a bridge in Rotterdam. We were never told his name, so we could not do any research on this guy. Layla led him into the light, and all went quiet and peaceful. We moved out of the house a few years later, and we're glad we never encountered anything like this again. It still gives me the creeps just thinking about it. Kind regards, and good luck with your website. I'm not sure if you'll understand my English, since it's been a while since I studied it. So if you have any questions, let me know. It happened when I was in my early teens. I think first... I should describe my room to you. It's the very smallest room in the whole apartment. The bed was placed, facing the door, and the piano was on the left side of the door. That day, my sister was sleeping in the room, on the floor. I don't know exactly what time this incident happened. All I know is that it was scary. So, I woke up in the middle of the night, opened my eyes to see a grim reaper with a scythe just standing there. His face was hidden under the hood, but the face under the hood was glaring with a very weird, greenish light. My body was paralyzed. The only parts of my body I still had control over were my eyes. Suddenly, he started laughing, but it was a silent laugh. The most unusual thing about this, though, was that I could still hear him laughing, even though it was silent. His laugh would be best described as something evil and demonic. It was just cruel. I closed my eyes because I couldn't look at it any longer. And if I did, my heart would have jumped out of my mouth. When I opened my eyes, he was gone. 
but I could still hear his laugh. It's weird that I fell asleep after that. After this incident, strange things started happening to me. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with my body stiff and be afraid of nothing, even if I was alone in the room. Or, I'd feel like something's trying to touch me. Having dreams about people I don't know, and they always tell me that they're dead. This happened some seven years ago, in 1996. The office building where I worked then used to be a hotel. I was told there were two ghosts in the building. One, on the seventh floor, was supposed to be the ghost of a murdered hotel maid, but no one could tell where or what the second one was supposed to be. I shared an office in the corner of the third floor, and my colleague and I would often look up from our work, expecting to see someone but there was never anyone there. We both felt that someone had walked through the office door, which we kept open for ventilation. An old office building such as this one did not have air conditioning. We talked about this and discovered that we each had this experience on several occasions. Sometimes we were alone, sometimes we were both in the office. We eventually decided that we must be hearing someone walk along the corridor past the office and after this, our imaginary visitor did not make their presence felt nearly so often. Then one morning, as I came back from the small area known as the tea bay, after making myself a coffee, I distinctly saw a man enter our office doorway. When I followed a few seconds later, there was only my colleague there. He insisted that no one had come through the door, and he said I must have been seeing someone going around the corner. I maintained that I had distinctly seen someone in the light coming from our doorway and that the corridor beyond our office was dark at that time because the lighting was being replaced. A few weeks later, I saw the same man going into the tea bay, which is no more than an alcove with a water heater, refrigerator, and cleaning facilities. And when I got there, it was empty. There was no way he could have come out again without passing me. There was no other exit. I told my colleagues. And they said, I must have seen someone going into either the men's or the women's toilets, which are on either side of the tea bay. I maintain that I saw someone going into the tea bay. If they had gone into the toilets, I would have heard the doors closing. There are none on the tea bay. Hello there. I've never thought of myself as being sensitive to paranormal things, but I've had too many experiences that I cannot explain easily. I would like to take this time and share two memorable experiences with you. Mind you, most of my experiences were feelings of not being alone, hairs on my neck rising, feelings of being watched, getting overwhelmed with sadness, hatred, and anger suddenly. I'm going to start off with my brush with the Martin House listed in the Haunted Places Index under Panama City, Florida, at the age of eight years. In 1978, it was owned by the paper mill company that was located across the street from the house. The Martin House sat on a huge amount of land and was surrounded by trees with moss hanging from them. There was a waterway running past the right of the house, looking at the front porch. The paper mill would rent this house out to various groups for parties. At the time, my father was in the Air Force, and his maintenance group rented out the house several times. I kind of felt safe on the lower floor and around the house grounds. I always made sure that my sister, seven years old and I, stayed with a group of people at all times. For the most part, kids were running all over the lower section of the house, and we had plenty of places to explore. We were told from the beginning not to go upstairs because it was not safe. A group of us, me included, decided to explore the upstairs area after we ate some food. I led the way up after the first five steps and stopped. I was looking at the top of the stairs and had the feeling of being watched by someone very bad. I let the boy behind me go first. We all started up the stairs and I stopped again, feeling very uneasy, couldn't seem to catch my breath. I was pushed out of the way by the other kids who went up the stairs. I went back down a ways until I was in the light that was shining from below and waited there still uneasy. 
Then the kids turned the screen and came running down the stairs with me in front and told their parents that a very scary man was staring at them. Our parents went up to look around and could not find anyone. We all got punished. Each time we went to find that house, I was always looking up at one set of windows overlooking the waterway. I felt like I was being watched by something. Last, the ankle grabber. I was 23 years old and visiting my sister in Marietta, Georgia. She lived in a two-bedroom apartment. The two bedrooms were located on the left side of the hallway with the bathroom right across the room. I would be staying in with my mom. This room had a faint nasty odor that got stronger towards the closet. My first two nights there in the room, I felt uneasy, like I was being watched, and fell asleep watching the closet door. I had a restless sleep, and I always woke up looking at the closet door. The third day, I helped my sister get some extra boxes put away in the closet. It smelled like rotting flesh. It was extremely cold and unpleasant being in there. My sister said that she had tried everything to get the smell out, but nothing worked. That night, my mom decided to sleep out in the living room. I fell asleep the same way, eyes on the closet. I suddenly woke up to the feeling of someone rubbing their thumb down the length of my right foot very hard. It then went into spasms. I looked around the bed, thinking it might have been my sister. Nothing, but that closet door was slightly opened, and it was not how I left it before I went to bed. I wasn't able to go to bed the rest of the night, and my daughter slept soundly. The next day was uneventful, except when my daughter was taking a nap. Strange sounds were coming from her baby monitor. I went down the hallway with a feeling of dread, and went into the room to look around. Nothing was out of place, and I even checked my daughter for marks. There were none, but I did take her out of the room to finish her nap in the living room. That night, I was hot and decided to sleep on top of the covers. Again, my mom slept in the living room. I placed my daughter's playpen in a safer part of the room. I slept in the middle of the bed with my right hand on the middle of the pillow. I woke up in terror when my ankle was grabbed and I was jerked six inches off of my pillow. My right leg was hanging off the end of the bed and my left leg was bent. I got up, picked up my daughter, and went to sleep in the living room. In the morning, I asked my mom about any unusual experiences in that room. She said she didn't have anything funny happen to her. Just then, my sister let me know that her former roommate had complained of hearing footsteps in the room when no one else was in there. The room, by the way, was carpeted, unusual sounds, bad smells, and being watched. I asked my sister to move out of her apartment. My daughter and I spent the rest of the visit sleeping in the living room. On the last day, I went into the room, threatened if it ever hurt my family members, I would be its worst nightmare when I died, and called it every dirty name in the book. I figured I'd take my chances and say it anyway, even if I sound ridiculous and yell at nothing. I would like to thank you for your time, and thank you most of all for allowing me to share my experiences with you. I know the paranormal can bring a lot of skepticism into this world, but I also know there are things you just can't explain. I believe in the paranormal. I believe in the things that go bump in the night, and I certainly won't dismiss something just because someone thinks it's something crazy that may not be existing. Keep an open mind. Don't be so dismissive, because you never know when something may lurk on you, and you never know when you're being watched. Here's kind of a creepy story. I go to school at Lalu, and my school, mind you, it is a private school. There have been a few suicides and drownings, we are on a lake, and other things such like that. Well, many students here have seen the Lalu ghost, and apparently, we have more than one haunting. One of my friend's sisters was being followed around by it, and one part of the school there are wooden steps, which makes lots of noise when you walk down them. She started to walk down them, and she heard loud footsteps behind her. She stopped. It stopped. She looked around. No one was there. So, she kept going, and the footsteps kept going. That, 
from what I heard, was the last time I know that the ghosts have been sighted, until two weeks ago. It was a late Thursday afternoon when my friends Kai, Clover, and Jess walked down to the Pine Room, which is basically our storage room and lost and found, to get a binder or something. When they went down there, Clover had stirred the feel of presence. Kai saw a flicker of light, and Jess saw the entire figure of what she could only explain as a ball of white light. All three of them just got what they needed and left, talking about this ghost. This is how I found out. I overheard them talking, and so did my friend, Jake. Jake is the most skeptical person I've ever met in my entire life. He doesn't even believe in luck. I had told Jake about this, and he basically laughed, and we went to go see Kai, who seems to be the resident expert on the occult here at Lalu, and find out what happened. Dave, who is also a skeptic, was laughing at her for saying this, and wanted to see it himself. Kai told all three of us not to go down there. It will just make him mad, and I trusted her, mainly because I believe in ghosts and the supernatural, and everything like that and I stayed, where Jake and Dave went down to the pine room to try to see it. They came back empty-handed and laughing. We talked a little bit more about the ghost and what it could potentially do to you if it was mad enough. Then, Jake and Adder decided to try again. By this time, about 10 other people found out and wanted to see it too. Everyone went down and everyone heard a loud bang, but nothing else. Then everyone went back up, but for some reason, Jake was called back downstairs. He was just inside of the door when he saw this ball of light light pass in front of him to the adjacent corner. Scared, he ran as fast as he could back up to where me and Kai were waiting. He told us of this story, and David overheard as well. So, being the idiot that he is, Dave went back down there and, yet again, didn't see anyone or anything. Dave then went to go see Clover, who was waiting in the stairwell down the hall to where we were at. We started to follow, slower than him, and about a halfway, we all had the same feeling as Dave Giuliano did in his story. The hairs on her arms sticking up and an uncomfortable constant shiver. At that time, in unison, we all asked, did you feel that? Then, the creepiest thing happened to me. A feeling of soft, very, very soft hands, almost like wind, only solid, ran across my arm. And later, I found out that every time that Jake had walked by that spot and that feeling happened, his legs started cramping up. We went to the stairwell and we talked with the two. Kai was shouting at Dave because it was challenging the ghost to its face. And then she moved over a little and both me and Jake saw it. We didn't see anything, really, but we knew it was there in its exact movements. Move over from the exact spot she was standing, right over to where Dave was squatting, and after David challenged the ghost again, we left. After all this, I found out from Kai that it was a different ghost, and that when Dave challenged it, she had saw it laughing. Within two days of this sighting, my friends Ben and Jamie were playing with the camera to use up the film, which only had three pictures left, and it was disposable. Ben's had looked through the viewfinder and saw a ball light behind Jamie and took the picture. They developed the film, and it was caught on film. Hi, I'm from Ireland, and I haven't seen many stories from here. Well, my experience started in 1997. I was 15 when we moved to the house. We moved to a little village in Wexford. Our new house is over 150 years old, but has been done up and looks modern. Anyway, about two weeks after moving into our new house, I was trying to go to sleep one night when I heard someone calling the name Martin. I shared a room with my younger sister at the time, and she was fast asleep. I was wide awake, and whoever was calling a name called it about five or six times. The next day, when I woke up, I went down to my parents and asked who lived in the house before us. 
They told me don't be stupid, and that I know. That I asked who lived in the house before the people we bought the house off of, and I was told a man's name, called Jimmy Martin, and his wife. At first I thought this was a coincidence, and I never said what happened the night before. I soon started to feel someone was watching me all the time, especially in the sitting room. It is hard to explain, but even though I could not see anything, I could tell you there was an old lady standing in front of the sitting room door, and this is where she always stands. I was afraid to go to sleep some nights, as one night, when I was laying in my bed, something kept hitting me on the back of my head, as if to try and wake me up. Well, I was wide awake, but I was too scared to look, as I was afraid of what I could see. Another night. I was just dozing off when someone decided to sit on the edge of my bed. This frightened the life out of me. I had kept all these experiences to myself as I thought if I told anyone, they would think I was mad. I had an ensuite in my room and one night, the toilet handle started going up and down by itself. Everything was getting to me, so after three years of keeping it all to myself, I started telling some of my friends what was happening to me. They thought it was scary and asked me what my parents thought. They couldn't understand why I wouldn't tell them, but I just said they would think I'm mad. Anyway, more stuff started happening, but nothing serious. I went out for a few drinks with my mom and one of their friends, and when the night was over, we all came back to my house and had a cup of tea and a chat. They got into the subjects of spirits and started talking about past experiences they had. I thought this would be a good opportunity for me to tell them about mine. I started with my sentence with, you're going to think I'm mad, but, and then I started to cry. I told them everything that was happening to me, and to my surprise, they had their own experiences. My dad was sitting in the sitting room one night, reading the newspaper, when a woman started whispering his name and started running her fingers down through his hair. My mom has heard them walk around upstairs and she could hear them call her name sometimes, and when she was in bed one night, it was like someone was blowing cold air into her ear. My brother woke me up one night because there was an argument going on in his room, and to his surprise, there was five spirits in his room bickering at each other. His room is across from mine. My mom and dad were annoyed with me because I never told them what was happening to me. We have two bedrooms upstairs and two downstairs, me and my sister used to share a room upstairs, but she has now moved out, and my brother, who has also slept upstairs, has moved out now, so I'm up there by myself, and some nights, I can feel there's someone there, and it would take me half the night to go to sleep, as I would be terrified, lying in my bed. I'm 21, and the eldest of four children. Now that my brother and one of my sisters have moved out, my little sister, 13, looks up to me, and likes to do stuff together. She's often asked me about my experiences, which are still happening today, but I won't tell her too much as it would frighten her. To end my story, I will tell you about a reading we held in our house. A man came to our house who could see spirits and he gave about 10 of us our readings. I was first to get mine done and as I sat down, the kitchen door opened. As I got up to shut it, the man told me to wait a minute he then told me that he is now, and that I should shut the door. This sent a shiver down my spine. He told my mother how I can sense spirits, and how a bad spirit entered the room with me. He said that he got rid of him, but there is a spirit that follows me around, but it's a good spirit, and this is the one that I can sense around me, all the time. He said that there are a few spirits in my house, but they're good, well except the bad one he got rid of. Well. That's my story, and it's going on today. The good news is, I've just learned to live with it in the sleepless nights at times. Hopefully I'll be the next to move, because the terror drives me mad sometimes. Thank you. First off, I'm 19 and have believed in ghosts my entire life. Now, I don't have a sixth sense, but I find it fun to discuss ghosts and all sorts of unexplained occurrences. I'm a pretty athletic guy and played football through high school 
and am pretty strong too. I can bench 280. I'm not saying this to sound like I'm bragging, just to say I'm not afraid of that much. What happened to me two summers ago left me pretty shaken. I was about 17 at the time and found out about a haunted church through my mother. She had gone when she was younger. Nothing happened, except she had a really weird feeling the whole time she was there. Well, finding ghosts fascinating. I wanted to go, but didn't want to go by myself, so I told my brother about it. We decided to go on a Saturday night. Maybe we'd have a story to tell at the parties. My brother at the time was 15, and he wanted to bring some friends along, so I agreed. Altogether, there were the five of us, me, my brother, my brother's friend, and two girls they wanted to impress. The layout of the church goes like this. The church is in the middle of a field, surrounded by woods. All around the church in sort of a U pattern are graves. The graves start a little ahead of the church and meet in back, forming the U. There is no space between the graves and church for a few people to walk. In front of the church is a stone wall about three feet high and two sensor trigger lights on each side of the stone wall. We parked in a little dirt parking lot right in front of the church and got out. Me, being the oldest and assumed the bravest, went over the wall first. As soon as my feet hit the ground on the other side of the fence, I got a really bad feeling and my hair stood on end. The first thing we did was go up to the front steps and hang out for the first couple of minutes. The thing that struck me was that there was no noise at all inside the wall, no crickets or anything, which is strange because it's surrounded by woods. Once we got bored of sitting around, we decided to go around back. That's when the really weird stuff started to happen. We were walking in a straight line because none of the younger kids wanted to be last. It was me, my brother's friend, the two girls, and my brother. That was the order from left to right. We were walking so that I was closest to the grave, and my brother was closest to the church. About halfway down the length of the church, we all heard a whooshing sound. My brother's friend and I to the left, and my brother and the two girls to the right, like we were being surrounded. Everyone asked each other if they heard the sound, and we all answered yes. After that noise, Mike, my brother's friend, and the two girls wanted to leave, but my brother and I convinced them to stay. Not that I wasn't scared, I just wanted to see more. I forgot to mention that me and my brother both had flashlights, which gets important. As we made our way to the back of the church, we all heard a loud hum, kind of like electric wires, but no one were around. This sound kept getting louder. Also, this went on through the whole entire time we were there, and probably would have scared us enough, if not for what happened next. At about the same time, I heard a noise. I saw a black ink blot, like shape moved from a grave to behind a bush. I tried to follow it with a flashlight, but it was too fast. However, Mike saw it move from that same bush to behind another tree. From that point, we would hear sounds and directions all around us, and when my flashlight or my brother's was aimed at the spot we heard the sound, we would just get a glimpse of a shape going back the way the light came to, too fast for us to follow it. Now, there had to be more than one of whatever they were, because as me and Mike were going through this on one side, my brother and the two girls were doing the same on the other side. All of a sudden, I heard my brother and the two girls scream. My brother is a pretty tough kid himself, and I never heard him scream like that in my entire life. Never mind the girls. When I turned to see what was wrong, the three were sprinting out of there at a very fast pace. When I heard them scream, I almost panicked, but got my nerves under control. Mike, however, took off like a world-class sprinter, leaving me by myself. Not wanting to be the only one there, I backpedaled as fast as I could, so I could see whatever it was, if it was coming after us. At this point, the humming was almost deafening, and that's when I got the impression that whatever was making the sound was coming closer at every very fast pace. At that same moment, my flashlight went dead, and then I did panic. I turned and ran faster than ever before in my life. When I reached the stone wall, I saw everyone else in the car waiting for me. I just jumped the stone wall. As soon as my feet landed, 
the flashlight went back on. The humming stopped. And I heard guess what? Crickets chirping. Also, all the feelings of fear I had disappeared, and everything was calm. I got in the car and asked what my brother and the girls had seen. They said it was the body of a little girl floating inside the second story window. At that time, the sensor lights went on, meaning something was coming towards the gate. Remembering the humming sound, I took off as fast as possible. There have been other stories about how people have seen the little girl, or heard her playing the flute, but none to the extent of ours. After this happened, I did a little research, and this is what I found. In the 70s, a man raped and murdered five young women, and buried them in the back of the graveyard, behind the church. I don't know where the little girl comes into the picture, but that is what everyone sees. Later, when I asked my brother, why a little girl scared them so much. He said the face looked mad, like it wanted us out, and he just got a bad feeling when he saw it. And this is the only ghostly experience, and hopefully the only bad one I'll ever have, and this story is 100% true. Hi, not sure if you are interested, but here's a couple of stories from the place I live in, in Tasmania. Australia. My boyfriend and I live in Daisy Cottage, an 1832 brick and stone house in Markey Street, South Hobart, Tasmania, Australia. Daisy Cottage was originally built as a nine-room hotel by an Irish stonemason. He built an almost identical house right next door for himself, which has been empty the entire time we have lived in Daisy Cottage. Legend has it that he witnessed the stabbing murder of the local policeman and testified against the killer in court. The killer was sentenced to lashings, followed by hanging death, and apparently it is he who haunts the house. Strange things have happened, but only one of us is in the house. The first thing happened to Chris, my boyfriend. He arrived home from work one day and checked the mailbox for an important letter that he was expecting. He took it out of the mailbox opened the front door, and headed upstairs to the bedroom to get changed. On the way, he started to open the letter. Once upstairs, he realized it was raining, so he put the partially open letter on the bed and went downstairs and out into the back courtyard to take the washing off the clothesline. Once he got back inside, he went back to open and read the letter, and it was not there. After about 30 minutes of searching, he called me out, out of frustration. I arrived home and helped him look for the letter, turning the house upside down. Eventually, I said, Are you sure you took it out of the letterbox? Maybe you should check. Sure enough, there it was, sitting in the letterbox, partially opened. Second strange thing happened two days ago. I was alone in the house, doing some painting. It was getting dark. So I turned on the hall, bathroom, dining room, and kitchen lights, and had not ventured upstairs at all. I finished, cleaned up, and started turning off all the lights, getting ready to leave, as we currently aren't staying there during the renovations. I got to the front door and realized that there were lights still on in the house. Every single light upstairs had been turned on. As I left, I noticed that there was a light on in the upstairs of the empty house, next door. The one thing that really got me though, as I was looking towards that house, I noticed some kind of print, like a handprint there. When I say handprint, I mean a floating hand. It was very faded, and then it just disappeared. Well, I guess he needed some light in the house. Thanks for reading. I've submitted a story on the site before, but since then, I've had another experience. So here it goes. I'm in my late teens, and during the summer, I stay home alone. One day around 11 a.m., I use the computer, and out in the hallway out of the corner of my eye, I saw a completely black figure, about six foot five inches tall, and very skinny. When I glimpsed around to make sure no one was in the house, the figure was gone. It happened to me about four more times over the next two weeks. 
I started calling them the shadow man. Then one day, when I was in the kitchen, I saw another shadow man. But this time, when I looked around my shoulder, a can of soup fell onto the floor, and the window was closed, and the cat was in the basement. Another moment, I was with my friends in the woods. Keep in mind, these are small woods, and there are never any hunters or trappers there. We were talking about ghost stories, and I told him about the shadow men. A minute later, we heard a rustling in the bushes, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw a shadow man. Then when I turned to catch a glimpse of it, it was gone. I asked my friends if they saw that, and one of them said yes, and the rest looked at me like I was crazy. I'm not sure if these are spirits or just an overactive imagination, but I usually don't imagine things like that. Since the experience in the woods, I haven't seen a shadow man since, but you never know. I could see one again sometime. Thanks for listening. My name is Kara, and I have another story I would like to share. This encounter, or whatever it's called, took place in the kitchen. It was about midnight, or one in the morning. My mother was asleep. I was on the computer, playing brain teasers or something, and my dog, Susie, a collie, was lying next to me in my chair. As I was playing my game, Susie started to make a noise in between a bark and a growl. I looked to see what she was staring at, and she was looking into the kitchen. Our house is little, but it's cozy. I couldn't see anything, so I took it as attention-seeking and hushed her. About ten minutes later, Susie was sitting in the corner directly across from where I sat, and she made a deep growling noise that was so unnatural to me, and she bared her teeth. Not at me, but towards the kitchen. I didn't want to look for I admit fear. I thought I would see someone like a burglar of some sort. I looked out of the corner of my eye, and that's when I saw a very, very large white dog. Looked like a wolf dog to me, because it was so large. It had eyes as blue as the sky, and fur as white as snow. It didn't look threatening but intimidating. It just laid there by the recycling bin and stared at me. Susie whimpered and caught my attention. I looked at the corner of my eye and the dog was gone. That night, everything was so still, quiet, freaky, the way nothing seemed to be able to move. Like a pause button had been invented to freeze the noise after the dog had vanished. I went to my room to lay down, but my room was piled with clothes, books, etc. So I decided to go to my mother's room to sleep, since her bed was a king size and clean. The time passed by as I laid there. 1.30, 2.30, 3.30 a.m., all the way to 4.30 a.m. I just stared at the wall with the background of my mother's snores. I glanced at my mom's door for a second, and there, perched on the door, was a dark cat figure. It had evil green eyes, fur as though I had caught the dark glistening of nighttime. I stared at it for no more than ten minutes. I rubbed my eyes. It was gone. It seemed as though someone played the sound button again, like the mute button wouldn't work. I looked out the window, on my left and I saw a cat crossing the street, and I decided to doze off. But something didn't seem right. It was like the temperature dropped 20 degrees in the room. I didn't like it, and neither did Susie. She sleeps at the foot of Mother's bed. She gave a very low growl and came over to lay next to me. I pet her for a minute and glanced at the hallway, and saw what appeared to be an overgrown house cat. I fell asleep ten minutes after that. I still don't know the connection between the dark cat figures and the white dog, but if you happen to know, I'd like to hear from you.
I had been reading through everyone's stories, and I decided that maybe I should go ahead and share one of my own. I'm 30 years old now. This happened when I was 4 years old. My parents and I were traveling to Oklahoma City to visit my mom's sister. Mind you, this is a short story, but definitely very eerie. Anyway, on the night before we arrived at my mom's home, we stayed the night at a hotel. My mother is not one to be inconvenienced. She needs her own space. So instead of staying in my aunt's house, she put in a stay at a cheap motel. My father obliged her. Now mind you, I did not know about what happened that night until I was about 15 because my mother was so freaked out about what happened that night that she did not tell me about it until then. Only then did it come out in conversation. She said that sometime during the night, while her and my father were asleep on one bed and I was asleep on the other, at about 3 or 4 in the a.m., I sat straight up and proceeded to scream. She said that my father tried to console me, but I would not stop. And the worst thing about it was, was that I did not sound like a small girl. She said I sounded like a grown woman in agony. After a second or two of my father trying to speak to me, to calm me down, nothing seemed to work, so he had no choice but to shake me violently. They said that I looked at them and laid back down like nothing even happened. Mom said her and her dad stayed up the rest of the night, and all was well. However, when we arrived at my aunt's house during dinner, my mother brought up the subject, and she explained to my aunt in detail what had happened. My mom said my aunt froze and looked across at my uncle. That was when she proceeded to tell me about the trench coat man. My mom asked, who was the trench coat man? She said last night, while she was sleeping, and while that incident was occurring with her daughter, she was awakened by a trench coat man, a dark figure in a trench coat, of course. He was just staring at her. My aunt then described the eyes that she saw. This man had crystals in his eyes, as if his eyes were so cold, like he didn't care about anybody. So this dark trench coat man, Blurred figure with glowing glacial eyes kept staring at her until he eventually disappeared five seconds after. That was when my aunt screamed and my uncle woke up asking what was the matter. Of course, that was when my aunt went on to explain seeing the presence of this man. After thinking long and hard about the incident, I'm able to conclude that this was a paranormal incident that occurred telepathically. I must have detected that something was wrong with my aunt, and I guess I was trying to scream to let someone know that something was wrong at the moment, even though I was not conscious and I had no idea what was going on at the moment. The real question I really like to know is, who was that trench coat man? What was he doing talking to my aunt? Or what did he want from her? I know a lot of people are gonna say this is a load of bull, and believe me, I really wish it was too, but the fact of the matter is, it actually happened. Ghosts are real, and you don't want to come face to face with them. This is just a collection of experiences I've had, and I don't know if they go together or make any sense at all. First was when I was about eight, and me and some of my friends were out in the backyard telling ghost stories. All of a sudden, we heard a deep voice slowly calling our names. It seemed to come from behind a shed in the backyard, and we all ran away from it. We ran into the house, and then calmed down, thinking it must have been my father. But then I realized my father was at work, and all of our neighbors were pretty up there in age, and I doubted they even knew our names. We were calming down in my room, when I looked out the window, and about 200 feet away in an empty field, I saw the outline of what seemed to be a man, but was totally black. But it was in the middle of the day. I couldn't even speak. I finally yelled as it was walking away, and I think when I yelled, it turned and looked back at me. 
I never saw it again. And even writing about this is bringing tears to my eyes. The other experiences I had were in the same room in my grandma's house. When I was young, I used to sometimes go to my grandmother's and stay for a weekend or a night. One night, I was sleeping and I got up half asleep in some sort of confusion of hearing something in the hallway. I looked down the hall and there seemed to be a shadow of a tall man against the curtains with moonlight shining through them. I wasn't scared like the first time, but I actually felt like this man was watching over me. And for some reason, I had a weird feeling it was my great grandfather. The other time, when I was about 16, I was actually living in that room because I had moved out of my parents' house temporarily. It was a typical night. I laid down to go to sleep, but was having some trouble. I finally started to get drowsy, and I rolled over onto my other side. And then out of nowhere, I hear my name whispered urgently into my ear. I even felt the air. I jumped up, and no one was there. I had the door closed, but my grandpa was somewhat of a jokester. So I thought maybe he was pulling a prank. So I got up and looked down the hall. And I saw him and my grandma in bed watching TV. He may be a prankster, but I doubt he can run that fast. I'm 18 now. And I haven't seen or heard anything weird since. But I also don't spend very much time at my grandma's house anymore. Thanks for reading. I've been pondering where to begin and which experiences to prioritize. I decided to begin at the beginning and submit separate accounts of my experiences chronologically. In other words, I've got many stories to share. I've read nearly half of the stories on this site, which is a really worthwhile form, and I hadn't realized that much of what I've brushed off, for whatever reason, is something that matters to others enough to write about. My experiences are not earth-shattering compared to what many have endured, but I think they're worthy of reading about. When I was about seven years old, my mother became involved with her friend's Jehovah's Witness study group. Now that I look back on it, I might want to mention that this was in the mid-70s, and my parents and those friends, a couple, were classic long-haired hippies, and they did their share of the stoner scene. My mother and Grace, her friend, were in a study group with Grace's mother-in-law, an all-older white-haired, straight-laced woman. They eventually ended up at our house to study, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Theory is this. My mother, who was raised strictly Catholic, was going to become a nun only to do as her grandmother, Granny, wished. They were very close, and my mother wanted to make Granny proud. That all went out the window when she met my father. She thinks that the opposing forces seemed very interested in having her on their side, kind of like vying for her soul. I know it sounds far out, but I kind of believe it from witnessing and experiencing the darker aspects of it as a result. She also had many, many, many things happen to her all of her life that make my story seem lame. It is prevalent on the maternal side of my family to have had experiences with the otherworldly beings. Anyway, shortly after my mother started fraternalizing with the study group, something sickening started to happen in our house. We had the fold-up, pull-down type of chairs to the attic in our living room ceiling. There was a door at the top of them, but it wasn't at the head of the stairs, as this area was open. Instead, for some reason, it was opposite. If one were to walk around to the back of the attic, open this door, and proceed through it, they'd fall into the living room through the opening in the ceiling. Well, this door started to be slammed with a force that shook the entire house. It scared the living hell out of us. It was really that horribly violent. My parents pulled down the stairs, and this door was ajar. They shut it. It kept happening often. They somehow tied the door shut by the knob. It still happened, but worse. 
The windows literally shook. Pull the stairs down. It was still tied shut. One day, during the late summer, the group was over at our house, doing whatever prayer stuff they do. My father was at work, and my older brother, Grace's kids, and I were playing outside. He heard screaming coming from inside the house. He ran inside to hear the attic door slamming beyond what any door should sound like. In this horrid, guttural growling noise coming from up there. It just sounded that awful that no one can convince me that whatever it happened to be was ever human. Everyone ran screaming out of the house to their cars and they were telling my mother to get us too and get out of that house. Well, we left for a little while but my mother decided we couldn't be homeless so we went home. Not my idea of a good time. It continued to happen usually lasting five or so minutes. It happened at least once a night. Well, my mother had an experience shortly after we had gone back to school. She claims that when she was home alone in the living room, with the windows open, the air just went silent. No birds chirping, no chipmunks, no locusts buzzing, nothing. We all lived in the country, away from any other houses. She said she started hearing the sound like a vacuum cleaner. It got louder and louder and seemed to pulsate. It filled the room, and the walls looked as if they were buckling and waving. She smelled this horrid, rotting stench, and she kind of knew she was in for something pretty awful. She ran into her room. I'd have run the hell out of the house and jumped into her bed. She pulled the covers over her head. She said she heard something walking slowly across the living room, towards her doorway, which was open. She was just praying, not daring to look. It sounded to her as if we were dragging a heavy cloak behind it, and it was breathing extremely heavy. It was nearly at her bed, and she was just about dying of fear when apparently our school bus pulled up and it dissipated. She'd apparently had enough. She took any religious materials she had brought into the house from the group, not including her Bible that she had gotten from Granny, which she kept, and burned it in the fire pit out back. I remember being upset when she took both my brothers and my books, which I guess you could say was like kids' versions of Bibles. They were small, pink, hardcover books, and they had pictures, and were easy to understand for me at that reading level. I absolutely loved to read, and it didn't matter what it was. I cried, but they got burned anyway. Well, I got over it soon, as nothing more of that nature ever happened at that house. It left as quickly as it came. It was evil. I strongly believed demonic, and it seemed like it was satisfied that my mother quit the group and burned the literature associated with it. It was not associated with the house. It came with a purpose, and left having achieved its goal. The only other thing I associate with this battle of good and evil of my mother happened when I was in seventh grade. I was trying to sleep, totally different house, but I swore my bed was shaking. I just figured I was being stupid, but it got worse. Still, I tried to dismiss it. It got bad enough to where I became scared crapless. I got up and went out to the living room, I startled my mother. She asked me what was wrong. I told her, and she got these big, weird-looking eyes, like she said she was spooked. She said, oh my god, I was just reading the Bible. She rarely opened it, for fear of bringing something on. Well, I was just fine with her not reading it, if it was going to target me to get to her. I just wanted to be left out of the whole thing. I know that probably sounds ignorant, but I truly felt it was demonic, and it scared me out of my mind. After what happened, I felt anything bad might just pop up at any time. Even though I'm not close to my mother, haven't spoken to my family in about 14 years, my heart does go out to her on whatever her spiritual fate is to be. She's not the best person, 
But she isn't inherently evil. Just a broken, miserable woman from years of abuse by both her father and my father. This experience added to my strength from any traditional religion. All I knew of Christianity was what my mother told us as kids and some of what I read in my pink Bible-like Bible book, and it wasn't much. I'd always had my own thoughts about the whole heaven and hell concept, but I was afraid of burning in this hell if I strayed from it. It just didn't sit right with me. It always scared me, including the concept of God. My concept of him was that he was very quick to punish anyone who had their own free thoughts and let people roast at the drop of a hat. I always felt spirituality shouldn't be a frightening experience, but I didn't have the hair on my butt when I was young to explore my inner beliefs. I was never baptized, and I suppose I'm pagan, if anything. It's confusing, but as much as I don't adhere to the whole Bible concept, I can't dismiss it for others. To end this story, I just want to thank you for taking the time to glimpse into my reality. I also have to acknowledge that some of you may have thought that much of it was due to my parents' use of weed, but myself and all of the others didn't imagine something so wretched. Rest assured, ladies of the study group wouldn't have been altered. The very last noteworthy thing of my mentioning in accordance to the subject is that I did later independently and most unwillingly encountered another demon-like thing when I was 19. Yes, quite another story. Please tune in. I've experienced quite a bit throughout my life when it comes to the paranormal, and it all started at my old childhood house. It was a three-bedroom, one-bathroom home in Garden Grove, California. If you were to drive by and look at this house, it's cute, and it's a little home in a good environment. However, the things I've experienced sparked my interest and curiosity about the afterlife. Everything in every room in the house felt awkward whenever I walked into it. I shared the middle bedroom with my younger brother, who was only four at the time. Once a month, I would have a nightmare of a girl sitting on her picket fence with red eyes aglow, staring at me with such a playful expression. She didn't seem happy that her family was there. Nonetheless, us kids. The strange part about that was, whenever I would have these awful dreams, I would wake up to find my little brother crying as if someone had really hurt him. I never really took the nightmare seriously, though. We had an old, rusty swing set that we loved so much. I was only 10 at the time. During the daytime, everything would be fine, and no strange feelings would occur. However, once nighttime falls, our backyard would be off limits. My mom wouldn't let us go to the back and play on summer nights, and she, well, never told us why. One night... My mom forgot to turn off the water hose, so she kindly asked me if I would do it for her. The idea of it was already bothering me, but I didn't take anything paranormal into consideration. So, I went down, straight to the back of the house, and the walk there felt like eternity itself. I had a strong, eerie feeling that I was being watched and even followed. I bent down to turn off the hose, and had a fear so strong that it made me tear up. I ran into the house and swore never to do the favor for my mother again. What made this incident particularly eerie was the fact that I swear I heard a sobbing. It was like in my mind, but I swear it was outside. In another awkward time, my mom was taking a shower, and I was in my room watching TV with my little brother. I heard her call my name, so I came to see what she wanted. She asked if I could go to the towel cabinet and grab her one. When I did, I walked up to the door in pure darkness, and I swear I saw a ghostly hand, but it was still a woman's hand with red fingernails. 
I immediately thought it was my mom's hand at first. The strange thing was, it was translucent. Like I said, a ghostly hand. But I mean, you could see right through this person's hand. So, naive as I was, I thought I said mom, and instinctively handed her the towel. The towel dropped to the ground, and the hand disappeared. My mom then opened the door and looked at me, saying, Barbara, what are you doing, honey? That's when I told her I was giving you the towel you wanted. My mom looked at me with such confusion and said, You know I was in the kitchen, right? When I look back at that instance, I know it terrifies me now. But at that moment, I was simply not afraid. I just chalked it up to something non-paranormal. And maybe my eyes were just playing tricks on me. But at that moment, it was pretty obvious that I was both hearing and seeing things come to life. Paranormal things at that. There was much more that went on in that house. Such as, if you are sitting in the living room watching TV, at the corner of your eye, you will see a dark figure walking up to the front door. Immediately, you would assume someone was here. So, you trot over to the door to find that no one is there. It happens almost every week to everyone in my family. I love that house, but I didn't love being followed or the feeling of being watched while taking a bath. After spending most of my childhood in that house, we moved to another city nearby. Now this house is quite dramatic. I'm 19 years old now, and I lived in Georgia for three years to finish up school. Coming back, strange activities started happening, especially in my new room. My grandfather passed away three years ago, and my room used to be his room. At night, Getting home from my boyfriend's house, I would hear the floor creaking. I just assumed there was someone walking around, but to find that no one was out there at all. I remember one night, laying on my bed with the lights out and just the TV glaring. I fell asleep and woke up to see a pair of transparent, veiny legs pointing in my direction. I knew immediately who they belonged to. Grandpa. Grandpa was watching over me, and that didn't, and still doesn't scare me. But, there's another presence in the house. A girl, I assume. I came one night from staying at my boyfriend's the previous night. I left the door open, because I was planning on changing and going to say hi to my parents. While changing, I have a habit of looking at the door to see if anyone will walk by and see me change. So, I looked a few times, and when I looked the last time, at the right side of my door, I swear I saw the apparition of a girl, her bright blue eyes, glowing and bulging right at me through the crack of the door. The eyes then disappeared. I trotted to the door, looked to my right, and nobody was there. Just then, it was my teenage cousin, Diane. But I looked towards the left, the left side of the hallway, and there she was. I was absolutely freaked out in that moment. Well, those were some documented instances of my family's paranormal history. I hope for future sake that I never have to experience any of this again. Even though the first few incidences weren't that scary, and even my grandpa incident, yeah, I wasn't scared. However, if it were any kind of other ghost, like the one I was just talking about, I might be a little bit more frightened. I'd like to refer to this haunting as the haunting in Duxbury, Vermont. We bought the house from the niece of Leo Morse, in the fall of 1999, Leo lived here his entire life. Shortly after we moved in, we heard strange footsteps on the second floor when we knew no one was up there. During one such incident, my husband, myself, my two children, 
and a couple friends heard someone walking across the floor in the upstairs bedroom as we all stood in the living room below. One night, when I was taking a bath and was lying back in the tub with my eyes closed, I suddenly felt very uneasy, like someone was staring at me. I looked behind me to where the door was and saw this transparent mist, and it disappeared. Within a second, the door creaked open just an inch, and I screamed my head off. My son, while still in high school, had similar experiences of being watched by someone who couldn't be seen. Our television has also turned on by itself on more than one occasion. Our channels have changed, with the remote sitting out of everyone's reach. In the fall of 2007, my husband had just walked upstairs to go to our bedroom when I heard him hollering at someone and asking him what he wanted. We all ran upstairs to where my husband stood in the doorway to our bedroom. He was staring at the back wall of the other bedroom, pointing to no one and yelling, tears in his eyes, for someone who no one else could see to get out. This lasted for several minutes. Until the man, who my husband said was in his early 30s, brown hair, clean shaven with round, wire frame glasses, dressed in a flannel shirt and blue jeans with the bottoms of the legs rolled into cuffs, disappeared. It was a very restless night that night, and my husband, who is not drunk or on drugs and isn't prone to hallucinations, doesn't like to talk about it much, but is very adamant that it truly happened. We haven't had any more sightings since then, but I still hear footsteps and unexplainable bangs and thumps coming from upstairs every morning after I get up, and I know my husband is still sound asleep in our room. My name is Andrea. I'm from New Mexico, and I'm 17. I've had numerous experiences throughout my life with the paranormal. I'll start from the beginning, I suppose. Before moving to Deming back in 2000, I lived in Hatch, which is about an hour away. We used to live in what was called the White Brick House, near the park, and not even a half mile from the schools. Hatch is very small. Anyway, living in the house was my mom. My very abusive dad, who I call Alex, I don't even call him dad. My two-year-old sisters, and my older brother, and me, the youngest. I don't remember the experiences in any specific order, but I remember them as if they happened yesterday. They are all very true, believe if you want. We had a certain room called the back bedroom that no one really liked to go to, at least not alone. This room had an extremely strong presence in it, and it was only when you entered it, you could feel its presence. You could stand in the doorway and look in the bedroom and feel nothing, but as soon as you stepped, that all changed. You feel like you're being watched by one great evil spirit, or a great number of evil spirits. You would have to leave. It was so uncomfortable. We couldn't even get any of the dogs that we had throughout the time we lived there to enter that room. While there was that room, there was also other things that happened in the rest of the house. One night, my mom swears up and down this happened, and so does Alex. They were getting along. The rare occasion, I love these nights. My mom put all four of us to bed, so her and Alex had some alone time and were relaxing together in the spa, talking one night. In the middle of their conversation, both my mom and Alex saw the shadow of someone walk past the doorway of the spa room. My mom thought it was one of us that had gotten up in the night and went to check in on us, only to find us all snoring in bed. Her and Alex then asked us the next morning if we had gotten up, and none of us had. Another time, me and my oldest sister were playing in what we called the second kitchen that had a room off called the craft room. My mom paints ornaments in there. We suddenly smelled a strong perfume that didn't smell like any perfume made today. 
Then we heard a conversation between maybe four or five people. We looked in and saw five older upper class people in clothes from the early 1900s time. I remember one man specifically. He was bald with a brown beard and a looking glass eyepiece like the rich people would wear back in the day. He was wearing a black penguin tailed suit with a white button up underneath. He looked somewhat pale but not very transparent. He turned his head slowly and looked straight at me, not my sister, and nodded his head. Shortly after, he continued to speak with his company. I ran to my room and stayed there for the rest of the day. We had an organ in the living room, along with a drum set and Alex's guitars. We we're all musicians. Amps would turn on, even when they were unplugged. The organ played as though a very experienced pianist were playing it. Piano was one thing none of us really learned how to play, so it was obvious none of us was playing it. There were times when the dogs would follow something we couldn't see down the hallway to my room and Alex's room. My older brothers one night got up to get a drink of water in the second kitchen, and that's where the laundry room also was. He's 22 years old now, and still swears this is true. He saw a tall figure standing by the washer and dryer near the back bedroom, and he felt it as an evil being. It just stood there, glaring at him, but never moved, as if it was frozen, but with the evil expression looking at him wherever he moved. He figured it was Alex. He shouted out Alex's name, but didn't hear a response, so he figured he was mad and went back to bed. The next morning, he asked Alex why he was so mad at him. Alex just looked at him and said he was at the bar. My other sister said she was walking by the back bedroom one night and swear she saw a black figure out of the corner of her eye standing straight up against the wall and it tried to grab her with its arms but couldn't reach as if it was restrained. After Alex left, we moved out of the house and into a little apartment. There's only been one thing that has ever happened to me there. I got up in the middle of the night to get something to drink, and as I was going back to my room, I saw what looked like a little blue orb glowing in intense blue. It moved around for a few minutes before ultimately dissipating into thin air. Aside from these apartments we lived in, we also moved into a trailer not too far from the white brick house. This house was always said to be haunted, because the man who used to live there died of a heart attack in either the yard or the bathtub, and he had two dogs that died of mysterious causes after he did. It was almost as if they died of a broken heart. There would be nights when we could hear the clicking sounds of a dog's nail on the tiles. I was in my room reading one night, when my whole dresser just fell over. No reason for it just to fall over. My friend and I, Rosario, and my sister, we were all in the living room one night, when we heard a window shatter come from my room. We never found a single shard of broken glass in the house, or even outside, even though the sound came from inside. Finally, I would always see the shadow of someone walk into the laundry room, and no one would be there when I looked. All of these incidents were fairly alarming to all of us, and I'm convinced that they were being followed by the same evil spirit that resided in the red brick house. These days, I never experienced any hauntings, and I'm very glad that this is all over. In the fall of 2001, my parents bought an old Victorian house in a quiet suburb. It was a huge relief for us, because that year was a very tumultuous time for our family. We couldn't find a house that was affordable, and nearly every house we found in the area was either in need of major repairs or super expensive. When we moved into this home, there had been mumblings around town that nobody wanted it due to its supposed hauntings. By the way, I'm 21. The house had a history of violence and death, 
city is very safe now, but years ago, it was considered one of the worst cities to live in. It was said that a man who had lived his entire life as a loner took up residence in the house in the early 1920s. One night, he apparently hired a prostitute to stay the night with him. She was unaware that he had no money to pay her for her services. He led her into the kitchen, playing off that he had some spare cash lying around the house. He ultimately ended up strangling her to death and chopping up her body. She was apprehended months later and ended up dying in prison. When the cops questioned him, all he could say was that he needed love. In the first months, we had stereotypical noises that any house would make and dismissed it as nothing more than just noises. However, doors would open and close, lights would flicker on and off, and there was this funky odor that always seemed to linger throughout the house. It was very hard to describe, but it smelled a lot like rotten eggs on a very subtle level. The most terrifying thing that occurred was when I was in the kitchen in the middle of the night. It was about 11 p.m., and I'd just come home from work and entered the front hallway of the house at first. That's when I heard whispers, which sounded like the word lonely. I figured I was just exhausted from a long day's labor, so I decided I needed to get to bed. But before I did, I fixed myself something to eat in the kitchen. I walked into the kitchen, but that's when I heard moaning sounds, almost like someone was struggling. As I sat on the chair by the kitchen table, I saw the transparent figure of a woman with an anguished look on her face. She appeared for a few moments, then disappeared. She looked like she was from another era and wore all black. Her face looked disfigured and beaten. It terrified the living hell out of me, so I ran upstairs to get my parents. I guess I just needed some comforting, and I found out they weren't home yet. There were other incidents that occurred in the house. My mom actually told me that she was in the laundry room when she could distinctly hear the sounds of a growling man in the laundry room late at night. This was something that seemed to happen quite frequently around the same time and always only in the laundry room, nowhere else. It was never something really loud and startling. It was always faint, but insanely scary. There were times that we would see two shadows in the corner of our eyes, constantly walk back and forth from the kitchen to the living room. Again, this was subtle. When anybody would actually turn to directly look, these shadows would be gone. Most of the time, we always thought it was just our eyes playing tricks on us. And even after my incident, I still thought that. Anyway, that's my story. It might not be too exciting compared to others, but it is creepy and insane. I'm glad I don't live in that house anymore. Sadly, my parents still do, but it seemed that nothing happens anymore, besides the subtle doors creaking open slowly from time to time, and the continuation of lights flickering. Thanks for reading. My family and I took a trip to Tennessee in the summer of 08. We went all over the place, such as Jackson and Nashville, on our second to last day before we left to go home. My family decided to go to Franklin because we had picked up a brochure of haunted places in Tennessee, and so we went to humor me because I was interested in hauntings at the time. This city, not known to most people, is actually the site of the bloodiest battle of the Civil War even worse than Gettysburg. There are two houses that were the main sites. One of them was the Carnton Plantation, which is the setting to my story. The plantation was creepy enough when we drove up to it without even knowing the history. When I got out of the car, I looked up at the house and noted how beautiful it was. Then my attention was averted to the balcony on the second floor. There, Standing on it was a man. He was clearly dressed in a Civil War uniform, though I quite can't remember which color, and I could clearly see that he had a beard covering his jawline. 
He stood there with his arms behind him, as if he was gazing out, overlooking troops. Of course, at the time, not knowing any of the history, I thought it was just the tour guide taking a break out on the balcony. I even hoped he was going to be my family's guide. Later, once we're on the tour, I noticed that none of the employees were dressed like 19th century citizens. Of course, then we got the history of the place, and I understood why this place was considered haunted. When the battle itself was both going on, and when it was over, injured soldiers were treated inside of the house. So many, in fact, that there are stains of blood inside of the house that will not come out of the floor. Many soldiers obviously died inside of the house. When we continued our tour upstairs, we entered a room with a door to the balcony. This is where I learned that no one was allowed out on the balcony. This confused me since I'd seen that man out there. When the guide took the group into the room across the hall and began talking, I couldn't pay attention. The closet in the other room kept grabbing my attention because it had a piece of black cloth in it. Finally, I tried to keep myself focused, and it was going well, until a gentleman in the group got bored and decided to go out into the hall. I watched him leave, thinking that it was very rude and should come back. For some reason, when he left, I noted that the sun was in a position that didn't cast a shadow of the man's head on the hallway wall. Once again, I turned my attention back to the guide. But the man in the hallway began to wander in the hall, and that distracted me. When I turned to watch the man, there was suddenly a very clear, indefined silhouette of a man's head and shoulders with a bearded face that traveled across the wall, then just disappeared. It startled me at first, then I got excited because I thought I must have seen a ghost. Then I thought, no, I have to be practical about this because that man is out in the hallway. Once the tour guide was done talking, I went outside into the hallway way. The first thing I noticed was that any shadow from the tourists on the wall wasn't that dark or defined. Then I noticed that the way the sun was facing caused the shadows to be cast in a completely different wall. The silhouette I saw couldn't have been from anyone on the tour. Then I noticed that there was an upstairs where I thought maybe an employee could be working. That theory was completely dismissed when it appeared no one was up there. There wasn't any logical explanations for the silhouette. It wasn't until my family returned home a few days later that I decided to research what I had seen. After discovering that there was a frequent spirit there that was called the General, I made the connection. The details from past eyewitness accounts were identical to mine. He stands out on the porch, has a Civil War uniform on, and has a beard on his face. I was, and still am convinced, that I saw the general on that day. This took place shortly after I turned 16. My dad was working up in Oregon and Washington but was based out of Rainier. I went up to live with him, I guess, just to do something different. I was used to being around the city type of atmosphere, and it wasn't too long before I grew bored. Not that the Oregon country girls in the area didn't stir my blood. It's just that they mainly wanted to waste their time getting high or drunk, tipping cows, or shooting the passing ships going down the Columbia River, which I don't mind. I just missed the city lights or something. Anywho, I'd been out partying with a friend and drove off the side of a mountain. Another story, which would take a while to go through, and I thought my dad was probably going to kill me anyway, without benefit of blindfold and a last smoke, so I decided to hitchhike back to Oklahoma. Needless to say, I lacked the understanding of just how far I was from Oklahoma. My newfound compadre decided to go along because he had gotten in recent trouble with his folks and wanted out of town too, so we took off. Somewhere between Portland and the Dells on I-84, which was only a two-lane at that spot, 
we were really tired and looking for a place to sleep. By this time, I'd found out that this hitchhiking thing wasn't for me, and it really should be called a lot of hiking and not enough hitching, or something similar. And what seemed weird was that out in the middle of nowhere, the fences were really well kept, and I didn't want to get cut up climbing one. No houses, no anything. It was simply just nice fences. Anyway, we found a rather peevish looking fence about three fourths of a mile before a bend in the road. The moon was out and actually lit up the area pretty well. There was about three fourths of a mile behind us from the last turn in the road, and like I said, about the same in front of us before the next one. We were in a valley or whatever they're called that the road went through, and it was really a beautiful sight. Just as we were fixing the jump the fence, a car came around the bench from in front. Of course it was too far off to see us when it rounded the bend, but we didn't want it to see us climbing the fence when it came abreast of us, like the owners of the land are out cruising in the middle of the night. The sides of the road in that area sloped down at a very sharp right and were gravel, at least on our side of the road, so we didn't have to go far to be below the grade of the road and out of sight of passing motorists. It went down probably 15 feet though, well below the road. Come to think of it, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like that since. Just as we were sliding down the slope out of sight, I caught sight of something way down the road, just the side of the curve. The lights of the oncoming car caught it, just as it was making the curve. Whatever it was, went down the embankment on the opposite side of the road from us. I asked my friend if he saw it, and he said yes, he saw something. After the car passed, we peeked over the top of the road, and right when we started to climb back onto the roadway, because we decided we didn't want to sleep in that area anyway. We saw what appeared to be two guys pushing a motorbike climb up where we saw it go off before. This was still about three fourths of a mile at least off, down the hill near the curve. We slid back down the slope, out of sight. I really don't know why. Then we kind of just looked at each other. A motorbike? We both looked at the incline behind us. If you pushed a motorbike off the side of the road down this embankment, you'd have a heck of a time stopping it before it went all the way down, and the river was on their side, and even a harder time getting back up. I couldn't imagine trying to get it back up to the road, assuming it didn't go into the river. We both peeked over the top, breathing really quiet and shallow, watching for another couple of minutes, when all of a sudden, it stood up. It wasn't two guys pushing a motorbike, it was something that had been on all fours, and stood up, and it was huge, at least twice as tall as us, and by the way, we weren't midgets. I almost crapped myself. I started looking around, and the fence, by this time, was looking mighty small. Thinking really fast in that fight or flight mode, and the flight was definitely the way I was leaning towards. I realized that, thank god it had been his turn to carry the backpack, which would slow him down and had the only food we had in it, and on top of that, I thought I could outrun him. Maybe it wouldn't want both of us. I looked at him, saw the panic in his eyes, and knew he was thinking along the same lines. I knew I couldn't run. I also knew that I had the senseless when it got directly across from us. I pulled out my little pocket knife. I knew that we're going to die, and all I could think of was, Lord, please let it be quick. I peeked over the top again, and it was almost even with us. I might have whimpered, silently of course, but I also noticed that the wind was blowing in my face from his direction. There might be hope. We ducked back down. And we could hear it almost stop right across from us for a moment or two, then start on up the road again. It was almost the curve up the hill from us from the direction we had originally came from, when another car came around the bend downhill. 
I thought about jumping out in front of it and yelling for help, but if it didn't stop, then whatever that was would know that we were there. We waited, and it disappeared below the other side of the road, like before when the other car came. This time, it didn't come back up. I don't know how long we waited, but we finally climbed back up and continued down the hill and around the curve. We didn't say a word or breath, anything about a whisper, till we cleared that bend in the road and was a mile or two away. When we called the Dallas, we called our parents to come and get us. We'd had enough of the open road in Oregon. I don't know what that was, but I still think about it sometimes. I've had a few other things happen to me in my life, but that really scared me. My boyfriend and I saw the state park on our way from Arkansas to Illinois and thought we should check it out. We had never heard of this place or even seen it before. We parked in the parking area and got out of the car to explore the woods. Naturally, I had to use the restroom, so I went to the bathroom and once I got to the toilet, I had a terrible feeling of being watched and I truly felt like someone was in the bathroom with me, but obviously, I was the only one. The feeling of this presence was so unbearing and evil that I ran out of the bathroom the second I finished with my pants down. Once I got out of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I started down the path. Within 30 seconds of walking and still within 30 feet of the bathroom, my boyfriend and I heard a loud footstep crunching the leaves. In fact, it was multiple footsteps. My boyfriend thought it was a bear or something because of the heftiness of the steps, so he was searching and searching for a bear or anything, but he couldn't find a thing. I didn't mention the bathroom to him, but after not too long, I insisted we continue. I know there is something terribly evil in that bathroom. For a while, nothing else odd occurred and we continued on the path which goes down to level ground with a large lake on one side. But soon after we got to this level ground area, the sun started settling, and that's when things got uneasy again. We both started to hear something large walking in the leaves again. Sean, my boyfriend, really wanted to see what it was, and at this point, I felt like we were really in danger, and that something else unnatural was there, so we barely started to move farther into the woods when Sean told me he saw a shadow or something farther in. Then, I was done. I told him we had to go, and I cannot be here any longer. So, I ran like hell back to the car, and Sean was close behind me. Once we got to the car, I was at the passenger door, ready for him to unlock it, and of course, he tells me that he hears that thing we've been hearing in the sparsely wooded area directly in front of the parking lot, which is to the very right near the parking lot, and that he has to see what it is. So, I had him throw me the keys, and I got in the car. He got in within a minute, and I asked him if he saw anything, and he said he just saw that a dark shadow move behind a tree, but nothing else. Needless to say, we booked it off that mountain, and it really seemed like a car was trying to chase us down the mountain, but we may have just been super spooked from the woods experience we just had, but I will note, we were driving at about 65 miles an hour, and the speed limit was way less. I forget now it was specifically, but I want to say between 30 and 40 max, plus, it was a mountain road, and very windy, and frankly, difficult to traverse at 65. Also, during the time I was taking pictures, the whole time we were in the woods, nature shots, that was actually the entire reason we were there in the first place, and the pictures were neat. The day ones didn't have orbs, but the night ones all did, and I thought maybe it was from the lake reflection or something, but I took a picture out of the car window at the moon, right after we got in the car, and in that photo, there's the moon 
in like 30 orbs. It's amazing to me. I mean, I've never taken any orb photo ever before. And I took another photo of the moon out my window about 30 minutes after we left the mountain and only the moon. I did some research to find anything on the area. It seems it was established in an old Indian burial ground, but few findings on much else, and I never found anything on cars chasing you out of this place. Be careful. During the day, the bathroom is really the worst part, and seemingly off the trail, but I just wouldn't go at night. And also, Sean didn't seem to have the feelings as intensely as I did, so if you're the right person, the feeling might not be too overwhelming. I was thinking about my dog last night, as he was put away a few years ago, and the immediate remembrance of a very weird experience me and my dog had in my home, in Tallahassee. This home, prior to any construction behind us, was all wooded landscape and ran into Lake Jackson. Within this wooden area were several Indian burial mounds. One day, shortly after I moved there for a new job, I took my dog for a walk, unleashed, back in the woods. I saw those mounds, but really did not know that they were Indian burial mounds. My dog and I both walked over these mounds just being adventurers. When I returned from our walk, my neighbor asked me jokingly if I let my dog run loose back there, and my response was yes. He then stated that I would see a black bird perched somewhere soon in a tree close by and that this bird would be watching me. I laughingly asked why, and he said that if we walked over those mounds, we would have possibly wakened the spirits, and that the bird was their watchful eye on me. Well, of course I thought this man was crazy, but he was actually a very nice and intelligent man as I learned later. So only about two days later, I returned home from work, and I recall thinking about the black bird Betty told me. So I peeked around the left side of the home to look into the wooded area, and lo and behold, there was a blackbird perched on a tree, staring at me. He would not take his eyes off either. Needless to say, that was creepy. So that very night, I was in my office, and my dog was usually laying in the living room by the fireplace. As I was doing my work in the office, my office chair was budged about two to three inches forward with a force that felt like someone actually pushed the chair. I instinctively reached by, looking over my right side, expecting to see my dog. No dog, nothing. So I quickly went into the living room, only to see my dog laying down facing the hallway entrance, which is where my office resided, as well as two other bedrooms and he had his head between his paws, staring and growling at something in the hallway. Talk about getting freaked out. So I grabbed my dog by his collar and tried to lead him down into the hallway, and he resisted every attempt. He was scared, obviously, and he definitely saw or sensed something. I did not see anything at all. As I walked into each room through that hallway, I did not see or sense anything. Then I walked into the bathroom in the master bedroom to find that my candle, which was lit, went out. So that night, I kept all lights on. The following day I came home and looked again for that weird bird. He was not there. So I took my dog outside to do his thing, but then noticed he was limping. Then he fell to his side with pain in the backyard. As I made the observation, I noticed that in his groin area, he had a large tumor-like bulge coming from this area. I immediately took him to the veterinarian, and I recall she had no explanation for it, but prescribed medication to reduce the swelling. Within two weeks or so, the swelling went away. Looking back at that, I really feel that the spirit, or whatever it was, made that happen as my dog was still young and very healthy. After that week of weird occurrences, I never had anything further happen. I never told my neighbor what had happened, 
as I did not want to look silly or have rumors flying around. But for sure, I can tell you that I know in my own gut that what that neighbor told me came to life. Dogs can definitely sense or see these spirits, as we cannot apparently. Between the bird, the bump on my chair, my dog growling and acting scared, and the bulge in his groin area, all made sense that something was in that house. Never walked in those woods again. I no longer reside there either. This is a ghost, entity, evil demon spirit, and whatever else was haunting our home I can tell you. I will never forget what happened as long as I breathe air. We moved into this big house when I was 15. It had been empty for about 10 years. It had old, creaky wood floors and a ton of doors. Everywhere you turned in the house, there was a door. Don't ask, I still can't figure it out. It was a doctor's house. In the very back of the house is where he saw his patients. Yes, some died in the house in his office. Both my grandparents also died there. The very first thought we had activity, about 3 a.m. in the morning, there was someone banging on our front door. My grandfather would get up, and no one would be there. This happened all the time. We'd drop our car keys in the glass bowl right when we walked in, and they would be in a different part of the house. Things were always showing up all over the house. It likes to play tricks all the time. So many things happened, I can hardly recall them. All but this one I will never forget in my life. I would love to forget it, but it just won't go away. I was 20 years old and just had a baby. I had my daughter in a bassinet beside my bed. I fell asleep watching Michael Jordan play basketball in the Olympics. My bed had a tall headboard that sat up against my bedroom window. I also had floor to ceiling curtains, very heavy curtains. The windows were shut, the curtains were shut too. I was sleeping on my back as I fell asleep to the TV. The TV was still on and the baby was fast asleep. All of a sudden, I felt a strong man's hand covering my whole face. He was trying to suffocate me. I was in panic mode. His grip on my face and nose was so tight that I couldn't breathe or scream. I was looking up at the ceiling thinking I'm gonna die, right there, right now. It seemed like an eternity, and I was losing my breath. Then, the phone beside my bed rang. It stopped. I jumped so far out of the bed across the room and looked back thinking I was fighting off an intruder, and no one was there. I looked out the window. Nothing. I looked in the mirror, and I had a bright red handprint on my face. It was evil. It was an evil something. I was praying out loud for whatever it was to get the hell out of my house and leave me alone. I've never been that terrified in my life. Never. I looked out the window, and it was pitch black. I got the feeling like something was out there laughing at me, or mocking me. The baby never woke up. It was her father on the phone. I told him what happened, but he thought it was a dream. I know from the start it was as real as I'm sitting here telling you today. Not long after that, my grandmother and grandfather died in the house on two separate occasions. I was left in this huge house all alone with my two children. They were one and just months old. The house was always freezing, no matter how high the heat was on. I would hear talking that I could never make out. Footsteps up and down the hallway, pinching, grabbing. The lights never worked. I changed the bulbs all the time. When I did the laundry where the old doctor's office used to be, I could feel a breath on my neck. I could see shadows of people out of the corner of my eye. It was a living nightmare. The energy was so thick and heavy, even on the brightest day. I was scared to death to be there alone 
and go home after work alone. I would just sit up with the TV on until I could fall asleep and pray to God that I didn't have to go to pee in the night. I was so scared to get up. The day I moved from that house was the happiest day of my life. I could have stayed there forever in that big house, but I wanted out. I still to this day 19 years later have vivid dreams of what happened. All the things I heard and all the things I saw. I've only told a few people this story. I've seen and felt both good and evil from a very, very young age. My nanny told me I had the gift of seeing and hearing spirits, like I was a light to them. I've had so many experiences I can't count. Most are very bad, but I have a couple that are good. I'm terrified of the afterlife. I pray that God carries me to heaven. If you don't believe, I'm telling you, there are things you can't see, but they can hurt you and make you so depressed you want to die. They can touch you, hurt you, and mock you, and laugh in your face. I know. Here's my story. It will be interesting to see what everyone else thinks of all this. I was at a friend's house listening to music tonight, Saturday, April 12th. He is a drinker, so he was feeling pretty good. He was at the computer with his back to me. I was on the couch directly in front of the TV, which was off. The only light on was right above the computer desk. To my right was the entryway which was dark, pitch black actually, but I could see the reflection of the room and the TV. He was playing O Death, from Brother Where Art Thou, song itself gave me the creeps, when suddenly, I looked into the TV, and saw a solid black figure of a tall man start to step out of the darkness of the entryway and into the living room. I didn't see anything like clothing or facial features, just tall in solid black. My friend at the same time swiveled his desk chair and pointed towards the entryway where he saw the figure. The figure stepped back into the dark as quickly as it appeared, as though it didn't want him to see it. I looked at him and said, Did you see that too? To which he replied, See what? He was only being animated during the song, but for sure didn't see anything. I've experienced several things at this house. He has not though, and it upsets him. But what I experienced that evening was the most eerie and frightening thing for sure. I know it wasn't one of his friends or someone goofing off. It isn't easy to walk into his house through the front door and not be heard. The floor is tile. We walked over and turned on the light and we both looked. There was no one there. I just went home. I couldn't stay there, and I begged him to come with me, but he wouldn't. A few days later when we talked, I asked him if he had ever had any seances or similar things in the house. He had first said no because it was his grandma's house, and he moved in about a year after she had passed. But then he paused, and then he said, well, remember when we cleaned out the attic? There was a Ouija board up there. Well, no, I didn't remember, and I told him to get his house cleansed, but he was just laughing at me. I've never been back to his house since that night. About two weeks later, he got an unintentional EVP, which is very eerie also. He has a voice-activated recorder, and was recording a couple of programs off the computer for a friend at work. He turned off the computer, and the TV isn't hooked up anyways. But when he woke up, there were three recordings instead of two on the recorder. I know he's pretty up on computers, but he didn't make this EVP himself. Actually, it scared him, and he said he wasn't going to listen to it anymore. Even though I'm not sure whether I do in fact believe in ghosts in the supernatural, I must be the ghost stories world's biggest fan and relentless reader, and have been a patron of your site for many, many years, at least a decade now. 
like I said, not being totally sure whether I do actually believe in ghosts, I've never had a story of my own contribute to a website. However, over the past months, possibly years, certain things have happened in our current rented home. Occurrences in this house that made me think twice, maybe even three times about what I actually do and don't believe in. My husband Craig and I have been living in our rented home here in Melbourne, Australia for almost four years now. We rent privately and know very little about the house and its history, apart from the fact that we are private renters and the rent has always been almost ridiculously cheap. The house isn't that old, however. It would only be about 15 or 20 years old. We do know, however, that several of the last tenants that lived here, families with children, by the look of the wall drawings in the study and backyard, moved out fairly quick after moving in. Which has always puzzled me, as the house isn't in that bad a shape. The neighborhood is okay, and the rent, like I said, has always been ridiculously cheap. Any questionable incident that has happened in this house has either taken place in the lounge room or the nursery. My daughter is now three months short of turning three. I remember one time when my daughter was tiny. She would have been six months old at the time. We put her to bed in her cot in her room. She's always been a fire alarm screamer. And on this particular day, after screaming for about 10 minutes, she quite suddenly stopped dead. Assuming that she had just fallen asleep, I walked outside into the backyard about 10 minutes later to feed the dog. I looked through her window subtly to make sure that all was calm in her room. When I noticed a very strange thing, my daughter did not look close to sleeping at all. She was in fact staring intently at the ceiling. I watched her eyes move from left to right and so forth, as if she was watching something very closely, but there was nothing there. Not thinking all that much of it, I went back inside and continued on with whatever I was doing, thinking that she was just boring herself off to sleep. A few weeks later, something very similar happened to this again, except this time, it was in the lounge room. Heidi was sitting with me on the couch. The family dog was also in the room, sitting by my feet. As Heidi all of a sudden starts staring at the ceiling again, with much the same intensity as before in our room. This time, the dog joined in and was making much the same eye and head movements as Heidi was, as if they were both watching something on the ceiling move from side to side. The dog's hair then stood on the back of its neck and he started growling, which frightened me, as he is one of the friendliest dogs in the world and wouldn't hurt a fly. Then, being a bit of a wimp, he got up and snuck into the next room and didn't come back for about a half an hour. This sort of thing has happened about three or four times since then, but nothing besides this has ever happened either. No apparitions or noises or banging. I've sometimes had the feeling, though, that we are not alone here. Nothing like this ever happens when my husband is at home, only when I am alone or with Heidi. A couple of days ago, it happened again. Heidi started off by staring at the ceiling, and then her gaze diverted to her toy basket in the corner of the room. She looked at me, smiled, looked back at the toy basket, pointed, and yelled baby. The word baby doesn't necessarily mean baby to Heidi. She calls newborns babies, as well as toddlers up to about her own age. I asked her where Heidi, where is the baby? There, she persisted, their baby. I shrugged and looked away again and hoped to dear God that she would stop pointing and looking at that darn toy basket. She did, thankfully. After only about a minute or so this time, what do you honestly think about this? Fluke? Or something more than just imaginative child playfulness?
This website has mentioned dark, powerful energies such as imps, and I noticed the creator of this website has seen what could be called imps. Imps are described as devil spirits, who are demons, in small stature. I've had many experiences throughout my life like the one the web creator had growing up. I don't like talking about them so much, and do my best to keep it dormant, but I did read their story, and I've had experience with a small black figure that sounds like one of the imps described in that story. Me, my daughter, and my wife all used to sleep in the same bed till our little girl was one and a half years old. Around the time my daughter was that age, I remember staying up till close to 1 or 2 a.m. watching a long movie. When I was finished, I went to the room and turned on the bathroom light to brush my teeth. Our room was well lit from the bathroom. Since around the age of three, I've had dealings with spirits as well. So, when I was about halfway through my brushing, I pretty much knew from that feeling I had that something was happening. I looked in the room where my daughter and wife were sleeping, and called her from behind my daughter in a fetal position was a small black figure. It looked human, but it moved, behaved, and felt like it was something else. It looked towards me, got on all fours, and scurried across the bed lightning fast. I kind of jumped back, but it disappeared when it hit the floor. The strange thing was, after I got into bed, my daughter, eyes closed, still asleep, did the exact same thing the figure did before I went to bed, only my daughter stopped with her still sleeping face right in mine, then laid back down and was normal again. Some other things started happening after that, but I don't know if they're related. I hope my story helps you figure out what these things are. My story begins about three years ago. I was 27, and me and my husband were expecting our first child. We had been living with his mother, but since I had become pregnant, we needed a place of our own. My parents owned two houses, one in which they lived in, and the other right behind theirs. My oldest brother and wife and children used to live there, but he bought the house right next door to my parents. Always wanted to stay close to our family, we're very close. Now that the house behind my parents was unoccupied, my mother asked me to move in. My husband and I gladly accepted. We would have more room and a place of our own. Well, the very next day we moved in, I was about 41 weeks pregnant and needed to go to the hospital to be induced for labor. We had a healthy baby boy. After our stay in the hospital, we returned to our new home. About four to six weeks after we moved in, I started hearing a noise in the middle of the night, coming from the closet in our bedroom. My husband worked a graveyard shift most nights at the time, so I was alone at night with our son a lot. The noise was that of the closet door opening. I had put a long rectangular mirror on the closet door, those that are about one foot wide and four feet long. It had two hooks that went over the top of the door, so as to hang the mirror. So every time you opened it, it would screech very loudly, since the metal hooks rubbed against the door frame. Well, like I said, about four to six weeks after we moved in, I heard this very loud screech at about 2.30 to 3 a.m. I woke up and realized it was the closet door opening. It opened about four inches. We had two chinchillas that slept on the floor at the end of the bed, and I just rationalized it to one of them opening the door with their paw. But I know that would have to take some effort, since the metal hooks over the top of the door made it hard to open, and would make the door get stuck. I didn't really get scared. I just looked, then went back to sleep. About two weeks later, again, me asleep, alone, middle of the night. 
then the screeching sound of the closet door opening. I woke up, and this time, sat up and looked at the closet door. What just happened? I checked on my baby in his bassinet next to my bed, and he was fast asleep. I looked at the chinchillas. They were awakened too, and looking at the closet door, but had not moved. So again, I felt no fright and went back to sleep. Again a few weeks later, my husband had a day off, so he was home that night, and again, about 2 or 3 a.m., the screeching noise of this closet door being pushed open from the inside. My husband wakes up and just stares at the door. Now he saw firsthand what I had told him about. The last time this happened was some weeks after that. Again, I was alone at night. I heard the screeching sound of the door opening, only it sounded like it opened a little bit wider than just four inches this time. I sat up and looked at the door. The chihuahuas were staring at the closet door as well. This time, they stood up. Then the closet door started opening a little bit further still. That set the chihuahuas off. One was barking at the closet door like there was no tomorrow, and the other ran under the bed crying and howling. Their reaction is what scared me the most. My heart was racing. I put my head under the covers. The closet door didn't open further, but it took me forever to get back to sleep. After that night, I was scared of the closet. I told my husband, and he put a lock on the door. I closed it and locked it every night. I didn't open it again. Only one thing happened after that. About a year later, the closet door became increasingly harder to close. It would get stuck, and I would really have to push to close it completely. One Sunday night, about 7.30 p.m. this time, I again was home alone. My husband was working, and my son was with my parents in the house in front of ours. I was watching some TV, and I didn't like to leave the closet door open anymore. So I walked over to the closet door to try and close it completely. I was really pushing, and I started banging on the door with my fist to try and close it. It was almost closed. Then, while I was banging with my fist, right on the other side of the door there was a loud bang, as if someone hit it with their fist. It was right on the spot I was hitting it. I could feel the vibration against me. I stepped away from the closet door. I tried to stay calm. I'll try to sit down and watch some TV, I told myself. I sat down, but could not keep my eyes off the closet door. After about 30 seconds, I decided I couldn't stay in the house any longer. I left my parents' house in front of mine and left the TV on. Why did that scare me so much? I was fine when the closet door would open in the middle of the night. Was it because I was so sleep deprived from having an infant son that it was so easy for me to go back to sleep? The fact that I heard the banging on either side of the closet unnerved me so much. Thinking back, I remembered when I was 14 and my brother first moved in the very same house with my then 4 month pregnant sister-in-law and her 4 month year old daughter from a previous marriage. I remember shortly after they moved in, her telling me she thought the house was haunted. I asked why, and she told me that at night, she would see the closet doorknob rattle and turn. Oh, it's just her imagination. I told her. Even at 14, I would rationalize everything. I guess it wasn't her imagination after all. I later asked my niece, now 21, if she ever saw anything. She told me she did, which I later write about. This is something completely different to my experience, and I think it had something to do with her, and not the house. She also used to tell me that the closet door used to open in front of my brother until he confronted it. Then it stopped. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I live about 20 minutes from an old covered bridge in Mableton, Georgia. 
this is one of the places I've been to in the surrounding area and where I have the most happened. In 2004, we went on a last minute hunt to the bridge. I know you're supposed to be better prepared, but I kept most of my things in the car at all times, just in case. We of course had heard the local legends and wanted to see for ourselves. So we headed down after about midnight. Even then, the traffic on the road was just heavy enough that we were unable to try the chocolate thing with the car. So we parked up the road a ways away at the Comet Trail parking lot. We walked down and took our flashlights with us. On either side of the bridge are orange street lights, so the bridge is lit up all the way through. One in the group brought her cousin, and I didn't realize at first that he had been drinking or he would have stayed behind. He got up in one of the bridge's windows and peed into the creek below. After yelling at him to stop, I realized I could no longer see the lights on either side of the bridge. Our flashlights also stopped working, all of them. After the temperature dropped and it became dark the way it did, I told others it was time to leave. We then saw the streetlights turn on for a second, and then in the distance, at the other end of the bridge, two kids dressed in formal attire, standing and hand-holding. Had to be about 30 seconds, but we saw it. We froze, then started back to the car as we walked out of the bridge. We heard what sounded like little kids laughing, and they actually touched and poked at our backs as we hurried as fast as we could back up the hill. One of our group reported hearing a voice in his ear telling him to run. I have to say it was unsettling. And though I haven't been back to the bridge yet, it hasn't stopped me from going to other places. I've heard voices and gotten pics, and even had things happen at other sites. This one was one of the best ones, because I don't get physically touched by them often. I also believe nothing would have happened, if he had not upset the spirits the way he did. I'm very much more careful about who I bring with now. Only one town over from our home stands one of the largest and most ornate railway stations in our state. The owners worked over 20 years bringing it back from neglect in a time gone by. As their second love is antiques, they have decorated it with period pieces throughout, now opened it as an outstanding restaurant. My husband and I often bring friends there to enjoy not only the wonderful food, but for the pleasure of watching them jump as the Amtrak fly by, only feet from the window. There is a very small organ that has been placed on a wall, not far from where we often sit. Several meals ago, our waitress entertained us by telling some people have commented there is a ghost attached to this instrument. One said she saw a very small, frail old lady standing by it, saying this isn't right, indicating dismay as to how our organ came to be sitting in an eatery. The waitress went on to say they never liked to work alone when closing up as there's so many unexplained noises. We enjoyed a meal there today, and as always, our conversation turned into the many thousands of people now gone that passed through these massive arched doors. Out of nowhere, I smelled a very strong odor of ivory soap. Mind you, we are eating fish, no one is passing by, and the other tables haven't changed their patrons. I say nothing, but a moment later, my husband smells it and says how weird it is. Such an uncommon smell today. It lasted for about three minutes. There was no explaining the smell. As we finish, we wander through the hall looking at various rail-related antiques and move on to the outside. There's an Amtrak train on the track, but it is going slow. Strange, as they usually are speeding enough for an onlooker to feel their wind as they pass, heading for Boston. It comes to a complete stop at the station. A man in uniform gets out and looks at the front and then under, turning to us. He says he thought he saw someone laying on the track. 
he walks about, making a full inspection, then he gets in, and then starts going. We see the riders in their seats, but as we watch, he stops again, just down the track, and repeats the inspection again. Strange day. This place should be investigated. This is my second entry in story. This takes place in Rusk, Texas in the 70s. This story comes from an acquaintance of mine, who is really more of a good friend of mine, of my good friends. Mike and Katie were married and had two children. One was a nine-year-old boy and the other was a five-year-old girl. They moved into a house that had a shotgun-style layout. In other words, you entered into the living room and there was a straight hallway all the way to the back door, with all of the rooms off of this one main hallway. Mike and Katie took the first door on the right as their bedroom, while giving the children the last door on the left as their bedroom. One night, not long after the move, Mike and his wife were sound asleep when they were awakened by screams of mommy and daddy, and turned on the nightstand lamp to find both their children wide awake and terrified. The children claimed to have seen a man with a hat on and a beard peering into their window. Mike immediately got his gun and ran around the back where he found an empty field and no sign of anyone having been there. At first, they were under the impression that this man had a ladder because the back of the house stood on a steep grade down and no one could be peering into one of the back windows without a ladder. But the occurrence repeated itself, and finally, Mommy asked the kids to describe exactly what they had seen. Their stories were both told at different sessions, and matched completely. What had woken the children was a strange light out the window, and someone walking up and down on what sounded like wood boards. They said this man leaned over and looked down into the window, and he had a shotgun in his hands. The couple moved the children to another room, and Mike did some laborious digging into the history and county files in the house. Through newspapers and files, plus some additional info from some of the older townspeople, Mike learned that this house had once been at another location, and when it was moved, it was turned around so that what had been the front of the house was now the back of the house. He also learned that the man who had died at the house had been arrested and died in prison for shooting his wife and her lover in their bed with a shotgun. I've sent in one other story about my mother's house in Illinois, but I have two more stories to share. I was raised by my grandparents. Their house has its share of odd occurrences, knocking sounds from within the walls, an apparition of my great-grandmother, and eerie feelings down the long hallway to the bedrooms. One night, I was around nine in 1989. I was lying in bed, trying to fall asleep. My bed was facing the doorway, and I could see into my grandparents' bedroom across the hall. The hall is only about four feet wide. The only light visible came from a small night light in the outlet at the center of the hall. As I was tossing and turning, Trying to fall asleep, I looked out into the hallway and saw a young woman with curly hair, her body glowing faintly. She carried a candle in her cupped hands. She walked slowly and paused for a second and turned to look into my grandparents' room. Being the nervous child I was, I quickly pulled the covers over my head and ignored it, eventually falling asleep. Years passed and I never saw another apparition. When I was 16, 1996, I was still living there. I grew up in that house, 13 years total, and had moved across the hall, having switched rooms with my grandparents. I decided I would try an experiment. I found a dress similar to the one I saw the apparition wearing, so I decided I would put it on and sort of relive that experience. I had have very curly hair, and it was the same length as the apparitions. I put on the dress, 
grabbed a short white candle, turned off the hall light, lit the candle, and took the path that I had witnessed the apparition take. I took the same route, made the slow walk, paused at my old bedroom door, looked in, and walked into what was now my bedroom. Was what I saw a ghost, or merely a glimpse into my future? Was I seeing myself on some other intersecting point of time? I'm still trying to figure that one out. Next story. This occurred in 1997, while I was at a Native American ceremony in the woods in Nebraska. We had been out in the woods for about a week, living in our tents and teepees, ceremonies going on throughout that time. I heard the stories of spirits who lived in the trees, and being as curious as I am about the supernatural, I was nervous and excited to see what might be out there. For the first few days, things were normal, and I went about my business working in the cook shack, making large quantities of food for the huge number of people there. One evening, after dinner, I was sitting at a table with the aider, talking about the name he had just given me, Star Woman, for my love of looking at the stars for hours on end, when my right hand suddenly went ice cold. My mother was sitting to my left, and I said, wow, my hand just went freezing cold. There was no wind, and it was July in Nebraska, pretty hot, even after the sun went down. She said, oh, don't worry, that's just the spirit touching you. I can't recall the name for them, so I'll just say spirit. I think it was Wayne Guy, but I'm not sure. Okay, no big deal. Our tent was set up along the perimeter of the tree line, with an outhouse about 50 feet to the right. On several occasions, while walking to the outhouse, I noticed black human forms in the trees. When I'd shine my flashlight on them, they were gone. I attributed this to my imagination. A few days later, a friend who I'd brought along for the trip was sitting in my tent with me, talking about the day. I was on the left side, leaning back on my arms, with my lantern flashlight next to my left hand, about 12 inches away. It was the kind where you could pull up the body of the flashlight to reveal a lantern. We were talking, and we noticed the light shifting in the tent. There were no other lights, aside from a bonfire on the side of the camp at about 300 feet. I looked at my flashlight, and it was standing on its edge. All we could do was sit and watch it. It stood on its edge for about two minutes. Then we decided to leave the tent for a while because we were a bit freaked out. The flashlight had a rounded head, not a square one. My hand did cause the tent floor to dent in slightly, but my flashlight was nowhere near my hand or the dent I made in the floor. The light was literally standing on one rounded edge when I mentioned it to my mom the next day, she quipped, they were playing with you, they must like you. I wasn't really scared, just a bit nervous, considering we were out in the wilderness with no lights. I was intrigued more than anything, considering the nature of the ceremony we were attending. I'm certain the spirits were focused by our activity. I hope to return to that spot in the future. This occurred in Miami, Florida in 1980 when I was 15. I still don't know if this was a paranormal experience, but it was unsettling nevertheless. I was babysitting for the next door neighbors one evening. Their daughter was down for bed, and I was in the family room watching TV. They had a small anchor biter type dog, and it went to the double sliding glass doors that led out into the rear patio and pool area like it wanted to go to the bathroom. All of the homes in this area had a screened-in patio pool enclosure, and when you open the sliding glass door to step out into the patio, immediately to your left was a screen door that led into the backyard. Unlike most of the homes in my neighborhood, though, the backyard was surrounded by a chain-link fence. So I go and open the sliding glass door, which was completely covered by trays for privacy to let the dog out, 
The dog steps out, and I immediately hear the crunching of grass in the yard to my left, as though someone is walking in the backyard. Startled, I look to my left, and there is what appears to be a man, adult size, reaching out as if to open the screen door. I immediately slammed the glass sliding door shut, scared out of my wits. I stood frozen in fear in the living room. Silence. After a few minutes, I cautiously peered through the curtain onto the patio. No one there, just a dog sniffing around. I let the dog in, and he did not appear agitated at the least. I never thought much about it after that, until years later. If there was someone there, why didn't the dog bark? If it feels supernatural. Animals are known to get agitated, yet nothing. My imagination? Definitely not. Nothing like that ever occurred again in subsequent babysitting for that neighbor. Well, this all started when my mother and I moved into a new home. Well, not new, but new to us. Anyway, it wasn't that old, about 30 years old. This was back in 1987. We moved in with not a problem, but I started to notice things about this house. Things would go missing, only to be found days or months later in the same spot. I'd see darts of movement out of the corner of my eye, and when I was alone, it felt like I wasn't. I spent a lot of time alone in the house, which was fine, until dark came. Then the house would not feel so warm and inviting, as it was in the day, but nothing ever came of it. Until many years later, when the footsteps started in the kitchen, they would come to the living room carpet and stop. As the time wore on, this came closer and closer, until one night, I was lying awake in bed, like most children do. They began to walk up my stairs to my room, and I know it wasn't my mom. I could hear her snoring downstairs. Now, don't say it was the house settling, because my stair made a very distinct squeak when someone walks up them. Anyway, once they reach the top of the stairs, I peek, being curious and all, and see a shadow standing at the door to my room. I froze, and a few seconds later, it turned around and it began its descent down the stairs. This happened once in a while, but only during stressful times in the house. The shadow itself looked like an average male, with nothing really standing out, but when he looked at me, it was a mixture of complete terror and a strange comfort like he wasn't there to hurt me or scare me. Like I said, I see him once in a while checking on me, but eventually, he became a part of my life. The one that did scare me lived in the basement. Again, it was a man as far as I could tell. He was very angry and his feeling was felt through the basement air. You could actually feel it as he walked into the basement that this was just the beginning of him. Mostly, he would just sit in the corner and glare at you as you did whatever you had to do and he always kept as far away from you as possible. It's weird because you would see him move as you move, which was at the time very scary. Even though I was a very brave child, I rarely finished my choir there, even in the daytime. Eventually, my mom refused to go down there anymore, after she was tripped by something and fell and broke a couple of toes. As time went on and on, the basement became less and less used, to the point in which the activity was too much that we couldn't even handle it. We were even too scared to even use the laundry. But after a while, we forgot about the guests downstairs. Until one night, when we heard a loud whoosh. We look at each other in terror, as we knew something was wrong in the basement, and we would have to see what it was. So, we braved the basement, to see a water pipe had broken, which in itself wasn't weird. But it was the fact that old cherished family photos and items that had previously been on a shelf across the basement were under this pipe that broke. My grandfather soon came over to help fix the pipe and clean up the inches of water. Everything was ruined. The drywall, the shelves, not to mention all the priceless family photos. When we finally cleaned out everything, the last thing to go was the aforementioned shelf, behind which we found a drawn chalk, a pentagram of sorts, and various other strange drawings in a large wooden Ouija board, which again, was strange, because my mom had never owned one in her entire life, and I was too young to even think about that stuff. Anyway, 
Fast forward 12 years to 2002. My mom had met a great guy and had moved to another town to be with him. And I was moving out too, so I could live on my own. I was just staying in the house until my apartment was ready, which was two weeks away, and cleaning the house for the next owners. Our other housemates had stopped making his presence known many years ago, except for the glaring he did in the basement, and it was the furthest thing from my mind, and I was down to the last three boxes of stuff in the basement. In the basement there was four lights. Every time I came back for a box, one light was burnt out. As I went to get the last box, and I see I'm down to one last light, I know what's coming, but I need that box. So, I grabbed the box, and stood up, and looked in horror to see him standing in the darkness, in his favorite spot. Two things I noticed this time. He was huge, standing around six foot four, and something I never noticed before. He had red eyes, and it seemed like he had a nasty smile on his face, but I wasn't sure. I stared at him for what seemed like an eternity, but he did the strangest thing ever. He waved to me, but I didn't stick around to say my goodbyes, and somehow managed to shrink the rod, yelling some very colorful language as I stumbled out the door. I jumped in my car and sped off, and I looked in the rearview mirror to see him standing in the kitchen, glaring out the window at me. Well, needless to say, I never went back. An interesting side note. The previous owners had been avoiding the Ouija board player and said that they knew of the entity I had spoke of. He only identified himself as Jay and never answered questions about who he was and what happened to him. They said he was fun to talk to until he moved in. Well, thanks for telling us now. This happened about four years ago, when I was 15. I was working at a farm in Connecticut at the time, and it was a habit for myself and my co-workers to have nighttime barbecues throughout the summer. On this particular occasion, we had killed three of the chickens we had and grilled them, nothing better than fresh chicken. As the night was winding down and we were getting ready to clean up, I noticed a very potent, sweet smell. To note, we were next to a sugar shack where maple syrup is made and this smell was much stronger than the strongest syrup I've ever smelled. As I smelled it, I noticed my friend glance at me with a perplexed look on his face, and suddenly, a very thick fog drifted in. He got up quickly and declared, we're leaving now. We of course left, leaving everything to be cleaned up the next day. We went into the farm office, and the fog was still there, along with the smell. It seemed to have followed us. I was a bit spooked, as I knew my friend was experiencing what I was, but the woman had no idea why we started acting strange, and was a bit confused at the sudden rush to leave. As we were leaving, it seemed as if the fog was thickening. However, when we reached a chain-link fence that is the border of the farm, the fog stopped abruptly. I looked out, and saw that the fog followed the length of the fence, which was about 50 yards. We left and proceeded to the woman's house, and my friend told her to walk in her house backwards. My friend comes from Ghana, in South America, and is very superstitious. His grandfather had been a voodoo doctor of some sort. I heard numerous stories of him healing crazed people who talked in odd languages. Anyways, apparently, she did not walk in her house backwards, as we found out the next morning. However, when he told me to, when he dropped me off home, I did so with no argument, knowing that sometimes you just don't ask why people tell you to do things. My friend picked me up from work the next morning, and I asked him why did he even make me walk in backwards. He mentioned the smell in the fog, and said if it was a supernatural presence, it would not follow you into your house if you faced it, because it would think you knew what was there. We got to work, and the girl was there before us, and she looked very disheveled and tired. She immediately said she barely slept because things in her house kept falling and waking her up all night. She even said her door opened twice that night. She then said how it was odd how she had smelled something sweet and seen the fog and then strange things happened to her. My friend and I had not said anything to her about the smell or the fog the previous night or yet that morning 
So we both looked at each other in amazement. She noticed and told us to tell her what happened to us. But instead of telling her that we had the same experience, my friend just asked her if she had walked in her house backwards. She said no. We can only guess why the strange happening went on in only her house and not ours. My name is Sherry and I live in Loves Park, Illinois. Loves Park is located right outside of Rockport. Well, about four months ago, I moved into an apartment with my boyfriend, which is located off of Perry Road. There are the three of us who live there, Bill, my boyfriend, Adrian, his son, and myself. All of us have the same encounters with some kind of presence. Adrian is 15 years old and has called us hysterical by things he has witnessed while he was home by himself. Adrian's experience. One day, while home alone in the apartment, Adrian was on the computer. He said that Bill and my bedroom door opened and closed by itself. All windows and doors were closed at the time, so there was not a draft moving through the rooms. About a week later, he was home alone again. There was a knock on the door. Adrian went to the door, and no one was there. He has also seen gray blurs run from the bedrooms to the laundry room. Noises have also come from the kitchen while he was by himself. Bill and Adrian's experiences. In August of 2003, we had family over. While sitting there, Adrian and Bill were staring off towards the bedroom. All of a sudden, they both looked at each other and said, Did you see that? They claimed they saw what looked like an old man or woman hunched over running and looking towards them into the laundry room. My experiences. My experiences pretty much consisted of only hearing noises, like things in the kitchen opening and closing on their own, and blinds rustling with nobody around. That was until two nights ago. Two nights ago, my mom and younger brother came over to visit. We played Uno and watched some TV. After they left, I got online and Adrian and Bill went outside and took the go-kart and minibike for a ride to Rockcut State Park. I was just sitting at the computer looking at items on eBay when I started to feel like I was being watched. I looked around and didn't see anything, but I was uncomfortable, so I went and got my cell phone out of my purse. By the way, they all left at around 12.30 a.m. Anyway, I walked back over to the computer and set the phone next to me. I continued my search on eBay when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I immediately looked over towards the hallway and standing between the bedrooms and the laundry room, I saw a grayish figure of a man. A shiver of ultimate fear shot down the back of my neck. I've never been that frightened in my entire life. He stood there for about two seconds and then disappeared into the laundry room. I grabbed my phone and bolted out the front door. I tried to call Bill on his phone, but he didn't answer. I remained in the front porch until he called me and said he was on his way home. When they got home, I told them what happened, and they said, Now do you believe us? I always believed, in a way. But now that I actually saw this thing, I know it's real, and it still frightens me. The ghost, however, has not harmed us in any way. He's just sharing our residence. I'm not sure exactly where to start. All my life, I had feelings and happenings around me. Some I remember, and some are still a bit hazy to me. I have a couple of true stories that have happened to me that I would like to share with everyone. I grew up in a small city in California called Pico Rivera, but moved in 92 to Colorado. Growing up in Cali, I've had three sisters and my mom and dad. The house we lived at was on Maris Avenue, and from what I was told, it was originally the first church in Pico Rivera, but was torn down to make a home for an elderly couple who, I believe, the husband died of old age. Their house was torn down and ours was built. I was eight, I believe, when I really started to understand what I was experiencing. I remember that I will always see horrid faces on the wood paneling in the house. By that I mean on the doors and the kitchen cupboards. I remember that my older sister and I 
would be the only one to experience all the happenings. Her and I would have recurring nightmares. I would dream of trying to run away from what I believed to be the devil chasing me, but the more I ran, the closer he would get. My sister would dream of a young girl in a checkered red and white dress trying to kill her. Every night, I would hear the same things, stomping on a roof or a stampede of running feet right above my head, and just as fast as it would start, it would disappear. One day, I was alone in the house. My parents and sister had gone to the store, and my two older sisters were at work. I was peacefully watching TV and playing with our cat Midnight when a feeling of being watched came over me. Thinking absolutely nothing of it, I went on watching TV, but noticed that Midnight had run off somewhere. I thought it was odd that she had just run off, but I still didn't care. I just kept on watching my cartoons. My mom has a habit of putting this plastic rug thing on her carpets to keep the dirt off, and we had one, so if someone was walking on it, you could hear them. So, what I started to hear was what I thought the cat running back and forth, so I yelled out her name to get her kitty butt over to me and stop making all that noise when I heard her meow from behind the sofa. I found this strange, wondering how she did that so fast, so I went behind the sofa to take a look. Sure enough, she was huddled in the corner, hissing and meowing with her eyes wide open. I of course tried to get her out, but she wouldn't even let me get near her. I left her alone and figured that she would come out when she's good and ready and went back to my TV. Then, all of a sudden, I heard the noise in the hall again. I put my TV on mute, thinking that maybe it was the cartoon I was watching, and the noise stopped for a second, but then went back right to it. I started to listen really carefully, and what it sounded like was footsteps, heavy footsteps. With this, I decided to do the same my cat was doing, so I hid in the little tiny opening that was behind her sofa, and I listened very carefully. Then I noticed that whatever it was making, that noise stopped, as if it knew that I was aware it was there. I could feel my heart beat in my throat, and then it started up again, but this time it was faster, and then the doors and windows were opening and slamming shut. I really did not know what to do. I just remembered that I was concentrating on how close the passes were, and they were coming closer to me with every beat of my heart, until I couldn't hear it on the plastic anymore. My cat took off from behind the sofa, so I took it as a sign, and did the same thing, and ran out my front door screaming, thinking that whatever it was would grab me from behind. I made it safely outside my home, and I sat on the sidewalk, waiting for someone to come home. I felt something burning a hole in the back of my neck, and when I turned back to my house, the front door slammed shut. Finally, my parents came home, and I was so happy to see them. My mom scolded me for being outside alone, and so I proceeded to tell them what had happened. My dad said that it was probably an aftershock or a small earthquake, but none of the neighbors experienced anything. My mom, on the other hand, said that I was being punished for being a naughty kid. A few days later, my older sister had come home from work to an empty house, and she experienced the same thing. Our home out here in Colorado has a strange feeling to it. I can't describe it. It's just something that always has been there. I remember one night, it was myself, my neighbor, and my twin sister were home alone. My parents had gone up to the hill for some gambling, so we decided to watch movies and just be the normal teenage kids. Well, my sister had gone in the shower, and my neighbor and I were just sitting around gossiping, waiting for my sister to get out so we could watch a movie, when the phone rang. Of course, I ran to pick it up, and I said hello, but the other side was dead. So, I put it back down and went back to our business. When it rang again, I got up, ran to the phone, again, no one on the other end. I hate prank calls, and two is enough to get me agitated with, so I unplugged all the phones in the house and left it at that. About five minutes later, there was a knock at our door. Now, I wasn't a stupid girl. I looked out the peephole and there was no one there. So I looked out my window and there wasn't even any footprint in the snow coming up to our door. 
Well, we both found this to be strange and the feeling a bit uncomfortable. We went around the house, making sure everything was locked and covered all our windows. We stood looking out the front window, making sure it wasn't one of our neighbors trying to play games when my sister came out of the shower and had a confused look on her face. We asked her what was wrong and she asked us if we had gone into the bathroom during the time she was in the shower. I told her no, there's no way for us to even get in if we wanted to because there's no key for that lock. Again, we asked her what was wrong, and she proceeded to tell us that before she got in the water, she took off her rings and placed them on top of the toilet seat cover so they wouldn't fall into the sink, but when she had gone out, they were on top of the toilet and the seat cover was up as if someone had removed them to use the restroom. At the same time, both the phone rang and there was another knock at the door. We looked out the peephole while my sister ran to the phone. Again, there were no footprints in the fresh snow and no one at the door. My sister came running and said that it was for me, so I started walking to the phone when I remembered that I unplugged all the phones, so I told my sister to hang it up. She said that it sounded important but I told her to hang it up. Finally, she did. My neighbor and I both turned white and my sister asked what was going on when I told her I unplugged them so there is no way they could have rang, let alone anyone talk on the other end. We still talk about this to this day and even in my own apartment, I wake up to hear my toilet flush on its own or things vanish and I find them in my cupboards. Crazy, crazy. About two years ago, my first love was shot to death and died instantly. I was devastated when it happened, but one night he came to me in a dream and told me he loved me and he didn't want to see me cry over him anymore because it hurt him. It was really strange because I woke up immediately after that and I just started crying so hard, but I only cried for a few minutes because I remembered what he said and I stopped. I didn't want to hurt him. I remember the dream feeling so real that when he held and kissed me, I felt so safe and secure, like he was really there with me. I never really cried over him again after that day. Sure, a few tears here and there when I visit his grave, but I never cried uncontrollably again. I never forgot about him, but I moved on and tried to make happiness in my life without him. Then a few days ago, a really good friend of my mother's came to visit us for Thanksgiving. Now, I never knew this before, but she has the power to feel the presence of ghosts and spirits. She can talk to them, hear and see them. She was scared to tell my family about this gift because she thought we'd call her crazy. Finally, she just couldn't take it anymore because she said we had a ghost in the house that was influencing my thoughts when I would sleep. She said it was a man and he lived in my room, and his favorite place was at the foot of my bed. I was a little skeptical at first, because I had never had that sort of thing before. I asked if she could see and hear him, and she said yes. She told me that he had black hair, sharp brown eyes, olive skin, a mustache, and he was about 5 foot 8 inches. The way she described the man sounded exactly like Raymond, my deceased lover. She asked me who that was, and I told her the story. She got this freaked out look on her face, and then I asked her how long this man had been living in my room. She said that before I could even finish the question, he answered me, two years, and she repeated this answer to me. I then got goosebumps all over, and I said, he passed away in 2001. She asked me if I had any pictures of him, and I showed her one. She only glanced at it when she said, that's him. I still don't know if I believed it, but I was freaked out by the thought of a ghost living in my bedroom for two years. She said she had asked him what he was doing in my home, and he replied that he loved me and was there because of me. She then told me that since he was my ghost, I was the only one who could make him leave. She told me to light a white candle and tell him to go to the light and that God was waiting for him in heaven. I felt like a lunatic talking to myself, but I did as she said, and then I left my room with all the lights off and the door shut, 
and nothing but the candlelight on. She went into my room about an hour later, and she saw him standing there. She then asked him, what are you still doing here? He told her that he couldn't go to heaven because he's done too much bad in his lifetime and God will never forgive him. She assured him that wasn't true and said that God loves all of us and will always forgive us no matter what we do as long as we ask for his forgiveness. She then told him to think about that because God is waiting for him and she left the room. About an hour after that, I returned home and we went to check if he was still there. Sure enough, he was there at the foot of my bed. I told her that I wanted to talk to him and asked him why I was there. Raymond was a gang member and was killed by the cops for reasons unclear to me at the time. I just knew that he was too good of a person and had too big of a heart to have done anything to deserve death. I never really had a sense of closure regarding his cause of death and I felt the real story was being hidden and no one would ever find out what really happened. Only the people who were there knew his death. Well, he started out talking about a teen named Joey that had gotten killed about a week before Raymond. He said that he wanted to know that he had never hurt Joey, but Joey had tried to hurt him with a blade of some sort. Raymond's uncle Eddie, who was a gang leader, ordered the gang to go after Joey, who was from a rival gang. They did, and they shot him to death. Raymond said he had nothing to do with Joey's death, but that Joey's ghost had come for Raymond to get revenge on his Uncle Eddie. Raymond said he was done wrong by his own family because his Uncle Eddie and Aunt Christian knew that Raymond was going down and they never warned him or said anything to anyone to help him out. They just let him die. I didn't really understand what he meant by this since he said he was killed by the cops and not a rival gang member, but I knew it was really him because of all the names he had said. I knew that my mom's friend could never have just known those names or made them up and for the most part it made sense except for the part about his aunt and uncle knowing that it was going down. They were both present when he was killed though so maybe that had something to do with what he said. He said that they had betrayed him and they were no longer his family because family wouldn't have done that to him. He just wouldn't tell me exactly how they did him wrong or what they knew that they never warned him about. He said he was very hurt to find out that two people he had cared so much for had done such a heartless thing to him. He said he just wanted to know this so I would know that he didn't deserve to die and he would never hurt anyone or try to hurt anyone, that he was set up by his own uncle and aunt. He also said that if his friend had known what was going on, he would have still been alive today. Leia, my mother's friend, couldn't make out the name of the friend he was talking about, so he said, the one with all the kids. Right then, I knew he was talking about my best friend Javier. He said he only told me all of this, so I would know the truth and would never think of him as a bad person. What he didn't know was that I never did think of him as a bad person, and I knew, deep down inside, that he didn't deserve to die the way he did, or at the time that he did, before he passed away. We were going through a lot of problems because he had cheated on me with another woman. He told me that she really never meant a thing to him, but that she threw himself at him and guys will be guys. He said that we were supposed to get back together and get a house together and I was supposed to leave his son. He said he wasn't ready to go yet and he had plans for us and that was why he chose to stay with me all this time. He just felt comfortable with me there. Leia had told me that since he died so suddenly, he never knew he was dead and therefore had not crossed over yet and had been trapped here on earth. He said that he never meant to hurt me in any way and that I was his true love. What was really weird was about a year ago, 2002, I had a new boyfriend living with me and he broke my heart. I still get sad about him and miss him occasionally and Raymond knew this. One of the last things he had asked Leia to tell me was that the man I was so heartbroken over wasn't even worth my time or tears and that he could just never be good enough for me, so not to hurt over him anymore. He said he didn't like that guy and that he never deserved me. He was just no good. Well, he was so right about everything he had told me in that whole conversation. At the time, 
I didn't know it for sure, but I just felt it inside. And I knew he wouldn't stay around for two years just to tell me lies. After he told me all of that, he said he didn't want to talk anymore because I should be able to figure out everything from what he already said. Leia and I then asked him to go to light and go with God. I promised him I'd pray for him to be forgiven by God and led into heaven, but I already knew God would take him without my prayer. Just then, Leia's eyes moved across the room as if she was watching someone walking. He said one last time, please tell her that I never meant to hurt her and I'm so sorry. I said I forgave him a very long time ago. He then asked me to tell me that he loved me and would wait for me in heaven. Then Leia told me to watch the candle, and just at that moment, the flame grew very tall, and the blue of the flame disappeared, and it was all white. She told me he said goodbye, I love you, and he was gone. He just wanted to tell me those things, and wouldn't leave until he got the chance. I felt really happy after that, because I sent my love to heaven, where he belongs. This is a true story, and it was honestly the best experience of my entire life, which isn't too long, since I'm only 19. Even though I couldn't see him or hear him, I knew for a fact that he was right there with me, just from what he said and all the names he mentioned. I know I will never experience anything like this again, so I feel very special that he chose me. It really was crazy to go through that, but once I knew it was him, I wasn't so scared anymore. I actually felt happy that he stayed all that time just to tell me how he felt and what really happened when he passed away. I felt even happier that I was the one who had sent him to heaven to be with God and be happy again. It may not make sense to you, but it did to me because he was my first love and I knew him so well. I tried to follow his case and dig to find something on what really happened when he was killed, but never could up until he told me. Soon after that experience, I spoke to his mother and we put the whole thing together to find out that his family had betrayed him, just as he said. His uncle Eddie is now standing trial for the death of Joey and he is looking at 25 to life with no chance of parole, but for what he did to Raymond, he deserves that. He actually deserves to be the one laying in that casket instead of Raymond, but I'm just glad Raymond is in a better place and away from this cruel world. He deserves to be happy for eternity. This happened over a span of time from June, my last visit on October 31st. When I first did a search in the Amity Hall Hotel in April 2003, I read about how back in the days of the PL Canal system, canal travelers used to stay there. Then in the Civil War days, it was used as a hospital. Then only internet, which I thought odd. I've looked on the internet many times for historical information on Amity Hall. The first time I went there was June. My friend had been telling me about it, so we went with a group. I brought my camcorder and was outside with a girl that was scared to go in. My battery went dead in about five minutes. I thought it was weird because a relative had put the battery in the charger while running the camera off of house electricity, but later, the battery charged, and now it's just fine. That night we saw, in the corner of the L-shaped building, very small bluish lights. They went inside, but reported nothing out of the ordinary. The first time I went into the house, one week later, was during the day. I'd wander around it many times, during both day and night, and the most creepy place on the outside is a door at the end of a hall, which is locked shut. We, me and that same friend, were walking around it looking for a door that was open and I went around front and was standing on the porch looking at the door. It was completely shut and suddenly, which seemed odd to me, I had the notion to try it. It seemed ridiculous, especially because it had always been previously been locked, but I reached for it and it easily swung open, revealing to me the beauty within. There is a hall that runs down the middle of it on either side, very large rooms. There is a bar on the left and a kitchen beyond it. There are old fireplaces in the rooms. The L shape to this building comes from the attachment of the hallway 
of hotel rooms to what I assume is the residential part as well as the kitchen. Strangely, the worst in the house is upstairs, the trophy room. This room is filled with a giant feeling of get out of here. Nothing has ever been seen or heard in it by me, but I went in it once and I'll never go in it again. That is how strange the feeling is. I'm not sure if the anger felt in this room is some ghost. All the glass and mirrors are broken and you walk on a crystalline floor about an inch thick. We were walking around and checking the doors. We opened the heavy metal black door and were lingering around in a small awkward room. I looked down the hall into an ominous darkness and said, I'm not going down that hallway. We kept checking other doors and came, not by my request, back to the door. When I looked down the hallway this time, it was well lit and I could see everything. There is a small rectangular window in front of the front door at the other end of the hall that let in a great deal of light, but before this could not be seen, before I couldn't even see halfway down the hallway because it was so dark. We continued around checking doors because we didn't want to climb around the fallen antique soda machine that lays at an awkward angle, stuck between the steps themselves and the railing of the upper part of the staircase. It looks like it's ready to fall. We went to the door right in front of the stairs, which was locked before, and my friend, for whatever reason, reached out and opened it. She was also very determined to get into the hotel rooms, so we were climbing across the little porches, separated by railings, and after we already tried all the doors, she, without rhyme or reason, walked right up to the third one in and opened it with ease. Throughout the summer, we went back with equipment, trying to get footage, but nothing works correctly around it. I've seen, one night, the very faint white figure of what appeared to be a woman in the attic window facing the parking lot. I've seen white flashes of light in the attic windows facing the road, but the worst time ever, I'm getting goosebumps and watery eyes thinking about it, was October 11th. It wasn't that cold, but I remember wearing my winter jacket. Me, my best friend since childhood, and my boyfriend went driving up. We talked all about it on the way there, and then we parked. We just couldn't bring ourselves to get out of the car. For some reason, we were all scared to death. That night, there seemed to be a battle going on of energies, good and evil, because believe me, the place has both. You could, at time, actually see in the window the swirling of something that is hard for me to describe as anything other than something out of this world. There were faint glows fading in and out of the windows, as well as small but somewhat bright points of light coming from the corner of the L shape. The driver, my best friend got out of the car and basically was so scared she just stood there and then quickly got back in. I'd heard of the hounds of hell chasing people from sitting in the parking lot like we were. Maybe that's what she saw. I don't know. I was watching the house, but suddenly my boyfriend in the passenger seat freaked out and pointed to the front left corner of the car. And just as he did, I was suddenly scared. I cried a scream that came straight from my soul. Go now. We spun out of the parking lot and parked on the other side of the road. Each time the car was still running. My boyfriend was talking about what he saw, which was a black figure, not the shape of a dog, but about the size of a dog lingering around the front bumper where the driver was standing. We were talking about how still, from this far away, the house felt creepy and strong. This may sound weird to some, but I don't care. I was sitting in the back seat on the right side, the side of the car that was facing the woods. Suddenly, I got this creepy feeling that something was outside the window. I knew it was watching me. In the front, my friends were talking, and just as I was turning to look out the window, in a split instant, my boyfriend, the passenger, started freaking out, screaming the driver's name, and to start driving. I was somehow too slow for this the time was just about right that i never got to see with eyes what i already knew to be there just outside the window not just watching but glaring at me i hadn't even began to describe what i experienced when suddenly it started coming from my boyfriend's mouth 
She was trembling and telling about how something was outside my window, looking in at me, and it wanted to hurt me. He said there was a woman outside his window, silently screaming at him, which is why he screamed. I started crying and going into near hysterics because what he was describing was what I felt, and at the height of my terror, he was the one who freaked out. It was one of the most horrific paranormal experiences I've ever had. He said he could clearly see her, and that it looked like the female was bleeding a lot, and that her clothes were from the 1800s. The last time I was there, October 31st, it seemed like respectful party people had taken up part-time residence in the house because furniture had been all moved to one room, and there was no further damage to the house. I later found out that several of my friends went later, and the house is now inhabited by a cult of some sort. They have told me that they spoke with someone, Whatever the case, I don't think I'll ever go back at night. There is something there that is anchored with me for some reason. I'm still looking for history to figure out who the woman and man were outside of my car. I would appreciate any ideas you might have for why the male gave off the feeling towards some and no one else in the car. My boyfriend is also wondering the same thing about the male. To be honest, I don't think I'll ever go ghost hunting anymore either because I've been so frightened by the above events. Well, I know loads of people send in stories about graveyards, and they never sound true, but this one I encountered was so scary, I didn't want to go out of my house for five months. Basically, my two friends, Ursula, Nikita, and I, were sitting on the wall of this graveyard we used to hang out in when I decided to take a visit to my friend who is dead, in the cremation garden and have a talk to her. Nikita and Ursula knew I liked to spend time on my own, so they left me to it. After all, they were still in view. Well, Asher, my dead friend's flowers were dying, so I went into the back of the graveyard to pick some flowers. Then, all of a sudden, I heard a voice. I thought nothing of it at first, just a hush cooing in the background. I presumed it was some mourner coming to visit a loved one, but it started to get louder and more distressed. The person sounded Latin. They were getting louder and louder until it hurt my ears, and I had to turn around and tell them to stop. But then, when I turned around, nothing was there. I strained my eyes, but all I could see was a graveyard and flowers. Quite startled by the experience, I decided to tell Urs and Keats about what just happened. Then I heard a scream. Things were getting stranger and stranger. I was scared now. I ran and ran, but my surroundings were unfamiliar. I hadn't a clue where I was. I couldn't find my way out of this whirling blur that I was trapped in. And the Latin voice was getting louder and louder. All of a sudden, I appeared to wake up. I was in the middle of the graveyard in the pitch black. I panicked like you would. I was so utterly confused. I looked up to see a blurred figure, and I screamed. The figure was about my height and my size, but it had no face. It was nothing. It was just there. And as I stared at it, it came closer and closer until I was practically inside it. And it stopped, stopped dead in front of me. And then the Latin voice came back, quiet at first, but louder it grew, louder and louder. I let it. The next thing I knew... The figure was fading and fading, into nothing, until that's all it was, just nothing. Eventually, police found me and rushed me to the hospital. They said it was just my anxiety hallucinating me, but I'm sure it was something more, something that won't leave my head. You see, every night when I go to bed, I say a Latin prayer and hope that the figure I see will rest in peace, but that didn't stop it from scaring the hell out of me. Please make sure you don't wake up at exactly 3.12, because I do, and I hate it. I see the figure at the foot of my bed, with a face and everything. She's a little girl, and she screams, silently, but she still does it, and it scares me. She hasn't hurt me yet, though. When I was 14, my family moved to Seattle, where my father was to do some teaching. We rented a beautiful old house. From the time we moved in, I was uncomfortable. I would turn quickly 
to think I saw someone move, just out of sight. I was placed in a downstairs room, which seemed to have the largest amount of activity. And each night, my dog would awake, barking, at what seemed to be nothing, and my cat would become very alert. I eventually moved myself upstairs, into my baby brother's room, and he was sleeping with my parents. One day, while my father was away on business, my mother and I heard what sounded like a large box drop. We all looked around the house and found nothing to have made the noise. Because I was so scared, I asked to spend the night with my mother. I was to sleep that night in my brother's bed, and my brother would sleep with my mom. My mother and I were facing each other, me, with my back to the closet. We said goodnight and turned out the light. A moment later, my mother bolted upright. Startled, I said, what is it? She told me to be quiet and reached into the nightstand for some mace. I turned to see what she was looking at. Out from the closet came light, as though someone had switched on a light. There was no light in the closet. We looked through the closet and through the house for two hours and found nothing. I remember my mom saying, don't worry, it's just a ghost. It won't hurt you. She was right. It never did. But I continued to feel uncomfortable and see what I think was a woman until we finally moved from the house. In another incident, in 1990, my grandfather was in a retirement home. He had several strokes and could no longer talk. His hearing was always bad but had gotten to the point that he could no longer hear. He had recently come down with shingles and was not doing well. That night, as I was drifting off to sleep, I clearly hear my grandfather talking to me. He told me he loved me and then said goodbye. The following morning, I got a call saying he was dead. I already knew. There was another incident that has haunted me to this day. My husband, Two kids and myself took a trip to Alaska last summer. We made it to the border of Canada somewhere around 8 in the evening. We were told that the nearest town was a place called Hope, about 30 miles up the road. When we got to the town, we found that there was no place to stay. It seems it was a national holiday. A kind woman at a local hotel phoned the next town up the road to see about vacancies. She reserved a room for us, and off we went. We reached the Yale Hotel around 10 o'clock and checked into our room. I turned on the TV for the kids, and they watched the family channel until we were ready for bed. We turned out the lights and went to sleep. Sometime later, the TV awakened me and had turned on by itself. What was showing appeared to be a sitcom. What was being said was far from funny. It seemed as though the voice was dubbed. What was said did not even match the mouth movements. It was a man smiling and talking to his wife in a kitchen. What I heard was a man with a rough voice, screaming. My husband had woke up with me and asked why I had turned on the television. When I told him I didn't, he asked that I turn it off. I accidentally switched channels, and when I turned the knob back, the show was gone. It was called Just Snow. It's funny, it didn't really dawn on me until the following day how very strange it was. I've never before since had a television turn on to what was the family channel and have it spew profanities at me, but I guess we all have first. In my last and final instance, my family and I moved into our house last October. My husband and I had been looking for houses for some time. When we found this house, we loved it from the start. It was a good warm feel, and it really was the best house we could ever have. Shortly after having moved in, my husband and I compared notes and admitted that we were both having strange feelings. Creepy was the word we agreed on. We were both finding the closet in our children's room open. The door would stay closed sometimes, and other times, you return to find it ajar or fully opened. My husband shared with me that he was outside doing some digging on the French drain. He had set down a piece of chalk he had found. He turned around to pick it up, and it was gone. On another occasion, my family and I were sitting on the couch. My husband asked me to smell my son's hair. 
and it smelled intensely of perfume. Being that neither my husband nor myself were any fragrance, we began looking around for something that may be curing the scent. To refresh his memory, he sniffed my son's hair again and asked me to do the same. The smell was completely gone. The oddness seemed to subside for months. Then, this year, around the same time, it seems to have started again. The closet door is again not staying closed. We are having trouble finding things again. The other night, I felt a cold breeze coming across my face as though the windows were open, but they were closed. I go up to find the back door unlocked, knowing that I had locked it the night before. A few nights ago, when I closed my eyes, I heard someone saying to me it's alright. After looking up the site and looking at the pictures, I decided to try my hand at photographing the potential presence. I went into the bedroom that has the closet door that doesn't close. I said out loud, though I'm not comfortable with the idea of having a presence in my home, I think I could deal with it better if I knew whether or not you exist and since I have children and they would be able to see you if you exist. I feel I need to be aware of that fact. So, I'm going to take pictures of the house, and if you are comfortable having me take your picture, you can get in front of the camera. If you're not comfortable, I can respect that. I'm guessing you're a good entity, because my cat seems to like you. Note, my cat is very insistent on spending time in this room. I must say, I felt a little silly talking to the air, but it seemed the right thing to do. So, I took pictures of the house. I frankly was hoping that nothing would be found and that I would find my imagination had run away with itself. When I got the pictures back, I found that the photos taken in the bedroom and in the closet have what I understood to be a vortex. Needless to say, I'm pretty spooked. I'm planning on finding out the history of the house to see if I can figure out who a roommate is. Also. I'm hoping to contact some people that are knowledgeable on the subject of ghosts. If this entity needs my assistance, I hope to help. If it just wants to hang out with us, that's fine too, and if it's bad news, I need to know. I'm hoping that my initial feeling of my house is correct, and that what I believe is a ghost is of the non-threatening variety. I just keep telling myself that. The ghost has been very polite for the last year, and those that should be able to sense the presence seem not to mind it. The cats and my two children, whose room the ghost seems to live and spend time in. Thank you for your time, and I'm glad that you are able to read my story. I grew up in a small town in central New Hampshire. When I was 18, one of my friends took me to a grave, which is located on the side of a road. The grave lies off the road, about 10 feet. The grave is that of a young boy named Miles Tyler, who died in 1811. He then told me about some of the experiences he had. I was a little skeptical of the stories. He had said that sometimes you will hear leaves and branches moving and there is no wind. Also, branches will crack and break. He had also mentioned that if you left food out, it would end up unwrapped and partially or completely eaten even on open cans of soda. The next day, I was over to a friend's house and told him of the story, and he also admitted of hearing this and being true. So, we planned a trip up there with a group of friends. One of these people was a girl who was into the ghost and spirit thing at that time. She was into the Ouija board and sand stuff. We arrived there about 11 at night, so this way, we wouldn't have any traffic or intrusions by passerbys. The girl and her friend started to try and communicate with the boy, who was buried at the grave, while the rest of us watched intensely. There was one person there who was mocking the whole thing, and definitely was a complete non-believer, and had no respect for the dead whatsoever. They had made contact with the boy within two or three minutes of trying. The spirits they were talking to was getting aggravated at the person who had been mocking him. I at that time didn't know what to believe, I just kept watching my eyes glued on the ever-moving oracle. Soon, we all heard the leaves and limbs rustling in the woods around the grave. We all started to get nervous while the person who had been mocking this whole event picked up his own pace. 
This just made things go completely out of control. Now, we could definitely hear the branches breaking, and it started to rain. Suddenly, the guy who had been mocking this whole event was staring at the headstone in complete fear. That's when we all noticed that it had moved and had tilted to the left at least two to three inches. That's when we all decided to leave. Me and two of my friends jumped in my truck to leave. It wouldn't start. I tried for what seemed like forever, still scared out of my mind. I jumped out of the truck and told my friend to get in the driver's seat. I got out and started pushing the truck down the road. Within 50 feet, the truck started and the rain stopped. So did the wind. We left and never looked back. I haven't been back since. We all stayed up until daylight and I dropped them off and went home. We were all shaking up by this and we didn't even talk about that after. That morning, I told my mom what had happened. Funny thing was, is that she did not say that she didn't believe me, but just chose to say, I hope you have learned your lesson and don't go back. I'm sorry for the lack of names, but didn't want to involve anyone without their permission. I now live out of state and have lost track of most of them. One summer, when I was about 11 or 12 years old, my parents, my little sister, two of my older sisters and myself moved into this old gray house in northern Indiana. It had a cement sidewalk that went around to the back of the house, and at the back of the door, there was a date and two footprints and a handprint. The date was about 1812, if I remember correctly. It has been at least 10 years since this has happened. Anyway, right before we moved in, my two older sisters wanted to stay the night at the house, so they did. They felt real uneasy after being there for a while. They sat on the floor back to back, wishing they hadn't done this. All of a sudden, they heard a loud banging noise coming from the basement. They called the police from the neighbor's house. After the police checked everything out and found nothing, they left. Once again, my sisters still scared out of their minds, sat on the floor. They heard it again. So once again, they called the police. They showed up and stuck around a while to see if maybe they could hear it. About 15 minutes or so later, they heard it. One of the police officers told them that it was just an old furnace in the basement making noises. My sisters had a good laugh and finally drifted off to sleep. When we finally moved in and settled down, I wanted to really check the place out. In my room there was a walk-in closet, about 12 feet in length, and on the left side inside the door was a smaller door that we assumed led to the attic. I felt very odd every time I had to go to the closet. One night, my little sister decided that she was going to sleep in my bed with me. Of course, being the brave sister I was, I picked up my little book of ghost stories and began to read a story entitled phone calls from a ghost. All of a sudden, the light in the hallway began to flicker. It was a light we were using to read the book by. We got scared and I threw the book out my bedroom door. We laid there talking, wondering what caused that to happen when we began to hear music and lots of voices coming from the attic. I could hear a child running around and laughing also, but my sister says she didn't hear that. We decided to go downstairs and sleep in her room that night. A few weeks go by and one of my older sisters bought a Ouija board. My mom didn't like the idea of it being in her house because her mother always told her that they were of the devil. But being a little curious herself, we all sat down and watched as my mother and older sister began to play the game. The spirit in the board said his name was Ghoul. I'm not sure how it would be pronounced. I remember how it was spelled. We asked it some silly questions, and then my mom asked it a more serious question about if one of us was going to die, when, and how. The board told her something. She wouldn't tell us. Then she got really mad at the spirit and began calling it names. The little device that you put your hands on began moving around the board really fast in a figure eight pattern no one was touching. Then it flew off the board and sailed across the front room into the dining room. My mom told my sister to get out of her house 
and never mentioned anything about what had happened. But she didn't take it out. She just put it in the closet in my room. One night, me and my little sister decided that we were going to be gypsies. So, we got our crystal ball, which was nothing more than an electric candle with a blue bulb, and sat in the playroom and turned off all the lights. My mom was the only one home, and she was downstairs. We sat next to the candle and began chanting, Oh spirits, if you are here, give us a sign. We want to know who you really are and why you're here. Over and over we chanted. Just then, I felt this cold chill. The windows were closed and it was midsummer. The bulb in the candle flashed and then went out and I heard someone whisper, I'm here. It sounded like a child's voice. Then, the hall light flashed twice and then stayed on for about 5 or 10 seconds and went out. My sister and I ran down the stairs, across the dining room, and into the front room to where my mother was sitting, reading a book. We asked her if she flashed the lights just now, and she said no. See, my mom can't walk very well. She can't run or walk fast either, so she wouldn't have been able to get to the stairwell flash the lights, and get back to her seat in time before we made it down the stairs. She didn't even notice the lights flash. Needless to say, we didn't go back upstairs. The next weekend, I stayed with my friend Robin. I didn't see anything about what was going on in our house. My mom and little sister were home alone. During the night, my sister woke up because she heard a woman scream. She ran to my mom's room and woke her up and told her. Mom called the police. They showed up, checked everything out. Nothing. After my mom got her calmed down and they both fell asleep, my sister heard the screaming again. So, once again, mom called the police. They still didn't find anything. I wanted to find out why all this crazy stuff was happening, so I began to ask around. A few of the neighborhood kids got together and helped me found out. Of course, they thought my sister and I were crazy. Then my friend Aaron talked to a lady at the library. She told Aaron what happened, and then Aaron came home to my home to tell me. We were standing outside the house, on the side where my room is below the window, in my walk-in closet. She told me that there was a mom, dad, and child who lived here a long time ago. One evening after school, the little boy was up in his room which was the same room I had at the time. The mom was standing in the hallway talking to him when the dad came home. He was drunk and told him to come down. She looked at the boy and told him not to come down. He could hear his mom and dad yelling and then all of a sudden he heard his mom scream and she just kept screaming. He ran down the stairs and into the kitchen. There was blood everywhere and his dad was still stabbing her in the chest and stomach. He turned to the boy and he said, you're next. He ran up the stairs and locked himself in the attic. The dad took the mother's body and went down to the basement. In the basement, there was a little cubby hole in the wall. Inside that hole was another hole. He put her in the second cubby hole and went after the boy. He kicked the attic door open and when he found the boy, he began stabbing him little at a time, just enough to make him bleed a little bit. The neighbor heard the boy's screams and called the police. The dad took the boy, still screaming, and went down to the basement and climbed into the second little cubby hole and finished killing the boy. He then took his own life. After Aaron finished telling me the story, I looked up at my window and it was like I was looking at a family photo. I could see the mom, dad, and boy looking down at me. She was wearing a whitish sweater. The dad was wearing overalls and a plaid shirt, and the boy was wearing a pair of overalls and a plain t-shirt. They looked happy. Then I looked at Aaron, who didn't seem to notice them, and then I looked back, and they were gone. After everyone went home, and I could sit and tell my mom about it, who didn't believe me anyway, I began putting things together. The child's voice in the attic, the woman screaming, the banging in the basement. I know it could have been of the furnace, it was the middle of summer and there wasn't a need for a furnace to be on, so it wasn't in use. I still had the visits from the family 
but nothing as bad or as horrible as what they went through when they were alive. I want to start off by saying that this is a great site, and I love reading about everyone's ghostly experiences, even though I must admit I have a hard time believing them all. There's some stories that you can just tell. The person writing it is a kid with an overactive imagination. I only say this because even though I am a believer, I am a college educational rational individual, and I can also be the biggest skeptic you've ever met, which brings me to this incident that occurred. While I was still in college, I just wanted to stress to everyone that's as skeptical as I am that even though this experience sounds extremely unbelievable, that this is true and it really did happen. I know that this is long, but bear with me. I want to make sure I didn't leave anything out. This experience happened one late night in October in 1994. I was a junior in college at the time and had very little free time to do anything because besides class, I also worked part-time and was very active in my fraternity. Every year, we would have a big Halloween party at one of our fraternity brother's houses and just have a completely wild, chaotic night, but nothing can compare to what we all experienced that night. I got to the party shortly after it started, got a beer, and noticed people coming out of the basement. I asked one of the people what was going on down there, and they told me that my friend Jeff had brought his Ouija board to the party and was down there, acting stupid. Apparently, these people didn't know Jeff very well. He took the Ouija very seriously. If anything, he was addicted to it. He constantly used it and kept people in close contact with a spirit named Jack that he contacted through the board. I'd come to learn that Jack wasn't the most pleasant spirit and was a pretty mean individual who had died in prison, but for some reason, Jeff liked conversing with him. I then proceeded down the stairs to see what was going on. There was about 10 people down in the basement. By the way, this was not a finished basement. This was the spooky concrete floors and dust everywhere basement. Jeff and a girl I knew named Lynn were using the board and talking to Jeff. Lynn began getting tired of it. She was just trying to have a good time and she thought that Jeff was taking the whole thing way too seriously. Before she could get up to go back upstairs, a girl we knew named Dana came down the stairs. As soon as Dana came down into the basement, the board went absolutely nuts, moving around at a frenzied pace. Jeff said that this wasn't like Jack and asked the board what was wrong. The board spelled out that it wasn't Jack and it just kept spelling Dana's name over and over. Jeff asked the board if the spirit knew Dana and it said yes. At this point, everyone's kind of looking around confused and everything, and Dana was just looking at the board all weird. Jeff then asked the board what its name was, as it spelled out the name Michael, and that he was six years old when he died. This is when Dana went ballistic. She just started crying uncontrollably and shouting, but we couldn't understand her because she was crying so much. She then ran upstairs and out the back door. A couple of us followed her, to try and find out what was going on and to try and calm her down. We went outside and saw Dana crying on another girl's shoulder. This other girl looked both pissed off and scared to death at the same time. We asked her what was wrong and started yelling at us. How could you dare pull a mean trick like that? You should feel awful for doing this to her. We were clueless. We asked her what she was talking about and then she told us that Dana had a younger brother named Michael that drowned when he was six years old. A chill immediately went down my spine. Once Dana calmed down a little bit, she told us that she'd been trying to contact Michael over the years, but was never able to. She then offered to buy Jeff's Ouija board from him so he could keep in touch with her brother. At this time, Jack came back, and it was like he and Michael were fighting over control of the board. Jack then told Jeff, that if he burned the board that night before midnight, that his soul would be set free and he would be at peace. Jeff immediately wanted to set the board on fire because he said he developed some sort of relationship with Jack and wanted his soul to be at peace. Let's just say Dana didn't like that idea a bit, so they both got in a huge argument and the party became totally chaotic. By this time, everyone at the party, only about 50 people, knew what was going on 
and everyone started fighting and yelling, split down the middle, either on Jeff's side or Dana's. Eventually, Jeff snuck outside with a can of lighter fluid and set the board on fire with Dana standing over it and crying her eyes out. As you can guess, no one was really in the mood to party after that, and everyone ended up either staying at the house the party was at or left for home to get their head back together. After that night, not one person I know that was at this party ever talked about that night again, not even once. I don't know how to explain what happened, but all I know is that there's no way that this was some sort of trick or joke that Jeff and Dana could have played on us. Being the skeptic that I am to this day, I tried to find out just how they could have pulled this over on us. Dana was just a friend of a friend of a friend that not very many of us knew that well, and that night the party, none of us knew that she had a brother. Just that one friend of hers at a party that yelled at us knew anything about it. And then there's Jeff. He just takes the occult way too seriously, but would never use it as a basis for a joke. And if it was a trick, he's not the type to let it go. He'd make sure he knew it in our face about how much he scared us and what a great joke it was every chance he got. That's just how he is. To this day, anytime I tell anyone about this, when I get to the part that the spirit was her brother, I get a chill all over my body. Words simply can't describe what it is like being that night and what happened, but I'll never forget about it. I can remember it was just like it was yesterday. If anyone wants to write me about this or anything, feel free to. You ever just get the feeling that when you step into a building, an area, or other place, that you aren't alone? Well, that's exactly the feeling I had when I entered the funeral home and morgue that my parents owned when I was younger. Of course, one would expect spiritual energy to reside within the walls of the old morgue, dating back to the early 1900s. A family business, and one of the oldest operating morgues here in the country for her personal reasons. I won't be disclosing the name of the morgue, but I have multiple stories of this place that will terrify you. They sure terrified me. The funeral home morgue is everything you would expect it to be when walking in. Barely illuminated, but light enough that you can see each room. Red concrete walls, red carpeting on the ground, curtains, etc. It almost feels as though you're stepping into a vampire's mansion. You have the lobby area and desk where clients are greeted for the first time. The fridge and freezer where all the bodies are stored. The viewing area where recently departed loved ones are awaiting family to visit. And just an overwhelming feeling of spirits and ghosts haunting the entire building. Oftentimes, I find myself alone working for my parents from the ages of 18 to 21. Little things here and there. Managing paperwork applications, etc. So, I'd often find myself there at night, some nights, completely alone. I'll never forget one night I was there. We had a new departed client arrive. The family that they had just set up the finances in order to cover the expenses of the upcoming funeral. And, we had to set up the viewing for those who wanted to see the man of the family, who unfortunately met his demise at such a young age, 43, working in a funeral home, you get some hysterical people who have a difficulty coping with the loss. Many choose to express themselves differently. Some are tight-lipped and reserved, while others tend to be conversational and talk. The widow of the man who passed away was very candid about her husband, spoke about how great a man he was, how he served in the Marines, how close he was with his parents. She was just very adamant about speaking about her husband and his career. So anyway, after she had left and the visitation for the family had ended, the husband was still set up in his casket. I went to the office area and closed the door where just outside was the casket or the viewing area was. So minding my own business, doing what I needed to do as far as paperwork is concerned. When I hear a loud knock on my door, I say what the heck was that? Since I knew I was the only one there, 
I thought it was a little bizarre. I thought maybe my mom or dad had stopped by to check in on me, since they are the only ones who would have come by. I then started to feel a pressure on my shoulder out of nowhere, as if someone's hand was being placed on me and was getting a migraine and pressure on my head. This was all of a sudden. I was completely fine before then. So, anyway, I sort of ignored the knock at first because even though I knew I heard it, I thought I was just tired. So this time, I hear another knock at the door, and curiosity got the better of me. So I opened the office door and looked out. I see the casket from the distance, and the strange energy, as if a presence was there. I felt a burning desire to check to see the casket where the poor man was. So I go. I check the casket, and there is, just lying there, nothing. No surprise there. My back is to the office door, however, and when I finally turn around, I see a shadow for a brief moment's time, standing in a door frame. It ends up moving quickly to the right, and then just disappears. That's really got me. So I called up my parents, told them I'm going to close up, and leave. I believe that the shadow I saw was the man who was in the casket. Maybe he wanted to relay the message to the family that he was still around and want to leave. I guess that would be the explanation. So, another story I have belongs to my dad who works at the funeral morgue. This time, he was the one who was finishing up paperwork for a new family that came in. And he was alone, late into the night. For some reason, he just keeps hearing whispering coming from the freezer and storage area where all the bodies of the people are kept. It would be on and off, as if there was a conversation of a few words exchanged between the two people. But it was very eerie, because again, the whispers would come and go, but he'd hear them. He wanted to make sure that nobody somehow was hiding in the freezer storage area. So he walks in, says, hello, anybody here? I kid you not, my dad said that someone or something answered back. He said he heard a loud yes that sounded so much like a human being. So he searched the entire building and couldn't find anyone else here. Remember, my dad was alone, wasn't expecting anybody, and yet this voice, heard clear as day, was there to greet my dad for a split second. Just pure insanity. When my dad told me this, I told him my story, because this happened shortly after my experience. Thankfully, my dad is a pretty open-minded person, so he didn't dismiss my experience, and neither did I with his. I remember having a strange dream about the funeral home morgue as well. What happened was, I was suddenly outside the morgue, but it was locked. When I finally was able to get to the door to the morgue, the morgue was lit up by candles all around, and there was a Ouija board surrounded by candles in a circle. I freak out, and I'm like, what is going on here? Suddenly, a screech that sounded like a banshee erupted from the building, and an old-looking witch gypsy appears, and flies straight into the building and disappears. I wake up, sweating, and absolutely traumatized. It wasn't a dream that made me feel good at all. I thought that maybe this place had some weird dark past that I was unaware of since the building was built in the early 1900s, so maybe there was a dark history of bad people there, way before my family took over the business. Perhaps it was an old home where people used to live. Before it became a funeral home morgue, we just aren't sure. Lastly, I remember going with my dad to ghost hunt and investigate because I really wanted to uncover the secrets and mysteries of this place. What kind of dark entities, if there are at all, exist in this place? And if they did exist, would they be willing to provide us with clues and some answers as to what this place's history was? So my dad and I did some EVP recordings in hopes that we could capture some ghosts speaking about themselves or the place they lived. The only EVP that was captured was a man's voice saying never bad after we asked it into the EVP. 
if there were spirits there who were trying to do any harm, that really put us at ease. It made me think that every spirit that was there was not harmful and no demons. Maybe the dream I had was my mind overthinking, but who really knows? Thank you for allowing me to share my experiences. I used to often take little drives around town in the middle of the night to clear my mind. I was young, had no clear direction in life, as I was genuinely confused about what I wanted to do with it. I feel like a lot of people go through these types of things in life, working a job that they don't necessarily hate just to get by, but not yet having a dream job to really appreciate, wishing for something a bit more, that kind of stuff. I was definitely not in the right headspace, but I digress. This story is about the time where I encountered something on the road late at night. To this day, I still can't put my finger on it, but it was very creepy and will stick with me for the rest of my life. So one night, I was aimlessly driving to clear my mind, sort of to get away from the pressures of life for a second, and decided to take a different route. I ended up lost in the middle of the night, traveling alongside the road. I kept driving for hours on this strange gravel road in what seemed like the middle of nowhere for miles, just a straight road that was going and going. The only source of light was coming from my headlights beaming forwards until I ended up driving slowly past this old dilapidated church. It looked like it was abandoned. I then shine my headlights directly onto the church, and I see an old lady with a bewildered and stone-faced stare just standing there. I mean, she looked very old, almost like she was near death. It was the oddest thing I'd ever seen in my life. The weirdest thing was, though, she even looked like a nun. I don't know if it was, however, because it was hard to tell 100%. But she was definitely wearing some sort of black dress or attire. She also looked very pale, even though it terrified me. I stopped and yelled from afar if she needed any help, just in case it may have been someone in distress. She didn't respond. I remember her starting to walk towards me, even though she was yards away. As she walked away from the church, I wasn't having any of that and drove off. Still have no idea what that was, but it had to be a ghost of some sort. No old nun lady would just be standing in front of an old abandoned church in the middle of nowhere. Just doesn't make sense. During the day, I decide to go seek this old abandoned church out. So I go, and I find it. This time, there was no lady there. I was curious, so I step inside the church. Nothing. Nobody there at all. No signs of squatters. It was just an empty church. I don't even know why any homeless or squatter would end up here anyway, seeing as there is nothing for miles, and the church itself is literally collapsing. I had another one of these moments where I swear I saw an old dog running directly in front of my car in the middle of the night, then just to vanish into the night. I had no idea where it went, or how it appeared in the first place. It wasn't the same road as the nun lady, but it was in the same area, I believe. Whatever is going on, I thoroughly believe that this road is haunted. This experience was in the morgue. I was getting a tour of the morgue. At the very end of the tour, when the ghost tour guide was trying to contact a young man, I stood at the very edge of the freezer and my friend stood right next to me with her back to an empty hall that we all just came through. While the guide was trying to communicate, my friend whispered to me asking if he heard that. I turned to her and let her know that I only heard a child say something that I couldn't even make out. I then turned back around to listen to the guide. A few moments had only passed. My friend asked me again if I could hear that. I asked her what she had heard and she said she stated she was hearing breathing in her ear right between us. I bent a little and tried to listen, but heard nothing, so I just shook my head 
and turned back around. She then told me to hold my breath so she could listen, and I did for about 20 seconds. After a few more moments had passed, she told me again, You don't hear that. This time, the look on her face was of horror, and her eyes were teary. I then shook my head, then turned back to listen to the guide. Suddenly, it felt as if someone took both their hands and slowly expanded their fingertips widely on the back of my head. I turned around, but nothing was there. Plus, my head was against a freezer, so no one could have done that. I have wrote to you before about my other experiences, but I've worn about a haunted house a friend of mine lived in a few years back. A bunch of us used to hang out there. He had a lot of bonfires over the summer. The first time I'd ever went there was a few months after he had moved in. I was dating his best friend, and he told me that he thought it was haunted. I in turn did not believe him. At first, then things happened. We were in the kitchen, and all of a sudden we heard something from the basement, like someone using a broomstick and hitting the ceiling from the basement. I laughed at first and asked who was down there. Then I saw the look on my friend's face. He was terrified and suggested we go outdoors for a while. While we were outside, I asked what was going on. He said that was the ghost's way of letting him know he was annoyed. So he leaves the premises for a while. I still was skeptical until I looked up and could see into the front door and standing there in his living room was this old guy who was somewhat glowing. I almost hightailed it out of there when they decided it was safe to go in. I told them I was leaving and they insisted I go back in, so I did. I asked my friend if he ever seen this ghost. He said no. I described to him what it looked like, and he looked into the previous owners of the house. Well, it turns out there was a guy who died in the house who looked like the same man I described. I freaked out after that as well as my friend. Things were going good at first, like every time my friend came home from work, he would announce himself, and the guy would never bother anyone. There was always this room upstairs that every time you walked by it, you could feel a cold draft from the door, and it was locked. We never thought anything of it, till the man started to get mad. There were more parties going on out there because of summer. Well, the man seemed to not like the parties, and he started showing himself more to me and my friend. I knew he was getting mad, and things got bad when he started attacking my friend at night. He would wake up with slashes across his back. We checked into the history more and found out that the man was not friendly when he was alive and worse when he was dead. It did not take long for my friend to move. The beatings were worse by the time he left. Although he never attacked me, I always felt threatened by him. I would wake up to him right in my face and he would disappear when I would scream. I still think about the horrors that the man would do to everyone and how my friend survived actually being attacked by a ghost. Sometimes I still have dreams about this man and how he chases people out of his house. To this day, the house is still empty. In the late 1970s, I attended a college in New York State around the Finger Lakes. The building I described was built in the 1890s. Since we were in the middle of the first oil crisis, students who remained on campus spent the short winter term in the old main dorm to conserve energy. As it happened, some friends and I were assigned a large empty room on the top floor. It was four floors up and one floor below the attic and one end slanted along the roof line. The room had primarily been used for storage. The gloomy winter sun had a hard time shining through the one iced up window facing the lake. Dark as it was, we cheerfully shoveled the desk one side and slept on the floor to give us more room. 
We were having a good time camping out and weren't inclined to do much schoolwork until our papers were due. After three weeks or so, a winter storm was approaching, so we set to stock up on necessities and have a little party just amongst ourselves. I'd like to say that we were all sober as judges and went to bed early after saying our prayers. However, it being the late 70s, we indulged in smoke and alcohol. We had the music stereo up loud, but the music couldn't completely cover the growing sound of the wind. Our window was frosted up and had a tree branch scratched at the glass. Every now and then, someone wondered whether we would be snowed in. Someone said we would at least be able to get down on the tree. Eventually, we turned in, unsurprisingly. That night, I had a very spooky dream. A woman hovered over me and was trying to say something to me. God knows I tried to understand her, but her fluid outlines and vivid colors made me feel a little bit queasy. I woke up, certain she was still in the room. I saw nothing. Just the shadow of the tree limb swaying outside. Too much party, I thought, and went back to sleep. We were quiet the next morning. I supposed it was due to too much of a good thing the night before. The snowdrifts were impressive, as the wind had been so wicked. The sun was out, and the sky was clear, and the snow was pristine. It was so different than the storm that I felt up to sharing my spooky dream. It seems that two of the others had a strange dream as well. Since we all dreamed different things, I was certain nothing occult had happened. I was very relieved, since we still had three weeks to live in that room. Being a Florida girl, I was still curious about snow still and wanted to have a look around. I dragged a willing soul with me and we make a quick trek around the yard. Finally, I wanted to see about our tree my companion was crying about the cold as she ran into my back. When she saw why I had stopped, she said, son of a crap. You may have guessed by now, there was no branch, no tree, no vegetation within 15 yards of our window, and nothing was four stories high. We dug in the snow a bit to see whether it had fallen. Nope, no trunk, no hidden limbs in the snow. We ran up to the room to look out and make certain we had the right window. When we heated off the frost with a hair dryer and we looked down and saw nothing but our tracks. Every one of us marched back down to try and find our tree. Nothing. We went back upstairs and talked a bit to get over our shock. We are all skittish. I managed to sleep in the room, but with our mattresses shoved much closer together. After that, we never mentioned much. Why bother? There was no rational explanation. I'm just glad I wasn't the only witness. That would have been crazy making. Hi. I live in the United Kingdom. I've had a few ghostly experiences. My first one I was about seven or eight, just after I had my dog passed away. He used to sit with me at the top of the stairs when I was younger, as if to protect me from falling down. He would let me be me till I made it all the way up or down. After he was gone, I used to sit on the same top stair, pining for my best friend. One evening, I watched as a cat walked from the dining room door, which was open through the living room door, which was shut. This wasn't the only time I met the cat. I always slept with the door shut to my bedroom, but felt a cat paw and pat its way to getting comfortable on my bed. I also remember it purring as well. We did have a cat at the time, so I thought it was her. I reached down to stroke what I thought was my cat. Instead, there was a small indent in my mattress. When I turned the light on, there was nothing there. My door was still shut, and my cat wasn't in the room. During my teens a few times, I woke up to find my light on and television turned on. This stopped when I moved out of the family home when I went to college. 
I suppose more disturbingly is what has been happening to me for the last few years. And three different properties I've lived in, my bed was shaken. First couple of times it happened, I was really scared. But I've gotten used to it now, and I've accepted it. If I had the courage, I would ask it what it wants, but it has never hurt me. And I believe it is there just to let me know it's looking out for me. Whenever it has happened, it is usually when I have been upset. It happened after I broke up with my ex-girlfriend, for example. Thank you for listening. From what I've seen of your website so far, it has been brilliant. I'm really not a big believer in ghost stories. I usually believe that there's a reasonable explanation for just about any paranormal encounter. But there is one story that my brother-in-law tells that I think there may be more than just a ghost story. He and some friends were driving home from visiting a nearby town's hockey tournament or carnival. I don't recall which, and they saw an old man walking in the middle of the road in front of them. My brother-in-law honked his horn to get the old man to move, but he paid no attention and just continued to walk on the road. They continued towards the old man and continued to honk the horn, but he just went about his business and ignored them. My brother-in-law says that as he approached, almost close enough to strike him with a car, the old man seemed to rise up and glide right over the roof of his car. Needless to say, they were all pretty freaked out. They thought they might have struck him or something. They still weren't prepared to admit that it might have been something more than just a man walking, so they stopped and got out to search the roadside to see if they indeed struck him. But they searched all around the area and found nothing to indicate that anyone else had been there. They still get creeped out by the story when they tell it to this day because they all swear that they saw the old man, and I know these people. They are the last people that would make up a half-cocked ghost story. At my church when I was the age to be in the choir, my choir director was very religious, so of course, she believed in demons. She used to live in this old house that was built in the early 1900s. As the usual setting for a ghost story, it was a dark and stormy night. She was a single mom at the time and lived in the woods. Her kids were very young, so during the storm they got scared and came to sleep in bed with her. When they fell asleep, she went to the bathroom. While she was in the bathroom, she kept hearing strange noises. She rushed herself so she could get back to the bed with her kids. When she was going to her room, she walked past her broom closet when she did, the air got cold and she felt a presence. That's when she looked into the closet as she went back to see what was going on in there. And she saw a face staring at her from the closet. She slammed the closet door, ran back to her room, and fell asleep. When she awoke the next morning, she had a huge slash on her back. It was more like scratches but it looked deep and scary. Well, that's the story I have. I hope you enjoyed it. About two years ago, my family had our first experience with our ghost when one night, my older brother got up to go to the bathroom. While he was there, he heard a screeching noise from behind the shower curtain. It got louder and faster as it continued, and he ran out of the bathroom and into my room with his trousers around his ankles. He called for me to come into the bathroom. Drowsily, I got up, and we started down the hallway. We never did enter the bathroom, because we were both much too freaked out when a shampoo bottle came hurling out of the bathroom door, hitting the wall opposite it and rolling down the hallway. I slept in his room that night. After that, we had many encounters with the ghost that we began to call Christine after the famous Stephen King novel. 
though I personally never witnessed her, both of my parents and my friend did. My mom was the first. One night, my friend Midge and I were asleep on the living room floor when the alarm on Midge's cell phone went off at about 3 a.m. It didn't wake up Midge or I, but my mom got up and came out into the living room to turn it off. She saw who she thought was me standing in the hallway on the other side of the room. She ignored me to retrieve the phone and silence it. That's when she noticed I was asleep on the floor beside Mitch. Scared, she went back to bed. Later that night, Mitch woke me up crying and insisted that I just shaken her awake, then ran into the kitchen. When she looked over, I was asleep next to her. Several weeks later, my dad was pulling into the driveway late one night and thought he saw me sitting on the couch, pulling back the blinds and staring out the window. As he pulled close to the house, I put the curtains back and got off the couch. But when he came into the house, he discovered that I wasn't even home. I was spending the night with a friend. In between these experiences, eerie things occurred around our house. The silverware dresser would fly open and slam shut. Doors would open, close, and lock by themselves. Lights would turn on and off. Then, a very strange event occurred when I made a collage in my wall of pictures of my friends. I had about 200 or so pictures completely covering one of my walls, which took me a very long time to do. I went to bed and awoke the next morning to find that every last picture containing Midge had been taken off the wall and was in a pile across the room with all the other pictures. And that is the end of my story. I lived part-time, if that makes sense with my dad in Whitmore Lake, Michigan, before he passed away last year. One night, it was about 2 a.m., my dad was out somewhere, and my brother and sister were asleep in the other room. I was sitting at the computer, talking to my friends. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw something peeking around the corner of the room I was in right at me. Usually this happens a lot to me, and then when I look at it, it disappears. Frightened, I turned slowly to look at it, and it stayed there, just staring at me. I wanted to puke. It was extremely tall, maybe seven or eight feet tall, and had long bony fingers and long, sharp nails. It had long gray hair, and its face wasn't that of a person's, but looked to cater like a monster. I got very scared, and after about three or four minutes, which it seemed longer, it slowly backed away from the wall. I told the person I was talking to on the computer what was happening, but for some reason, I was too scared to get up to call my dad. I ran upstairs. And when I turned the corner to go up the stairs, I saw it again, standing at the top of the steps. I'm a huge scaredy cat, so I was freaking out, and I had tears in my eyes. I ran up the steps with my eyes closed and ran into my room. I turned on my light and checked in the closet and under my bed. Then I slammed my door and locked and laid in my bed until I fell asleep. The next day I woke up and went downstairs and saw my dad in the kitchen. I told him about the previous night, and before I could even describe what the creature looked like, he already knew. He told me that he saw it all the time. He told me just to ignore it. My dad was definitely not a religious person, so it bothered me that he was okay with the crazy thing just staring at me or anybody. To this day, 
that was the scariest thing that has ever happened to me. I don't like to tell too many people because they just look at me like I'm crazy. And now I wonder if the thing had any connection to my dad and his death. About a year later, he got me heavily into drugs and it was going downhill. And even after he lost his huge house in the lake that he spent his time and money and energy building, he still wouldn't leave the home. He lived in between the home and his neighbor's house in his camper. In July of 2004, my dad intentionally decided to leave the world. It makes me want to go back and investigate. That's my story. Anyway. I grew up in an old house in the rural area of Sandy Lake in Stonesboro. It was built around 1847. On the bottom floor, the walls were 16 inch stone. The top floor was built during the time the brick builders traveled through Mercer Company. Our kitchen was on the top floor and outside the door was this large lilac bush. We milked cows, but I didn't care for milk, but each night after dinner, I had to sit until I drank my milk, and my parents went into the living room. It was a nice night, because I remember the door was wide open, and I saw an old woman come up the walk. She had her hands wrapped in her apron. I turned my head to yell at my mom to tell her we were getting company, and when I turned back, the lady walked around the bush. When my mom got there, I told her about the lady, and she got very pale and called my dad, and I had to tell him the story. And being six, I didn't understand their looks. Dad went on to prove to me that there was nothing there, but I saw her. As I grew, she stayed and often just stood there outside my closet door. Even as a teen, she caught me from falling out of bed one night. I never enjoyed her being there, but tolerated her presence. Dad later told me it was probably my grandmother, who lived down the road and passed before my birth, and she always folded her hands in her apron, when not busy, as idle hands were the devil's plaything. The house is still there, and I wonder if Grandma's there too. I would like to share a story about my friendly, and sometimes not so friendly, ghost mother-in-law. I moved in with my boyfriend, now my husband, shortly after I left my last husband in Colorado. He had a son who lived in the basement of the home he inherited from his mother. My boyfriend lived upstairs, and he and his son had established a rather bachelor existence coming and going with no notice, dishes everywhere, etc. My arrival was not met with joy and friendship from his son because I brought structure and responsibility into the home as well as rules. Family was very important to my then boyfriend. His son tried to emulate him as much as possible. My mother-in-law made herself known to me right away that she did not like the disagreements and bad feelings in the home or removing items from the kitchen and around the home, some that have never resurfaced. I spent a great deal of time in the home alone, so I think I was aware of it the most. Plus, I was the only one who did dishes. Anyway, time went on and things disappeared, only to reappear in the weirdest places. Wooden spoons, which were obviously favorites due to their worn condition, disappeared and reappeared and disappeared completely, never to return. My husband, who was one of the most difficult to convince of supernatural occurrences, I mean, he saw his mother in a blinding white light standing in our hallway. He said I was sound asleep right next to him. She then faded to nothing. The last occurrence was when I was thinking really bad and evil thoughts about a co-worker of mine 
while doing the dishes. The dishes were many and stacked all over the counter. I was concentrating on what I was doing in the sink, washing dishes, when all of a sudden a landslide occurred, sending several sharp knives flying, as well as a cobalt glass globe daylight holder my girlfriend had just given me, crashing to the floor. I was thrilled to see it hadn't been broken, except for one large piece that could have been glued back. As I was crouching, looking at the glass globe without picking it up, bad and evil thoughts all ran rushing through my mind. I watched the antique knife sharpening steel literally hopped off its nail and crashed to the floor flipping several of the items already on the floor, smashing hard into the cobalt tea light holder, crushing it to smithereens. Since the nail had a large head, and the circular hook on the end of the steel was somewhat ornate, you had to lift it off the nail, over the head to lift it off the nail. I never doubted again the thoughts or things, and my mother-in-law, who hadn't put an appearance in in years, thought I should be aware of that, telling me to stop sending bad thoughts into the atmosphere. She always seems to appear during times of stress, not exactly a comforting spirit, but one telling you to buck up and get over it. I was staying at a friend's house a couple of years ago, and she did warn us that it was haunted. Of course, I didn't believe her, but after seeing this, I do now. Unfortunately, there is no evidence or photos, but I swear that I've seen a ghost. Anyway, there were the three of us sleeping in my friend's bed. They were asleep. I was not. I looked to my left at a blank space in the wall, right above my head, and to my absolute shock, a hand began to move through the wall. I thought it was just my imagination and woke my friends and just pointed at the hand coming out of the wall. We jumped out of the bed and ran to the opposite side of the room and waited. The hand began moving out of the wall and attached to the hand was the body of a woman. Now, it wasn't what I imagined a ghost would look like all floaty and transparent. It just looked like a woman standing there. She was about 5'2", which was about my height, and she was dressed in black jeans and a button-up white shirt. She was barefoot, long brown hair. She stood there for what seemed like ages. It was only about two minutes, but that's all she did. She just stood there. And then she turned, and she walked back through the wall. To this day, I will never forget what she looked like. Unfortunately, as I've said, there was no evidence that would make you believe me. No one else does either, but I swear that I've seen a ghost. I happened to stumble upon your sight, and I found it very fascinating. I thought I would share something that happened with my family with you. We live in the UK, in a small town called Stanley, in Co Durham. My mom, my little sister Rebecca, who was a week away from her fifth birthday, and I were going into the town center when Rebecca stopped at the top of the hill, and then she turned around. She pointed to the golf course that you would see from the top of the hill looked at my mom and said, That's where I crashed my plane when I was a man, mommy. She then began to stress that she saw a figure standing right there, just waving at her and smiling. Rebecca then waved back, and we asked her what she was waving for. She proceeded to tell us that her friend Billy was waving back. We didn't see anything and shrugged it off. We both laughed it off and said, come on, don't be silly. But she went on to tell us that she was flying with her friend Billy when they lost control and crashed and that they both died and how she thought it was nice she could still remember Billy. 
When we searched it just out of curiosity, it turned out that a BE-2C had actually crashed there in October of 1960, killing both of its pilots, who were both members of the Royal Flying Corps. Unfortunately, no names were listed, so we could not see if Billy was there. How else would a girl who was not yet five and could not read well enough to research some things like this know that this was the place a plane crashed and killed the pilots years earlier? I recently returned from a visit to my boyfriend in the beautiful state of Pennsylvania. On one of our day trips, he took me to Pithole, a large oil boom town with a lifespan of 500 days. Since it was fall and late afternoon, we were afraid the visitor center wouldn't be open, but we were jovially greeted by three members of the staff who told us we were just in time for the movie. Entering the small theater, we joined a couple and their two giggling girls. 20 minutes later, my boyfriend and I started down the hill to what was once a pit hole in the meadow. You'll find descripting markers of the buildings and the streets, a few old wells, and holes in the ground, which were once cellars. We were reading the markers and snapping pictures when I saw my boyfriend stop in his tracks and shake his head. I asked him if he was okay, and he said he was, so he continued walking. I kept hearing a conversation between a man and a woman and assumed it was the couple with the girls, so I kept looking up the hill to spot them. We got to the end of the street and were talking about French Kate, a brothel manager, when it got really cold. I could still hear the man and woman talking, but my teeth were actually chattering and I was having trouble breathing. I grabbed my boyfriend's hand and started up the hill, thinking we might be having an experience, but not wanting to say anything. He asked me if I was okay. I told him I was, but it was so cold down there, I was having trouble breathing. As we walked up the hall, the temperature rose, and I was breathing easier. Once we got home, we talked about what we both experienced. My brother stopped in his tracks, because he saw the back of a woman in a dress walking behind a tree. We both heard the conversation and felt a drastic temperature drop. I was the only one who felt breathless, but I guess we all have different reactions to experiences. I kick myself now for not taking any pictures, but I guess I was trying to rationalize everything. My name is Brittany, and I live in Greenfield, Massachusetts. I always thought I was crazy when I was little. Now I know I'm far from it. Okay, so I was about five or six at the time. I live in an old, big, whitish, grayish house on Woolly Greenfield. I had two imaginary friends when I lived there. Hatta and Heidi, a little boy and an old lady. I used to always play with them, and my mom was a little confused at the time. Like, is it normal for a little girl to have an old lady as an imaginary friend? But they were my best friends. I used to go in my basement with them and see things, like a man in a suit, standing and reading a book. I would run upstairs and tell my mom, but she would never let me go look. So we moved about five years later into a house on Greenfield. This house was worse than the last one. I was about 11 or 12 when we moved, and I live in this house still. And I walked into my room four or five weeks after we moved in, and I saw two little girls. They were in pink and white trilly dresses, rolling a blue ball back and forth in the middle of my room. I screamed and ran out of my house. I called my mom at work and told her the story, and she said it's okay. They won't hurt you. I've seen them too. 
I was absolutely shocked that she said that. But I went back about six hours later, not to find anything at all. My phone rang two times before the answering machine picked up, and the smell of cigars filled my house. When I listened to the phone, there was two little girls talking on the other line. So I picked up the phone and said, Hello, who is this? And they hung up. So, after six months of me and my mom getting hit on the back, our trip, our lights clicking on and off, we decided to go to the library to get some kind of history on our house, and the old house as well. We found out that the house that I lived in when I was five or six was an old funeral home, and my imaginary friends were far from imaginary. The house we live in now is an old boarding house, and the little girls have no records of ever living in the home. They don't bother us anymore, but you can still feel them every once in a while. Once, when I was around five years old, we were visiting my grandfather. He lived in a small town near the northeast corner of Colorado. My grandfather's house was very old. The only indoor plumbing that it had was a kitchen sink, but even that was somewhat antiquated. The water would come out of the faucet, but it had to drain into a little pot that sat on the floor underneath it, which then had to be tossed out of the door. To go to the bathroom, we had to go to the outhouse in the backyard, which in itself was rather scary. The house was surrounded by trees, and I seemed to remember that there were railroad tracks nearby. One night, during the particular visit while everyone was in bed, my brother in the front room on the couch, my grandpa in his room, and my mom, dad, and me in the second bedroom, a strange occurrence was about to happen. It was pitch dark, and I was lying in the middle of my mom and dad, which made me feel very safe and secure. I was wide awake and happened to be looking in the bedroom door. That's when I noticed that someone was walking through it. My mom and dad were both still in bed, and this did not look like my brother or my grandpa. It looked like a very small woman wearing a veil with her head slightly bowed. Anyway, she, or whatever it was, walked past the brass footboard of the bed, went to the window, turned around, walked past the foot of the bed again, and then out of the door. The image was extremely bright in the otherwise dark room, and I did not feel frightened by it at all. Now, the next story scared the living daylights out of me. I was around 10 years old, at home, in a very unassuming bi-level brick house. My grandfather's house looked the part for a haunting, but this one, not even close. It was just your average everyday home. However, something not so average was about to take place in it. It was in the middle of the night, and for some reason, I woke up. From where my bed was, I could look straight out into the living room which I just happened to be doing, and that's when I noticed the dark image walking out of the kitchen. It walked into the stairs and stood there for a few seconds. I concluded that this was my dad, about to go downstairs to check on my brother, who was a teenager at the time, to make sure he had come after being out with his friends. But he seemed to change his mind about doing this as he turned and started walking towards my room, which was nothing out of the ordinary, because he had to walk past my bedroom to get to his and my mom's room. He stopped at my door and stood there looking at me. I finally said, hi, Dad. I got no response. I looked at this dark image more closely and noticed that it was staring at me with big, dark, hollow eyes. No. This was not my dad, and in spite of the fact it was not threatening me in any way, I lost it 
and started screaming. This screeching woke my mom, who rushed into my room, running right through the dark figure, and it vanished. I slept on the floor in my mom and dad's room for about a week after that. I would like to tell you of an experience my husband and I had when we were living in an old house in the village of Alamnitz, North Carolina. We lived in this house for two years and discovered we had another child in our house other than our two children. You could sit on the couch in our living room and out of the corner of your eye see the shadow of a small child, female, maybe three years old. I know this was not my own children because my daughter would be in school and my son was an infant. I never said anything to my husband until he saw it and told him I had seen it several times, but didn't say anything to keep from being accused of being crazy. That spring, I was reworking my flower garden in front of the home, and as I cleared away the grass to extend my borders, I found a brick edging in the ground about the size of a small child's grave. I've never been able to find out any history on this land. We have since moved from the house, but I've always wondered who this little child was and why she is still at this home. We never felt uneasy in this home. My mother was very young when she had me, so when I was growing up, my grandmother would help me out a lot. I was very close to her, having been her first grandchild. I know she loved me very much. When I was 17, my grandmother developed heart problems and had to have surgery. She was in the hospital for a long time, never really getting any better. Then one cold night, my mom was going to the hospital to see her. I really wanted to go, but I was very sick with a high fever, so I didn't think it was a good idea for me to visit her. I went to bed around 12.10 a.m. I remember the time because I looked at the digital clock next to my bed. On March 10th, 1991, I was awakened out of sound sleep by the feeling of someone squeezing me so hard I almost couldn't breathe. That lasted for about three minutes, and then I felt a feeling of extreme sadness. I brushed it off, as I must have been hallucinating, due to the 104 fever, and fell back to sleep. About 40 minutes later, my mom returned from the hospital and woke me up to tell me my grandmother had passed away. I sat up in my bed and asked when. And my mom told me around 10 after 12. I cried and then I told my mom what happened. I had such a close relationship with my grandmother. I really felt she wanted to say goodbye to me and hug me one last time before she left this world. This is a shorter story, but one that will always stick with me. When I was a little girl, I would often have nightmares and afterwards would run across the hallway to my parents' room to sleep with them. One night, after a terrible dream, I went to the room only to find the door locked. I banged on the door crying that I was scared. My dad then said, come on in, the door is unlocked. I tried and I tried, but the doorknob wouldn't turn. While waiting for my dad to unlock the door, I glanced down the hallway into the living room. I saw the figure of a man getting up out of the rocking chair and coming towards me. Just as I screamed, my dad opened the door. I ran and jumped into the bed, telling my parents what happened. I've been around ghosts my entire life, for as long as I can remember. My house has had several unexplainable things happen. Doors open and close on their own when no windows are open. 
Lights will flicker and blow out only in certain parts of the home. We have used the same lamps in other parts of the home. The same type of bulb from the same box with no problems. When I was a child growing up with my older brother, we shared a room together. We were always told to clean our rooms before supper, and we always did. Every night when we went to bed, our rooms were nearly spotless. But every morning, when we woke up, our rooms would be a mess. When my parents asked me about it, I told them I was a ninja, big Ninja Turtles fan, and they asked what I was talking about. I told them I was a man dressed in black, and he was messing everything up. After my older brother moved out, we switched rooms since ours was bigger. In the room I have now, arguing can be heard from the restroom, which was never appeared when we got the home. The arguing goes on for about three or four minutes, getting louder and softer at times, which always ends with a muffled shout and scream. After about 15 minutes afterwards, you can hear sobbing. My younger brothers hear it too, but my parents remain skeptics. They don't want to scare them. Now the mention the imps. My friends and I have heard about the Jewish graveyard on Sand Ridge Road in Ferguson Valley, Lewistown, Pennsylvania, which is only a few miles away from where we live. We've had so many experiences there, but since this email is already long enough, I just want to let you know I've had experiences with this stuff throughout my life. I will get to the point now. The graveyard started out with nothing there. But as we went there more and more, we saw more. I haven't gone back there the last time we were there. My friend Jim was in three different places at once. We spotted creatures just as you described, being around the apparition that appeared in your home. There's more to the story, but I don't want to waste your time explaining all of this. If you heard about the graveyard before, the last time we were there, it's the last time I'll go there at night. My girlfriend and I drove past it two weeks ago, about two months since the last time we were there, and we saw a young boy dressed in early 1900s style clothes with a brown shirt, a brown vest, and a brown hat. I've been over there over a dozen times, and never have I seen anything outside of the gates. It was the belief of my friends and I that they could not leave the gates, as they never had before. But the child was crouched down on the edge of the ridge outside, as if waiting for us. This was nearly two in the morning, and it was raining, but the child did not appear wet, and I'd say that they appeared around eight or nine years old. My husband and I lived at the house for one year and had several experiences. Our apartment covered two floors, the third and the fourth. The living area, kitchen, etc. was on the third floor, bathroom and second bedrooms on the fourth floor. It started slowly, like after I had gone to bed. My husband would think that I was awake because he had heard someone walking out of the bedroom. The TV and clock radio would turn on and off by itself, sometimes change stations. The bathroom door would sometimes open by itself. One time, after getting out of the shower, there was a three-dimensional image in the mirror of a man in a sports coat. You can't see a face, but you can make out the shoulders, the lapel, and even that one button is buttoned. We happen to take a picture of it, actually. It's hard to make out because it's a mirror, but you can see that it isn't something we can draw in the mirror ourselves. One time I felt what I thought was my husband sneaking into bed, as to not disturb me. I felt the weight of his body behind me, and the weight of his arm over my waist, just holding me. My heart was racing like I'd never felt before. I reached my leg back to touch him, 
and everything vanished instantly. Another time, my husband was getting ready to come upstairs to bed and thought that I was trying to scare him by the stairs, so he slowly crept up the stairs. When he got to the top, he saw a large black shadow hovering at the top of the stairs, then it vanished in front of him. He saw that shadow again at the foot of our bed. When I told my daughter, who was out of state at college, she said we all knew something was there. It's about time that we saw it. The next time that she came home, she saw it out of the corner of her eye. When we moved out of the apartment, we had two last trips to the truck, and we went to get the last box. The door was locked. We didn't lock it. So I have a story about ghostly lights. The lights I'm going to try to explain have more to do with me, I believe, than a particular place. About 17 years ago in Texas, I came home from work, and as always, Danny, my Pomeranian, was jumping and yapping, happy to see me. He followed me into my bedroom where I sat on the edge of the bed, removing my shoes. On the floor appeared three tiny white lights in the form of a triangle moving slowly in front of me. Danny saw them and sniffed them. His ears packed and he ran out of my room. I watched these lights move for about 20 seconds and then they were gone. I ruled out every possible source I can think of. The blinds were always kept closed in my room. It spooks me still. There was an instance where my daughters and I watched lights move in the corner ceiling of the living room. I ran to get the camera, but the pictures came back. Nothing appeared on the numerous prints. We all saw the lights, and about four weeks ago, it happened again, only this time, I'm in Minnesota. I was sitting in my room on the bed, watching TV, when I had this urge to open my door, like I felt something was on the other side. I opened the door. My eyes focused on the floor because I expected one of the cats to be there. A light on the floor about the size of a teacup moved slowly into the room. Again, the blinds are always closed in my room. A few days later, my 13-year-old fell asleep in a recliner and woke to hear voices whispering incoherently behind the chair. She said she picked up a book and threw it into the air and told whatever it was to please shut up. But the whispering continued until she went into her bed. I never said a word about the light I saw either. It all disturbed me so much. I had to find a medicine man and ask him to please advise. Often, I can smell freshly brewed coffee or something delicious cooking, but visual occurrences are extremely rare for me. I do believe in ghosts. Black Forest, Colorado. It isn't just a Lee residence. I just want to say that I am enjoying your website. I was personally a visitor of the Lee residence when he wanted me to clean his house. My sister-in-law went with me. I was halfway up the stairs. She was at the bottom, and we both got extremely warm for a period of three to five seconds. Well, we couldn't get out fast enough. This home is also known for faces appearing in the mirrors, locking people in the rooms, and ghosts standing over you. Very creepy. Most of Black Forest is haunted. A little known fact is, the Native Americans, long before the white man arrived, said it was evil. They had a pathway of bent trees marked through the black forest. It was the fastest trail to cross through. It always has been eerie. The property I grew up on is behind the black forest store. Nobody has ever been able to walk down the driveway from the store to the house at night without feeling as if someone were about to eat you alive. 
It is horrifying. And as soon as you get to the light at the house, it goes away. Orbs are in every picture we have taken there. I have several pictures with ghosts in them. They've been seen, heard, felt, and even smelled there. And you'll hear stories like these from any long-term resident. And the new people wonder what's wrong with the place. My family alone could keep you busy with stories for a week about Black Forest near Colorado Springs, Colorado. I grew up in suburban Illinois and have had a great many experiences throughout my life, currently 24. As a child, 5 through 10, I've had many experiences seeing floating faces and heads in my parents' home. One night, I woke up around 1 a.m. Whenever I wake up in the middle of the night, I would walk over to my parents' bedroom to get back to sleep. I felt safer there. Our bedrooms were all on the second floor. As I walked up to their bedroom, I noticed a white object over the staircase floating at about my height. I wasn't sure what I was seeing, so I walked down the staircase to see what it was. I looked up at it and saw nothing but a floating white cloud. At this point, that was when I realized I could go through it and nothing was holding it up. I ran screaming to my parents' room. Another time, I was sleeping over in my cousin's house about age 12. I was always the last to fall asleep, and I hated it since I was always scared of the dark. An hour or so after everyone else fell asleep, two cousins, one brother, an aunt and uncle in another room, I heard the back door, along with the screen door, open and close. I heard several people walk into the home talking loudly. Although I couldn't make out what they were saying, they all walked into the room we were sleeping in and continued to talk and otherwise make lots of noise. I hid under the blankets until the noise stopped. I never slept over there ever again. My name is Karen and I live in a small town on the coast of North Carolina. I've always been sensitive to paranormal occurrences. It began when I was small, and my imaginary friend was actually my mother's cousin, who had died nearly 12 or more years earlier. I told her his name, what he looked like, how he died, everything. That was just the beginning. Then, when I was about 13, we moved into the home my grandfather grew up in. My house is between 80 and 90 years old. My grandfather and his 13 brothers and sisters grew up there. My great-grandfather actually died in what is now our living room. My sisters and I have experienced many creepy things. Take me. I've actually seen my great-grandfather standing over me. I was sleeping on the couch in the living room, in the exact place where he died, and suddenly I woke up saying something odd, and as my eyes began to adjust to the light in the room, I saw the apparition of my great-grandfather. He looked exactly like he did in the picture of him we have hanging in our entranceway. He actually looked multicolored, like when the TV scrambles and you see all sorts of colors. When I was fully awake, he disappeared. Needless to say, I was absolutely terrified, but I actually stood there trying to rationalize what had just happened after everything occurred. I also didn't like to be alone in my house that night, especially if I have to go upstairs. It's not that I feel unsafe, but I always feel like someone is directly behind me, breathing on my neck. My sister lived with us with her son for a year, while her husband was away at boot camp. Her son was maybe between one or two, and we constantly heard soft humming 
coming from his room. When we put him to bed, he would sit in the hallway, staring at the wall laughing and babbling to someone he called Big Mama. We asked my grandfather about it, and he said they used to call his mother Big Mama. No one had ever told any of us that, and we definitely didn't tell my nephew about it. While they lived with us, my sister was really screwed around with. She went to the kitchen late one night to get a drink, and when she opened the freezer to get some ice, she heard the sound of what she described as a woman's high heels, like they were in the 40s, bigger, clunky heels, and the footsteps stopped at the edge of the kitchen door and then directly behind my sister. She heard in a whispered voice, Shh! She ran out of the kitchen, leaving the fridge open, and jumped on the couch where my mom was sleeping. She also was always awakened to a woman's voice softly calling out her name. One night she had gotten fed up with being woken up, and she sat up in bed and said, Great Grandma, please let me sleep. Just let me go to sleep. From that night on, she never heard her name being called again. It's not only the family that gets messed with, it's our friends too. Once, my sister had a boyfriend that stayed the night and slept on the couch where my Uncle Ty had always slept before he passed away. Lee, the boyfriend, kept on having his feet thrown off the couch. Being in the middle of sleep, he didn't really regard it as anything until he finally woke up to his feet being held up in the air and his legs being twisted back and forth. My college roommate recently came home with me and slept in one of the rooms upstairs. It used to be my room, but that room never even got warm, even in the summer when the upstairs of our old house is blistering hot and remains cool. Anyway, she woke up in the middle of the night to see a man lying on the floor with his hands behind his head. He never moved, but he just stared at her. When he disappeared, she got up and turned on the lights and slept with them for the rest of the night. I could really go on and tell you even more stories, but I think I've written enough. I hope you enjoy my stories, and believe me, these are true. I wouldn't have spent so much time typing them out if they were fake. I love the fact that our house is haunted. I feel privileged. And it seems that every time one of my grandfather's brothers or sisters passes away, our house receives more activity. They are all just coming back home, I guess. Pretty short story but I think it's worth mentioning. Our family moved to this old house about five years ago. It is located in Ray, Michigan, a small town, of course. The house itself had some very scary and bizarre occurrences. Pictures fell off walls. Objects and small items were constantly moved around, and we somehow managed to get ourselves locked out of the house for about 45 minutes. The odd thing about that moment was, we had never locked the doors previously, and even if we did, we had the keys. My family and I were trying to open the door with the keys, but somehow, the keys wouldn't even work right. So eventually, we were able to get into the house via an open window. Other things also happened, such as money would mysteriously just vanish, and then go missing. It would then appear in another place shortly afterwards. Pretty bizarre. Of course, all these instances forced us to have a priest complex to home. We also came out to find out some disturbing details about ghosts who live here. One of them is a woman who seems to be living in a crawl space under the mudger, as well as the rest of the basement. The mudroom and basement are combined. What was intriguing was the door. The door of the crawl space kept falling off. But after the priest blessed it, 
the door stayed on. I can't really put my finger on it. We have also seen another figure in the home. I have seen her face actually. She's a young girl, dressed from the 1950s, hair like the 50s. This house was built in 1928, but I'm not too sure about what was here before, or who did even live here in the past. I know that this house used to be a part of a farm. Don't know any of the history around here either. I know this sounds crazy, and at first, I was a little nervous about all the creepy things going on in here, but this young girl doesn't seem to be doing anything real harmful. She's more prone to being a prankster and playing tricks. The other woman in the mudroom, I can't say for sure. I try to stay as far away as I can. That's the story. Ancient Hawaii had a feudal system of government. Each island had one chief Ali. Each village had lesser Ali. Each island also had a city of refuge where the soldiers of the Ali couldn't enter. Laws were harsh at this time. One could be clubbed to death by merely stepping on the shadow of the Ali or eating one of the many forbidden foods. To escape the king's wrath, the criminals would flee to the City of Refuge. The City of Refuge on Oahu is now Lai. Three ancient temple markets extend. These are the only temples on Oahu where human sacrifice wasn't performed. After a sufficiently long stay in the City of Refuge, criminals would try to sneak out. The Ali had a special troop of soldiers who patrolled the outer limits of the City of Refuge ready to carry out punishment. Today, the spirits of these soldiers still patrol the ancient boundaries of the city of refuge. Two in front beat drums, followed by four pipers. A thousand warriors march behind, looking for anyone trying to sneak in or out of the village. This ghost story became real to me on a camping trip at Hokkaido Beach. As is the custom, we used tarps to create a roof and wind block. We didn't bother with regular tents. Our shelters open up to Hakai River and the beach. We told all sorts of wild tales and stayed up until a little past midnight, then turned in. About two o'clock, I was woken up by the sounds of distant drums. My tent mate also was awake. We looked around but couldn't see anything. The drums were louder now and the sound of the flute floated through the air. Scared, we ran back to our sleeping bags. More noises played on our ears, marching feet. As we gazed out towards the river, we saw a long column of mist advancing. It hugged the river down to the beach, then turned right. The sounds grew stronger as the mist got closer. After the mist passed, all was quiet again. That morning, we found thousands of footprints following the same path the mist traversed during the night. Never again will I camp so close to the boundaries of the city of refuge. My father passed away in April of 2002, and his loss has been very difficult on both myself and my mother. Mom had a dream right after dad died, in which he came to her, sat on the bed and just smiled at her. She felt he was okay. I never had that, and so I wanted to know he was okay. The oddest thing has been happening. My mother and I were preparing to go out one afternoon. Mom looked down, saw a penny on the floor, and picked it up. She smiled at me and said, you realize that when you find a penny, someone from heaven is sending you their love. She held up the penny and said I love you to Richard, my father's name. I simply just smiled at the thought and off we went. I didn't think any more about it. Well, since that day, almost every day, I find a penny on the ground in various locations, home, work, on the street, you name it. They are always heads up. The first few times I didn't pay attention, I would pick them up and go on. Then it struck me that it was happening an awful lot. Maybe my mother is right and daddy is sending me love. 
So now, each time I see yet another penny, I smile and say, I love you too, Daddy. I hope you keep sending me pennies from heaven. One night after band practice at my high school, I went to the band room to get my bag. We were practicing outside. As I went to get my bag, there was a faded image of a girl playing the flute. I walked towards her. As I was walking, I stopped about 10 feet away from her and said, Come on, it's time to go. She said okay and walked away. As she was walking away, her legs weren't moving as she walked. I thought my head was thinking weird things, so I just let it go. And as I was getting my bag, I turned around and I heard a running sound coming towards me. I threw my bag, about 13 chairs, and one instrument. The running stopped. I looked for my bag in the pile of chairs and saw that the girl's flute was there. I said to myself, I didn't throw a flute, I threw a trumpet. That's when I started to scream because I knew it was that girl's flute. I ran to my car outside. As I was driving away, I took a quick look in the band room window. She was right there playing the flute, looking at me. That's when I found out that the girl was a Japanese girl. She died in the band room when the band teacher beat her after school when everyone left. This strange encounter happened sometime at the end of 1983. We, meaning the ex-husband, four-year-old daughter, and my son, who wasn't a year old yet, and me, the mother, were stationed in Barber's Point, Hawaii. I was getting ready to make a trip back to Ohio. I never really liked sleeping in the dark, but my husband at the time liked the darkness. I remember waking up like I was being smothered by this big black thing. A big giant spider is what I thought it to be. Whatever it was, I touched it when I was frantically swiping it away and screaming. I jumped up, switched on the overhead light, and followed what looked like a black steam cloud from a tea kettle. It went into the kids room, it went straight to the baby's crib and hovered there. By this time, I was frantic, screaming, and yelling for it to leave. It quickly raised up from the crib and exited out the window. By this time, everyone was awake and I related the story to my husband at the time. He thought I was crazy. A few days later, my daughter, new baby son, and I flew to Ohio to show him off to the family. And that's where my story ends. Thank you for reading. My daughter came for a one night visit with some of her co-workers and she spent the night with me while the others went to a hotel. The next morning she dropped me off at work and did the tourist thing with her friends and they were scheduled to leave that night, April 21st. I got home from work around 5 p.m. and did my usual routine. I walked into the bathroom to turn on the small oscillating fan on the counter and I noticed a battery pack sitting in front of the fan. I looked at it and wasn't sure what it was, then walked into the living area to open windows, etc. Around 6 p.m., I called my daughter on her cell phone to check on where they were. They were checking out the hotel and had to hurry to return the rental car. Then she asked, By the way, Mom, did you see my battery pack? So I told her it was on the counter in the bathroom. She sighed, and I told her I would mail it to her the next morning. After we hung up, I went to the bathroom to get the pack so I could put it in my bag, but there was no battery pack on the counter. I stood there, pretty stunned, and I knew I hadn't touched the pack or moved it. I looked everywhere and finally decided I would have to let her know something happened to it. The next day, April 22nd, I called her in Dallas and blurted out, I don't know what happened to the battery pack. I couldn't find it anywhere. She said, I found it, Mom. It was at the bottom of my carry-on bag. She said she must have put it in there early in the morning and forgot about it. 
I told her it couldn't be because I saw it and even described it to her. Well, this was a strange encounter. Now I'm wondering about the holographic universe and dimensions. Thanks for letting me share my experience. It's never a dull moment. First off, let me explain that I am in the military and we were living in military housing at AMR during this encounter. I was married at the time. I don't recall the exact date, though I know it was early in 2000. My wife and I were home on a Saturday morning, relaxing like we usually did. I was entertaining myself, playing video games and sitting on the couch, while my wife was at the computer desk about four feet behind the couch, checking her email. All of a sudden, I felt what I thought was a hand pat me on my left shoulder, as if to say what's up. For a second, I thought I could feel someone standing behind me. Figuring it was my wife, since we were the only ones in the house, I turned to greet her, and there was no one there. And then I also noticed that my wife had not moved, and was still typing at the computer. My next thought was that it must have been our cat, China, playing around. So I asked my wife where the cat was. She turned her chair to face me a little, showing me that the cat was laying in her lap. Obviously, I was a little freaked out, so I told my wife what had just happened. She got scared and asked me not to talk about it. Soon after that, I was again on the couch, holding and petting the cat. Unexpectedly, she started to claw into me, while at the same time looking at something unseen that seemed to be right behind me. The experience gave me a chill. I let the cat go, and she ran off to the bedroom. Though I thought it was a bit weird, I shrugged it off, even though I was a bit unnerved. A few days later, I was laying on my bed watching TV, and I noticed that the cat had wandered in the room, so I called to her. Usually she came right to me right away, and she stood there, just looking at me. So I continued to call to her until once again, she seemed to see something behind me. At this moment, I sensed a presence again. The cat turned and ran out of the room. As you can probably imagine, I was a bit tired of it all, so having had enough, I turned my head, looked over my shoulder, and as a reaction said something like, please leave me alone. After that incident, Nothing more ever happened. First off, let me explain that in Hawaii, you are raised to be suppositious from small kid time. I was always told that if you ever hear someone calling you from outdoors after dark, do not answer or you will be taken away by some spirit or obake as we call it. When I was about 11 years old and quite obsessed with supernatural powers, witchcraft, ghosts, and such. Day after day, I would hold up in my room and read every ghost book I could get my hands on. In our backyard, we had two big mango trees, which for some reason would scare the bejesus out of me. You could not get me to go back there in the dark, even if my life depended on it. One night, while in my room reading, I kept hearing my dad call me from the backyard. Being an obedient child, I answered him. When he called me again, I got scared, remembering what I was taught when I was younger. I went into my parents' room to check and see if my dad was outside, and if not, and to see if indeed it was him calling me. To my surprise, he was on his bed watching TV and asked me why I was yelling for him. I explained to him what happened, that I heard him calling for me from the backyard. He told me to never answer a call from outside, unless I know for sure who it is I am answering, and that he did not call for me. Needless to say, I was scared to death, and did not want to go back there, even during the day. All the neighborhood kids would want to go back there and climb the trees, pick mangoes, or play hide and seek, but day after day, I would refuse. Like all kids though, I eventually forgot that night, and went to play with my friends in the backyard. We must have been playing back there all day. I didn't realize until around sundown that it was getting late. I remember the night someone called me from the backyard. 
The mango trees make good shade during the day, but at night, they make it even more dark. As I was walking very quickly around to the front of the house, I heard my baby brother calling me, sounding really scared. For fear of getting in trouble, I am the oldest with two younger brothers. I ran back to go get him. When I got to the corner of our house where I could see the backyard, something made me look up in the mango tree. To my horror, I saw a pair of glowing red eyes. I ran into the house as fast as I could. I just opened the front door and saw my brother there at the kitchen table waiting for my mom to bring him his plate. After telling the story of my encounter in the backyard, my mom tried to convince me I suffer from an overactive imagination. I am positive what I saw was not of this dimension and most certainly was a supernatural being. It's what we in Hawaii call chicken skin. My family and I were out for a night drive and decided to head to Kiwanala Beach in Yokohama Bay, Makakawa. It is a drive we took many times to watch the sunsets or to gaze at the stars. On this night, we really didn't notice how dark the night seemed. As we entered the park, it seemed as though we were the only ones there. My sister needed to use the bathroom, which is located near the entrance of the park. When we stopped, we noticed three lights at the end of the park, about a quarter mile away. Most locals tend to park there to avoid police patrols who most times won't go that far into the park. We assume that some locals attracted the attention of some officers. As we were getting back into the car, we noticed that these lights way at the end of the park changed from blue to green. Soon these lights started towards us. As these lights would bounce up and down, the number of lights would multiply by hundreds at a time. Each light was only about three inches long and four to five feet off of the ground. This covered the whole beach from the mountain to ocean, which is about two to three football fields wide. All of the lights move up and down at the same time, each by multiplying by the hundreds. It soon gained on us near the entrance in a matter of 30 seconds. We all got back into the car and quickly left. These lights were about 40 feet away from our car, but we couldn't make out what it was. As we left the park, we passed another car. We were so frightened that we drove as fast as we could to the nearest convenience store and stopped to talk about what we had just seen. As we did this, the car who passed us before heading to the park drove right past us at a high rate of speed. It was later that I found out that it was the Hawaki Po, or Night Marchers. Thanks for reading. Today I have a story for you that is very scary for me, but might be a bit sad. Also, this is fairly recent in memory. I'd say it was about a month ago now. I was chilling at my grandparents' house, which is quite large. I hate it, and still do, going up the stairs alone when nobody else is in the house. Alright, so now I'm getting to the point. So me and my brother Tasman had stayed over the night. But during the night, it seemed that I would get woken up constantly to the sound of someone digging their heel into their wooden floor and then dragging it as if they were limping. This was very creepy as neither my grandparents nor Tasman own a pair of hard shoes. Then I thought back to my great-grandmother. She had a broken leg, and since she was so old, she died because of it. She always wore those wooden-type shoes, so ones that look like clogs, but have a buckle and a heel. Then I have one more strange event that happened to me and my friend Katie. When we were about 12, we were about to watch a small movie. Nobody else was upstairs, and this is really important information when we heard a little human sigh. It sounded like it was from an old lady as well. We sprinted out of there without even thinking, but it gets even weirder. Me and Katie both sat down to watch that same video again, when out of nowhere, the whole room just went white. Like a blinding white, but just for a split second though. There wasn't any cars around, and it was most certainly not the sun. So how? From now on, 
I'm not going upstairs by myself or with a friend to watch movies, and I haven't stayed the night since. This was all very strange, and I hope that it will not happen anymore if I go back to my normal ways. Thanks for reading. The following story involves a house that is literally across the street from my best friend David. By the way, David's house is haunted. You can hear the story in Hell Freezer's channel. This story takes place in my city and neighborhood of Silver Spring, Maryland. Anyway, one day, David and I were building a patio for his backyard. I decided to take a break and head it out front. I sat on his rocking bench and lit my cigarette. That's when I noticed a disturbance coming from that house. As I stood up to take a closer look, I noticed an old Korean woman muttering hysterically in her foreign language while waving around something that was smoking. While she paced back and forth, she was trying to be comforted by two family members. I was immediately intrigued by whatever she was holding, but also wanted to see if I could help. I slowly approached the situation. As I got closer, I see the woman with tears in her eyes, holding what is mostly known as the sage smudge stick. A sage smudge stick has many purposes, and one is cleansing a space inhabited by evil spirits. I asked the other woman, her daughter, what was going on? She told me that this was her mother's home and that she couldn't stand the ghost in her house anymore. My mom thinks this place is haunted by an evil spirit. I asked if I can help with anything, but she declines. I wanted to keep asking questions, but this wasn't any of my business. David's neighbor knew a lot about our neighborhood, told me why the house was haunted too. He said that in 1989, a young man who lived there killed his parents and then himself. I found an old article on this story. It stated that a 27-year-old man, armed with a shotgun and a rifle, fatally shot his parents in their bed in their Wheaton home before killing himself. Back to me. His parents didn't live in that house, but he did. His sister was the one to find her dead brother. The police officer asked her whether her brother was mentally disturbed. She nodded yes. I suppose a troubled man can also be a troubled ghost. When I was 17 years old, a group of friends and I decided to check out a haunted place in our state of Maryland. It is known as Crybaby Bridge. As a side note, in the early 70s, my mom actually went to this same exact bridge when she was 17 too. It's pretty cool stuff to be honest. Now, this bridge is also known as the famous Goatman Bridge. There claims to be a Goatman Bridge all over the country, but through some research, I discovered that this particular bridge was the original, at least for the legend of Crybaby. If you're ever in Maryland, go to Governor's Bridge Road in Bowie. There are some sketchy backwoods characters who live out there, so be very careful. Anyway, let me start this story from the beginning. There were five of us. Andy, Hector, Mary, Jessica, and of course myself. We hit the road all excited. Andy was blasting his new subwoofers he installed in his Cadillac, so we were in good spirits. Our GPS was directing us pretty well in the beginning, but once we hit that area of Bowie, it literally stopped and our phones were all disconnected. Jessica was filled with fear and grabbed my shoulder tight. I assured her and Mary, who was also scared that this is how it is in the boonies. We were getting so close to the bridge, but didn't know which dirt road to take. It started getting dark. That's when we randomly came upon a trailer park spot. It wasn't really a trailer park community, but just three isolated shacks that were literally miles and miles away from civilization. I mean, fuck, you see that kind of shit in the movies and know that this would be a good time to leave, but we were so close to the bridge that we couldn't just turn around. Hector decided that we should ask for directions. When they saw our car stop on this dirt road next to their home, this woman and man got up from their rocking bench and walked slowly over to our window. The woman, who was maybe in her 70s, she was missing her two front teeth and was holding a Budweiser, and the man, who was maybe in his 30s, was a husky fellow with the most cliche backwoods outfit on. He had it all down to a T, with the dirty overalls, missing teeth, confederate flag tattoo, shotgun by his side, and a lit marble Lucy hanging from his lip. They were very friendly, almost too friendly. They had already known why we're here. Apparently, 
A lot of people venture out to this bridge all the time. I asked if the rumors were true. The man with a slight southern twang said they used to hang goats from nooses back there. I asked about the crybaby bridge. He said he didn't believe in that one, but the woman did. She told me her version of its origin. Keep in mind that there are once again many variations of this legend's origin. The origin I was told was that legend states that in the early 20th century, a young woman was impregnated, but not married. In order to avoid judgment by family and peers, she drowned her baby in the river. Days later, with all of her guilt, she was trying to find her baby, which of course would have been impossible, so she too jumped off the bridge to her death. Time for the fun part. The urban legend rules were to first cut the car lights, get out, stand right in front of the bridge, and shout, I have your baby. What's supposed to happen is first you'll hear the faint sound of a baby crying. As soon as you head back to the car and get in, the woman will appear with a soft but crying voice, repeating, where is my baby? She then will erupt in anger and chase you down, only to disappear. So here we are. However, I did one thing a bit different, which I've now learned never to do again. Being the asshole that I was, instead of just saying I have your baby, I said, I have your baby you stupid bitch, come and get it. Yes, disrespectful. I know viewers will be mad, but I thought it might achieve more attention from the ghost. I was also trying to be funny and show off to the girl I was seeing. I was a dumb 17 year old kid, so give me a break. Anyway, nothing happened, although I did feel a bit strange, but I figured it was all in my head. Now this is where it gets creepy. When I got home, I went downstairs to my computer to do more research on the bridge. I've only been home a couple of minutes when I hear a loud crash from upstairs. I thought it was my grandpa who would occasionally drop something off his bed or even fall, so I rushed upstairs to his aid. I run down the hallway and reach my grandpa's room and he was sound asleep. I look around his floor and nothing was on the ground. I shrugged and turned back around. That's when I see it. I must have missed it while I was running. I stand there shook and see that three framed pictures off both sides of the hallway walls had fallen off the wall and shattered on the wooden floor. As I look at each picture, I notice that every single photo was of me as a baby. One was even my mom holding me as an infant. I put two and two together and thought, oh shit, did this ghost follow me home? I must have really pissed her off. I thought this had to be a coincidence. I pick one broken picture up and notice that my dog is acting strange. She was staring at the front door. It was so intense. I was calling her, offered treats, and even tried to move her, but she wouldn't budge. This bugged me out because she always, and I mean always, loyally listened to me. I do believe animals can see things we can't, and my dog was aware of some sort of presence. I was starting to get really nervous, but kept my composure and remember my dad telling me a story about a ghost experience of his. I'll make it quick. My dad said when he bought his first apartment, it was extremely cheap, almost too cheap because the last two tenants claimed it was haunted and wanted out. Apparently, a woman was stabbed to death in the apartment eight months earlier, and now she's haunting it. My old man could give two shits about it. It was cheap, and he didn't believe in that stuff. His outlook changed the very first night he moved in. He said every night, around 11 p.m., he would hear what sounded like footsteps starting from his hallway and ending at his bed. He's a mechanical dude, so he thought it had to be time machinery within the walls. However, after a week, it clearly sounded like footsteps. So one night, when he heard that last step at the foot of his bed, he announces, Look, I'm sorry, but I live here now. I don't mind that you're here either, but please stop making noises because it's scaring me. And just like that, it stopped. So I decided to do the same. While holding the broken frame, I apologized out loud that I'm sorry for saying those things. I don't have your baby and I won't ever do it again. My dog then clawed the door. I opened it and closed it. She was back to normal and I didn't have a sense of dread anymore. After that experience, I did research and found that if ghosts are angry enough, they can attach themselves to you. Then again, this all could have been a coincidence. But what I learned 
is that you don't disrespect the paranormal. This is a story of a young woman that got killed on the highway in the town near us. Some people say a gang of men attacked and murdered her when she got stuck on the highway late at night, and some say she was killed by a moving vehicle on the same highway when she got struck there at night. A guy who said he'd encountered her late at night was basically driving home at night on the same highway the lady got killed on. While he drove, he noticed a young woman hitchhiking, so he decided to give her a ride. He picked her up and asked her where she wanted to go, and she said she wanted to go home. She got into the car and he noticed the temperature dropped, so the man offered the lady his jacket. When he got to the young lady's home, she wanted to give him his jacket back, but he refused, saying he would pick it up the next morning since it was still a bit chilly. The next morning, the man went back to the house of the young woman and he found an elderly woman at the house, and so he asked if he could fetch his jacket from the young woman, whose name was Sheila, which he later discovered. But the elderly lady refused, and looked confused, and told him that Sheila had died years ago, and she used to live there. She told him where she was buried, as she did not believe the old woman. He then got into the car, and drove to the graveyard where Sheila was buried, and lo and behold, he found his jacket draped over the headstone of Sheila. One night, some friends and I were driving around, and we decided to check out an old bridge that was supposedly haunted. The story behind it is that a girl hung herself from the old one-lane bridge in the country. My best friend, Tommy, is into ghosts and believes heavily in them, and I decided to call him out. I was telling him that he was a coward and nothing would happen if we went there. As we turned down the foggy, beat-up one-lane road, I ridiculed him about the whole situation, as we came to the bridge, a black cat scurried across, and in my headlight, the green eyes of the cat glanced at us eerily. As we crossed the bridge, my friend told me that this was a bad sign. I again replied with sarcasm, and told him that must have been the ghost. We passed over the one-lane bridge so that we could turn around down the road and come back over the bridge facing the main road. My friend Tommy then convinced me to leave. We drove around a bit more and I convinced him to go back with me. We went back, and like the first time, we crossed the bridge, turned around, and drove back towards the bridge. We then came to the bridge once again, and I decided to stop my vehicle on the bridge. I went to put the car into park, and glanced into my rear view mirror. When I did this, my jaw dropped. A fog-like figure shaped like a basketball head with a human body walked behind my car, turned towards me, and looked at me with the same green cat-like eyes. It looked upset, and I've believed in ghosts since. The anger in the cat's eyes shot fear down every limb in my body. I then hit the gas and flew out of there. Now, I am a 3 plus 0 student at the University of Finley in Finley, Ohio. I'm a baseball player at the university, and I'm about 6'2 and 200 plus pounds. I'm not scared easily, and I get chills whenever I think of this. I can't even tell the story to friends without coming to fear, and the image is ingrained in my mind. I feel like I have upset something, and I now believe in demons and ghosts and would like to learn more. On January 8th, I was hanging out at a local shopping complex with a couple of friends of mine. My friend, Mary, turns to me and begins telling me a story of a bridge just over the North Carolina and South Carolina state line called Catswoman Bridge. She was telling me that a number of years ago, a woman was driving home one night, and just before she was about to cross the bridge, a cat ran out in front of her. Trying to miss the animal, the woman swerved and wrecked her car in the woods just before the bridge. The next morning, local police found her car sitting, upside down, underneath the bridge, Upon investigation, police found a woman's body being beaten by a group of cats. My friend, Mary, continued to tell me that if you park your car in the center of the bridge and turn off the engine, you can hear the faint sounds of a vehicle crashing into trees at the end of the bridge. I'm in total disbelief. She continues to tell me that if I go to start my car to drive away, then my engine will not start unless it is pushed to the end of the bridge. I decide, okay. Let's test this. 
We drive to the bridge, and I park my car in the center of the bridge. As I go to turn off my engine, my other friend, Robin, starts crying with fear and begs for us to leave. Not wanting to upset a close friend any further, I put the car in drive and began to drive away. As I drive away, there was a very thick fog that completely obscures my vision momentarily, and I decide that it's time to go home. However, the only way to go back home is to drive back over the bridge again. I turn my car around and begin to make my way over the bridge. The moment my front tires are on the bridge, my engine dies. Now, this could have not been a mechanical failure due to the fact that I was driving a 2005 Chevy Impala. I apply my brakes to prevent wrecking my vehicle, but my brakes wouldn't work until we rolled over to the other side of the bridge. After we get to the other side, I stop my car, put it in park, and restart my engine. Just as we are about to pull away, we all see bright lights that appear to be car headlights beaming upwards at an angle as if it were a car that had run off the side of the road. Scared out of my wits, I drove as fast as my car would get to get off that side of the road. When we got back to my house, we look over my car as soon as we get out. To our surprise, there were cat's paw prints all over my car, the hood, roof, and trunk. There were also streaks that looked like someone had tried grabbing the car with their hands. There were also complete handprints on my back window. None of these prints were there prior to us going to the bridge. I set my car through a car wash almost an hour or so before we went to the bridge. I tried doing a search on the bridge and I found nothing. At first I was skeptical about the validity of the bridge, but after this, I will never drive over that bridge again. Thanks for reading. I was in the Navy at the time and stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. I was driving to Houston, Texas on leave and had been on the road all night and alone. My diet had consisted of just coke and it was coming on 2 to 3 a.m. I remember seeing something out of the corner of my eye, so when I turned to look, I was surprised to see what appeared to be a runaway slave sitting in my passenger seat. He had an unkempt fro and bib overalls with no shirt. He kept looking around frantically as if someone was chasing him, then he was gone. I then noticed something out of my other eye. When I turned, I noticed hovering outside my car was an older white man with a sunburned face and neck, wearing a khaki shirt and sporting a crew cut. Out of the two apparitions, him I did not like. Now things started getting interesting as he proceeded to yell or chant something at me through the window as I was traveling about 70 miles an hour. The next thing I knew, I was transfixed on my windshield as it starts to turn white, like at the beginning of a movie when the screen goes white. Oblivious to everything, the slave man starts yelling at me to look out. I snap to and am literally inches from plowing into the car in front of me. Then everyone was gone. A few minutes later, the white man shows up again and everything starts over and ends the same way. Finally, the third time it happens, I couldn't snap out of it as quickly. I felt the car shaking and bopping about as the white man chanted and the slave man yelled at me to look out. When I did snap out of it, I was in the median between the two roads headed for a bridge. Of course, there was no bridge for people on the median, so I slammed on my brakes took the keys out of the ignition, covered my head with my jacket and prayed. I fell asleep for a couple of hours and when I woke up, I drove home without incident. That was trip one of two. I never really believed in the paranormal. I consider myself a skeptic and wholeheartedly believe that it is rational to question experiences without substantial evidence to back it up with. I do not believe in a higher power and consider myself to be an atheist. But after these accounts I had, I now believe that the afterlife does exist. Firstly, I wanted to reassure you all that I am not crazy. I'm not on any medication that causes me to hallucinate. I consider myself to be a competent human being. And during this experience, I was completely awake and alert. I was inexplicably looking out my bathroom window from upstairs. I say inexplicably 
because I can't even begin to explain why I felt the sudden urge to look outside my window. It was almost as if I felt some intense energy force me to look outside my window, and I couldn't resist it. So I was brushing my teeth, and that's when I noticed it. A cloaked figure, the size of a normal-sized man, floating across my courtyard, wearing all black. I wasn't able to get a good look at the apparition's face, because I had only noticed it from a side angle, and it was 20 feet away, moving across my line of vision, where I was able to get a side-on view of the hooded figure. My initial reaction, believe it or not, was met with apathy. I did not think anything of it, and so I went on with my daily routine. I think I may have been in denial about it, because I just didn't want to convince myself that spirits exist. And besides, I had an important job interview that I had to get ready for. A few days later, I was sitting in the living room watching YouTube videos on my laptop. I decided it was time for bed, so I closed my laptop since it was getting pretty late. I can't remember exactly what time, and I was home alone, but still alert. I just couldn't sleep. I had completely forgot about the experience I had a few days prior. Now this is where it gets extremely creepy. As I was heading upstairs to go to my room, I swear on my life, I heard a distorted voice saying the words death and now whispered faintly in my ear. I can't even begin to explain the eeriness of it all. It just didn't sound human, and it had a certain calmness to it. Seven months later, my 27-year-old brother died in a horrendous accident involving a car hitting him on the M40 after he ran out of fuel and was walking down the hard shoulder to get to the nearest fuel station. Could this have been some sort of warning? I can't seem to find the answer I'm looking for on Google, so I've signed up on here in hope of finding some expert help. Again, I consider myself a logical human being, but after these experiences, it seems there's much more to this universe that I can't truly ever explain. This is one of the scariest experiences I've ever had, so I'm going to tell it to you right now. My friend and I were heading home from a friend of ours in a nearby town or village, I should say, because I live in a really remote location. It is at least 15 miles from my house, and there are a lot of alternative roads to use. The best roads are the longest, so we figured we could check the GPS to see if there was a quick route, and we saw an alternative road we decided to use, which to all of our surprise, we never heard of because both of us have a very good knowledge of this part of the county. We started the drive, and the first part, we're on a road we knew well, but as we seen on the GPS earlier, the left turn into the unknown was coming ahead. We took the left turn onto a gravel road with no signs on it, and it was heading right into the forest, and we drove for a few miles. Suddenly, asphalt appears in the middle of a timber truck-like road, and thick smog was building up outside. So I was fighting to see the road, and it was getting really cold in the car. We kept on driving longer into the woods, and then... Out of nowhere, a lady all dressed in white was standing by the side of the road. She was holding an old washboard and looked me right into the eyes with what looked like black eyes or very dirty around the area around the eyes. I remember specifically her long white dress and the horror that struck me right away. I wanted to drive 120 miles per hour, but I couldn't drive faster than maybe 20 because of all the fog. So it felt like we drove for hours, which I'm sure wasn't more than 10 minutes. And then suddenly, fog is clearing up, and we're at a crossroad near a village close to mine. Because of the panic, I couldn't memorize everything properly, and then I drive to my friend's house safe, and dropped him off and got home. Today, we're trying to find this road again, to show a couple of friends who didn't believe us, but it is nowhere to be found. We even drove to the same village at the exact same location where we dialed in the GPS, but it did not show that lost road as an alternative. I have always been able to pick up and sense things. It's kind of random. Most things I keep to myself, because in my experience, it makes people uncomfortable. That's another post though. 
The first time I saw the Hat Man, I was eight years old, about 1970. I lived with my parents and two sisters. I shared a room with my middle sister. It was late. I knew everyone was in bed and sleeping. I feel this memory like it happened yesterday, and I think thinking about him will open up that part of me that's sensitive to that kind of energy. It's scary. The terror and just the sense of having been watched. The energy or vibe of badness, wrongness, and or just a darkness. Hard to convey the shock that I felt when I knew I wasn't dreaming. I woke up and in the doorway, I saw a man with a long black overcoat, kind of like one of the old western duster coats. He had on a fedora hat with a large brim. I couldn't see his face clearly, it was in shadow, but the nightlight from the bathroom lit him from behind. He crooked his right index finger, motioning me to him. I blinked, rubbed my eyes, and he was still there. It seemed like he was closer to me then. He was still backlit from the nightlight. I remember looking at him getting closer, closing my eyes, and saying the Our Father prayer. When I opened my eyes again, I didn't see him, but I knew he was still there. The energy or feeling was still there and very strong. I knew I shouldn't have got out of bed or tried to run across the hall or else he would somehow get me, or so I thought at the time. I don't remember how long I sat there in my bed. It seemed like a long time. I finally got up the courage to run to my parents' room. Don't think my feet even touched the floor. I woke my parents. The police came. The house was searched. Neighbors all on alert. No signs of anything or anyone. I remember distinctly seeing my parents, their friends, grandparents, in little groups huddle up talking, looking at me. I don't think anyone believed me, and they thought I might be incapacitated in some way. It was close to five or six years before I would sleep alone in a room, much less by myself in a bed. Now all these years later, I've had a few incidents recently that brought it home again. Thanks for reading. After lurking around the site ever since the same age this happened, I finally decided to write out what happened to me 10 years ago. The following experience is my very first paranormal encounter, though not the only one. When I was in third grade, I lived in the city of Spring, Texas, which is a suburb about 18 miles north of Houston. The subdivision this happened in was Oak Creek Village, Old Oaks. At one corner of the subdivision, near my house, there was a forest and if you continue along the main path for about 10 minutes, you'll reach a clearing in which there is a small river with a large drainage tube with its mouth open perpendicular to the side of water. A neighborhood friend and his dad showed me how to get there, and I often rode my bike to the location to explore around. One holiday weekend, my mother invited a boy in my class named Steven to our home. As he was my only friend from school, I went to a school outside of our neighborhood because my mom taught there and the nearby school wasn't very good. After playing baseball a bit, I told him about the forest and he agreed to ride there on my scooter with me as I rode my bike. When we got to the clearing, we slid down the grass hill to get to the river and Steven stepped on the rocks atop the water to enter the drainage tube as I watched from the grass nearby. About 20 seconds later, he walked out looking quite bewildered, and said, I just heard a gunshot in there. Being a brave child, and since I hadn't heard a gunshot, I wanted to investigate, so I walked on top of the rocks and peered into the drainage tube as Stephen stood behind me, seven or so feet away, not in vision of the inside of the tube. I had planned on walking inside the tube, but stopped because of what I saw. Inside the tube, about 50 feet away, was a glowing white figure, and though fuzzy-ish, was clearly in the shape of a human, as I could make out a head, shoulders, arms, legs, and torso, though there were no details. It was only an outline of mostly a man. Unable to comprehend what I was seeing, I could only stare at it in quizzical wonder. I started to look around the figure, but there was only darkness. It didn't appear as though anything, but the figure was inside the tunnel, and no noise whatsoever could be heard. I continued to stare at the figure, 
and saw that it appeared to be walking around within a small area, occasionally bending out and then standing back up. It seemed to be looking for something on the ground. As I continued to stare, I felt like it was gradually coming closer, at which point I realized, isn't that a ghost? Only having heard the word mentioned a few times before, and in scary stories, I started to worry about the danger of glowing figure behind me, so I stepped back, faced Stephen, and told him what I was seeing. His eyes widened, and he told me we should get out of here, so we ran as fast as we could and raced on my bike and scooter back to my home. Though I remember having a small interest before, this experience is what truly got me into the paranormal and what led me to this very site 10 years ago. Though I've been back to the location several times after, as it is dangerous, I haven't ever stepped on the rocks leading into the tube since then. My own theory is that it was the ghost of a man who had died in the tunnel or nearby, and the gunshot was the sound of what had killed him. Though now an uninhabited and empty forest, I later found a mountain of bricks that I felt had been used to build a house in the clearing long ago. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, and went to school with lots of the country music stars kids. This afforded me some rather unique experiences, and one of those is how I came to encounter a ghost. There is a hotel in Watrice, Tennessee, called the Walking Horse Hotel. I know it is still there because I visited it yesterday with my wife and kids on the way back to Atlanta from visiting family in Nashville. The property has changed dramatically on the inside, but as soon as I saw the outline of the building, I knew that it was it. It was in the early 1980s, and I was invited to go with some of my friends and one adult, the wife of a very prominent country music star, to stay New Year's Eve as the guest of the manager of a unique hotel located in Tennessee, Walking Horse Country. We were to be the only people in the hotel as it was closed that evening. My friends had stayed there in the recent past and had some interesting experiences. This particular hotel was the resting place of Strutting Jim, one of the most famous Tennessee walking horses of all time. His trainer Floyd had lived in the hotel and sometime after the horse's passing had died himself in his room on the third floor of the three-story hotel. Floyd was still said to be wandering the grounds in the halls of the hotel, but our host George, the manager of the property, assured us that he was always friendly and had not harmed anyone. We arrived mid-evening after stopping for dinner on the way and enjoyed a nice quiet evening. We spent most of the evening looking at the amazing walking horse artwork that hung on almost every square inch of the lobby and main staircase. It was shortly after midnight. We had been listening to George's tales of encounters from other guests when everyone started settling down to sleep. I was feeling a bit brave and still wasn't as sold as the others on the authenticity of Floyd the Ghost, so we decided to go up and sit in his room on the third floor to see if anything would happen. I sat on the bed in almost total darkness and waited for Floyd. When I opened my eyes, I was laying on the bed, still fully dressed in clothes and shoes and day was just breaking. I knew that I had fallen asleep and that there had been no visit from Floyd. I went downstairs to find George, starting to put together breakfast and the others were just starting to mill about. George suggested we go out and see Strutting Jim's grave marker and stretch our legs before breakfast. As we headed out to the back pasture to visit the stables and grave, it all seemed strangely familiar. As we approached a fenced-in area on the side of the pasture, I stopped George and asked how long the English sheepdogs had lived there. He looked rather surprised, as we had not been out there the night before, and there had been no mention of the dogs. But sure enough, they came running up to the fence and started barking and looking directly at me. We then proceeded to the stables where the grave marker was, and there were a few horses kept. As we approached one of the stables, George told us all to stay clear of the big black one as he bit anyone he didn't know. The black horse immediately came to me and started nuzzling my head and stamping his feet in excitement. We then walked over to the grave marker and I led the way as if I had been going there for years. By now, even George was blown away with all of this and when asked, I responded that I slept in Floyd's room, but didn't remember leaving the bed all night. 
We all walk back to the hotel, talking about the strange events, and without asking, I walk directly in the rear kitchen door like I owned the place. We had not been anywhere near this area of the hotel for our visit, but I knew exactly where to go. We all sat down in the dining room, and George asked who would like biscuits with honey to start. I jumped up and stated that these were the best biscuits in the world, and everyone should have some. George asked how I knew this since this was my first visit and we had arrived after dinner the night before. I walked straight into the kitchen, opened a pantry, reached up to a tin on the third shelf and opened it up to reveal a tin full of the very biscuits. That pretty much sealed the deal. It is my assumption that Floyd took me for a little spin the night before, using my body as a vehicle to get to his favorite places and get some of his favorite food. I am still not quite sure what to make of this incredible event, but I know that I now believe that there are some people who just aren't ready to go on to heaven or whatever awaits them and they are still here on earth with us. On my visit yesterday, it was so disappointing to learn that the new proprietor had gutted the hotel, changed the entire layout, losing the lobby and grand staircase, and didn't believe that any of the tales about Floyd were anything more than poppycock. The entire feel of the place was different, and I hope Floyd has moved on to his eternal resting place. I know the memory of that incredible day will always be with me. When I was 14, my family transferred from Danbury, Connecticut to Simbago, Maine for my mom's work. My parents bought a farmhouse with an attached barn so we could keep our horses on the property. I was a freshman in high school and my sister was a few years behind me. Almost immediately, I began seeing, out of the corner of my eye, someone walk past the bathroom door and go down the stairs, but when I looked straight down the stairs, no one was there. This would happen every morning as I was getting ready to go to school. As the months and even years progressed, I'd witnessed voices having conversations that I couldn't make out. I heard banging and footsteps coming from the second floor when no one was up there and a voice calling me by name and demanding that I come to it when I was the only person in the house. I did not have the courage to come to the voice, so I stood there until my father came inside the house. There was also the time I was in the barn with the horses and was enveloped by the stench of decaying flesh. No dead animal could be found in the vicinity of the barn. During the summer of 1992, I was 17 and working for a family camping resort in the general store. I remember being asleep and being woken up by a man's voice in my ear. He said, wake up and hear the storm. I can still remember feeling the vibration of his words in my ear and being puzzled by what I had just heard. I sat up in my bed and was afraid that there was someone in my room with me. My father was the only man in the house and I was positive that it was not his voice that I heard. Beside the fact that I didn't hear my door open or close, so I was sure that whoever had spoken to me hadn't left yet. Lightning was coming down outside, and I could hear the horses whining, so I got out of bed and tried for the light, but the power was out. I stumbled down the stairs and saw that my father was in bed sleeping. I took a flashlight with me to the barn and saw that the horses were outside loose, one horse had broken through the fencing, and the others were running around, panicked by the storm. Thanks to the voice, I was able to gather up all of the horses and put them in their stalls safe and sound. It was the only time that the spirits were helpful to me. Thanks for reading. I'm an experienced ghost and demon hunter. That is a big claim, but I can offer eyewitnesses if needed. I want to share my first real encounter. I was 15 and my family saved for months to rent a vacation home on Cape Cod. It was in the little village of Warham near Onset and the whole area was made up of vacation homes. When we got there, I was excited and immediately ran into the house only to run through a wall of cold. The cold got in and took over my mind. I was pushed to the back of my mind and this other being thought through me and touched things with my body. The entity actually held a conversation with me about what she'd remember things being like in her day. The strangest part of this was that my vision changed. I wear glasses, but she took them off. Also, 
All colors paled into a weird black and white vision. I was terrified. No matter how I squirmed, I could not break loose. My mother called me outside, and as she went to see who my mother was, my body crossed the threshold of the door and the entity was popped out. I was panicked, but what could I do? Saying nothing, I built a wall up in my head that said simply no. When my little brother and sister went upstairs, they soon came down screaming that a dead hand had reached into the open window. I had not told anyone about my encounter, but my no strategy was working, so I cradled them in my arms and said no to the ghost for them as well. My baby sister was stationed in a crib in my room. She often woke up about 2 or 3 a.m. screaming. I got good at waking up when the presence got near and throwing my proactive no over the baby too. We had so much poltergeist activity in that house. Like the salt and pepper shakers would fly off the fridge and onto the table. My mom would put things away, turn around, and they would be back. We also experienced knocks, footsteps, and bad smells. And when my cousin came to visit, he stuck his head through the open window that led from the TV room to the porch, a window that was jammed all three of us could not budge it, and it slammed down on his head. At the end of the week, I finally told my mom about the encounter I had. She believed me and went to see the realtor we had leased the house from. He casually told us that the reason we got the house so cheap was because it was haunted. A woman had been murdered there 20 years ago. We rented that house out a couple more times. Since we knew it was haunted, we would say hello to the ghost. My mom felt bad for her when we got there. It was never an easy thing for me, as she often tried to get into my head or talk to me. I built up my auric protection from that experience, but I was very afraid of ghosts for a long time afterwards. As will happen, ghosts were very interested in me. Then demons started being put in my path. It is one thing to believe in ghosts, but it took much convincing and hand wriggling to accept that there are demons. For every encounter with the demonic, I've had to reach deeper into old myths and religious writings to tease out what the ancients knew. I am not a devouted Catholic, although I was raised to be. That path never held answers for me, or I should not say enough answers. Yet I became an ordained minister of universal light. I know there is a great spiritual mind, a great source, and sometimes that source appears to me as female, sometimes male, sometimes both, or neither. I died a few times as a child due to what I now know was demonic attacks. When I gave birth to my daughter, I had complications and bled to death. That journey took me to the great source, in a word, to love. But not love as an attachment to a person, idea, or pet. Love is an infinite ocean of creation. I was immersed in this oceanic experience while the Great One spoke to me. It was really more like receiving direct knowing. He, she, said it was my choice to go back on or move on. That I had a hard life in addition to my non-stop illnesses. I had been abused in every sense of the word. And it was fine to let go. My children would do fine without me. I was needed, but not necessary. If I chose to go back, however, I would be sent teachers and would fulfill certain duties for the balance. I would be a teacher and healer and have the tools and gifts I needed as such. In this place I had no ego, no desire. I was awish in love. I looked down at my daughter, not three minutes old, and chose to go back for her and my son. As was told to me, within a year my teachers showed up. Also, the demon showed up. Those first few years were dedicated to clearing out my mind and personal history. As I came to know my personal demons, a correlating world demon would make itself known. At first I did nothing but observe and clear myself. After practicing mindfulness for nearly eight years and having the help and teachings of a medicine man, a Buddhist nun, a master therapist, and a couple of gurus, the universe gave me the nod and people literally started showing up at my doorstep. I worked with people on many levels for many years. I worked with hauntings and cast out some demons from buildings. I've not done an exorcism yet, as one has not been in my path, and I do not go searching for these things. I cannot say I would know where to begin, 
But for God's grace, guidance, it can happen. I've trapped destructive forces and banished them or helped them transmute. The people involved always have dramatic changes, even the ones who don't know what happened. I've had spiritual duels with practitioners of dark arts and removed hexes and lesser known demonic attachments. But the hunter can become the hunted. I caught some backlash from a few entanglements that involved black magic and ghosts that stuck into my car and followed me home. Before I knew what hit me, I was really sick with an undiagnosable problem of my nervous system. I had to leave the city, move to Vermont, and get involved with horses to ground me and bring my being back to life. For the last three years, I've done nothing but heal and surround myself with nature. Some very tricky forces have challenged me here, as Vermont is ripe with haunting and strange energies, but I have not worked the public more than a few times. Now, I am ready again. I am also ready to learn new things. I would love to talk to others who have had any experiences like my own. Please feel free to contact me, and thank you for my very long read. I first got into the paranormal on October 16th, 2011, when it was my 11th birthday and my mom and I went on a ghost tour of a War of 1812 fort and saw a strange shadow. Since then, I've created my own paranormal group and expect to ghost hunt many haunted places like the Waverly Hills Sanatorium in the future. Today, technically this night of October 24th, my granddad took me on a ghost tour which had a bunch of people get led around a small part of Jordan Village in southern Ontario. There was this one point we got to go to a nice winery building known as the Cave Spring Winery or Cave Spring Wine Shop. Here, we got to descend down into the cellars here. Before that, we were informed about the three main spirits here. One was a nice female spirit named Margaret, the other was an unnamed male malevolent entity and the other was a horse who was said to have had a heart attack and you could hear the hooves on the cement clip-clopping along. Anyways, our group of 30 or so people headed down to the tunnels and we learned a bit more of the history and discovered we could enter one of the supposedly haunted tunnels where screams and voices have been reported. When I went in there with my grandpa and two women on the tour, it was just four of us because we went four at a time. It was somewhat chilly. At first we didn't hear anything, just looking around for a moment then taking pictures. Then it happened. There was a loud clang right near us. It was as if someone picked up a sewer grate and dropped it right by us. We thought that they were closing the door on us and we'd investigate the tunnel alone, but the door was open and the tour guide didn't seem to be reacting to the sound. Then it happened again. The same loud clang, maybe a bit louder only a second or two after the first one. It was getting a bit closer to us now. Moments later, there was a third clang. I didn't get a negative feeling, but more shocked like, wow, that's interesting. Once the tour was over, I spoke to the guide about it. She claimed she didn't hear a thing, nor did the rest of the tour group. But they were so loud, someone besides us must have heard it, but there was no noise. The Cave Spring Winery is in operation on the upper floors, sometimes busy, but the floor is thick and we were at least 10 plus feet underground. It would be very difficult for sound to get through. Even so, it wouldn't sound like it was close by. It would be muffled, the tunnel didn't have any vents for noise to travel through, and there was only a staircase way out on the other end of the tunnel. It would be practically impossible for a noise like that to get through. Can I verify what we heard was paranormal? No, I can't conclude it was paranormal, but based on the evidence gathered with thick walls and a thick floor above us, and nobody but us four in the tunnel were able to hear these three loud noises, there might be something there. I've heard stuff about these knocks or scratches means a demonic presence, and yes, I do believe demons do exist. Was this a demon? This is somewhat unlikely. I'm a bit paranormal sensitive. I can't tell when a spirit has entered the room, and when I have encountered a negative entity, which I have before at a local cemetery, not in Jordan. If this were a demon, I would probably feel the negative presence as a very, very uncomfortable feeling in my chest. 
I have a slight heavy feeling in my chest when a good spirit is in the room, not wanting to do harm, probably just making itself known. If this were a ghost, I guess it was Margaret as she wants people to acknowledge her presence. Personally, I would recommend taking this tour to where you'd have to speak to someone at the Jordan Historical Museum and the tours sell out fast and are usually in October. Of course, to put you in the mood for Halloween, there are people dressed up and hiding behind trees and stand there silently to freak you out. Many places on the tour had ghost reports surrounding them, but I do believe the Cave Springs winery is haunted. It was the beginning of December when I received a phone call from my father in Orange, California. He explained to me that my grandmother had a heart attack and that she was in the hospital. After the phone call, I packed a few days worth of clothing and started the six hour trip to California. Upon my arrival at St. Joseph's Hospital, I checked in and visited my grandma Sally. She seemed to be doing okay, but had to stay in the hospital for testing and for shortness of breath. I stayed with her that whole weekend, then had to make the trip back to go to work. I did this for three weeks. Each week I visited her, she began to look worse and her breathing was getting shorter. The last week of her life, I can recall the doctor letting us know that she had cancer and her lungs were hardening, unable to take breaths. After weeping for some time, we lied to her and told her she would be fine and be out in time for Christmas. That last weekend, I can clearly remember being in the room with her and noticed her staring at a chair. But the time, I did not think anything of it. She would ask me to stay with her because she was so scared. I asked her why she was so scared, and she explained to me in Spanish that there was a guy in black in the chair, sitting by her feet, sticking his big tongue out at her and throwing spider webs at her. I could tell she was scared. That evening, I grabbed her holy water from home and bought some saints for her room. It was a very uncomfortable feeling when I would go into that hospital room, seeing my grandmother focusing on that chair. I eventually had her moved to a room in front of the nurse's desk. The following morning, they transferred her out to a hospice where she died two days later. My dad says she would tell him she could hear singing right before she died. First off, I'd like to say that I really appreciate your sight. So far, I found a lot of interesting things to read and learn. It's great to read other people's tales of true hauntings because in a way, it's like sharing war stories with other veterans. These tales, if nothing else, really make a person think. I've always religiously believed in the supernatural. Too many strange and bizarre things have happened in my life for me not to. These are just two of the more interesting ones that I hope you and other readers will find mystifying and enjoyable. During the summer of 1995, I lived in Washington, D.C., where my father had rented an apartment suite at the Watergate. It was a very nice apartment, right across from the Kennedy Center on one side and a hop and a skip away from Georgetown on the other, and since the apartment was at ground level, had a nice fenced-in patio area just several yards away from the main pool. I was working as a White House intern and was just enjoying the first real summer away from parental guidance. After a time, however, I came to realize that I really wasn't as alone as I had thought. Upstairs were two bedrooms, the master and a smaller one right across the landing. At first, I decided to take the master because after all, bigger is supposed to be better. But I quickly changed my mind because in the dead of night, I'd feel suddenly very cold and very uneasy, as if someone was standing near my bed, its dark, shadowy presence vaguely menacing. I didn't know who or what it was. All I really knew was that it was big, male, and didn't seem to like me as much as a roomie. After two nights of this, and getting very little rest, I moved my stuff across the landing to the other bedroom. Anyway, about this time, my roommate and best friend from college came to visit for a while and, without telling her of my own unsettling experiences, offered her the master bedroom. The very next day, she reported the same unnerving sensations. She told me that during the night, she felt someone breathing cool air on her cheek and felt a heaviness on her chest that both scared and kept her awake all night. After that, she promptly moved her things into my room as well. Since I knew what she was talking about, I graciously gave in 
and the two of us were very careful to never enter that room unless we absolutely had to and only in broad daylight. Summer came to an end and we both got ready to head back to college. As I was in the bedroom packing, I suddenly heard her calling my name from across the landing. At first, I was puzzled because it was unspoken between us that we would never enter that room, and since we didn't have anything in there to pack, I hesitated before answering. Finally, I crossed the landing and entered into the master bedroom, calling out, Yeah, what do you need? When I walked in the room, nobody was there. Chilled by the episode, I went downstairs calling my roommate's name. I finally found her in the kitchen area, the furthest part away in the house from the master bedroom. When I told her what happened, she shook her head in bewilderment and told me that she hadn't called my name and was, in fact, inside the pantry room packing up some canned goods. When she told me that, my back stiffened and an eerie shiver ran down my spine. Needless to say, we got the heck out of Dodge. An interesting postscript to this tale came near the end of 1998. My mother had been diagnosed with liver cancer in May, and in a desperate bid to lengthen her life, she had decided to become a Buddhist nun. She dressed in the traditional nun's garb and shaved her head, but at the end of September, she passed away, unfortunately. During this time, a close friend of hers was in D.C. and so stayed at the Watergate apartment. She had not seen my mother in over a year and, in fact, did not even know that my mother had just died less than a week ago. She unpacked and fell asleep in the master bedroom. Around midnight, she awoke because, as she told my father later on, she felt and saw an enormous shadow sitting on her chest, cutting off her breath. She couldn't scream because of the weight, and for a second, thought she was dying. She struggled and fought, but the shadow wouldn't budge, and she finally drew in one breath and cried out for help. Immediately, she said she was blinded by a light coming from the closet door, and as the light drew closer and nearer to the bed, she felt the weight suddenly dissipate, the shadow fleeing from the unearthly glow. She opened her eyes and saw a woman standing next to her, brown robes flowing to the ground. Instantly, she said she knew it was my mother, but the only thing that made her wonder was the fact that this woman, this friend she had known for years, was shaved bald. The glowing woman then smiled gently at her and slowly disappeared. Only after this friend of my mother's had told my father about this incident did she learn that, indeed, the day my mother died, she had died with a clean-shaven head, dressed in brown robes. The second place I experienced a haunting was when I lived in a two-story house on the south side of Las Vegas. The house was owned by a chief in one of the casinos near the strip and was completely furnished as advertised. As I came from a traditional Asian household, my grandmother also lived with me and my father, and since he was frequently away on business, it was just the two of us there most of the time. The first week we moved in, my grandmother discovered very fine, very black sand would accumulate near the tiled fireplace, and since we didn't ever use the fireplace, we thought it was rather strange. She would sweep it up, throw it away, but the next day, it would appear again. This happened for about four days in a row. My grandmother, bless her heart, is a Capricorn, and thus, rather anal about things. She was forever checking doors and windows, making sure they were locked and secured whenever we left the house. So when we came home one day from shopping, we were shocked to see the front door standing wide open. We always came through the garage door, so it was very unsettling to see the door open, knowing we had locked it before leaving. And since the front entrance is protected on one side by the garage, we knew the wind could not have done this. Nothing had been stolen or otherwise disturbed. We ended up not talking about it because really, what was there to talk about? And put it down to a freak of nature. During this time, my father came home from his trip and stayed in the master bedroom. Now my father is not a man that is given to sudden wild and unexplained imaginings. He's 6'2", weighs nearly 200 pounds, and is perhaps one of the most self-assured men I have ever known. But after a week in that room, he abruptly confessed to me one day that there was something else staying in that bedroom with him. He said that whenever he closed his eyes to sleep, he would feel as if someone or something was staring at him through the darkness, and he would then have to get up and sleep with the lights on. At first, 
I just thought that was ridiculous. I mean, the man had faced down a robber at gunpoint, and he had to sleep with the light on. I smiled and nodded, but didn't think much of it because this was Vegas, not some creepy little Stephen King town filled with outlaw boogeyman. But after he left again, and I decided to stay in the master bedroom, he had cable. I quickly changed my mind because as I snapped off the light, I too felt something peering at me through the shadows. It wasn't the same as it was in DC. This one was just as unsettling, to be sure, but it wasn't as menacing, just very disturbing. It was almost like it wanted me to notice it, had something it wanted to tell me, and as I turned on the light, I couldn't help but feel that it also needed to do something. Finally, one night, I sat up in bed and asked it, Okay, what do you want? I've had some prior experience with channeling, and this wasn't the first time I had encountered a restless spirit, so I just bluntly asked it what it wanted of me so I could finally get a decent night's nice sleep. When I closed my eyes and exhausted semi-consciousness, it was around 3 a.m. at this time, I saw behind my closed eyelids the pale figure of a woman dressed in white with long brown hair down her back. To be honest, I didn't really believe what I was seeing, just thought it was a product of first stage REM cycle. I don't really remember what she looked like, just that she was slender and had curious stains on her white dress. She looked to be in her late 20s to mid 30s. She told me that she had been taken out to the desert, raped, strangled, and buried in the sand where the present house stood. Again, I don't know how much of this is true because I was nearly asleep at the time, but what I can say with certainty was that the spirit was obviously distressed by the manner of her demise and I felt very sad for her. Later on, I told my grandmother about this, and as she burned paper money for my mother, a traditional act in Asian countries, she would be sure to burn some for the woman in white as well. She would burn the paper money and plead at the same time for this nice lady to not come out and frighten her while she was alone in the house. I thought it was highly amusing at the time and just indulged her whimsical actions. To me, it had been a very vivid dream. And as I was not the owner of the house, I certainly couldn't come up and dig around the property to substantiate the ghostly claims. After six months, the owner of the house was ready to move back in with his family, and so me and my grandmother packed up and moved to the west side. Another three months passed before I got a call. It was the owner of the house, and he had a very strange story to tell me. First off, he asked me if when I had lived there, did anything weird happen while I was there? Honestly, I did tell him yes, then told him about what I experienced and concluded that I thought the house was haunted. He agreed, telling me that the doors had started to open by themselves and that he would hear strange noises at night. Finally, he asked me to speak to his girlfriend because she had a most peculiar dream last night and needed to tell me about it. When she got on the phone, she told me that last night, she had dreamed she had walked downstairs to the garage and met a young black-haired woman dressed in a white dress. The woman asked her if I was there because she needed to speak to me. Puzzled, the owner's girlfriend said that sorry, but no, they moved away. The woman in white had gotten agitated at the response and then asked, Well, is the grandmother there then? Again, she replied no, she's gone too. At this point, the woman in white became exceedingly upset and started to shout, But I know she's there. I know, and I need to speak to her now. Please, you've got to let me talk to her. The owner's girlfriend was shocked at the desperation in the other woman's voice and kept repeating, Sorry, but they're not here. Finally, she woke up, sweat pouring down her face, and immediately asked the owner to contact me. I really wish that I could tell you that there's a proper ending to all of this, but since I never went back to the house, nor my grandmother, I don't know what happened in the end. I just thought it was thoroughly bizarre that something which I had convinced myself was just a dream was actually probably based in some reality. Perhaps one day, I'll get the courage to go back there and tell him what the woman in white had told me. I still think about the poor woman at times, wondering if she's still on her quest to find some sort of justice or peace and I hope that time really will heal all wounds. I just know that I've been blessed in the sense that I've been given opportunities to touch a world seldom seen by rational people, and hopefully 
this will not be a trend that will soon break. I also wish that I could include father's incidents that have raised my eyebrows a nod or two, but I think that I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you for listening. Oh, and by the way, my grandmother still burns paper money for the lady in white. She's convinced the poor soul will come after her if she doesn't. I was reading through your website, and it gave me the confidence to speak out about what I saw as a child. At age 12, I saw the angel of death, or what have you. I witnessed him come to a woman whom I had no knowledge of or have ever spoken with, take her away by giving her direct eye contact. Here's what happened. It was before summer in 1989. My family was poor, and we were being evicted from an apartment in Washington, D.C. We had to go to court to talk about it with the judge. In the waiting room at the courthouse in D.C., There was a woman sitting beside me with a large oxygen tank and a mask over her mouth. She was really heavy and she wore a purple flower dress. I sat beside her. I remember I noticed her oxygen tank and wondered what was wrong with her. Then I heard a knock on the glass, which was right behind me. The seating arrangement was like the chairs were facing the waiting area, But your back was to a glass wall that if you looked through, you could see the security guards checking people in through an x-ray machine. I looked up when I heard a knock. Three knocks. Then I looked up, and so did the other woman with the oxygen tank. We looked up at the same time. The angel of death looked at me with eye contact, then looked directly at her. He stared for about three seconds at both of us. Me first, and then her. When he looked at her, she wheezed a big, uh, then she fell on the ground in front of her chair. People, adults, started running to her and they said, get those kids out of here. And I just kept saying, you did not see that man scare her? Then I looked down the long hallway. He walked down and only saw his long black coat that looks like what judges wear. A black hat, black cape, her cloak and black shoes from the back. He did not look back and his arms were swinging. When I ran to catch up with him, he was gone. The security said no one came in with all black on and they insisted I was crazy and to take me home. I still remember how he looks. He was a medium complexion black guy that was medium built and was older looking. The woman was white. This is a true story. And I'm not just saying that because I want you guys to believe this. It's because it is true. Thank you for reading. This is only one example of an encounter I had in a house I lived in. My daughter was only about six months old and my husband and I were living with his parents at the time. On one particular morning, he had left for work and I decided to lay on the couch until my baby woke up. I left the door to the upstairs open as well as our bedroom door so I could hear when she woke. I fell asleep on the couch. Shortly after I fell asleep, something woke me. As I opened my eyes and looked up, I saw what appeared to be someone wearing a black hooded robe going towards the stairs. I watched the figure, I sat there frozen, turn and go upstairs. At this point, I was freaking out. My baby is up there. I got up and started running towards the stairs and I yelled for my mother-in-law to help. She was sleeping in the room off of the dining room. When I got upstairs and went into the nursery, my baby was lying there, limp with her eyes rolling in the back of her head. I grabbed her and ran downstairs. She was lifeless. We put seven up soda in her bottle and forced it into her and left it for the hospital. By the time we reached the doctor, she was okay. No one could explain what had happened. When they looked at her at the hospital, they thought we were nuts. She was laughing and having a great time, getting all of the attention. So, what was that? Had I beaten the angel of death? Or was she in trouble and that spirit was warning me? Whatever it was, thank God I still have my daughter. A little after 8 p.m., I was in bed exhausted and waiting for my husband to come back from the kitchen with snacks. I dozed off for a few seconds and when I opened my eyes, I saw a hunched over figure carrying what looked like a walking stick. 
He was standing sideways, so I saw his left side only, but his hair was gray and must, and he was wearing a ratty, moldy-looking cloak around his shoulders and partially over his head. As I stared, he just faded away. It was really disturbing. I didn't know if it was a dream or what. My husband came back a few seconds later, and I didn't know what to do. Finally, I told him, and he joked that it was the angel of death. I thought he looked a little like the guy from Akalog, Death Row Tool Cover, but not quite. The next morning, my daughter told me first thing to call dad immediately. His older brother in Italy passed away that morning. I asked what time, his time and our time. I saw him about four hours before he passed. The strange thing is that even though there are 11 children, the only other sibling, another brother, passed away 28 years earlier, on the exact same day. I've not seen him again, but I've experienced visits by scent mostly, and he has visited a few times, mostly to tell the other siblings to call Italy and take care of his widow. I had spent time with this man, and he really liked me and even gave me a memento of his. I believe he somehow knew I could see things others couldn't. He knew I could, and did, carry out his message to my husband and for him to make sure his siblings stay in touch with her, too. Oh, and by the way, he did have a stick that he used to carry with him. Upon ever thinking of the paranormal, my initial feeling is fear. I am not, maybe never will be, comfortable with my encounters with the supernatural. I've always been what you would call overly scared when it comes to the subject of ghosts, but that doesn't stop the supernatural from paying my frightened self to many visits. For some odd reason, most of my encounters have been while being just in the midst of falling asleep, or they will wake me out of my sleep. For this reason, I've always tried to convince myself that they were just my imagination. I've come to cope with the fact that they have been happening more frequently. The past homes I've lived in have been older homes, so you would think that if I were having encounters, the history of the home would be to blame. But I now live in a newer home, and I'm recently being visited by a close friend of mine who passed away almost two years ago. My first encounter when I was about 13. I was lying in bed, almost asleep, when I heard what I thought was my little sister talking and playing in my room. I told her sternly, Holly, get out of my room. But when the little voice in rummaging through my belongings in the corner didn't stop, I opened my eyes only to see that the little voice wasn't my sister's. It was a little girl whose face I couldn't really make out being that she was a little ball of light. Some of her features were distinctive, but I could clearly tell what was happening. I jumped out of my bed and ran for dear life. My mother is a big fan of the supernatural and always says, Elizabeth, you should try to talk to them if you see them. Ask them what they want. Is she crazy? My first experience made me run, much less strike up a conversation. We eventually moved into a much older home where I experienced a lot of lights turning on and off by themselves and the frequent sounds of someone walking up and down the hardwood stairs. But I grew used to it and never had any more visual experiences until recently. My closest friend, Morgan, passed away in a car accident almost two years ago at the young age of 18. I believe that she hasn't crossed over because she is confused. Her life was taken so quickly that I believe she is lost and she is now visiting me. She has come to me two times in the past month and I have a feeling that she's going to come again. Anytime I have an encounter, it scares the wits out of me. Again, this encounter came in the midst of falling asleep. I was actually having a dream about her and I don't know if it was a noise that woke me up, but in my groggy state, I opened my eyes and someone was standing in front of me. I know it was her, but couldn't make her out. I heard her talking to me, but it was very muffled. I was scared to death, of course, so I closed my eyes and tried to fall back asleep, blowing it off as my imagination, until I woke up. The same night, I was having yet another dream about her. I'm a very light sleeper, so any noise, touch, etc. will wake me up. While dreaming of her, I popped awake instantly while catching a chill and having something touch my back in the dead darkness of the night. I tried to scream, but nothing came out, 
so I hugged my infant son closer and went back to sleep. My way of dealing with my encounters is to be very still, if you call that dealing. I would like to not be so fearful of the supernatural, much less my best friend. Please help if you can. My parents found a house to rent in a beautiful location off the Appalachian Trail for an extremely good price. Half of the house was fairly new, and the other half was very old, put together with wooden pegs instead of nails. The first odd thing we noticed was that one area of the lawn which was enclosed by a stone wall was constantly sticky and covered in flies. Then we started to hear balls bouncing and what sounded like children running up and down the hallway. Every night the front door would open and close, followed by the door into the kitchen and around the corner to the side door going out. My dog refused to go into the old part of the house and would urinate if we forced her. Things continued to escalate to the point where canned goods would fly off the shelves. My brother's closet door would slam open and shut rapidly, and we'd be woken up by faceless children. My father refused to believe anything was going on and always had some rational explanation for it. That is until he was asked by the landlord to replace the floor in the living room. When he opened the hatch to access the crawl space, a fireball of electricity shot out at him which he ignored. But when we went down the ladder, we found a small dirt room about four feet high, and it was a stone slab approximately six feet long with a groove carved around the edge and forming a sort of stone spout at one end. The next day we came home to find four of our birds with their necks snapped in their cage, and a mirror flew off the wall at my brother. My parents packed what would fit in the car, and we moved to a campground until we found another place to live. Whatever was in that house, I don't believe was a ghost, but something evil and dangerous. It all started when my fiancé and I bought a new house. It's actually a few houses down from my mother's home, where we've also had chilling tales. Our houses are directly across the street from an old cemetery. Upon moving in, we had odd things happen. It started off where my dogs would stare into my dark hallway, always around 3 a.m., and growl and raise their fur. It always gave me a sinking feeling. I was taking a shower not long after the dog incident, and something touched my shoulder. I ran out of the shower, soap in my hair and eyes screaming. My fiancé said the look of terror on my face made him think someone was in our house and caused him to panic. A few weeks later, I heard a low whisper while in the shower, and I ran out in terror again. The icing on the cake is about to take place. I was out on my back porch, cleaning and organizing things, when on my back door, I heard a loud slam on the glass, so loud I expected it to shatter. I ran outside couldn't even speak. I was so horrified and again, my fiancé thought an intruder was inside. There was nobody around. We live on a dead end street in good neighborhood. I wasn't expecting a human to be the cause. Fast forward to a few weeks later and we decided to put a fence in the backyard to keep my dogs contained. Upon building said fence, my fiancé unearthed a gravestone in our backyard. It was dated from 1851 and appears to be from a young girl. I have a photo on my phone. After finding the gravestone, things escalated. I would be on my treadmill in the bedroom and something would touch my shoulder. I started seeing shadow figures and hearing creepy low voices. My animals usually picked up on a presence too. I had the majority of the experiences, but I think it's due to the fact that I'm the woman of the house and she's looking for a mother figure. I own a duplex and rent out the other half. My past two tenants and current ones all had their own ghost stories and said it was haunted. I mentioned my mother's house is a few houses away, built along the same cemetery near my house. Well, she called one day after getting home from work at 11.30 at night. She was almost in tears, saying she entered her kitchen and said she's heard the creepiest voice that sent chills down her spine. She's lived on her own for 20 years and wouldn't even enter her own house. She was horrified. 
My fiancé and I came right over and went through her entire house, but nobody was there. When I was a child and we had just moved into that house, she called the police before because it would sound like someone had a baseball bat and was beating on the outside of the house, but of course, nobody was ever there. I still live in my house with the gravestone we unearthed. The gravestone is still leaning against my house. I wasn't sure what to do with it. I didn't want to just desecrate it, so it's leaned against my house in my fenced-in dog pen. We also dug all around looking for a body, but I suppose didn't dig that deep, and we didn't dig the whole yard up. For all I know, there could have been a body in my yard. It was from 1851. It's quite possible the family buried their child in their yard. It's also possible the graveyard expanded to where my house is. Athol used to be a hot spot back in the 1800s. That pesky graveyard was taking up prime land, and folks wanted to build here. Just another thought of mine for why I have a gravestone in my yard, and all these creepy experiences. I can't remember the exact date. It was almost 25 years ago. I do remember it being in the summer, though. I was about the age of eight years old. My parents had a family friend pass away, and since they didn't have a sitter for me, I had to go along. I was afraid of dead bodies at the time, understandably since I was a child. I just sat at my seat and waited until my parents decided it was time to leave. I distinctly remember a brunette woman coming up and talking with me. She was wearing red heels, black tights, a black dress about down to her knees, a red and black suit looking shirt, and she had on earrings and a necklace. I cannot recall what they were exactly. I don't know why I can remember this woman so well, or why I can almost perfectly recall her exact outfit. She just took out in the crowd. She asked me what my name was. I told her Josh. She then asked me a few more questions about how I knew the deceased. I told her he was a family friend. She then proceeds to tell me that she is his wife. I thought maybe it was his daughter or another friend of the man's. She was a lot younger than him. Her exact words were, I know we will be together again very soon. At eight years old, I didn't know better. I was brought up to be friendly to strangers, and I just talked to her. Too many people around for her to try and kidnap me. I do remember everyone looking at me funny, though, and giving me dirty looks. I didn't know why they were doing this. We sat there and talked a good 15 minutes or so. Someone must have said something to my parents about me. I remember when my mother told me they were leaving, she was griping at me that I should stop talking to myself. I told her I wasn't talking to myself. I was talking to the man's wife, who had died. She was talking to me. We still kind of mention this today and share a chuckle over it because even she says she remembers saying this. Josh, that isn't funny. That man's wife died. It was about 11 p.m. I had just gone into bed and turned on the TV. And after about five minutes, the TV turned off by itself and the telephone rang one time. It then felt like someone put their arm under my pillow and my head and shoulders were lifted up about 20 inches or so. I then yelled, oh God, and I was instantly dropped. Another time I woke up in the middle of the night and smelled a strong smell of urine. It was so strong smelling that I had peed myself, so I jumped out of bed and checked, but I hadn't. I then went to the bathroom to pee, and I saw a puddle of some liquid on the floor in front of the closet door. There was no reason for liquid to be there. I got paper towels to clean it up, and you could smell that it was strong urine. This worried me. I thought, did I do this in my sleep? It happened again a few nights later with a strong urine smell, and urine on the floor at the same spot. Sometimes I would get a whiff of urine throughout the day. I asked a friend that came over to smell me and tell me if I smelled like urine, and I didn't. I told him what was happening, and after a few days later, he brought me a book. He said he read the back of it, and when I did, I started crying because it said, if you smell urine in your house for no reason, that you have a demon in your house.
Some people told me they saw a black shadow in my dining room, and some other weird stuff would go on from time to time. What got me was this was a new house that I had built. I sold it after living there for five years. I was very careful not to talk about moving because I did not want this thing coming with me. At one time, I did demand it to leave, and things did settle down somewhat after that, but I always felt like someone was watching me. It creeped me out when I would take a bath. Thanks for reading. I've seen or experienced ghosts or spirits most of my life. My family is from a small town in southern Louisiana, where just about everyone I knew either saw ghosts or had a family member who experienced such. When I started telling my parents about the things I felt, saw, and dreamed, I was encouraged. One of my parents would always say, Oh, your uncle sees, sees this ghost. And don't forget about your Aunt E. She lives in a haunted house and talks to spirits all the time. So when my most recent experience happened, I was not surprised. My aunt died on January 18th, 2016. She was 96 years old. And although it was sudden, I was happy that she didn't suffer and had lived on her own up until two weeks before her death. She was the last relative of my parents' generation both having crossed over many years ago themselves. I'd been feeling rather blue to say the least, but I returned to my daily routine within a matter of days. On Friday, January 29th, I was driving home after a long week. I was on a very wide and busy street. I stopped at a stoplight at a major intersection. While I sat in traffic, I experienced the most delicious aroma of a cheeseburger. I could smell the patty on the griddle, the yellow-orange cheese, the hot salty yellow peppers, the yummy pickles and the bun on the griddle, as well as the crispy french fries. The aroma was so great, I said out loud, boy, if the burger wouldn't be cold by the time I got home, I would stop and buy one. And that is when it hit me. There was not a single burger joint anywhere in this area. So I smiled and chalked it up to a visit from my aunt. But my visit wasn't over. I got home and started to relax into the evening. I went into my bedroom and my cat followed as he usually does. When I sat down on the side of my bed, I observed him to jump up in the air as if he was playing with a string of some sort. This went on for about two minutes. I just sat there amazed, wondering what Kitty found so delightful. Then it hit me. My aunt liked cats, but my mother loved cats, so again, I smiled and chalked it up to my aunt, had also brought my mother, which was her sister, both of which loved cheeseburgers and pastrami, and my mother decided to play with my cat. That night, I slept well and happy, and I think that kitty slept well too. It is nice to know the spirits are always with us, even when they take form in the mundane. I'd like to start out by saying that, while I am interested in the paranormal, I tend to be pretty skeptical and prefer to think things out rashly before dismissing every little thing as ghosts or the like. This experience, however, has no logical explanation I can think of. I'm pretty new here as well, and I apologize in advance if I'm not doing this right. So yeah, here we go. I was 17 and it was mid-October, nearing Halloween. My family and I had gone to a really small, fairly rural town to meet a group of family friends for dinner and catching up for old time's sake as my siblings and I had grown up with the children of the other families. After dinner, the parents stayed at the bar drinking and those of us that weren't of legal drinking age were starting to get a little bored. That's when one of my friends brought up the cemetery. Apparently, there's a cemetery in this town that's said to be haunted. I think some ghost hunter or paranormal type show did an episode about it or something, but the legends are said to have been around since before that. The story goes that a group of teenage boys wandered into the graveyard one Halloween night with the intention of causing trouble and maybe stirring up some spooky ghost action in celebration of Halloween. After dicking around for a while with no unexplained phenomena, they decided to sit on top of this mausoleum which is basically just a big tomb built up around a coffin instead of actually burying it in the ground. They were about to call it quits and head home when all of a sudden, unseen hands seemed to push one of the boys off the top of the tomb and onto the ground. 
All the boys are obviously scared shitless and hightail it out of there. All of them describe feeling an eerie, ominous energy following them around for weeks after the incident. There have also been numerous reports of orbs, headstones inexplicably moving or disappearing, ghostly apparitions, inscriptions being changed, flashes of lights, strange noises, the whole works. We arrived at the cemetery well after dark and one of my girlfriends, we'll call her Emma and I, were the only two brave enough to go in. We hopped out of the car, careful to be as inconspicuous as we could since we didn't want the police showing up and ruining our ghost hunting experience, and headed towards the entrance. It was chilly and a bit windy, as autumn in Wisconsin tends to be. We gripped each other's hands and started down the gravel path. As soon as we passed the fence that surrounded the plot of land, everything seemed to get very still and quiet. We couldn't even hear the wind anymore which was strange as it had definitely been breezy as we got out of the car. It was so silent that even whispering and our steps in the gravel seemed, pun absolutely intended, loud enough to wake the dead. Though there were no lights in or near the cemetery, there was enough moonlight filtering through the clouds to allow us to see pretty well. We soon realized we had no idea where the fabled haunted mausoleum was, but we kept walking anyway. We made a random left turn and, lo and behold, there it was, about 30 yards in front of us. Pretty good luck, right? As we approached, I began to feel almost an electric sort of energy in my fingers and hands, but I wrote this off as just nerves or something due to breaking the law. We reached the tomb and this thing is huge. It was twice my height and at least made of weathered grey stone with moss scrolling sparsely on it. We stare for a moment and Emma whispers, you should touch it. Being the badass ghost hunter I am, I oblige. There is nothing really remarkable about the cool roughness of the stone, so I decide to take it a step further and hop up to sit on the lip of the curved top of the thing. Again, nothing happens, so I jokingly whisper shout, if there's anyone here, any spirits or anything, come on out. After listening in silence for a second, I think, fuck it and make my way to the very top where that kid is rumored to have been pushed off by ghostly hands. I have Emma snap a photo or two before climbing back down. Slightly disappointed by the lack of spooky encounters, we agree to head out and are about to do just that when we see a pair of headlights slowly creeping down the road that borders one side of the graveyard. We immediately assume someone noticed us and called the cops. So we crouch down behind some bushes with the mausoleum directly to our left to hide. Both of us are completely silent except our breathing as we watch the vehicle slowly make its way down the street. I'm watching its taillights turn the corner when I hear a low, creepy, menacing laugh coming from my back right. It sounded so strange, like it was a few feet away but also right in my ear. I'm freaked out and I'm about to chalk it up to some kind of adrenaline-induced hallucination when Emma, who is standing to my left, whispers, Hey, did you hear that? My blood ran cold as I slowly nod a silent, yes I did. I cautiously turn my head to the direction I heard it come from and, I shit you not, see a dark figure stand up from one of the headstones not ten feet away from us. I scream bloody murder and somehow end up on the ground as the next thing I know, Emma is pulling at my arm shouting, we have to run, we have to get out of here, come on, we have to go. I let her pull me to my feet and led me blindly by the hand. We're full out sprinting, tripping over gravestones and plants and who knows what else in the dark and we can't even find the exit in our panic. We finally reach a gap in the fence and I can feel tears streaming down my face as I run for my life down the middle of the road, not even paying attention to the oncoming headlights until I nearly run into them. Luckily, it was the car containing the rest of our friends, and we rip the door open and throw ourselves inside screaming, go go, please just drive, before we even bothered to sit in an actual seat or shut the door. I can't remember who was driving, but I think our panic and terror shook them enough that they did what was asked of them and sped away back to the bar. They kept asking us what happened and if we were okay, but we couldn't calm down enough to answer until we were back inside the bar and sat down. 
Still shaking and out of breath, we recounted our story to all of them, drunk parents included. I think a lot of them were pretty skeptical, and honestly, I would have been too if I hadn't experienced it myself. In the weeks that followed, I felt that same eerie energy the boys in the legend described hanging over my head. Personally, I attributed more to the paranoia after being scared out of my mind by something I couldn't actually see than some kind of curse, but it made me uneasy nonetheless. It's been a few years since this happened, and I still cannot think of a single logical explanation for what happened that night. While I have no idea how credible anyone else's reported experience with this place are, I know we were without a doubt the only people in that graveyard, or even on the streets for that matter, and we would have heard someone trying to sneak up on us. This sound of that laugh was so unnatural too. I can't get it out of my head, even now. I've never even been more scared than what I was that night. And I know now that people mean when they talk about not being able to fully believe in the paranormal until you've experienced it firsthand. Anyway, just thought I'd share this experience with you guys, as it was my first and most memorable ghost experience. This could have not happened at a better time. The year was 2009, about a week before Halloween. My sisters and I got a call that our grandmother's health had taken a turn for the worst, and that the doctors were calling the family in. My grandmother was in the LaGrange hospital, and we were in Nunan. It would take us 30 to 45 minutes to get there. Each of us four girls took off from work, and we all met at my house, where we would ride together to the hospital. Being in such a hurry, neither of us took the time to use the bathroom, so by the time we got to the hospital, me and my baby sister were about to burst. We got parked and Kelly, my baby sister, and I ran into the hospital looking for a bathroom. The entrance that we took, we had to walk through double doors and turn slightly to our right then slightly to our left before heading down a long corridor. The corridor led us to a gift shop that sat on the right. Just before the gift shop, there were two small bathrooms, one for men and one for women, to the left of the hall. My sister and I were racing to the bathrooms when we saw an elderly woman in front of us. She was about 25 feet away from us. She was stooped over a tad and wore an old outdated black coat and an old black hat with a flower attached to the side of the hat. It was not cold enough outside to wear a coat. The old woman entered the bathroom and my sister and I raced in after her. The bathroom was so small that it only had two stalls and one sink and three people would be considered a crowd. My sister beat me to the second stall after she saw the old woman enter the first stall and heard her lock the stall. My sister and I were laughing at each other and we were talking to each other while my sister was in the stall. I was play fussing at her for beating me to the only available stall. So here I was standing outside the first stall waiting for the old woman to come out. All of a sudden, the door to the first stall slowly creeped open, and I stepped to the side so that the old woman could get out. Told you the bathroom was very small. After a few seconds, no one came out, and I peeked around and pushed the door open a little bit more. I was scared that I may find the poor old lady sitting on the toilet, and she had let the door come open on her or something, and we would both have an awkward moment. I looked into the stall, and no one is there. My sister was still in the second stall, and I said, Kelly, wasn't that old woman in this other stall? My sister replied with a yes and why. I said, Kelly, she's not here. Kelly asked, what do you mean she's not in there? I saw her go in, and I replied with, well, she has either gone down the toilet or she has disappeared. I remember Kelly asking me, did I see her go out? And I said, uh, Kelly, she would have had to bump into me to get out, and no, she did not go past me. The conversation went on like this for a few more seconds, ending with my sister coming out of the second stall, fast as lighting, with her pants half buttoned. Flying towards the door, she turned to me and asked if I was coming, and I responded that I have business to take care of. Of course, my sister left me there alone while I took care of business in the first stall. I was either feeling brave or stupid that day. 
<laughs> After I came out of the bathroom, my sister was waiting by the gift shop. We knew we just had a ghostly encounter. Retelling the story to the rest of our family members had them thinking we were off our rocker. I retold the story again to the nurse who was signed to my grandmother and she confirmed that there had been several ghost sightings in the hospital. One day, I had an appointment at Clark at noon. I finished the meeting with my client early, and being near Orchard Road, I went shopping. By the evening, I got ready to go back to the flat. The same flat which is in my story, an invisible housemate. I was filled with dread due to the previous experiences there, and as I boarded the train for NS from Orchard Station, my friend Louise called me on my cell phone. We talked for a while and she invited me over for a movie and dinner at her house. As we were longtime childhood friends, I was delighted to spend some time with her. And with that, I changed the train. Earlier, I was going in the opposite direction in the NS line, and now I boarded the train to Semabwag on the same NS line. I reached Toapeo station and loads of people rushed to catch a seat. While the train started, I could see from the window a middle-aged woman standing at the platform just looking inside the compartment. She was wearing a kimba, kind of a bluish grayish white clothing. She had unkept but jet black hair. I kept on staring at her because she looked pale white as if she had severe anemia. I think her face looked almost the same as her blouse. I kept staring at her as I thought it was a very unusual for any woman to be so pale. And then the train sped away and I got back to playing subway surf on my cell phone. I was distracted by the people getting up to get out at Bishan Station. As the train halted, I saw the same woman on the platform. I got shocked as I clearly saw her on Toapeo platform and she was here again at Bishan at the speed of the train. It was highly unlikely that she reached Bishan station so fast and I kept looking at her. But she just stood on the platform without fidgeting when people passed her by. The train doors closed and she didn't board the train again. And I wondered why she traveled from Toa Peo to Bishan without any intention to board the train and just stand at the platform. I kept staring at her. She was still standing at the platform from the window and the train started in full swing. I again went back to another game of subway surf when the lady sitting right next to me elbowed me while opening her purse. I looked at her and she apologized, but that's when I looked towards the right side of the compartment, and to my surprise, the pale woman was standing inside the compartment, near the door. Now, at this moment, I still can't explain to myself how that woman defied the laws of physics, as last time I saw her, she was outside on the platform. The train doors are obviously closed shut before the train starts to speed away. Then how on earth is it possible for her to board the train? And she was clearly standing outside on the platform and no way in the train. And I could see her outside, except when she disappeared from my view, from the window's edge. While I sat there in total shock, rethinking what I am seeing, I still kept staring at her. The passengers near her seemed indifferent about her presence, and she had the same expression throughout the time she was standing there, and her hair, which seemed unkempt from the front, was nicely tied in a loose hanging bun, which came until the center of her shoulder blades at the back. But from the thickness of her hair bun, it seemed like she had long hair, except for when she caught me staring at her she moved her head to left to look at me. Her movement seemed as if someone was turning a puppet's head on its neck. At that time, 
When our eyes interlocked, I felt the dread that I have never ever felt in my entire existence. Her eyes color were the lightest shades of gray. It was like the meanest of all the eyes I had ever come in contact with. I was filled with the emotions of grief or something on the lines of envy. I lowered my eyes and fixed it on my cell phone and tried to refocus my mind. But I kept looking at her dress's bottom and then another electric shock ran through my body. I couldn't even see her feet. Normally, someone who's wearing a kabaya, you can see their feet. But it seemed she didn't have any feet at all. And then the train halted at Angmo Kyo Station. I managed to look up to find out whether the incoming passengers can see her or not. And as I looked up, she already left. She was gone. It looked like a nanosecond for her to disappear, even before the train doors had opened. At that moment, realizing that it's impossible to get out without the train doors opening, and that she vanished in the moment, I rolled my eyes up to look at her. I just froze in terror. I looked around to see if anyone else also saw that or not, but nobody seemed to be influenced by the woman. Or maybe they couldn't see her. At this point, I was horribly scared. This was the second incident for me in which something, in this case someone, vanished in thin air. Though I didn't see her vanish, but she was there at one moment, and like a microsecond later, she wasn't there. It wasn't even humanly possible to get out of the train or get into the train in that moment. So I... I put on my headphones and music and closed my eyes shut so as to not see anything else. I got out at Semabwag Station. At first, she joked that I rode with a Pontenac, and I gave her a smack on her arm. A Pontenac is a bloodthirsty ghost of a woman and quite popular ghost in Southeast Asia. But after calming me down and realizing that I was actually frightened to my core, she told me that the pale woman could be the white ghost of Angmo Kyo MRT station. And when I checked it on the internet, I found out that almost all the stations I crossed today on my way to Semabwag are supposedly haunted. And yes, white woman is one of them. It was rather amusing as how can ghosts haunt a train and station for that matter. But it was written that white ghosts targets lonely people. But I was in a filled compartment, so why did I only see her? Paranormal is a part of everyone's life, but not everyone noticed it. My first encounter was around 18 years ago, when I was 10. It was Christmas morning when I lost my father. It was a devastating loss for all of us. Since then, I don't want to celebrate Christmas. Anyway, let's get to the point. The day after the funeral, I was sitting in my room. I was bummed. I didn't want to accept the truth. And then it happened. I heard my father's voice calling my name not once, not twice, but three times. I couldn't believe my ears, and I raced out of my room into the kitchen. My eyes were starting to water because I didn't see him. I started to cry and headed back into my room. Then I realized that it was very bright winter's day. I mean, it was freaking December 26, and then I saw him. My dad was standing before me, smiling, surrounded by that light. I stared at him for what seemed to be hours. Then suddenly, light started to flicker, and I heard him talking directly to me. He said to me, I'm sorry. Be good. I have to go now. Goodbye. And then he disappeared with the light. That was the last memory I had of him. The next experience was four years ago, when I was in my neighbor's neighbor's house. My neighbor, let's call her Z, lived with her father, let's call him A, who by the way was a creepy guy. However, Z was gifted, she could see the future through cards. I was stunned when she told me things known only by me. 
I went there often times, but every time I took even the slightest look to A, my head started to hurt like hell. When I shared that to Z, she told me that I was sensitive. Every time, when I get a headache, I was in a way cleansing the negative energy. I shook it off because that couldn't be true. After the seance, you know the cards. She told me that I have a big hole in my heart, a hole full of pain and sorrow. She started to cry and told me that soon, very soon, I will lose someone very close to me and I needed to be strong at that moment. After that, I stopped going there and a week later, she died, leaving behind her awful father. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but he was evil. I can't explain how I know. I just do. Ten days after Z's death, A got ill and died. I know my stories aren't as exciting as the others, but they are true. Just letting you know that the person who I was supposed to lose was my mother who died a year after Z and A. You may say it's a coincidence, but it's not. Every time I pass Z's house, I get the same headache and I get the feeling that someone is watching me through the second floor windows where A lived. I'm 28 now and I still get that feeling. About 20 years ago, when we lived in Navy housing on Oahu, Hawaii, my daughter and I experienced something that still haunts me. Honestly, I'm not sure what it was in that I'm not sure if it was a ghost. At the time, we, my husband, our two daughters and I were living in Navy housing. I never believed in ghosts or the supernatural and we didn't entertain such stories or thoughts in our home. It was a summer sunny day. My husband was at work, my oldest daughter was out surfing with her friend and my youngest was at home with me. We had just finished lunch and decided to watch some TV. The TV room was just off the living room, dining room, and filled with windows and two doors, one to the kitchen and one to the backyard. There was a wall composed of two large sliding doors that separated the living and dining room from the TV room. Against that makeshift sliding door wall was a love seat that my daughter was sitting on. I was sitting on a chair opposite the love seat. The TV was to the side of us on a low bookcase below a bank of windows. While sitting there watching TV, something shimmery, a staticky, sparkly, flashing sort of mass passed between us and the TV. It had entered from the living room into the TV room and then moved across the room and out the back door. Within seconds of seeing it, we turned to look at each other. She then jumped into my lap and we sat hugging each other tightly for a bit before either of us could speak. I knew by her actions and the panic on her face, she had seen what I had. With fear in her voice, she asked me, what was that? I had no idea what it was, but I tried to reason it away. Staying as calm as I could, I told her it was probably the sun reflecting off a car passing the house. With a trembling soft voice, almost a whisper, she replied, but all the blinds are down. Not wanting to give in to the panic, I told her that the shades don't fit the window so tightly that light can't find its way in between window frame and shade. I then changed the subject to picking up my oldest daughter and going for shaved ice, a Hawaiian snow cone, but better. Other than telling family and friends for the next few weeks, we didn't and haven't talked about it since. We put it behind us. Fast forward two years later. My husband, reassigned back to Rhode Island, had moved back to the mainland to open our old home and get it ready while the girls and I were still in Hawaii. The girls still had a few months of school to finish, so he went ahead without us. The last few days on the island, I spent alone cleaning our base housing. All our household belongings had been moved out the day before, and we were on our way back to Rhode Island. While I cleaned the house, Readying it for inspection, my girls enjoyed their last few days with friends on the beach. I had cleaned the kitchen and laundry the day before and was now cleaning the bedrooms, bathrooms, 
and on into the living room and dining room. The whole house was floor to floor covering, which I had to sweep and mop spotless. I was mopping the living room and dining room area. The only thought in my mind was how warm it was now that the air conditioner was gone. Then, out of nowhere, appeared that same shimmering, sparkling, wild flashing mass. It crossed the room right in front of me. Being all alone and startled by what I was seeing, I packed up and left. I still hadn't mopped the TV room, nor finished the living or dining room. I didn't care. I was out of there. I grabbed my cleaning supplies, my purse, and locked the door. I left the mop and bucket with the curbside trash and got in the car and didn't look back. I have never ever seen anything like this before or after Hawaii. I've also since become more open-minded to ghosts. Once back in Rhode Island, I started watching the many supernatural and ghost hunting shows that had since started appearing on TV, and although I am open-minded now, I haven't seen any real proof. I say that because I am still not sure what I saw in Hawaii. I still feel like there might have been a logical explanation. I'm still waiting to come across someone, somewhere, who has experienced the same thing. Someone who can tell me what it was that my daughter and I saw. I'm an amateur UFO researcher. I say amateur, but I think some might consider me an expert in the field. Anyway, I'm writing here to record what's already occurred. I'm too afraid to post on the forums I usually frequent when discussing my findings because I really don't need the extra attention right now. I'm afraid that something is going to happen, and I have to document it somewhere. So here it is, and I hope you enjoy my story. I know what you're all thinking, no doubt. I'm probably some nutjob that sees airplanes flying at night and thinks they're aliens, and I can respect that train of thought. My purpose here isn't to get people to believe, it's purely selfish. Now, I'm not really in fear for my life. Well, I am, but that's not why I'm writing this. It's my research I'm concerned about. All my years looking into extraterrestrial life, I've had a number of experiences, some more notable than others. I've seen orbs in the sky maneuver in ways aircrafts never could, and I've picked up radio waves with no point of origin on Earth. Those types of things I've looked into, but no real proof has ever come out of it. But what happened the other day changed all that. I live out in California, pretty much the middle of nowhere, out in the desert. Gotta be close to the action, you know? At night, I routinely go out in my pickup and see if I can get a glimpse of anything. I have numerous outposts I go to where I've had experiences and where I know people have known to have seen UFOs. I was at one such place, sitting in my truck, in the absolute darkness of the desert, sipping my coffee, when out of the corner of my eye, I saw a bright light streak up into the sky, like really bright. It was coming from the middle of a rock plateau in the distance. Naturally, I revved up the engine and headed over. I parked about a quarter mile away and walked the rest. I didn't want the noise to scare off whatever it was. so. I snuck up and warmed my way in between the rocks to get to the middle where the light was coming from. I peeked in, and in an instant, everything I've ever believed was validated. I saw two creatures, pretty short but humanoid, no doubt. They had big eyes with no pupils, pure white, and I could see that their flesh was moist and scaly. I could hear them speak to one another, their language is difficult to describe. I can't really put into words what it sounded like. It was high-pitched and echoed, though that was more their voices and not the language itself. Hearing an alien language sent chills up my spine. I was so excited. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. There were two pods behind them, and they were both standing around some sort of metallic rod stuck in the sand. That's where the light was coming from. It was shooting out the top, like some sort of beacon. I assume it was transmitting back to the mothership, but I don't really know. To me, it appeared to be sucking something out of the earth. I could hear the device humming. I inched closer for a better look, but I cracked the rock and they both turned to me in unison. I froze, their eyes cut through me, and my excitement turned to terror. 
I was so scared, but in that same moment, I could see in them the same thing, fear. One of them reached out and touched something on the rod, and the light exploded out, blinding me for a moment. As my eyes adjusted back to normal, all I saw were the two pods jet straight back up into the air. There was no noise made, only the sound of the sphere ripping through the air. Now, as much as I'd like you people to believe what I've just told you, that's not really my concern. Because when they left, lying on the ground was the rod. They'd forgotten it or dropped it. I don't know. All that matters is that I have it. Actual proof of intelligent life. And if you looked at this thing, held it in your hand, you know it came from another world. I mean, with how bright the light on top can get, there's nothing on earth that could power something like that. You'd think I'd be on top of the world, and believe me, I was. Until the next day. I woke up to a knock on my door. It was early that afternoon, but naturally I was sleeping in. The knocking was persistent. It didn't stop. Just a slow paced knock, over and over, until I finally got to the door. I opened it to see two large men standing in front of me. They were both bald and pale, with no eyebrows or eyelashes, and they were wearing crisp black suits. Everything from their ties to their shoes appeared to be brand new, like it was the first time they'd been worn. The man on the left was the only one who spoke. He introduced himself as Agent Quinn and his associate as Agent Reed. Then he addressed me by name, my full name. I didn't think it was odd at first. I mean, he was at my house. I'd buy he knew who I was. But then he asked me the question that almost made my blood freeze. Where's the rod you procured last night? There was no emotion in his words at all. Almost robotic in tone. I immediately looked at both their sides and noticed they didn't have guns. I thought it was strange for government agents not to carry weapons, but I was also sort of relieved. I denied knowing anything, saying I'd been at home all night. Agent Quinn, however, didn't seem to have any interest in talking about whether or not I had what he wanted. As far as he was concerned, I had it. It is your best interest if you simply oblige us and gave us the item we have come for. I can assure you it would make life much easier for you. But I stuck to my guns and told them to leave. I stood firm and raised my voice, getting upset with them. But when I said leave, Agent Reed reached out his hand and grabbed me by the arm. Now, I'm not a strong man. I don't work out or anything like that. But the strength in his grip was inhuman. I have no doubt about that. He held me in place while Agent Quinn got in my face, our noses almost touching. I was staring in his eyes and I could see how lifeless they were, like what made him human had been stripped away. It is unfortunate that you have chosen to lie to us, he said. My sincerest hope is that you will reconsider and soon. Agent Reed then released me and the two of them walked back to a black van that was parked out on the street. That was the other day. I'm freaking out. How could they know that I have it? How do they know about it in the first place? I've heard the stories, stuff similar to this, and I'm afraid of what's going to happen to me because I'm not going to compromise myself and give them what they want. I was smart enough the night before to hide the rod, but I'm hesitant to say where. But I do want to. I want someone other than me to know where it is, but I have no family or friends, so I've turned here. I'm not really looking for advice as to what to do, but I'm not adverse to it either. I only want to have what is happening to me be out there. I can't let them cover this up too. As long as they don't find these posts, I'll keep posting about what's happening. I need it documented. Alright, things have gotten pretty crazy. I'm not much of a drinker, but I've since took up the habit. I'm two drinks in as I write this. I appreciate the comments and advice I've been getting, but I don't really have any intention of handing the rod over. I've dedicated years and years to investigating UFOs and extraterrestrial life, so to finally have something and just hand it over just isn't an option for me. I left a good job paying and another life to come out here to chase my passion, and that's what I intend to do. After posting the other night, I waited a few hours until a little past midnight and decided to head back out to the rock plateau where I originally encountered the life forms. 
It had been a few days, and I wanted to get a second look at the site, but after the agents came to my door, my mind had been in a different place. But I refused to let fear change the way I live my life. I went out and crept out, got into my pickup, and headed towards the desert. I half expected to be followed, so I couldn't help but glancing back to my rearview mirrors the whole time. But it seemed I was alright. I got out into the desert, no problem, but as I got closer to the rock plateau, I could see it was illuminated. Not by some extraterrestrial technology, but like the lights you see when they're doing construction late at night on the highway. The entire thing was encased in what looked like a white quarantine tent. I parked quite a distance away and got out my pair of binoculars to take a closer look. The tent seemed to be surrounded by black vans, the same that I'd seen the agents leave in. There were men similar to the agents all around, no hair and in the same fine suits. I have no idea what they were doing, but I got extremely nervous as I watched them. Some were going in and out of the tent while others stood motionless, as if they were on guard like statues. There was no way they could see me from the distance I was, so I decided that even though it wouldn't be that clear, given my range, I thought I'd record what was going on. I got my phone out and zoomed in as far as I could. It wasn't good enough to see what exactly they were doing, but I could see one thing that didn't show up in my binoculars. The eyes of every single person there were glowing, like some sort of bluish white, but I could see it very clearly through the screen. It sort of disturbed me, but I didn't really know what it meant. Some of you have commented that you have thought that the agents were themselves aliens, and I didn't really think that until seeing that. Though I do also believe they work for the government, there's no way they would be able to churn out an operation like that without people having questions and them having the right answers. I have in the past heard some of the crazier UFO researchers make claims that our government has been working with extraterrestrials for as long back as the 50s, but I never put too much validity into those claims. Seeing this, however, made me question everything. Anyway, sorry, I got sidetracked again. I recorded them for about a half hour, for no real reason, other than I thought something more interesting might happen at any moment. You couldn't tell what they were doing at all, so it was a half hour of guys with glowing eyes walking around and standing. I would have just kept filming, but all of a sudden, I could see that two of the eyes had turned and were staring out into the distance towards me. I didn't think much of it, just that he had moved, but then slowly, I noticed the same stationary eyes turned towards my direction. It wasn't long until, on my camera, it was a wall of eyes staring. I immediately jumped in my truck and peeled out of there. As I rushed home, I kept assuring myself it was nothing. There was no way they could have seen me. It was pitch black out there, and I was so far away. I assured myself something else had to have caught their attention. I got home and rushed inside. I just stared out the window for about a good hour, expecting a black van to show up or something along those lines, but nothing. I breathed a sigh of relief and opened up my laptop to transfer the footage from my phone. I hooked it all up and opened the file, and much to my dismay, the video was fuzzy. And not like a normal fuzzy video, this was like the black and white fuzz you'd see when the VHS tape stopped running, something I'd never see on digital video. To say I was pissed is an understatement. It had recorded so smooth, it makes no sense that it was corrupted like that. I was shaking. I was so angry, so you know I decided to get a drink to calm my nerves, and I just kept drinking till I woke up the next morning, or I guess afternoon on my couch with a splitting headache and a bad taste in my mouth. I looked out the window, and sitting in front of my house was a black van. All the windows were tinted, I couldn't see anything. I was pretty scared, I'm not gonna lie to you, but I had things I had to take care of, and to do, that I had to leave my house. I mustered up the courage and walked outside, where I suppose ran is more accurate. I wanted to get into my truck as quick as possible, but the moment I stepped outside, the van drove off. I was relieved, but I knew there had to be more to it, but I didn't have time to worry about it. I had things I needed to do, 
So after a few hours of running errands, I came back home to my door being wide open, pulled in my driveway, and took a deep breath before heading in. The place was a mess. Furniture turned over and ripped up, books and knickknacks thrown about. I turned my couch back right side up and just sat on what was left of the cushions, looking at everything I owned, broken and beaten. I knew that they thought they'd find and I knew it wasn't there, so they gave me a bit of relief. Then as I sat there, I remembered the rest of my research. I went back to my bedroom and sure enough, everything had been tampered with, cords had been yanked out of my computer, boxes of documents emptied, out, all over the floor. But as I looked at everything, I noticed nothing was missing, it was all there. They hadn't taken anything. I did notice, however, there was an envelope amongst the mess. I didn't have anything that I kept in an envelope, so I knew whatever it was, it must have been them who left it. I opened it up, and inside was just a single piece of paper, typed up. It said, It has come to our attention that you are not only continuing to hinder our investigation by keeping what we desire from us, but that it appears that you have begun an investigation of your own. What you saw the other night was not for your eyes. To continue on this path, you appear to be on would be unwise. Now I'm just sitting here, three drinks deep in, what used to be a nice and tidy house, typing this, wondering what to do. I'm at a loss. I don't know how far they'll go. Right now, I think they're just trying to scare me into doing what they want. And since I know I'm not going to, I'm nervous as to what's coming next. I worked night on it at this semi-swanky hotel next to the airport. One night, I get a call from a lady in two or four. She says there was arguing, loud banging, and crying coming out of 206. Check the computer, and no one has checked into that room due to maintenance issues. What the fuck? Called my supervisors to see what to do. She tells me to call on site security and follow them up with a key. I decide to be the bigger man and go up anyways. As we get off the elevator, we can hear the crying. It's loud. My heart starts racing as we near the door, so I hand the key to the security guard. The next five minutes seem to happen in slow motion. He opens the door and immediately flicks on the light. Keep in mind 206, we're on the second floor, only door was by me, and this is at like 3am and there was no one around. As we enter the room, the shower is on, steam is coming from under the door. There is only one lamp on in the room. It's super cold, and there is a lady in red, lacy bra, black panties, with super red hair curled up crying in the bed. She was facing away from us as Frank approached her. He asked if everything was okay. She sort of just stopped crying and rolled over. When she did, a wave of horror came over me. She was super pale, covered in blood, and was just staring behind us. That's when we realized the shower had stopped and the door was open. There was a man about six foot five standing in the doorway. As we turned around, cops tased him and arrested him. Turns out he was a rapist who hides in hotel rooms, kidnaps women who stay there, and cuts them open. To this day, I will never go to a hotel again. I'm currently a janitor at a gym. We have a stairwell that leads down some stairs to a door that doesn't open because we lost the keys years ago. One night, there was a loud banging sound coming from the door. It sounded like someone was banging it every second for a couple minutes. I stood at the top of the stairs and listened and watched, and it stopped. It started up again a few minutes later. I went back up there to see, and it stopped again as soon as I got there told my manager the next day and had a locksmith come in. He got the door open and it's just an old supply closet that's empty. Every so often, someone hears a banging sound coming from the door at the bottom of the stairs. Third shift gas station attendant. My first night alone. I'm out cleaning trash around the pumps and refilling the windshield fluid containers. Cop pulls in, drives by really slow, staring at the store, 
doesn't see me standing near pumps, parts, and walks into the store really fast. He's clearly looking for an attendant, so I walk into the store. He jumps when the door opens and I say, hey, what's up? The Dunkin' Donuts, two streets over, just got hit and the guy doesn't fit any profiles. We think he just likes to shoot people, so we're letting people know. He gets in his car and drives off. Was sitting at a desk in front of a good sized window, reading a binder. Sort of had that feeling like someone was watching me, so I looked up and there was a face pressed to the glass. No idea how long he was there before I looked up. Ran out to the foyer where there was a glass door on the porch that should be locked. It wasn't. He started shaking the door trying to get in. Ran to the next room and he just followed me around the house while I was on the phone with the cops. Watching me through the windows, they didn't catch him. That night, he came back the next night they caught him. Creepy as fuck. Surprise. Sometimes patients come in for other problems and don't mention that they sleepwalk. There have been a few occasions where I've been sitting in my office watching vitals and writing reports when I turn around to get something and a patient has sleepwalked into my office and is standing right behind me. At 2am in the dead quiet, that gives one quite a shock. Right out of college, I got a job as a nanny for two elementary school aged girls. For their anniversary, the parents went on a week long cruise and I stayed home with the kids. The first few nights, the 8 year old come into my room multiple times a night and wake me up. It was obvious she hadn't pre-planned what she was going to give me as a reason for waking me up, so she would stumble through an excuse on the spot like, I just wanted to make sure we are still going to the park tomorrow, or I think I forgot to brush my teeth and wondered if I should do it now or wait till the morning. I figured she was just missing her parents and feeling out of sorts, so I let it slide at first, but by the fourth or fifth time, knowing I needed sleep to keep up with two active kids, I told her that she wasn't to wake me up unless there was an actual emergency. I got a couple more hours of undisturbed sleep, but wake up with a weird feeling around 5am. I turn over and nearly piss myself. The girl had brought over a chair right next to the bed and is staring down at me. It didn't help that she had long, dark hair and this happened a few months after the ring came out. Her explanation? I just thought it would be fun to watch you sleep. I didn't wake you. Touche kiddo. It was the summer of 1992. I was 20 years old and I had just completed my junior year of college and I was staying in the same city as the campus to take some summer classes. I also worked a couple of part-time jobs to handle living expenses. One of my jobs was as a fast food delivery guy. We cooked and delivered steaks, chicken, and burgers instead of the usual pizza or Asian food. One night after completing my shift, I was bored and for laughs, decided to check out an adult movie and novelty store that I had seen sometimes in the course of all my driving for that job. I parked amongst several other cars and got out of my car to go into the store. I saw a middle aged man with a pasty appearance with greasy dark hair and receding hairline in the car parked closest to the store. I approached the car on the way in and he raised his hand hello to me. Not wanting to be rude, I raised my hand and returned. As I walked directly by the driver's side door, he said hey, and I said um, hello. He leaned his head out of his window. He said, you want to get it off? I browsed about and put off by the sheer seediness of the place, quickly left. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the guy in the car in a different parking space. I got into my car and started out of the parking lot. As I got to the road, I saw the guy start his car and start to come out as well. Hoping this was coincidence, I turned out of the parking lot to go home. It wasn't coincidence. Suddenly, this guy was following me very closely and blinking his high beams at me every few blocks. I tried to lose him at some traffic signals, but was unsuccessful. I decided to go an alternate route at that point, not wanting to direct this creep to where I was living. Luckily, 
My delivery job had made me familiar with a lot of the roads in the city. I headed for a particularly labyrinth neighborhood, turned in, and took as complicated a route as I could, and quickly as I could, and finally lost him in there. I thought that was the end of it. A few weeks later, during work, at the takeout place, I stopped at a convenience store in the course of delivery to get a soda. After I checked out, I saw the same guy. He smiled and raised his hand hello again. I hurried outside to my car, but this time, I was in my shirt and hat from the takeout place. Now he knew where I worked. By the time I left the convenience store, he followed me again. Fortunately, I was able to lose him again, but spent the rest of the summer afraid to see him pop up in the place of my work, or worse, order food and bring me to his house. Thankfully, that did not happen. The skeevy guy who likes to follow people, let's not meet again. You believe in ghosts? If so, then boy, do I have a real ghost story for you. Being so involved with the paranormal from an early age on, you tend to open yourself up to experiences that you've never previously had before. I'm of the belief that if you commit to actively hunting spirits, they will start to manifest and make themselves known to you. However, if you close yourself off to this realm, the chances of finding yourself in a paranormal situation are slim. A lack of commitment will result in most spirits ignoring you. Just think about it for a second. If you have absolutely no desire to see paranormal activity, why would a ghost waste their time trying to communicate with you? It would be just like talking to a wall. Just like the saying goes, seeing is believing, or in this case, investing is believing. This story I'm about to share with you, though just a story, is undeniable proof that ghosts are living among us in the human world. These experiences occurred late in September of 2005, and at the time, I was 15. My mother tragically perished in a car accident the year previously, and that left my dad to care for me alone. It was an absolutely miserable existence from then on, as this was the love of his life. My dad ended up being so depressed that I would often find him crying alone in his room at my house every single day for the next month and a half. I personally have never seen my dad suffer so much, and although I was also hurting, I was more concerned with my dad's well-being. It was then that I would start praying for mom to return and give us a sign to at least help comfort my dad and let him know that she was okay. However, all that praying didn't seem to help. All of the nights begging God to send her back down to us for a message almost seemed futile. I remember doing spirit sessions alone to frantically contact my mom, using a Ouija board, a spirit box, anything I could get my hands on to help. I never got any signs, and the house stood silent, as quiet as it's ever been, except for the faint sounds of my dad, crying most nights. It made me start to doubt, and think that ghosts and God were imaginary. I lost my faith in nearly everything. I remember angrily saying to myself that God and ghosts don't exist. My dad is hurting so much. I wanted to connect with the afterlife so bad, and yet nothing is coming through. Show me something. I remember saying that in utter and complete frustration. Still nothing. But all that was soon about to change. I remember one late night, I could once again hear my dad sobbing in his room after a hard day's work. He came back later that day, around 10pm. He was lying on the bed, and to comfort my dad, I went to sleep with him in his room. We had a bed across from my dad's that I would sleep in. I reassured dad that everything would be okay, even saying, Dad, I can't lose you too, please. You have a daughter to raise. Mom wouldn't let you go on like this. My dad simply smiled and told me that he would never give up on me or his life. 
So he fell asleep. I tried to fall asleep as well, laying in the bed across from me. This was the moment when I was finally going to see a sign that I had been desperately seeking. Although, this was not the sign I was looking for. An hour or so passes. I was drifting off to sleep when I saw a shadow outlined in the form of a person. This wasn't a good shadow because I felt a very negative energy. There were no features except the shadow person looming over my craving father. I then got up, turned on the light, and that shadow was gone. I went to wake my dad, and he wasn't waking up. I screamed so hard for dad to wake up, but nothing. I went and called the ambulance immediately. They rushed him to the hospital. This nightmare just couldn't get any worse. I had already lost my mother, and I was on the verge of losing my father as well. So I waited, and I waited in the hospital. My aunt and uncle swung by to give me the most gigantic hug I've ever felt in my life. We were all waiting on the word for the status of my dad. As the doctor walks out, he has a very somber and stern look on his face. Your dad suffered a heart attack in his sleep. We are doing everything in our power to make sure he recovers from this. What they didn't tell us in the moment was that he was fighting for his life and receiving life-saving emergency surgery. It turned out that he also died on the operating table, but came back. After hours of surgery, thankfully, my dad recovered and eventually woke up. The crazy part is, years after this incident, he finally told me that he experienced an out-of-body experience and said that he felt like he went to heaven. He remembers being able to see the doctors working on him. Then suddenly, he was in a sunny field with roses and daisies, all these beautiful flowers surrounding him. He then saw my mom in a blue dress, just smiling at him from a close distance. My dad saw his grandfather, who he had been really close with as a kid. He also saw his childhood dog Spike, and he was running around the field. They both waved at him, gesturing him to come forward. He felt nothing but peace as he moved forward. Everything just felt great for a moment. As he approached mom, he gave her a great big hug, and my grandpa as well. He said he didn't feel like leaving this place at all, but he knew he couldn't stay. Grandpa said with a great big grin on his face, we will see you later. Then suddenly, he woke up back in his body in intense pain. That same night my dad was having that episode, my uncle took me back to his house. As I waited for my dad to recover, I had a dream. I dreamt of the Grim Reaper, and he was literally trying to drag my dad up into this dark room with red wallpaper. I remember screaming no. I need you, Dad, and trying to physically pull my dad away from the reaper so he wouldn't take him through the door of the strange room. Eventually, the reaper gave up and disappeared. My uncle rushed in to hug me, and I told him I had a nightmare. Years later, when my dad told me about what happened to him, I told him my nightmare as well. My theory is that the whole incident the black shadow, the heart attack, the out-of-body experience, and my nightmare, they were all connected. Something dark and sinister was trying to take my dad away from me, and I feel like my dad's grandpa and my mom were somehow stopping this from happening. My uncle believed that my dad was just so worn out and hurt by the loss of my mother that it caused him to have a heart attack because of a broken heart. He does admit, though, that what my dad told us in the nightmare were very eerie, too coincidental to be one. The fact that I was praying for a sign, then challenged something from beyond, and then demanded one, made me feel like I really angered some sort of evil entities. I also believe that in those dark moments, good and evil were fighting for my dad to stay alive. 
My theory is that these dark forces are trying to take him away from me. I also know that because we're surrounded by so much darkness after we lost Wong, these dark spirits were taking advantage of us in the worst possible way. And I think they were feeding off of us. This whole time that I was hoping for a sign, it was there all along, and I should have realized this. Maybe we were consumed by a dark energy that whole time, and we needed a priest to bless this house. Eventually, that's what we ended up doing, and all felt pleasant and better. My dad slowly started feeling like himself, and the rest was history. I know this sounds insane, but I swear that all this happened, and it is 100% true. Thank you for my long story. Update. Fast forward 10 years. To my surprise, I recently found out that my old house, which was built in the early 1900s, was built on old Indian burial ground. I went to a psychic witch who did a reading on me, and we found out some fascinating things that I could be surrounded and attached by spirit guides, one that represents good benevolence and the other which is bad. She said that these two clash with one another, and when the bad spirits get through, they have the power to influence the entire mood of life and the events occurring. All this could have played a factor into what happened to my dad. She said this, plus the entities that are living in our home including that dark force cloud that I told you about, seemed to have a spiritual clash where the good could be fighting evil. Now, I know this sounds wild, and maybe the witch was just making educated guesses, but after what had happened, I truly believed that there was something going on there. She suggested that she come to the house to perform positive rituals with her group of witches as sort of a good omen ward off the bad spirits, even though we seem to get rid of them. The psychic also stressed that, because I still have these attachments, it is very possible that these things could continue and come back. She also suggested that the road my mom was driving on when she passed may have been cursed. She told me that just in case, they could go to the area of the accident to perform a positive healing ritual for the road. We also invited a group of witches to visit my dad in our old home, so we could defeat whatever darkness looms in our home. Well, they ended up showing up to our house late at night. Three of the witches showed up, and me and my dad participated in the seance as well. We also used a Ouija board. First, we gathered around the kitchen table and held hands as the witches channeled for the spirits. They encouraged them to appear. They stated that they didn't mean any harm, and they wanted to figure out who exactly lives in this house. The main witch, Cynthia, who gave me a psychic reading and told me about the clashing spirits, told me that she felt a tightness in her chest as soon as she walked into the kitchen. She did not sense any good vibes from the kitchen at all, even though the entire first floor, living room, felt more comfortable and at ease. She called out, Who is the spirit that is choking me and making it hard to breathe? That's when the kitchen cupboard opened by itself and slammed shut so hard that it startled all of us. That gave us the confirmation that there wasn't a positive ghost that resided in the home, or at least one of them. It was only seconds later that I heard a voice say go away in a very low and guttural tone. It was more of a whisper, but it immediately sent shivers down my spine. I turned to the psychic, who was sitting right next to me, and I asked her if she heard that. She said no, but that she could feel the presence of a dark shadow standing between us both. Cynthia then told us that she was getting messages in her mind that the spirit was named Tim, and that he used to be a very angry man, about middle age. What we were able to confirm next was crazy. We used a Ouija board and asked about Tim, and the Ouija board both confirmed that it was exactly him. Cynthia was right. She then said that Tim was a very lonely man after his entire family died in a house fire. 
We later found out that the house we lived in had been rebuilt shortly after. We asked the Ouija board to confirm, and to our surprise, the Ouija board spelled out yes. We then asked about mom if she was still okay, and if she passed on. We never actually got any answers from the Ouija board, nor did Cynthia. However, a few days after the whole incident, and I'm not sure if this was just a coincidence or not, but I ended up getting a random text from some unknown number. The text literally showed up with a YouTube link to the song Found Out About You, a song by Jim Blossoms. That was my mom's favorite song. The song is also about grieving for the loss of a loved one, so it really seemed to be a direct message that tied into me and my family and what we experienced. Anyway, incredibly lengthy story, but I couldn't leave any details out. Thank you so much for reading. Today, me and my dad are doing great. Stay safe, everyone. This is my first, not my last experience. I'm a slight skeptic and a psychology major, so I believe in scientific explanations first and foremost when it comes to aliens and ghosts before classifying it as a ghost story. I've always been overly curious about my family's lineage and who's related to who in my grandparents' tiny town founded by my grandfathers and grandfathers. I was adopted into the family, and I always felt like a bit of an outcast with no background of my own, so I linked to adapt my family's history despite our lack of blood relation. One day while my father and I were visiting, he asked my grandmother if she wouldn't mind taking us to the graveyards around the tiny town and showing us around. She took us to the family graveyard, another family's graveyard who was apparently not related in any way. And finally, she took us to a large church and soldier shared graveyard. I was struck by how large this place was and immediately wandered away. It was about 99 degrees that day, with very little wind and high humidity. What happened next could have easily been caused by the heat, but as a half skeptic, I'm not sure. I decided to tidy up around the headstone, believing it wasn't fair to neglect someone in life or death. As I traveled around emptying out dirty vases, straightening flowers, dusting dirt off headstones, I came across four neat little graves in a row. The graves were old, moldy, and worn. Each one had a little weather-worn clip tulip in front of it, and each one bore the same title, Infant. I don't like to talk about it, but I suffer from an anxiety order that causes me to be emotionally numb. It's extremely hard for me to feel empathy or sympathy. But looking at those little graves, I felt my heart break in my chest. I run my fingers over each one and whispered a little prayer for them. I walked away to continue my volunteered grave cleaning duties and feeling a little strange tug to go back to the little one's graves and stay there. After a few moments, I stopped under a large tree for a rest, drenched in sweat. Someone had hung a wind chime over another grave. On the same tree, I blankly studied it, listening to my grandmother and father talking across the graveyard. I could see the infant's grave out of the corner of my eye. I reached up to touch the chime. When I froze in place, a cold feeling slid down my spine and consume my stomach. Without thinking, I turned quickly towards the infant's graves and stopped cold. A woman was standing beside the second stone. She had ebony black hair down to her thin waist, and she was wearing the old-fashioned blue dress that looked straight out of the 1900s. But that wasn't the most remarkable thing about her. Her face was smooth, round, and pale, and literally blank. She had no eyes, lips, nose, nothing. I gasped and voluntarily took a step backwards, flinching at the sight. When I recovered, she had vanished without a trace. The last thing I wanted to mention about the cemetery 
is another night. I actually went back to the cemetery on my own, and I noticed something that was really, really alarming. What I noticed was something so alarming that it literally made my face turn pale. Now, I'm not saying this was a ghost, but I saw a group of people who were in a circle around the gravestone. Even creepier, they all had what looked like brown robes on and hoods on. It was like some sort of cult. That's why I can't immediately just say that it was a ghost or a group of ghosts because it's pretty obvious that it may have been something else. Maybe it was just some sort of evil ritual that they were performing out there. But I didn't want to last long over there, so I bolted. How's that for a couple of crazy encounters with some spiritual entities or some cult-like figures? Anyway. I really hope you enjoy these pair of stories. They weren't the longest in the world, but I think they were very effective. What do you think? Let me know. When I was four, I shared a room with my mother. I slept in a toddler bed that was low to the ground. If I laid on my side, I could see under her bed. One night after she turned out the lights and got into bed, I happened to look over and see these red eyes staring at me from under her bed. I was so scared that I couldn't move and just continued staring at it. The eyes were close to the ground and did not blink. I finally started to scream and cry. My mom jumped out of bed and turned on the light. She looked under the bed. And so did I. There was nothing there. She turned out the light and got back into bed. The eyes were there again. This happened three times that night, but never happened again. This is where it gets really freaky. When my oldest daughter was four, she was playing in her room alone. When she started screaming, I ran in and asked her what was wrong. She told me that there were red eyes looking at her from her toy box. I had never told her what had happened to me. Well, I completely flipped out, and we ended up running from the room. She never slept in there again. I recently asked her about this, and she told me that the eyes were looking back and forth, but didn't blink. I wonder if this is some kind of demon or something. When my middle daughter was four, she told me that angels talked to her at night. She's five now, and it doesn't happen anymore. My son is about to turn four next month, and I'm terrified of what supernatural thing will happen to him. My only consolation is that it should only happen when he's four. This is not my actual personal experience. The house that I currently live in is extremely old and has a lot of history. My aunt had once lived in this house before me and my family. She had never experienced anything out of the ordinary. She had just come back from the hospital, having just given birth to her newborn daughter. The night she had returned home, she had done everything as normal had gone to bed. The baby's cot stood just across the room. She woke up in the middle of the night, simply terrified by what she saw. A ghost with a small figure at its side stood looking into the cot holding a knife. My aunt first lay froze in her bed, not knowing what to do. She finally worked up the courage after several minutes and ran to grab the newborn baby and ran out of the house. The room in which this occurred is now my room, and I can honestly say, I've never seen an apparition, but I've heard many things during the night, such as when I once heard the banging footsteps of someone climbing the stairs. This had really frightened me, so the next day, I'd asked my sister if she had heard the noises. She replied yes. 
the weird noises continue up until this day. But we are now used to this, so we never really get scared, as we had done years ago. But just several weeks ago, my sister lay in her room watching TV, and all of a sudden, a black figure emerged in the corner of the room. The figure vanished, and we have never heard or seen anything unusual since. My name is Sam. I've been interested in ghost spirits and other unexplained phenomena for years now. When I was young, between the ages of 6 to about 13, I had experiences in the house I grew up in. I'm now 29 years old, but I know that something happened and that there are things that we as people can't even explain. My story takes place in Tallahassee, Florida, home of the Seminoles. I was about six or seven years old. I always heard footsteps walking down the hall of my house. And sometimes, it sounded like the floor was just simply creaking. Like old wood, I guess. The creaking sound moved down the hall like footsteps, though. On several incidents, I would wake up in the middle of the night and hear footsteps in the hallway. I never saw any apparitions, but I'm sure they exist. There is a sleep paralysis where you can wake up from your sleep, but not be able to move. I've seen many accounts of this on your website. I've personally have awakened plenty of times in my youth, and could do nothing except look around in my room. I've never felt as if someone was holding me down. But I'm 100% positive I was wide awake, and I couldn't move. On one occasion, a Saturday morning, I woke to the sun shining through my window. I wasn't scared, mainly because it was daytime. About 10 a.m. in the morning, when I was frozen solid, I tried my hardest to move my legs, my arms, and just talk, but I couldn't do anything. In the past, I would just lay there, and in time, the paralyzing feeling went away. This morning, I decided to lie in bed and just wait. What seemed like minutes was only seconds, when I heard whispering just above and behind my head. My bed was against the wall, and my dresser was a foot or two away from the head of my bed against another wall. In the corner, the whispers came from that corner. It sounded as if two people were telling secrets just behind me. At this point, I snapped free from my frozen state and immediately jumped out of bed and dashed into the kitchen where my mother was cooking breakfast. I know something was there, but I was so scared that I didn't look back. I clenched my mom's legs and she asked me what's wrong. I explained to her what had happened, and she kind of blew it off. There is no solid evidence that anything had happened, but I know what I experienced. That wasn't the only thing to happen. If you live in Florida, then you've experienced a hurricane. Hurricane Kate hit Florida in the mid-1980s. My mother was a single mom at the time, it was trapped at City Hall during the hurricane. She worked for the city, so during the bad storm, they didn't want to let them drive in the weather and asked the workers to stay until the storm let up. My brother is about five years older than me, so my mom called and asked him to watch out for us until she could get home. The hurricane soon knocked the power out in the entire neighborhood and probably in several parts of the city. She called again and asked my brother and I to sit in the hall. But there were no windows or doors until the storm stopped. I, being the younger of the two brothers, felt comfortable with my brother and soon dozed off to sleep. When I fell asleep, my brother 
brother said he began to hear footsteps walking up and down the hall. Sometimes the footsteps walked right past us. He also said, no matter how hard he tried to wake me, I wouldn't wake up. So we had to endure the steps and freaky sounds alone. He said it sounded as if three or four people were in the hall walking around. When I woke up, city workers were outside working on the telephone pole, trying to restore electricity to the neighborhood. My brother was curled up by the front door, almost relieved to see light, even if it was just lights from the work truck and light from the sparks of labor to the transformer on the pole. At this time, my brother told me about the footsteps he had heard and how happy he was the lights were coming back on. Other incidents happened, but nothing really worth talking about. I just wanted to share my story because the site is very interesting. I have two experiences that I know are so unusual that I thought I might share. It's a little short, but I know that these were some freaky ghost occurrences, and I simply can't not tell it. My eyes don't play tricks on me, and I wasn't tired or hallucinating. In fact, this first story, especially my friend's experience, was also very real and happened at school. I was about eight years old. I was riding my bike in trails of the woods near our house. I had been riding for so long that I lost track of time. And being an eight-year-old kid, of course it was the time of my life. I ended up getting lost in the woods and the trail for quite some time. It had to be a couple hours. And it started to get dark. So as the sun was setting, I tried to make my way back the way I entered. As I was going through the woods, I ended up going through a cornfield, and from a distance, what I saw couldn't be ignored. I saw a short figure of a man just standing in between the cornfield bushes. It almost looked like a leprechaun. Obviously, I know leprechauns aren't real, but it was the best way I could describe this ghost. It was a scraggly looking thing, and stood three to four feet tall. It disappeared after a few minutes, and was gone. I am the only person who ever saw this thing. There was never any mention of a ghost near these cornfields. For a while, I didn't even want to say anything, for the fear of looking crazy. Plus, at eight years old, who will take what I saw seriously? Today, there are houses where I saw it, so the cornfield doesn't even exist anymore. Another weird thing that happened, happened to my friends at school. Between the Christian middle school and high schools in town, there are some woods here. I never saw this, but some of my friends at the time did. One time, they looked into the brush and saw a pale-faced man in a hoodie or a robe of some sort. I'm guessing that it was some sort of ghost monk or something. They looked lost, but he didn't move at all. He was just squatting in some brush. When I was told about it, it made me realize that my experience might have been tied to this one, and that I wasn't as crazy as I thought. What happened was just odd. It's possible that the guy in the robe just could have been a creepy dude spying on the school. Personally, I think the one at school was just some weirdo, but the leprechaun could be something. However, I wouldn't just write it off, as I know that'd be hypocritical in doing so. Thanks for listening. Let me know what you think. A couple of months ago, I was living in a house with my friends that had a history of strange sightings and stories. I personally had never seen anything there, but had somewhere else. That was about to change. I was standing in the kitchen with one of my friends, 
and we were the only two people in the house at this time. The kitchen door was slightly open, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like a gentle whisper in my ear. As I looked towards the door, I saw a lady walk past the door, wearing jeans and trainers towards the front entrance of the home. At first, I thought it was my friend Laura, who always used to wear jeans, so I popped my head around the corner to try and scare her, but there was no one there. I wasn't scared because it was in the middle of the day. I actually found the experience quite exciting, but also unexplainable. We bought my father's in-law house with the understanding that he was to stay with us so we could take care of him. He was in his mid-70s and not in the best of health. Before we moved in, we turned the two upstairs bedrooms into three bedrooms. My husband was upstairs taking the panels off the walls and called me upstairs to figure out how and where to move the heating duct. As soon as I got to the top of the stairs, my husband hung his hammer on a nail that was sticking out of a stud. We were standing right next to the stud the whole time I was upstairs with him. We were the only two upstairs. When we were finished talking, he went to grab for his hammer. It was no longer hanging on the stud. We looked for it for about 15 minutes before finding it under a pile of panels about 10 feet away from the stud it was hung on. We just gave each other a raised eyebrow look and didn't say anything about it. The TV would always turn on and off by itself. It was my father-in-law's TV that was sat in the living room. It was the only TV in the house that did that, no matter what outlet it was plugged into. I would turn it off, and by the time I would walk into the kitchen, it would be on again. I would have to say something like, I don't have time to play right now, before it would finally stop. I was at work the night my father-in-law passed away. It was 3 a.m. on a Monday morning when one of the high-low drivers broke a main water line that caused all the presses to be shut down. I'd been working there for two years and had never seen or heard all of the press operators being sent home, as there is always something else for us to do. I went straight home and straight into my father-in-law's room to check on him and tell him what happened. We had a close bond and talked about everything was gone. His estimated time of death was 3 a.m. It may have been a coincidence, but man, what a coincidence. After my father-in-law passed away, I experienced only one more thing. I was up in my room and heard my son call me from the kitchen. I was at the top of the stairs, and he was at the bottom of the stairs. He asked me what I wanted. I asked him what he meant, because I heard him call me. He just shook his head and said, Oh, not this again. I came home from work early again one night, about a month after my father-in-law had passed away. I walked into my son's room to see if he was home yet. He was lying in his bed with the blankets over his head. My son was 18 at the time. I whispered, Are you still awake? He popped out his head from under his blanket and told me that he heard footsteps in his room just a few minutes before I got home. Could have been the cat, I told him. No, definitely human, he said. But when he looked to see who it was, there was nobody there. My oldest brother heard me and her brother talking downstairs and came down. She told me about an hour before I got home. She thought she heard someone walking around downstairs. She thought it was her brother. She heard footsteps from his room to the bathroom. She went downstairs and peeked her head in his room, not in there. She walked to the bathroom, but the door was standing open, so she knew he wasn't in there. She was spooked, so she went upstairs and didn't come back down until I got home.
We moved to a big old farmhouse in 2004. In my former residence where myself, my husband, and my teenage son lived, there were lots of paranormal happenings. All three of us experienced strange things, but the one that was the most bizarre happened while I was asleep in my bed. My husband had gone away on business for a few days, so I was alone this particular night. My son was asleep in his room down the hall. I owned a large male cat named Bing, who almost always spent the night on my bed. I also had a hamster that was kept in a cage in my son's bedroom. The cage door was broken, so we tied it up with baggy ties. She had escaped once or twice, so I had planned on buying a new cage the next day. As I lay sleeping in my bed, I could remember hearing someone yelling in my ear, wake up several times. I then found myself standing in the hallway, and to my disbelief, my cat had the hamster cornered and was about to pounce. I screamed for my son, and he came to the rescue before anything could happen. Someone had made sure that I would wake up in time, that's for sure. I know I heard those words wake up repeated several times. I was not terribly afraid at the time because I figured that this entity had to be friendly. Before I moved into the house on Willoughby Lane, I never had given the slightest thought to paranormal activities and had always dismissed it with a wave of the hand and an offhand comment of how such things are scientifically impossible. However, all that changed a few years ago when myself and my newly acquired husband decided to buy an old farmhouse in upstate New York. The real estate agent, while giving us a tour of the home, had in fact related some disturbing information to us. She told us about 20 years ago, a young woman who had lived there with her two sons and her father, who apparently was an alcoholic, as well as an abusive parent, had gone missing. Her remains had never been found. There had been almost certain proof that her father had murdered her, and was shortly thereafter tried, and sentenced to 10 years in prison, where he had almost died. I thought nothing of this, except for the fact that one day I might be gardening and dig up a little bit more than dirt. However, this did not stop us from buying the home, which was gorgeous, with green shutters, a post and bean barn which was in good repair, and a drive that was lined in grand old maple trees. But my friend, who was indeed a strong believer in the supernatural, strongly advised us that there might be what she called restless spirits residing in the home. Again, me being convinced there was no such thing did not take her warning seriously. After a long day of moving all of her possessions into a newly bought home, I'd fallen asleep in what was soon to be the living room. The movers had helped me bring in our couch, as well as an old rocking chair we had found in the barn. Both my husband and I thought we were able to save the old thing, which was made of oak and not damaged, except for the fact that the seat itself was no longer there. I was snoring away in the couch when I awoke, drowsily, to a consistent creaking. My husband, who was at work, and the movers, who had long since gone home, were absent, leaving me alone in the home. As I looked around, I noticed that the rocking chair was moving, as if someone was in it. Needless to say, I was incredibly scared, and proceeded to throw a book I had been reading at the chair, or running out of the home. As the weeks passed, more and more of these types of things would happen, all ending with me rather frightened. Things would disappear and reappear without notice some of which would never be there in the first place. Some of these items consisted of a wide collection of women's jewelry, 
that I occasionally would find, and what we found out later used to be a bedroom. Though we converted it into a study, I would hear knockings. Doors would open and shut for no apparent reason. We would occasionally hear the faint creaking of the rocking chair, even though I had insisted it be placed back in the barn. Occasionally, I would hear hushed voices and see flashes of what appeared to be figures out of the corner of my eye. This behavior increased as time passed, till I was starting to get used to it. I even admit to talking with the spirit whenever I was alone in the home. I would always be rewarded with an abrupt cease in all abnormal activity. On the evening of the housewarming party me and my husband were holding, one of my friends came to me in a state of anxiety. They said that they had been in the basement when they saw a woman standing there staring at them, then turning and vanishing. Myself and a few others hurried down to the basement where we looked all over, trying to find the woman. What we did find was a hidden cupboard with what was later confirmed to be the remains of Sue Hoover, the woman who disappeared nearly 20 years ago. After this finding, the noises and sightings immediately stopped and we have yet to hear the slightly disturbing creak of the old rocking chair, which we eventually moved back into the home and repaired. However, I will never forget my experiences that year, and never again doubt the existence of spirits in the physical world again. I am a great fan of your site, and have submitted some of my own stories. The other day, I remembered an experience my sister Christy had many years ago. Although I was not a direct witness to this, I was there when she came home in hysterics. She was in such a state that we all thought she was attacked, and we could not get any sense out of her. The story goes like this. Christy had been walking home from a friend's house down a long lane called Langley Lane. On the right hand side of this lane, there was a field which was used for cattle from a local farm. There was also a book with a large tree hanging over it. The summer before, I think this happened later in the year, as it was quite dark early, a young man had hanged himself from this tree during a fit of depression. I recall that other people have hanged themselves there too, at least one other one that I know of. I think I was about 16 at the time. I'm now 36, and Christy would have been about 11. Anywho, myself and my brother were sat in the house one evening, and that's when we heard Christy loudly banging on the front door to be let in. She was crying hysterically and was trying to talk but couldn't. She was obviously very distressed, and we thought that she had been attacked. When she eventually did calm down, which was sometime later that evening, she told me what had happened. She said that she was walking down Langley Lane when she looked over at the tree and saw a figure hanging from it. She said that the figure was glowing white and had a bend in its neck like its neck had been broken. She then proceeded to run all the way home which was a distance of about a quarter of a mile. She did not want to tell her brother, as she thought he would not believe her. Having had experiences myself, I am open-minded and certainly don't feel like she made it up. She has always stood by her story. I was looking at your haunted places in Houston, Texas. I grew up there. I came across the Jefferson Davis Hospital, and it reminded me of something. Once after a good night of hanging out, a group of friends and I decided to go and check it out. When we got there, I immediately felt unwanted. My skin crawled with fear. I kept telling everyone that we were not welcome there, 
We were only equipped with several lighters, so the shadows were unbelievable. We kept hearing people talk, thinking it was someone else in the hospital. Someone would call out, but nobody would answer. I kept feeling something touch my back, thinking it was my boyfriend. I turned around, but he was a couple of feet away from me. The entire time I was there, I kept telling him that we needed to leave. My friends got annoyed with me, so we decided to leave. As we were leaving the building, I was holding my boyfriend's hand, and something shoved me. I fell so hard that I twisted my ankle. It was swollen for weeks, and my doctor couldn't tell me why. Nothing was broken. It finally healed after six months. I still have problems with my ankle to this day. I have an experience that I would like to submit to the website. I have attached it below. After my encounter one late night in August with my sister, I found out that we'd always been around ghosts. My family has moved five times, and in every place, there had been at least one ghost there with us. When I lived in Texas, I moved from Houston to San Antonio. In that move, a ghost that we'd had for a year followed us to our new apartment. After living there for about a year, we discovered a new ghost. This one would hold the bathroom doors closed and knock over items we had on display. The event that completely changed my view of the paranormal happened in August of 2001. It was the early hours of the morning, about 4 a.m., and for some reason, I couldn't sleep. My older sister was on her computer, and she found a bunch of old music files she had downloaded for her history of rock class. Then she came across a Britney Spears parody song, downloaded from a radio station's website. The song itself was actually an e-clip, about 30 to 40 seconds long. We played it, and for some reason the file was corrupt. The words were garbled, playing in a slow, deep, incomprehensible voice. I had chills listening to it play, and when I looked at the counter, it had been playing for over a minute. My sister finally turned it off. She was just as spooked as I was. We moved on, laughing about the look on each other's face. Then about five minutes later, we heard three soft, solid pounds in the back wall in the far back of the apartment. Neither one of us said a word. We just listened, trying to explain away in our minds. We lived on the second floor and shared only one wall. And that was not it. Another couple seconds passed by and the banging jumped to the one long wall we shared, still towards the back of the apartment, but getting closer. We couldn't help but to stare at each other. After that one, we finally decided to ask others if she had heard that. Of course we heard the same thing, and not a minute later, the banging jumped to the room next to us, on the same wall. Three solid bangs escalating in amplitude. My heart was racing, waiting for the next set, afraid of where it would jump next. A couple of minutes passed, and just as it began to calm down and blame the banging on the maintenance worker that we shared the wall with, the banging suddenly jumped forward to the wall behind the computer. I looked above me to see the ceiling light shaking. Moments later, the banging shot across the room to the balcony. It sounded as if the entire wall was pounded on with one giant fist. Three echoing pounds later, everything stopped. I checked the sliding doors, and they were locked, thankfully. We both ran into my mother's room, and somehow she was still sleeping. She hadn't heard a thing. That was something I never understood. My baby brother was in the same room with her door closed, and he heard a soft rumble, and my mother heard nothing. After that experience, 
I've always been a little on edge. I always think about what would have happened if I had left the sliding doors unlocked that night and what the thing was trying to get in. One thing I know for sure is that my ghost from Houston left that night and the one already there seemed to get more active. Everyone started to hear their name being called even when no one was around. Luckily, no one ever attempted to communicate with whatever it was. As a matter of fact, we rarely began to answer unless we saw the person who was calling us. Two years later, after I finished high school, we moved to Iowa when I was accepted to college, and so far, we have not had any strange paranormal occurrences. Eight years ago, myself, my husband, and my brother lived at this home. We were told by the neighbor that no one ever lasts, and we didn't either. Not because of the haunting, but because we needed to come back to Massachusetts for family reasons. Anyway, we lived in this house for nine months. We were told the AC was broken, and in the Valley of Folsom it gets very hot but not in our living room. It was always very cool in that part of the home. On one occasion, I was in the bathroom, and after my shower, I was looking towards the mirror, and I saw an orange blur over my shoulder. I turned to look, but it wasn't there. It looked as though it was a face, and it would have been standing at the right height, to where her head would be on a grown man. After a few weeks, I mentioned it to my brother and my husband, and my brother relayed a story about one night, while sound asleep, he was awoken by a very large thud on his bed. He said it felt like a bowling ball had landed on the bed, like someone sat down. He said he was too scared to look, so he fell back to sleep. After a few more months, we found out that the house used to belong to the town doctor that treated inmates from the Folsom prison back in the 1800s. After putting all the info together, we realized we were living in a haunted home. I was hoping to see other stories about the house on this website. Maybe my story will start the flow. When I was 11, my father died from a heart attack in our home because of the trauma on my little sister, she witnessed people trying to resuscitate him. Our mother decided to move. We ended up moving just a little bit further down the road into an older house that had been built in the early 70s. The owner of the house also died in the house many years before. It was a two-story house, and the bottom level was made of cinder block. I'm guessing because of this, it was the reason that it was always cold downstairs. Luck or unluck would have it that the bottom level would be mine and my sister's rooms. It always was a creepy feeling downstairs. It always felt like you were being watched, but I always just chalked it up to an overactive imagination. Me and my sister both felt uncomfortable in the downstairs area. It consisted of our two rooms a laundry room, and a cellar. One morning, when I was 14, I was standing in front of my dresser and putting on my makeup. Then, I heard a voice come up to my right ear and whisper my name. The fact that on my right side was a wall really freaked me out. I ran upstairs and asked my mom had she called for me. She told me that she had not. I hated sleeping in that room from that time on, and always tried to sleep with the light on, even though it drove my mom nuts. My sister had a similar experience. I was staying at my friend's house one night, and my sister went upstairs to make sure the door leading outside was closed. She said that as she went to place her foot on the bottom step, she said something came up to her and whispered my name. She said that she also experienced things being thrown in the dark, 
when there was no one to throw them, such as a sock. My mom lives there by herself now, and as far as I know, she has never had anything odd happen to her, but whenever I visit, she knows that I will not sleep in the lower bedrooms. I still feel odd in the lower level, but not as bad as I used to. If anyone has any thoughts or suggestions on this, I would love to hear it. Feel free to email me. Hi, I'm 40 years old, and this story is very true. When my brother, sister, and I were young, about 7, 8, or 9, maybe even younger, we used to see what we would call the brown man. He was brown from head to toe. We came to the conclusion he was a shadow spirit, but with a literal brown look, not talking skin, but visibly brown. His hat, his face, his clothes, and his shoes were all brown. Different shades, but all brown. We would see him periodically and take off running when we did. But our parents never would see him. We'd walk from the kitchen and turn the corner, and he'd just be standing there. Sometimes we'd hear the toilet set drop, just little things. After we grew up, my sister was about 25 when she had her first child. She had a girl. My sister's daughter used to what we thought talked to herself when she was about two or three years old and my sister decided it was time to ask her who she was talking to, and her daughter told her, Mr. Burgess. This went on for some time. She would play, have tea parties, and sing with him just about every time she was in my parents' home. Well, one day, my niece asked my sister why Mr. Burgess wore brown all the time. Needless to say, that really shook us up. Because we thought we saw the brown man, we would tease each other and say, the brown man's behind you, and get a real kick out of it. I've since had three children, and my sister and another daughter, but they've never come in contact or ever seen the brown man. We live in a haunted house. It is really not bad once you get used to it. In fact, at times, when there's no activity, you can actually get a little lonesome for them. We moved here in 1982. It wasn't long after we settled into our new house that we bumped into the former owner at the local church. She asked us if we had seen the ghost. We didn't know what she was talking about. She said it sometimes appears in the front bedroom, our daughter's room, as a shadowy figure of a woman in a rocking chair. Our daughter overheard us talking about it and she said, oh, that must be the lady who sits in the chair at my desk at night. She doesn't bother me, just sits there kind of watching after me. We had noticed some strange things in the house, but put them off to natural causes such as the reoccurring footsteps in the hardwood floors after we went to bed, the strange way the television would turn on and off by itself, other electric appliances doing funny things, and objects disappearing then turning up somewhere else, but we dismissed the idea of it being ghosts until one late night. My wife woke up thirsty in the middle of the night, so she went to the kitchen to get a drink. When she got to the living room, she saw someone in the shadows in the middle of the room. Thinking one of the kids had gotten out of bed, she hollered, Get your butt back in bed. The figure streaked off and disappeared. It didn't go around the sofa. It went through the sofa. It didn't walk. It glided. It was the figure of a woman with long black hair. The kids were sound asleep in their beds. My wife came back to bed without her water. My first experience with her was about 10 p.m. one night. I was walking home from next door, and as I approached the driveway, I saw a figure of a woman walking in the drive. She was cutting across the edge of the lawn on the north side of my shop about 20 feet away. The light on the north side of the shop was on, illuminating her faintly. I could make out no details of her, only a dark figure of a slender woman walking briskly towards our house from the west. As I got in range of the motion detector light on the east side of my workshop, it came on. The figure vanished. This phantom female I saw matched the description of the dark woman other family members have seen in our house. But the dark woman is not the only spirit in our home. We have discovered there are others. Some are shy and reclusive. 
Some are a little mischievous and playful. They like to play with stuff, just to let you know they are there, I think. They hide things. You put something down, and a minute later it is gone. You search all over, and then find it right back where you laid it in the first place. They turn things on and off. TVs, radios, just about anything. Even water faucets. One morning, my son went into the kitchen to get a drink of water. Uh, Dad, Dad, come here. I went into the kitchen to see what was wrong. What's this all about? My son asked. He was standing back from the sink, pointing to the faucet, which was running full blast. My wife was standing beside him. The knob is turned off, but it's still running, he said. We stood and watched it for a minute. Figuring a faulty valve, I started to walk towards the sink to try to turn it off by myself, and suddenly, it just stopped. Turned off all by itself. I looked it over, turned it on, and then turned it back off again. It worked fine. I checked the valves the next day, and everything was functioning properly and has worked fine since. TVs are a real favorite. I was waking up from a nap one evening when I heard the television on in the living room. I assumed my son was home and was watching a movie. As I rose, I heard the television turn off. When I went into the living room, the lights were off, the television was off, the door was still locked, and my son was not there. My wife and I were the only people in the house, and she was still sleeping. I turned on the television, and the same movie I had heard from the bedroom was playing. Radios are popular with them, too. On another occasion with my wife, my daughter and I were watching television in the living room. All of a sudden, the CD player comes on and starts playing a CD at high volume. My wife got up and turned it off. Reaction from all of us was very casual. Go to grandma's if you want to listen to music. We are watching TV, I jokingly said out loud. At the time, my mother was living in a mobile home behind the property. My sister was staying with her. I found out the next day they took my suggestion to heart. My sister called. I went out to go to work, she said. The radio in the van was playing. I thought someone left it on. Oh great, now the battery will be dead, I thought. Then I realized the radio doesn't work unless the key is on. I was holding the key in my hand. That's weird, I thought. I unlocked the door and I reached in to turn off the radio and it was already off. It quit playing when I touched it, so I put the keys in the ignition and turned on the radio and it came on. I turned off the ignition and it went off. Ignition on, radio on. Ignition off, radio off does not work without a key. How is it playing without the key and the ignition and the knob turned off? She asked. We have all gotten used to our ghosts now. Our children have grown up around them and have their own stories. The friends in ours have all been scared out of their wits a time or two, but are accustomed to it now. New friends take a little time to get acclimated, though. My son was in his teenage years, and most of his friends knew about our house. His new friend Jason did not, though. My wife and I had gone out for the evening, and my son was having a party. All his friends were over. Everyone was having a good time but Jason. He was tired. Jason was new to Tommy's parties. Jason was also new to our house. If he had known about the things that happened here, he might have not left the main group and gone to the game room where it was quiet. Most of our friends know and have experienced eerie things while here with enough frequency that it really doesn't surprise them. Ah, but Jason was new. Ripe picklings from a mischievous ghost. So Jason left the party and went into the game room by himself, where he laid on the floor to get a little rest. My son and his friends were only a little surprised to see Jason run into the living room pale and frightened. The pinball machine, Jason said. Flash Gordon, it came on all by itself and started playing itself. There's nobody in there, and it just came on and started playing. Yeah, so, responded my son's other friend, who was so accustomed to such things here. Flash was Philip's favorite machine, my son explained casually. Philip was our nephew who died in an accident a short time before. He was probably just enjoying a round of pinball, said my son. He is a nice guy. He won't bother you. Everyone went on about having fun, except for Jason. He stuck close to the group for the rest of the night, but he never came back to our house. There have been times when these spirits have saved the day for us. We once awoke to find a fire had started on our patio by a candle of burning when we went to bed. About 15 square feet of one wall covered in rattan was charred from the flames but somehow, mysteriously, it had gone out by itself. The dry rattan, though very flammable, had just stopped burning. This was not the only time. It had only been a couple of weeks since we buried my wife's brother, Virgil. Tragically, he was killed by a car while walking home. My wife had been cleaning out his mobile home next door. 
A terrible task, but she faced it with courage and fortitude. Sometimes I think she is operating on automatic pilot. She came home and told me. I saw him. Virgil. He was just standing there in the doorway of his trailer while I was sorting out his things. He said nothing. Then he disappeared. A few days after that, my dad came into the shop where I was working. Do you know the door on Virgil's mobile home is open? He asked. No, I replied. I'll check it out. The home was vacant since Virgil died. We were watching his property while probate proceeded. I walked over and saw the front door ajar. I feared the worst, that the vacant home had been broken into. We were careful to lock the door, and no one else had a key. I carefully entered the premises. The overwhelming odor was unmistakable. Propane, strong. I had to exit immediately, a gas leak. The house was full of it. I went to the rear of the home and found the main gas valve. I turned it off. Covering my mouth, I entered the home again. Quickly, I began opening windows. I could not stay in there for very long. I can't believe this place didn't blow up, I said to myself. It's a good thing the front door was open, but how did the front door get open anyway? Sometimes they go with us. Sort of a spirit field trip, I suppose. In 1998, my wife and I took on extra jobs. I was managing and bartending at a local hotel bar, and my wife was the cocktail waitress. I guess they got lonesome for us. No one at home to pester and all. Maybe just bored. So they started going to work with us. We were at the lounge. It started out small. TV on, TV off. Glasses doing funny stuff. That sort of thing. We had closed for the night. It was clean up time. I was walking to the kitchen when I heard a noise from the juice box. The pages of cards which show the selections were flipping on their own. Page after page flipped, all in one direction, then it would switch and go back the other direction. This was just the start. They seemed to prefer after hours at the bar. We were cleaning up one night when we decided the small table and chairs would look better if I moved them farther away from the pool table. I moved them over near the dance floor. I proceeded to clean the rest of the bar. When I turned around, the table and chairs we moved are back in their original positions by the pool table. The next night we decided to mess with them. After closing, we rearranged the entire setup in the bar. Tables, chairs, everything. Then we went to my office, got our stuff together to go home, and walked out to find everything back where it was originally. What had taken us a couple of hours to do, they had accomplished in a few minutes. We have lived here in the magic spot about 25 years now. I have notebooks full of activity, notes about ghostly occurrences, sightings, etc. We have never tried photography, but being an artist, I have done paintings of some of the entities we have here. We also experience really odd weather patterns, most often in the winter. Radios and televisions, actually just about any electronic device, is likely to act up when used here, and we have learned more about the history of this area. A local Native American medicine man once told me this place gives them the willies. Teenagers refer to this place in the surrounding area as the magic spot and have many stories about it. Over the years, we have actually had a good relationship with our ghosts. Though at times mischievous, for the most part, they just go about their own business and we do the same. We do at times bump into each other, however. Sometimes it is as much surprise to them as it is to us. Sometimes it is nice to have them around. Other times, it can be quite frightening. I was actually surprised one late night, and it and I streaked off in opposite directions. I don't know which of us was more surprised. They have become as much a part of our home as our family members. It wouldn't be the same without them. As the youngest of five children, all boys, and the son of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, of the seventh daughter, supernatural followers will know that means a white witch. I've seen many strange things. I and my brothers grew up in what would be described as a haunted house. At a very young age, I loved to play in my parents' bedroom, which overlooked the landing, first two steps, and small landing at the top of the stairs. On an almost daily basis, I saw shadows walking along the landing. They were not ordinary shadows. These were floating. They were not cast on the wall, but were in mid-air, but I could see through them. As I got older, they seemed to happen less frequently. I still see these shadows occasionally, out of the corner of my eye. In the early 80s, my brothers discovered the Ouija board method of entertainment, which heralded some very interesting results. On one such session on the Ouija board, the spirit known to us as Paraga put us in touch with a chap called Ray with a message for my father. I can't remember the surname that we were given, 
But we passed the message on to my father, who accused us of conspiring with my mother to try to persuade him that Ouija board works. Of course, this was simply not the case. It turned out that his friend Ray had committed suicide while my eldest brother was very young. Therefore, it would be impossible for us to know anything about it unless we were told by someone. We simply had no knowledge prior to the session of events that had taken place so many years before. On another occasion when I was 11 or 12, we had a very strange encounter. My mother and father were out for the evening and my brothers were left to look after me. The session took place in the dining room which had one exit into the kitchen. From the kitchen, you could exit to the hall towards the front door or a door latch with one bolt lock to the back garden and side entrance to the property. There was a window looking into the garden that the strange phenomena took place in. It was a strange session that seemed to pick up an angry persona. All of a sudden, there was a bluish glowing light out the back of the house and the window started to shake violently. As we made a mad dash for the kitchen, the door to the back garden also started to shake violently. We all ran for our lives out the front door and scattered in all directions up and down the road. There was snow on the ground and I was dressed in PJs and no shoes. It was almost half an hour and much deliberation before we returned to the house and went in. There were no signs of any strange happenings. We used playing cards with letters drawn on the back and yes and no written on separate cards and numbers in the middle of the table in a row and some excellent shaped wine glasses that were virtually impossible to push. In an early experiment, the glass zoomed round and round with great speed. All of a sudden, it left the table lifting up to the top corner of the room and smashing into small pieces. Even the stem and base broke into pieces, the biggest the size of your little fingernail. Anyone who has ever broken a wine glass will know it takes a tremendous force to break the stem and base to that extent. In 1985 at the age of 15, I was walking home to the family home around 10pm from a friend's house. It was a wet and windy night and I walked with a collar up on my coat with my chin tucked into the top of my zip, only looking up every now and then to see where I was going. There was a small village in the outskirts of the city, just down the road from the family home. I was walking towards the village, where I would have to turn right to go in the right direction to get home. Approximately a thousand yards before the road I was walking along came to an end. There is a ten-story block of flats, and next to that, a retirement home. As you get nearer to the end of the road, approximately 500 yards from the end, there is a row of attendant bungalow flats going along the road I was approaching and intending to turn right towards home. To the left was a large grass area between them and the main road. I passed the end bungalow flat, heading to the T-junction with the grass area to my left and approximately 100 yards of space all around me to the nearest object, some small bushes. All of a sudden, I saw a pair of brown shoes come into view a couple of steps in front of me. Startled, I looked up to see an elderly gentleman in front of me. I took a step sideways and went around him. Something struck me as strange and after a few more steps, I turned around to see nobody behind me. There was absolutely no way that the old man walking slowly with a walking stick could possibly have moved quick enough to get behind something to obscure him from my view in such a short time. In fact, the distance between me and the nearest object was too great for Ben Johnson at his prime to reach before I turned around. It wasn't until I thought about it while walking home that it struck me what it was that was so strange about the gentleman when I first laid eyes on him. Despite being quite persistent, rain and strong wind driving the rain, the man was dry and there were no drops hitting him. He was all dressed in brown, brown shoes, suit, and flat cap. I can't remember the color of his shirt or if he was wearing a tie, but I will never forget his face as he smiled a gentle smile and thanks as he moved out of his way. His features were very clear. I have never seen him since. This village was quite a friendly community where most people knew everyone else, but I did not recognize this gentleman. There were many strange things that happened in the family home from power cuts that were localized to just our house in the whole street. We had electricity meters that took coins to pay for the electricity supply. If the electricity went out, it should need to be topped up by popping a coin in the slot. Even after putting money in the meter, the electricity would not work. It would be found to have been switched off and in those days, there were no such things as circuit breakers that would trip the switch. When my father knocked out the dining room window to put in a patio door, we found three patio negatives of an old gypsy man. The first of him, out the front of his caravan. Another of him, stood on the caravan steps and the last of him, laid out dead. We intended to have them developed. They were missing from the place we put them. 
We assumed they fell down behind the kitchen cabinet where they were left. When the kitchen was remodeled, there was no signs of them and other things we assumed had fallen down behind the cabinets. On many occasions, I've told certain people to answer the phone because it was for them and it was. The problem was the phone had not actually rung until after I had told them but within a few seconds. I can't explain it, but it still happens. It was in October of 2004, around 3.30 in the morning. I was slowly waking and was in the state where I could hear the TV, but wasn't quite awake. I remember having this eerie, scared feeling, and in my sleep started singing Jesus Loves Me, the old childhood Sunday school song. Anyways, I remember feeling a presence in my legs, real heavy, and I felt something was watching me. I snapped awake and moved, and the thing made a swooshing noise, and my cat even looked up in the air where this went over my head and out the door. I was on the couch and the front door was behind me. My cat was acting funny even before this, and at times, I would come home and feel a nervous, scared feeling like someone was in the house. That's when I saw it. It was the silhouette of the hat man. I looked petrified, and I couldn't just shake the feeling. It was almost inside my head like it was screaming voices at me. The voices released from the hat man into my head were all mumbled, so I couldn't really understand any of them. A split second later, there is silence, and the hat man slowly fades into the abyss, actually fading into the TV screen once and for all. I don't know if this has anything to do with the paranormal, or if I'm just losing my mind. Was it sleep paralysis? Was the hat man real, or was it just all in my imagination? I have no idea, but I'm kind of hoping and praying to God and Jesus that this doesn't even exist and that I'm all hallucinating this just to make myself feel better. As I previously stated, my cat has even noticed weird things that have occurred in this house, and I'm just not sure what to trust anymore. Are my senses going crazy? Am I just in touch with the paranormal? Am I opening up another portal? to the paranormal dimension in which beings and spirits, including the hat man, come to greet me with demonic images and voices in my head. I don't know, but I'm just hoping that I will never find out the true answer to this mystery. Thank you so much for reading. I know it's short, but thank you. In my life, my family and I had numerous paranormal incidents. There were always heavy footsteps, sounding like a person in boots upstairs in the attic, Sometimes I heard them coming down the stairs or on the front porch at night, but oftentimes I had trouble keeping them. They said the TV kept going off and on. One said she saw a man in the attic through the window. My boys were afraid to sleep in their room alone sometimes because they saw people in the backyard. There were two very strange occurrences that happened in the winter of 1991. I was married at the time to a man who was abusive to my children and myself when he drank. One night, I smelled something burning in the bedroom, and the bed was smoldering. I woke up my husband, and he pulled the mattress off the bed. There was a burning area right in the bottom of the top mattress. He had not been smoking in bed, and wouldn't have been there anyway. Another night, I took the kids to get ice cream. When I got back, the doors were all dead bolted and windows locked to where I couldn't get in. I looked through a crack in a curtain and saw my husband lying unconscious on the floor and the heavy dining room table was turned over. The phone was dangling from the wall. I pried open a window and climbed in. I called for an ambulance and called the police. My husband was taken to the hospital and the police detective was totally baffled. Later, my husband said that he was talking on the phone to his mother when he was hit hard from behind and knocked out. His mother called to check in on what had happened, saying they had been talking, she heard noises, and he was no longer there. I felt like maybe we had a ghost that was protective towards us, but angry with my husband for his actions. I usually felt safe in the house, but on occasions, I was very frightened. After my husband and I divorced, I felt the need to move. While checking out the history of the house later, I found that it was originally owned by a doctor who kept his ill patients in his home with him. This was in the early 1900s, around 1907. After he left, there was a terrible train wreck just outside of town where some Mexican immigrants and a couple of local workers were killed in a train collision. Their bodies were badly burnt and thrown into a massive grave, which turned out to be in the back acre of our yard. I feel certain that we had multiple spirits, though before this time, I never believed in ghosts.
I was visiting California on a school trip. My friends and I were hanging out in the hotel's hot tub. We were playing truth or dare. I was dared to leave the hot tub and dive into the cold pool, then run back to the hot tub. I got out and went to the edge of the pool. Looking at the clear water, I dove in. Next thing I knew, I was face to face with a dead body. He was face down at the bottom of the pool. It was like it was slow motion. He turned to me with his eyes closed. He slowly opened his eyes and stared into my eyes. He was missing his left eye. I was scared. I breathed into scream and breathed in water. I pushed through the dead man on accident and in my struggle to get to the top, I was thrashing around quite a bit. A friend came and helped me out, panting. I said I didn't feel like playing anymore. Me and my two friends went back to our hotel room. One friend was taking a shower and my other friend was watching TV. We noticed our phone blinking. We checked the messages. We had 362 messages. We were only out for an hour. We had no way to trace the calls. No one even knew our hotel phone number. We listened to the first few messages. They seemed like they were all blank. Finally, we heard something. One word, hell. This freaked me out. I haven't told about the man at the bottom of the pool. I tried to downplay the message. Later that night, we went to sleep. I don't recall any of this next part, but my friend said that at 3 a.m. I got up, turned on the curling iron, and turned on the faucet. I then hit my head really hard on the headboard of the bed and went back to sleep. I woke up that morning with nothing but an eerie feeling, which was soon forgotten since the next day we went to Disneyland. A week later, we drove home. The thought of this man still terrified me. I just pushed it to the back of my mind and continued on. I did not believe he wanted to harm or scare me though. Weeks went by. I remember doing chores around the house. I was putting laundry away in my mother's room. Her dresser has a huge mirror. After placing the clothes in the drawer, I looked up into the mirror. Standing behind me in the back of the room was this man. I could see him very clearly. He was young, long blondish hair. His skin was grayed and almost green, waterlogged, and a little wet looking. His good eye was brown, and where his other eye should have been was just a hole. It seemed to go on forever. It was almost hypnotizing. I noticed this all in an instant, because when I turned around, this young man turned and walked away. I sensed that his name was William. I didn't see William for a very long time, although I felt him following me. Our house began to change. Radios would turn on when they weren't even plugged in. A music box would start to play randomly. Shells would fall off the wall. Everyone noticed it. Everyone was afraid. I wasn't. Years went by. I started to feel a difference over me. At night, I would wake up to voices in my room, like a crowded room where you could hear only a few words that made sense. I tried to ignore the voices. Sometimes, I would wake up with a single voice in my ear talking to me. They seemed to never make sense. It was like the end of a sentence or the beginning. I remember waking up one night. I felt scared for the rest of the time. It was very late at night. I knew no one was awake. A blue light was outside my closed door. My door began to shake very violently, but the beads on my door didn't even sway. I kept all of this to myself. Who wanted to tell their friends and family they heard voices in their head and see people in swimming pools? I don't think so. Later that year, I moved out and started going to college. My family said that since I left, the strange happenings seemed to have moved out when I did. Strangely, my roommate said that since I moved in, strange things started happening. Pictures falling off the walls, TVs turning on, shadows, and the feeling of being watched. I still heard voices at night, but never anything scary. I learned to live with it all. Now, in 2009, I am married. I still hear voices at night, but they are making more sense now. Sometimes, the voices say things to me like, get out, I'm not kidding, get out, and laughing followed evil laughing. I tried to go back to sleep. One night, a few weeks ago, I woke up feeling like someone was in the room with me, a different energy than my husband's. I looked up and saw a dark figure standing over me. My dog started barking and growling like crazy. The dark figure turned his head and walked out the closed door. I went back to sleep and woke up to a voice telling me, your destiny will be at the Valley of Thunder. 
then all the voices shall be heard. I haven't ignored that one. Sometimes I will go to Yosemite National Park, Valley of Thunder, and see what my destiny is. It just doesn't seem right yet. Two nights ago, I had a dream. William came to me. He didn't say anything, but I sensed he was telling me it was okay not to be afraid of him. I feel as if since I've met William, I've become sensitive to spirits and energies. I've met other spirits beside William. I feel as if now I have the ability to read energies and sense thoughts. I almost regard William as a friend. As an avid EVP researcher and long-haul truck driver, I've had many opportunities to get EVP recordings from all over the country. My research has revealed some startling results lately. On the 20th of January this year, an EVP has attached itself to me somehow. Now, no matter where I am or where I go, this EVP named Desmond Heathers is in every recording I make on my Olympus digital voice recorder. Even when I'm traveling down the road at 65 miles per hour, Desmond is there ready to talk when I turn on my recorder. I know a lot about them and where he is now. One startling development occurred when I asked Desmond if he knew anyone that I knew. He said, yes, Joe. I said, Joe, my brother? He said, no, Joe, who is with me. I asked him if Joe was with us now, and he said, he is in you now. So I asked, Joe, are you there? And I got this voice in the recording that was very deep and gruff sounding. I can only say it sounded like Mr. T from the TV show The A-Team. Joe said, go away, leave me alone. Well, I don't communicate with those who don't want to, so I just do what I always do with the ones I get who I don't think deserve my attention. I just ignore them. Here's where the story takes a strange turn. The week after that, I was talking to my doctor about a fatigue problem I've been having lately. Nothing serious, just tired during the times of the day. I don't think I should be. He asked if I was sleeping okay, and I said I tend to wake up several times during the night. He recommended I get a sleep study done. After finding the only sleep research center within 100 miles of where I live, I was told the study would cost an excess of $1,600 for one night. Well, I thought this was ridiculous, so I figured I would do it myself. I was on the road the night I decided to do my sleep study and set up my digital voice recorder and DV camera on the sleeper of my big rig. I fell asleep within 15 minutes. When I reviewed the recordings the next morning, I was so startled at what I had recorded, I could hardly listen to it. The recording revealed that I snore rather loudly. What was startling, though, was the EVP Joe was using my snoring sound to speak to me in my sleep. With every rattling snore, he formed words. He said things like, Don't you know you love me? Don't leave me. Don't wake up. I'm not done yet. Don't you remember me from the Navy? You know you're listening to me. You know you love me. How did I get in here? What happened to me? I need you. I'm just jealous of you, Tony. Tony, please help me. Not just that night either. Every night I've recorded, he's talking to me in my sleep. It concerns me because I don't know if there may be some subliminal influence with him talking in my sleep like that every night. I think I know him. I vaguely recall a friend I had in the Navy named Joe back in 1980. I remember feeling sorry for the guy because of his drinking problem and was always trying to help him when he got in trouble. I used to buy him gifts for his birthday and Christmas because his family wanted nothing to do with him. Other than that, I can't recall very much about him. When I asked him how long he has known Desmond, he said about five years. That's how long Desmond told me he's been dead. Actually. Desmond didn't even know he was dead until I convinced him he was. He kept trying to tell me he was alive. So I asked what it looked like where he was, and what did he see around him. He said nothing but a faint amber and turquoise colored light that was all around him. He desperately wants out of there. He says he can see me sometimes. One day, when I was sitting at my office desk at home, I asked him if he could see me, and he said he could. So I reached in my pocket and pulled out a $20 bill and asked if he could see what I had in my hand. He said a dollar. Thinking it was just a lucky guess on his part, I dropped the bill and picked up a Bic lighter. I then asked again, what am I holding in my hand right now? And he said, a light. I reached in my desk for it and had my hand closed around it so I couldn't even see it. How did he know? Many times Desmond will ask if I can see him. 
I've never been able to do so, so I got on my digital camera and asked if he would let me take pictures of him. He said, I will try. I told him where to be in my living room at home while I snapped a few dozen pictures. Nothing showed up on review, so I asked if he would mind trying something else. I explained what white noise was to him, and he was already familiar with it. He helps me to adjust the levels and spectrums of white noise to be able to hear him better. I explained that I could generate a different type of noise that is not audible, but that I might be able to see him with. So I set up my DV camera to form a video feedback loop with my Sony Trenton 32 inch TV, manually adjusting the focus in such a way that the feedback picture was focused on the pixels on the screen as it oscillated slightly due to some technical reason I can't explain now. After talking with Desmond during the setup and adjustment period, I told him where I thought he could best try to show himself. Desmond appeared to me only once for about two seconds in the video. He had very plain symmetrical features and was shown from the waist up. He seemed to be in his mid-thirties with dark sunken eyes. He was wearing a bowler hat and a 1940s type jacket with wide rounded lapels with an open shirt that had no collar. Further research with Desmond shows he can see me and some things around me when his energy level is high. For example, I can give him instructions on how to travel somewhere. One time I showed him a map on my Microsoft streets and tips and showed him the same roads and satellite photos taken from Google Earth. With this information, I am able to ask him to get a specific place and get information I desire. One time I sent him to the Powerball Lottery Drawing Headquarters located at Urbandale Drive in Urbandale, Iowa to see if he could see the Powerball numbers being drawn six hours before the draw. I have reason to believe he is not bound by time as we know it, and thought he could travel through different threads of time and different timelines. While well, I asked him to go and do this one for me, after about an hour of instruction on what to look for and how to get there. Then, when I asked if he was ready, he said I'll try. Then, I'll be right back. He returned in approximately 30 minutes and gave me some numbers. I was all excited and purchased our ticket. Later the next day I went to check the ticket and realized I had sent him on the wrong day. I explained to Desmond how sorry I was for the mistake and how much time and energy we wasted. I asked him what the numbers were he gave me because he was there 24 hours too early to see the actual drawing and realized he must have witnessed one of the practice draws they do to check out the machines. Lately, I've been having some other problems. I injured my back seriously at work and have not had the desire to record anymore due to my pain and medication. I have been recovering well and expect my research to continue. My new job doesn't offer me as much travel and time to do the things I'd like. I just hope when I start recording again, Desmond and Joe will let some other people talk to me. I wanted to share my experience with you guys. I'm not sure what it means or anything, but if you do make it to the end of the story, you can decide for yourself and let me know what you think. One night when I was 13, I couldn't sleep, so I tried to turn the other way, on my side, to try to get myself comfy. As I turned around, I saw a figure of a woman against the wall in front of me. She was kind of a black figure, and she seemed to have a hunchback and a hump on her back from the way she was standing. This, of course, freaked me out, especially since I was only 13 at the time. I lay in shock and not knowing what to do, and after like two seconds, I put my head under the covers and called for my mom. She came in, and I was really afraid to tell her in case she thought I was crazy, so I just told her that I had a really bad dream. I was definitely not asleep. I couldn't sleep for a few nights, as it freaked me out so much. This kind of went away after a few weeks, and I was gradually able to sleep again. However, a few weeks after this had happened, I was getting pains in my back and I went to the doctors to get scans and things. I then found out I had sclerosis, curvature of the spine. I eventually started getting a slight hump in my back because of this. It has been 10 years since I saw this woman, but I can never get it out of my mind. I have since told my mom about this, and she seemed freaked out about it as well. I'm not sure what this means, or if it was a ghost or spirit trying to tell me something. I have no idea, but it really did freak me out. This is just a short experience I had at about 17. A group of four friends and I were sitting at my house, bored out of our minds. My buddy Joey, not his real name, 
was literally banging his head against a wall out of boredom. Tommy, also not his real name, was reading a book he brought. His sister Alexis, of course, not a real name either, was teasing my dog with a flashlight. Henry had his earbuds blaring. Finally, my friend Annie was on my laptop looking for something that might be fun. Annie came across a story a few guys had posted on a ghost website about an abandoned local farm. They posted how they went exploring the farm and got the hell scared out of them by a black figure. Annie is into the paranormal and asked if we wanted to investigate it. I said sure, better than sitting around waiting for my dog to bite Alexis for teasing him. The others agreed, so we hopped into my truck. It's a single cab with three seats. The girls rode in the cab with me while Henry, Joey, and Tommy rode in the truck bed. I didn't believe in ghosts. If someone told me they saw a ghost, I would have to say stop watching Scooby-Doo and return to reality. Annie told me how to get there with the directions the guys posted on the ghost site. When we arrived, we all hopped out and walked up to the gate. We hopped the gate and started talking about where to go. We agreed to split up. Tommy and Joey were with Alexis. They went to the old barn. While Annie was with Henry and I, we went into the two-story farmhouse. I looked in the upstairs window. All the glass looked like it had been smashed out of the windows. The house looked wrecked. It looked like whoever lived there had been a hoarder. While Henry and I were exploring, we heard what sounded like footsteps upstairs. We were intrigued, so we took off upstairs. When we got to the second floor, it was empty. While walking down the stairs, I felt like someone had been pushing me. I was mad. My right shoulder was cut thanks to the old wooden steps I had twisted my ankle on. I asked Annie and Henry, what the hell are you guys trying to do? Are you trying to kill me? Annie said she and Henry were in the bedroom to the right, looking through some of the old junk when they heard me scream and they came running. Henry held me up and we were about to leave when we heard something slam hard in the kitchen. We went in and saw a toolbox we had seen on the table on the floor with various tools around it. Henry said no way in hell that toolbox had a damn padlock on it. We all looked around the lock. It was on the table now, besides where the toolbox used to be. Henry tried to get in the toolbox earlier, but the lock prevented him. We heard footsteps upstairs again. Annie said screw this and ran outside along Henry while I hobbled out. The jerks left me behind. When we were out of the house, we saw Alexis, Tommy, and Joey. They were panting out of breath and looked terrified. We asked what happened. Alexis said that they saw a black figure with red eyes and it charged at them. We all heard a loud snarl like a big dog and we took off towards my truck on the way there and said, look, in one of the upstairs windows, we saw two glowing eyes go from the middle of the window to the top. Then they separated. One went left and one went right. We all hopped the fence and peeled out of there as fast as everyone could. I am not currently experiencing any hauntings, but I do have a tale of a spiritual encounter. I will begin by prefecting story with the events leading up to the event. My grandfather passed away in hospice care in July 2000. I spent his last night on earth with him, holding his hand and reading the Bible to him, which was his favorite literature. He was an artist and a carpenter, and spent his last remaining years up in his home carving beautiful artwork out of wood. He loved his simple life and carved because he wanted to, never once selling his museum quality work. He would only give it away to anyone who truly appreciated it. At 88, he was about 80% deaf and completely blind in one eye and nearly blind in the other. After a stroke six months earlier, his health declined quickly and he simply gave up on life. As he lay in the bed, I sang to him, although he probably could not hear me or even knew that I was there, and he was in a coma-like state with his eyes open. He had stopped eating and he was severely underweight, and it was hard for me to see him like that, knowing how much he loved life and living. Many times he cried in his last few years, saying that he loved his life and didn't want to die. During his last living moments with me, I looked down into his distant foggy eyes knowing he couldn't hear or see me, and told him that the baby goose that he held in my house the last time he visited had grown up now and had four babies of her own. His eyes filled up with tears and turned red, and his mouth began to quiver 
as if he was trying to say something. He hadn't spoken in nearly two weeks. His love for animals and nature transcended through his limitations that night. I knew he would probably die that night, so I sat next to him with my hand on his chest, feeling his every breath and heartbeat. He didn't pass away until the next day, after I left. He was alone, which is what I didn't want. I didn't want his spirit to leave his body and to look down at an empty room. That bothered me for a long time. In an attempt to comfort ourselves, we turned to his Bible. He was much more dedicated to the word than we were ever, but knowing that it was so close to his heart, we thought it would ease our minds. My mother said to read something that he had underlined or highlighted, which is something his Bible was full of. I read the first thing I opened that was underlined. You do not have to understand the Bible to feel the power behind these words, which read, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, where there comfort one another with these words. We all felt a chill run through us. At his wake, I waited until everyone left, and I cut a small lock of his beautiful thick white hair and placed it in an envelope. As myself and my friend walked to the vehicle to leave, I opened the door and a mourning dove flew into me as if trying to enter the truck with me. It injured its wings and I brought it home. I rescue and rehabilitate small animals all the time, so I mended its wing and let it go about a week later. I took that as a sign for my grandfather, as we had that bond of loving all creatures great and small. A couple of weeks later, in August, my best friend was at my house, and I was showing her videotapes of Papa, that is what I called him, because she had never met him. I wanted to share with her the kind of person he was. For nearly two hours we watched him talk about God, Leonardo da Vinci, his childhood, his 24 brothers and sisters, his beloved mother, and we saw him play his guitar and sing old, sad songs about homeless children and hobos, songs that made grown men cry, including himself. After the tape was finished, I got up to go to the kitchen for something to drink, and my friend went to the restroom. At that moment, we both heard a loud musical tone that sounded like a doorbell. Since I do not have a doorbell, we both said, what the heck is that? We both re-entered the living room where we had been watching the tape and searched everywhere where the sound had come from. My heart sank as I realized what it was. About two years earlier, I had one of those cheap doorbells that you plug into the wall using a battery operated button at your front door to operate the sound. I became so irritated by all the neighborhood kids ringing it that I just took the button off and put it in my piano stool. The battery had gone bad anyway. I never unplugged the part that rings. I had forgotten it was there because it was hidden behind a chair. That was eerie enough, but what really got me thinking was when I explained to my friend that I had the ringer set to only ring one long tone. To change it to the traditional two-tone ding-dong, you had to take the back off of the unit and set the switches according to the manual. Needless to say, it did ring in the ding-dong fashion. Oddly enough, it was my friend who said, maybe it was your grandfather saying hi. It hadn't even occurred to me. Shortly after that, I was explaining what happened to my mother on the phone, and it happened again. She could hear it, and we both fell silent. He was letting me know that his fears of leaving his family behind were pointless, and that he was with the rest of his family in heaven. I believe he was thanking me for being there for him when no one else could. It has been three years since his own death, and the doorbell has not rang since. Hey, my name is Maddie. Today, me and my best friend Summer had a strange encounter with a malevolent spirit. Let me explain what happened. 
A few months ago, me and one of my other friends, Alicia, met an eight-year-old spirit named Reese through a Ouija board. She seemed like a very sweet and innocent girl. She told us at her own will, and I repeat her own will, how she met her death. She apparently got beaten to death by her abusive father. Then a few weeks went by, and I introduced Reese to my now best friend Summer. They got along very well. It didn't seem like she had any sorts of problem with her or anyone she met. The next day we were playing when we got a call from my friend Amy. Long story short, she had an encounter with a spirit named Sarah. She claimed that Sarah was a very stubborn spirit. It took her hours just to get her to say goodbye. Amy also stated that Sarah seemed like a very lonely and clingy spirit who did not want to let her go. Then we made an attempt to contact Sarah through the board. It was a success. After we talked to Sarah for a bit, we asked her if she knew Reese. Sarah suddenly stopped moving to Planchet. We asked her if she was all right. She answered no. She also said that Reese isn't Reese. She said that Reese is actually a man named Roger. Sarah also told us that Roger was the one who killed her at the age of 27. The final thing she said about Roger was that if we ever told him that she was the one who told, that he would send her straight to the gates of hell. We tried to contact Reese, Roger, on December 10th, 2016, around 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. We successfully contacted Reese. At that period of time, he didn't know that we knew who he really was. Then, we did something that we both regret. We asked if she was hiding anything from us. He responded this in his own words. Fine, you fucking caught me. Then right after that he said, Who told you two idiots? We simply responded to the internet in hopes to keep Sarah safe. Then Roger responded by saying, You are a liar. Then the planchet started the circle around the alphabet counterclockwise, excluding the letter M. It did not touch the corners whatsoever. Summer and I started to panic, wondering what it was trying to do. I thought he simply lost control over the planchets, but Summer thought it was something more because at that time, it was spinning around continuously for about 30 seconds. So I suggested that if we put pressure on it, it might stop it. It just kept going even with pressure, but just slower. But after we lifted the pressure, it continued to spin and got even faster. After a while, it just randomly landed on Dubai. Maybe it just got tired or got sick of us panicking. I really need to know your thoughts on this, and if this occurrence was really legitimately something evil, because I don't know what to explain it for. Thank you for reading. I didn't believe in the Ouija board because they sell them at Toys R Us, so I didn't think they would sell something dangerous to kids and adults. I've read stories about the Ouija board, but I don't know if it's true. People do make up stories, so it's hard to tell if it's true or not. Some people say the Ouija board is just a game. Others say it's not just a game, and some say it's dangerous. I had to find out for myself if the Ouija board is really dangerous. On Sunday, I decided to go to Toys R Us to buy the board. I drove my car in the morning to Toys R Us, and I was just looking around at first for about an hour. After looking around, I went to the game section and I purchased the Ouija board. I drove back to my apartment and put the board in the closet. The same day, about 10 p.m., I decided to try it out. I took it out of the box and put it on my bed. I didn't have any candles, so I just dimmed the light. I put the board on my lap and the planchet on the board. I put my fingers on the planchet and I started around in circles for about a minute. I stopped and I started saying, is anybody out there? I kept saying it for about 15 to 20 minutes. And then all of a sudden, I felt a strange presence right above me. I was so scared that I ran out of my room and I threw the board in the garbage. I was very shaken. I went back to my room and turned the lights on, 
and I didn't sleep at all. And that's why I don't mess with Ouija boards. I have had several experiences, but I will tell you two of my most frightening. A friend and I had started playing with the Ouija board, and it ended up turning our lives upside down for the span of around two years. One night, my friend Judy, her husband Luke, Loma, and myself were watching a movie called Witchboard right in the middle of a winter storm. All footprints had been covered at this time, and the streets were empty. About halfway through the movie, the front door blew open, and we heard running footsteps come into the house up the stairs, down the hall, and into the bedroom where Judy's two-year-old lay sleeping. We were all just sitting there frozen in shock and fright when we heard a loud slam, which turned out to be the bedroom door, and the poor little boy started screaming, monster, monster. Luke took off up the stairs, only to find a very upset little boy, and nothing or no one else. As things started to calm down, Judy and I went to shut the front door, and there were still no footprints in the snow. The only snow that had come into the house was blowing from the wind. It was around March now, and one day, as I lay down for a nap, I felt the bed start to shake under me. I was uncertain if I had really felt what I thought I had, so I was not frightened, but I got up anyway. That was only the beginning. Not long after that, it became a constant thing. Every time I tried to lay in my bed, the shaking started to get more violent and it also felt as if someone was punching up at the mattress from beneath. I complained several times and no one believed me. It was now to the point where I was afraid to go to bed. I began sleeping at my friend Loma's house because her bed didn't shake. After staying at her house for two weeks, my mom said it was time to come home and I did agree but not until she promised to spend the first night sleeping in bed with me. That night, we had only been in bed for about 10 minutes before the bed started its usual shaking. It was very minor at first, so my mom started to make excuses for why it was happening. By the time five minutes had passed, it was now undeniable, and I could tell my mother was getting scared, but was trying to stay calm for my sake. The last straw for my mother was when the punching started. It was harder than I had ever felt before. We laid there for a moment while my mother mustered up the courage to peek under the bed. Of course, she didn't find anything and we promptly left the room and set ourselves up in the living room for the remainder of the night. My bed continued to shake and punch for some time thereafter, but it eventually quit. However, once in a while it will start, to this day, and I just get up or ignore it, and it stops. This encounter involved a Ouija board, and possibly my guardian angel. Years ago, a friend and I were goofing around with a Ouija board. Being a bit ignorant of the unknown, I mistakenly asked it how old I would be, when I died, and how. It replied that I would be 16 and that I would die in a car accident. A month or two after I turned 16, I was asked if I wanted to go out with my parents the next day to run errands. I said yes. That next morning, I woke up to discover that my parents left without me. I was annoyed. An hour after I woke up, my mother called me from the hospital. They had been hit by a transport truck an hour before. When I asked why they had left without me, my mom replied that her and my dad had tried for a half hour to get me up, and then they gave up. What makes it so scary is where the truck had hit. My one brother has to sit behind my mom, and my dad does not wear a seatbelt. Had I been in that car, I would have been sitting behind my dad with the seatbelt on. The transport truck hit the car on the driver's side almost imploding on the driver's and left backseat side. That's where I would have been sitting. Guardian Angel, I think so. I was celebrating Halloween around my best mate Felicity's house. We usually have a laugh and a joke, but neither of us had played with a Ouija board before. So, 
we gathered about seven friends from the neighborhood. First, we lit candles, one black, one red, one green, and one clear. Fliss had purchased the board from an old shop in the Stoke Town Center. We sat down in her dining room and placed the board right in the middle of the dining room table. We all placed our fingers on the gold planchet. I was the reader, so I asked the questions. At first, we did not get any response, so we all giggled and made fun of the silly people who got themselves worked up about these silly boards. About five seconds after we stopped giggling, we heard a massive bang on the floor. I thought it was one of the boys playing a trick, so I suggested that we all sit legs crossed on the chairs. I made sure we were all cross-legged, and I said, if it was a ghost that made the bang on the floor, can you please do it again? And it did. I spoke again. We will now try to communicate using the board. So we started to use the board again, and I again asked if anybody was present who wanted to communicate with us. The planchet moved to yes. I asked for a name, and it replied, I am unclean. Fliss's uncle had passed on, so I inquired if we were talking with her uncle, Ian. The response was no. Again, the planchet moved to the following letters, I am unclean. We had made contact with an apparent demon. We decided to say sorry for disturbing, and we thanked the spirit for its presence. However, it did not go. The spirit of demon flung Fliss back into the wall. Then it came for me. I had a vision of hell itself at that moment, and I remain grateful to this day that it did not hurt me. In telling the story, let me assure the reader that it was passed to me by my grandmother, Eileen. Eileen is in failing health, but her memory is untouched, and her ability to spin a tale is uncanny. This particular story is about her father, Joe, his first wife, in a house that will never be forgotten. My grandmother is a devout Christian, but she believes these tales of the unexplained to be completely true. Judge for yourself. In the late 1800s to early 1900s, it was common practice in the coal fields of Kentucky and West Virginia for a miner to spend the majority of the week at the mines while leaving his wife at home alone. This is exactly what Joe, my great-grandfather, did during his first marriage. After a hasty marriage, Joe bought a small, quaint home for himself and his new wife, Sue. Sue quickly alerted her husband to a potential problem. The house was directly across the road from the local cemetery. Joe, being a firm disbeliever in such superstitious nonsense like ghosts and spooks, had a good laugh when Sue begged him not to make her stay alone in a house so close to a graveyard and told her to get used to it. When Monday morning arrived, he left her alone and laughed as she sobbed on the porch, that night, after completing her tours, she settled down in the bed for a good night's rest and doused the lamps. As soon as she had climbed into bed, a strange noise became apparent outside. As she pulled the covers up around her head, she could hear something like barrels rolling or horses galloping around the house. She tried to sleep and eventually, as the sunrise drove the mysterious sounds away, found some comforting slumber. Every night, the noises started getting louder and louder, seeming to get closer to the house, and, on Friday night, Sue heard three knocks on the door. In a terrified fit, she screamed, leave me alone, and suddenly, the noises faded. The next morning brought Joe's return, and the first thing Sue did was beg him to let her leave the house, telling him of the haunted noises. He laughed unsympathetically and told her to get over this stupidity. In desperation, she bitterly screamed, Joe, I hope to God it gets you. Joe wasn't the least bit frightened and told her that it was Cheryl's local men playing tricks on her. Later that night, Sue slept well in Joe's arms, but some subtle suspicion began to eat at the unbeliever. As he drifted into a shallow sleep, he was startled at a loud crack coming from the fireplace that startled him, and as he sat upright in the bed, he saw the apparition of an elderly woman staring at him from the rocking chair at the foot of the bed. My grandmother says that Joe knew exactly who the woman was, but he took the knowledge of her identity to his grave because simply, she had been dead for six months before they moved into the house. Joe shut her with fear in her bony, cold hand, stretched to clutch his ankles as she latched onto his foot and began pulling him towards her and the footboard of the bed. 
Joe fainted with fright as he felt his foot slide down to the foot of the bed in the dead hand of the spirit. The next morning, Sue roused her pale husband and sat up in the bed as he opened his eyes and screamed with terror. The footbed of the bed was broken and the rocking chair had been toppled during the night. Joe immediately promised his frightened wife that not another night would be passed in this restless house, simply telling her, Sue, whatever it was, it got me. Thank you for reading my grandmother's story. I hope you found it entertaining because, well, I thought it was pretty frightening. See you later. I have told this story to people who are not there to witness the actual event, and some look at me as if I am just telling a story to get a good laugh, but I find nothing funny about it. Everything I am about to relate is true, and I guess in some bizarre way, I feel that by retelling this story to anyone who is willing to listen to it will bring me some comfort. On July 6, 1990, a high school friend shot himself in the head with a rifle in a nearby local baseball dugout. The act shocked and saddened everyone, especially his parents, of course, who did not want to believe their only son would take his own life. The days that followed his death were happening, for me, as if in a dream. Fearing this act would spark some sort of chain reaction, school's counselors were sent in to help the students grieve and discuss their feelings of loss. Days went by, and there seemed to be a cloud of despair and confusion hanging over our entire high school class. If he had lived, my friend would have graduated from high school with the rest of us that same year. When he died, he was two months away from his 18th birthday. About a week after his suicide, I was visiting my best friend at the time, we'll call her Anne, in her home. We were both still very affected by the death of our friend, and we began to talk late into the night about his possible reasons for taking his own life and how crazy and unexpected it was. We had been discussing the whole chain of events and basically trying to make sense of something we couldn't even imagine when I suddenly became very uncomfortable talking about our deceased friend. I was sitting at the time in a desk chair across from Anne who was sitting comfortably on her bed facing me. She was looking directly at me and she could see the discomfort on my face. She assumed I was just overreacting, and our discussion had gotten to me, so she stood up and moved towards the door of her bedroom and gestured in a sweeping motion with her arm for me to follow her into the kitchen down the hall. There was a single small desk light on behind me when she made this motion with her arm, so that when she moved, her body created a shadow on the wall. This is going to sound ridiculous, and I'm no physics expert, but when Anne swept her arm up into the air, gesturing me to follow her, her shadow did not follow her arm. Instead, there was a strange kind of delay, and I saw her arm move, and about 5-10 to 10 seconds later, the shadow of an arm moved, mimicking the same gesture she had just made. I, of course, thought my eyes were playing tricks on me and ignored the shadow, and I would have kept it to myself if only Anne had not turned to me and asked, did you just see that? I answered yes, of course, and we fled out of the room and into the kitchen. Anne's house was large, and our frightened voices bounced off the columned walls, but nothing ever occurred after that. My friend Anne and I no longer speak, and I am sure that if she knew I was relaying this story to strangers, she would think I was crazy, but I remember the death of her high school friend as if it were yesterday, and I can't help wishing that the shadow we saw was indeed a sign from our friend, but I will never be too sure. I write this story in his memory, and in the hope that he is in a place where his problems have been all taken away. Thanks for reading. This story I'm about to tell you has been talked about in my family for years. Now it has been passed down to my own daughter who tells it to her friends at slumber parties. It begins with the first time I ever saw anything when I was around the age of 7. It happened in a house that we lived in years ago in western New York. I shared a room with my sister. We both had the feeling something was always watching us, but being so young, we never really worried all that much about it until one night while I was trying to sleep. My bed was up against one wall and my sister's bed faced the other. I turned so I was facing the wall when I opened my eyes after getting that feeling of being watched again. There, standing in the wall was a woman. She was a young woman, dressed all in black, high white lace collar, wearing a cameo, and hair pulled up neatly in a bun. She stood there with her hands folded in front of her, smiling sweetly at me. 
Now, mind you, I was seven years old, so I pulled the covers up over my head and then down again to take a peek just to see if she was still there, which she was, and this time with a bigger smile. I got so scared I jumped from my bed and ran across the room to my sister's bed. I landed right on top of her, waking her up, of course. I told her there was a lady in my wall, but when we looked again, the woman was gone. The next day I told my mom about it. She said it must have been just my guardian angel and left it at that. She refused to talk about it any further or even years later. Then recently, my brother and I got to talking about that house. He said, don't you remember what the neighborhood kids used to say about our house? And of course, I didn't remember a thing. He told me that apparently a couple had died there years ago. Then he asked me if I remembered the time that he and I were in the backyard and we saw the old man in the attic window. And all of a sudden it rushed back. Bam. Right when he told me about the old man in the attic window, I had a major flashback and remembered it like it was yesterday. I don't even have to tell you even after all these years it scared me. Well, many years have passed since we lived there, but I still have dreams about that house and I wish the dreams would stop. I have many other scary stories to tell, but I freaked myself out telling this one so the others will have to wait. This incident happened about two years ago. I was 17 at the time working at a restaurant motel in Old Saybrook, Connecticut called The Castle. The scariest thing about this place, besides the low pay, was the old story of what happened to one of its original owners. From almost my first day working there, I was told that one of the members of the family who built the house had killed himself on the grounds. The story was that one night, the son had discovered that his fiance was cheating on him with one of his close friends. Deep in depression, the son climbed to the tallest tower of the castle, tied a rope to some type of pole on the roof, and hanged himself. The next morning as the parents were leaving the home, they saw him hanging. They immediately sold the mansion and it has been a hotel ever since. Many employees said that they had heard and seen things, yet I, as most people believe at first, didn't believe the stories. That is, until one night, I was working the late late shift with a friend of mine named Katie. We were cleaning up the dining room after closing when we heard the kitchen door slam shut. I had popped them open, but as the wind off Long Island sound is pretty strong, I figured they had been blown shut. Katie yelled at me to get over there and look at the kitchen. When I arrived, I saw a weird green light pouring through the round window of the door and flooding out the crack at the bottom. Still unconvinced of any supernatural going on, so I tried to open the door, but it was not happening. I thought someone was in there, and I knew if the place got trashed, I would get fired, so I reared back and tried to put my shoulder through the door. At the time, I was about 6'2", 200 pounds, played football and lifted a lot of weights. The door should have popped right open, but not this time. Katie and I peered into the window, and there, plain as day, was a man dressed in antique clothes with a noose around his neck looking right back at us. He walked by and the green light left us. We instantly figured, forget the boss, it's quitting time. We ran outside and could barely light our cigarettes. Our hands were shaking so badly. From then on, I was a believer and I knew I would never, ever doubt ghosts ever again. My aunt and uncle had a passion for restoring old country houses, the last of which had been at an end at the turn of the century. The house sits on 50 acres at the top of a hill, next to a historic old church with an equally historic old graveyard. I can't claim to recall for certain, but I think the church was used as a field hospital during the Civil War. My uncle would tell us the stories about the months after they moved into the house. Their bedroom was on the second of three floors, near the large, almost spiral staircase that emptied into the foyer to two sitting areas. Late in the evening, while they were in bed, my aunt and uncle would hear what sounded like a distant crowd of people in conversation. Living in quiet country houses most of their lives made them fairly light sleepers. The local volunteer fire department changed that over time. I'll get to that. My uncle would get up to check out the noise and find nothing, but since it was an old house with a boiler, and that it was more or less near town, there were many possible rational explanations for the noise. Still. Over the course of a few months, the noises grew louder and louder until it sounded like a party was being thrown in their own house and my aunt and uncle weren't invited. 
This had grown so gradually that my uncle was much more annoyed than fearful. One night, he went to the stairs and shouted for them to shut up so we can get some sleep. That seemed to scale back the noise enough to satisfy him, although it didn't go away completely. The next weekend, he took a walk for the first time through the local graveyard and noticed many of the stones were overturned and some of the plots were neglected. He righted the headstones and cleaned up some of the plots that weekend and never again heard the noises in the house. My uncle passed away in that house one year ago this October. Subsequently, I spent a great deal more time there last winter than I had before taking care of a few things for my aunt. I slept on the top floor across from the game room. Many nights an air raid siren would go off, summoning the local volunteer firefighters to the station house. I never did get used to sleeping through that. Then one night, the siren wailed at about 2am, and I was having a hard time going back to sleep. I was wide awake when I heard something. It lasted only an instant and seemed to me to be a crowd in the distance that had just been told the punchline to a very funny joke. Whatever it was, it reminded me of one of my uncle's stories. As an epilogue, I should mention that my aunt is trying to sell the house. So far, the most likely buyer is the local funeral home. While sitting around looking at photo albums with my grandmother, we came across some newspaper clippings. The clippings were from a newspaper in Indiana. They were about an old brick house being torn down. Since we live in Mississippi, I found it strange that my grandmother would have these clippings, so I questioned her about them. She then told me one of the eeriest stories I have ever heard. In 1946, my grandmother lived in Nobile, Indiana with her husband and their child. They lived in an old brick house that was built before the Civil War and stood on the outskirts of town. It was a large house with very high ceilings and wooden floors. In the master bedroom was a closet with a heavy wooden door that did not have a knob, only a wooden latch to keep the door closed. My grandmother would shut and latch the closet. When she would leave the room and return the closet door would be standing wide open. She would shut the door again and go about her chores. When she returned, the door would be open. She did this several times a day. She said the door stayed open more than she could keep it closed. She was more annoyed than scared by this strange event. About eight months later, she and her husband divorced and she moved to Mississippi with my grandfather. The house she had lived in did not cross her mind until 10 years later when her aunt Bonnie wrote her a letter and sent her the newspaper clippings. The clippings talked about her old house and reported that it had been torn down. While they were tearing down the house, a hole was discovered under the closet floor. They had found the remains of a man in the hole. It was believed to be the body of a soldier from the Civil War. After lurking around here for ages reading everyone else's story, I finally got up the nerve to post one of my own. My story isn't as dramatic or interesting as some of the other stories posted here, but I feel confident enough to post it because three other people have had experience in this particular house, so here it goes. This happened a few months ago while I was visiting a friend's house one evening. I referred to my friend as G. A mutual friend of ours, J, was also present. This was my first and only visit to the house, and no one else was home at the time apart from the three of us. The house in question is an old wood villa, which would be, at a guess, 80 to 100 years old. It's a rather large one-level structure with two long and connected hallways, one that leads from the front door to the back of the house and another that spans across the back of the house. Together, the hallways form the shape of a T. While eating dinner in the kitchen, dining room area located in the back portion of the house, something drew my attention to the right, so I glanced down to the top section of the hallway. As I watched, a dark shadow moved across very quickly from right to left, as though it just moved up the other long hall, through the center of the house, then straight ahead crossing the top hallway. I didn't say anything at the time, although I was curious about what I had seen. I have to say that while I definitely believe in ghosts, I didn't want to get too excited about something which could have a very logical explanation for. After dinner, G invited us on a tour of the house, and while exploring the rooms off the back hallway, I carefully checked to see if there were any windows that could have let car headlights in to cause the shadow I'd seen, but I couldn't find anything to explain it. 
Sometime later, G left the lounge to make coffee and, while she was out of the room, I whispered to Jay that I had seen a shadow cross the back hall. She surprised me by telling me that she too had seen a ghost moving from right to left in the same exact place, only she seen it twice before in broad daylight. We were intrigued and quite excited about this, but didn't say anything to G as we didn't want to frighten her. Interestingly enough, G approached Jay recently to ask her opinion about ghosts because a young woman who also lives in the house claimed to see a shadow move up the hallway. She was concerned because she too would be spending several weeks alone there, and understandably, she was frightened. G explained that while she hadn't seen anything herself, there was one occasion when she was walking up the hallway and she felt like she accidentally pushed someone out of the way, even though she couldn't see anyone there. I've been in various places before where I've been able to sense unseen presences. I've had one experience where I used to get a feeling of overwhelming fear every time I went into one particular room in a house my parents owned. With the shadow that Jay and I saw, we didn't feel any strong feelings or emotions connected with it. At this moment in time, I haven't heard any more events in that house. When I was about 12 years old, my brother, sister, and I moved into my grandparents' house. Ever since, we could remember we heard stories about the house being haunted. Nothing too big, but strange things happened a lot. Rumor had it that there used to be a horse track room stable where my grandparents built their house and a little boy had been trampled in there. We have never actually checked into this story, but it is what we heard. At least, it is what we were told. Anyway... All of us grandkids were petrified of going upstairs. It was always so cold up there and just freaky, but that was where all the bedrooms were, so when we moved in, we had no choice. Actually, I had no choice. My little brother and sister had beds set up downstairs, and I slept upstairs. When I was about four, I had taken up smoking cigarettes, but no one knew about it. I used to turn off my bedroom light and smoke cigarettes. I turned off my light just in case my grandparents happened to come up the stairs. They always turned on the hall light to help their way up the stairs. This way, I would know how to put out my cigarette and spray air freshener. One night, I was upstairs alone smoking when I heard someone coming up the stairs. It was late and everyone had been in bed. The hallway light never came on, but all the same time, I butted out my cigarette and waited, but no one ever came up. This happened quite a few times and I just got used to it. This house is about 50 or 60 years old. The doors are the old latch type and made of nothing but wood. They are solid. To close the door, you have to lift the hook and latch it onto the other part of the door. To open the door, you have to lift the handle and pull the door open. On my bedroom door, I also had an eye hook lock to keep my room locked and my little brother out. I would be laying in bed at night watching TV and my bedroom door would just pop open, but it would never open all the way because of the lock on my door. I never thought anything of it. I just thought it was a breeze until my brother and I started sharing stories about what was happening in that room in the house. I have since moved out and my brother moved into my old room. We have all grown up and started sleeping upstairs and we have gotten over our fears pretty much. There were four bedrooms upstairs and they were set up weird. The house was square, two bedrooms on each side of the house with a staircase up the middle. To get to the two rooms, you have to walk through the main two ones. When my little sister finally decided to move upstairs, she moved into the room behind mine. She swears to hearing a little boy crying in her room at night. Recently, I bought a Ouija board and have been using it at my new house. One night, my cousin, brother, sister, and boyfriend were using it when my cousin and I started talking about how we used to use the board when we were younger at my grandparents' house. My cousin remembers talking to a little boy who died at this location, and she remembers the little boy telling us his vision of the story of what happened to him. He told us his name was Brandon, and his father beat him in the tack room, and that unlike the story being passed around, he hadn't been trampled at all. Which story is true, I don't know, and I guess we'll never know. My little brother is the only one of us left living with my grandparents, and he is now living in my old bedroom. He has heard the footsteps coming up the stairs when he was doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. He has heard whimpering, and he has talked to this little boy. Not literally talking, but questions will pop into his head that he already knows the answers to, like, what year is it? And he will answer out loud. 
He will not even be thinking about a certain thing, and then all of a sudden, he'll have a question. The door pops open on him, but he doesn't have the latch, so it pops open and closes again. Now, here's the last we have heard from the spirits in our grandparents' house. He was sitting in his room talking to his girlfriend on the phone when he heard someone coming up the stairs. The footsteps stopped at the top of the stairs. He hung up with his girlfriend and went into the hallway, but nobody was there. Now, what happens next makes us believe that the little boy was beaten to death and not trampled as everyone had been told. The footsteps were heavy ones, definitely not of those of a child. When my brother realized no one was there, he just assumed that it was the father because of the heavy footsteps. He told the father that if he didn't leave Brandon, the little boy, alone, that he was going to kill himself and haunt his butt down. He would then beat him to a fine pulp, then come back to life, yeah right, dig up his grave, and burn his mangy hide. My brother has become attached to Brandon and has not heard anything from him about his father or heard his father around the house. I'm here to tell you about the strange occurrences that happened to my mother at the Lawrence family mansion on Teddington Park Avenue in Toronto. The first thing you need to know is that my mom is a down-to-earth, no-nonsense type, and she believes that the house was, as all its tenants have believed in the past, that it is haunted. My mom lived in an apartment, dirt cheap because it was haunted, at the top of the mansion. It was, she says, extremely beautiful. High vaulted ceilings, many rooms, and spacious too. In the kitchen, there was a mirror called the talking mirror. This was because anybody who stayed in the kitchen long enough started randomly talking to themselves in the mirror. My mother says no matter who passed it, they started to babble. My mom even talked to herself without realizing it, until something brought her attention back to where she was and what she was doing, making her realize that she had been talking to herself. On the bottom floor, a German man named Hans, I don't know how to spell it, he was the most serious man my mom had ever known. My mom visited him sometimes, and oftentimes she would go into this bathroom that was there, and just study the CLW footed top that dated back to the 1930s. She got the most creepy feeling looking at it, like she could almost see a body lying in it. She compared it to the portrait of Murder of Merit, which is a painting of a man with his throat and wrist slit. She told the man, and he said that he heard noises coming from it at night, and that he knew it must have been haunted because he said you could almost see the outline of a body in it. They looked into the history of the home, and sure enough, somebody had hurt themselves in the tub around the 1950s. Another thing near the bathroom was a hall, where people would say they felt a deep desire to run to get down it, and that before going down it, you had to stop and brace yourself, getting up your courage, like there was a wall there stopping you from going that you had to get through. Another place in the house was a great living room. It was in the apartment of a policeman and his girlfriend. They always argued, mostly in that room. One night, the girlfriend took the man's gun and held it to his head as they argued. People always reported that happy couples would always go into that room and just start arguing. Old spots were numerous in the house. I could tell you many other stories about various spots, but I have to get going. My mom says the house is sold for over $5 million, and that she suspects that someone tore the house down to get rid of the hauntings and build a replica. My name is Lindsay. I've lived with my family in this home for four years now, and ever since we've lived here, we've experienced some things. It seems though that most things have happened in my bedroom, and I often thought my parents did not believe the things I had told them about. The first month of living in my home, my mother awoke in the morning to find a painting of a woman. This painting was lying on the floor in the closet. It appeared overnight. 
She had questioned all of us in the home, and nobody had seen it before. The music boxes would play randomly in the middle of the night. Doorknobs, turning seconds before turning them yourself. My bedroom door always sounded like it was opening by itself, when it was really shut. It wasn't for a while when I actually started to see people, or should I say ghosts, in my room while I was sleeping. I have seen a translucent woman wearing brown rags several times. The first I'd ever seen her, she was standing at the foot of my bed with her mouth wide open, as if she was screaming, but I never heard a sound. It felt as though my heart had stopped. I was frozen with fear. I had rolled over and told myself it wasn't actually there and that I was seeing things. Then about a month later, the same lady sat in my chair, in my room, just watching me. I then covered my face with my pillow and went back to sleep. In the morning, I told my mother about both times this lady being in my room, and she just mocked me. She just kind of laughed and joked about it. She told me that the first time that the lady was there, it was because her teeth hurt. Because I'm planning on becoming a dentist after schooling. I didn't think my mom believed me at all. Sometime after that, a tall man stood next to the head of my bed. Once again, just staring at me. When I awoke, I started screaming and my mother came running into my room. She told me it was just a dream and to go back to bed, but I knew it wasn't. She was just saying what parents would say, just to make me feel better. It was strange how my room was the only room I'd ever seen them in. My family would just make fun of me and would make stupid jokes about the ghost in my room. Later one night, my sister was across the hall from me sleeping when she woke to a flash that lit up the room at one in the morning. This was when she was 20. She then ran into my room and slept next to me. She was not sure that it was a flash from a camera since we were upstairs and everyone was sleeping. We never figured what the flash was. When my mother was away on vacation and I was the only one home, I was sleeping and when I woke in the middle of the night, I found myself eye to eye with a young girl who had to have been at least 10. She had a wound in her head where her eye had been. Terrifyingly, there was a hole through her head. It was the right eye that had been gone. This was the most frightening thing I'd ever seen. I once again couldn't do anything. I was the only one home, so I laid there and went back to sleep. Once again, I see the woman lady, except this time, I find myself fighting her in my dream. The weird thing was, a mobile that was hanging above me on my ceiling had fallen and hit me in the stomach while I was sleeping. I still found that my parents didn't believe me until one night, my dad went downstairs for a drink at one in the morning. That's when he heard some girl humming a song. He thought it was me, until he realized that he and my mom were the only ones home that night. Later the same night at 3 in the morning, my mother awoke and had to use the restroom. While she was walking down the hall, she heard a lady talking. My parents told me about this when I arrived home the next morning, and now they believe me. We don't know about who these ghosts are, but we are trying to find some history about our house, as it was built in 1890. Maybe the history will reveal who these ghosts are, and why they are there. I grew up in a typical Maribyrish small southern town in southeast Tennessee. Our home was less than 80 feet from a Norfolk Southern Railroad line. The tracks were on a rise in the hill, 
and from the second story window of our home, you would be parallel with the tracks. The town I grew up in was once a coal mining camp and then grew to be a coal mining town. Point of fact, the town's name came from the original proprietor of the first train depot. It was called Daisy, after his only daughter. From my house, the original train depot was situated just about a mile north, and the area of the train tracks in between was often referred to as Black Track because there were several curves in the railway and coal was often spilled in these curves, leaving the soil covered in the black, chalky coal residue. It is purportedly haunted, and there are several ghastly and ghostly tales attributed to that area of track. What I'm able to gather, one story is that a female slave was once accused of leading other slaves to freedom via the train tracks, and when her trajectory was discovered by her owner, she was tied to the tracks until a train came through, chopping off both of her feet. Once this was done, she was carried to the slave quarters as an example of what would happen to all others who attempted escape or assisted others in escaping. Slowly she bled to death, despite the other slave's best effort. I know several people who have laid their hands on the Bible today and testify seeing her feetless body in the area. Other stories about a train wreck that happened about 15 yards from the back door of my old home. In southern Tennessee, we do not get much snow, but we can get quite a bit of rain. Apparently in the late 30s, a weather front came through, bringing a lot of rain and flash flooding to the area. One night after the rain had slowed to a drizzle, a fully loaded train was slowing to stop at the depot, not knowing that the ground below was giving way under its weight. During the initial wreck, several railroad workers and hobos were trapped in the rubble. Many of the rescuers were local farmers and residents who perished as the mud shifted under the weight of the debris, and ultimately, a large land and debris slide halted all rescue efforts. As many as 50 people perished, and the old timers would say that they could hear people moaning and screaming for help for days after the wreck, and how help never came. Some people swear that they could hear the sorrowful screams and moans of the trapped, unbright, still nights. Lastly, Another story about the area of tracks has to do with teenage hormones and stupidity. Along the section of track is an old paved road that weaves back and forth across the tracks. In the 50s and 60s, this area of road was used by teenagers to prove the muscle in their machines and the guts in their drivers. More than one person has perished in their efforts to outrun the train. Many people say that those untimely deaths are the culprits of strange flashes of light that are often seen in that area. I am new to this site, and I've read many of the stories posted. I wanted to share my experiences. For the past five years, myself, my son, who is turning six, and my daughter, who will be two this fall, lived in a small cottage-style house with a full basement. The first weekend that I moved in, I, of course, had a party. My son stayed with my parents for the night. I also had a roommate for the first two months that I moved into the home. She had a cordless phone in the basement, and I had a regular phone upstairs. After our guests left for the evening, I took the cordless phone upstairs to make some calls. When I went to bed, I left the phone on the floor in my room. The next morning, I heard someone walking up the basement stairs. My bed was on the other side of the wall that led to the basement. I heard the footsteps walk through the kitchen, small dining room, and into the living room. I had my bedroom door shut 
and I tried to call out to my roommate to tell her to come in. I thought that she was looking for the phone. It was then that I realized that I couldn't open my eyes, move, or even speak. I heard the footsteps pass through my doorway. The door never opened. I noticed that the closer they got to my bed, that the floor appeared to be shaking, hence the shaking ghost. The only auditory comparison I can give is it sounded like when my dad would do laundry and try to cram 20 pairs of jeans in a washer that had five. The whole machine would shake and you could hear it all over the house. The bathroom floor would even vibrate. That is what it felt like to me. I realized that whatever it was, was standing over me, and soon, I felt a hand resting on my hip. It was just a gentle pressure. I think that he was trying to see who was in the house. At that moment, I was extremely terrified and still couldn't move, speak, or even open my eyes. There was a banging on my window. The noise stopped and whatever had touched me let go. I jumped out of bed, and there was nothing in the room. Apparently, my dad had been standing outside for 10 minutes banging on the door. I never heard him pull into the driveway, which is right outside my window, or knock on the door. He also said that he tried to call us, and I'd never heard the phone ring. I never had this happen again until just two nights ago. My daughter and I share a room, and around two in the morning, she woke up. I could hear her cry out, Mama, and I tried to get up. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move anything but to lift my head off the pillow briefly. I realized that the floor was shaking again. I tried to open my eyes to look at it, and I couldn't. I believe that I was looking to the crib at my daughter. I didn't feel anything evil, but I don't think it wanted me to see it. After about five minutes, the shaking stopped and my daughter was back asleep. It all happened so strange that I even considered that I was maybe dreaming it all. When I checked the crib, my daughter seemed fine and nothing was out of place. Some other just normal haunting things I've experienced are footsteps and cabinets open when I know that I left them closed. The ghost seems to like my kids and likes to check up on them. I smoke, so during the winter when it is cold, I go down into the basement and smoke by the back cellar steps. I have often heard footsteps go from one bedroom to another, but they never go back out of the last room they entered. Also, when my daughter was in her baby swing, any time I went downstairs, I would hear footsteps walk over to the swing and stop. They are always too heavy and slow to be my sons. Also, whenever I hear them and go back upstairs, he is soundly asleep in his room, so I know that it was never my son. There have been a few times that I felt that I was unwelcome in the basement. I feel like I'm being watched in there, and that something doesn't like me to be there. I have also felt that feeling walking past my kitchen at night. It's like something is standing there watching me, and this thing seems very cold. I have never been harmed or felt completely threatened by anything. My son has complained of being scared, but if he has seen or heard anything, he doesn't tell me. I just wanted to share my story. We are moving in a month, so it will be interesting to see if the people that end up renting my house have any experiences too. When I was about six or seven, I woke up in the middle of the night for a strange reason. I had a loft bed, and I looked down at my closet. As I was looking, I saw my bead curtains that were hanging over my closet starting to sway. I then felt something brush the side of my arm. I flipped out and almost ran to my parents' room, about halfway to my parents' room. 
I came to the realization that maybe my fan was on. When I went back to my room, I noticed that my fan had been unplugged the whole time. I knew that, that my curtains were definitely moving on their own. I didn't even own any pets, so I had no logical explanation for what had happened. I remember always seeing someone in the corner of my eye. I would turn to see who it was, but when I did, no one was there. Things would disappear such as homework and school supplies, then they would reappear on the kitchen counter and on my dresser. I would always feel someone is watching me, then I turned around to see that no one was there. I remember one time in particular, I had a friend sleep over. We were up in my tree fort, and it was dark out, and we were hiding inside. We had dared each other to turn off our flashlight so that it was pitch black we were getting ready to open the side door when a pair of red eyes appeared on the door window we rushed inside and started to shake from fright i have moved from that house five weeks ago and have lived in that house for seven years i'm glad not to be in that house anymore i feel a presence here but i don't know if it's good or bad I believe I can like the video, I believe I can share it and subscribe if I'm new, because it helps channels grow, and this is what we do when we hit the show, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway guys, uh, ignore the weird singing for a second and I appreciate your subscribership. If you got to the end of the video, please leave a keyword at the end, that way I know you got to the end of the video and the keyword is glasses glasses because everybody likes glasses right anybody anyway guys love you i'll see you in the next video please leave a like share and subscribe like i said it means a lot and i will see you to the end of the video in the next one love you